I've never spoken about this to anyone, apart from the girl who was with me when it happened. We had just turned 18, and it was in the summer. There's this old abandoned bandstand where we would go to drink wine and talk about the future and watch the stars. We went often. I now realize that this was a bit silly of us, but we were young. One night, it would have to be around 2 a.m., a dude dressed in all black walked past the road above us and looked down at us. My friend was creeped out and I was like, it's okay. If you don't feel comfortable, we can leave. We started to gather our things and the guy jumped up through the entrance on the other side. The road he was on to the entrance would have been like a five minute walk and we couldn't have been getting ready to leave for longer than two minutes. We run away and he followed us, chasing us up the steps. It was honestly the scariest experience of our lives. My friend was falling over as she ran because she was so scared. So I put her in front of me so I could keep picking her up. She said she had looked behind us and he was so close. She said if he had reached out with his hand, he would have been able to grab my hoodie and pull me back. We ran for about another 10 minutes. I'm not sure exactly when he stopped following us, but it was so scary. We ran onto the grounds of my old high school with the idea of, if he does do anything, he will be on CCTV. We never drank there again after that night and never found out who he was, but I have to believe his intentions were not good. This happened to me in my 20s, about five or six years ago. I went out for dinner with my friend I had left my car at her condo since we carpooled. When we returned to her condo, we part ways. She went into her unit by the elevator and I walked to my car outside. It was around 11 p.m. and there were a lot of lights around, but I still took the precaution considering that this wasn't the best part of town. No one else was outside, no cars leaving or coming in. I got in my car and proceeded to drive on my merry way home as normal. I pulled up to the light and a white SUV pulled up beside me. I absentmindedly looked around and Lynn looked to my right and made eye contact with the driver. Not sure how long he was staring for, but it was creepy. I suddenly got a cold sweat feeling. I proceeded to drive down the long street and his car was always beside mine. I noticed that he was matching my speed and trying to look over at me. I ignored it. This went on for 15 minutes down the same street. My house was another 15 minutes away. There were other cars, but they mostly turned into smaller streets. I was nervous the whole time, so I texted my friend and my boyfriend and let them know what was happening. But as of now, I was fine, and maybe I was just misinterpreting this. At one point, the street became one lane because of the cars parked on the right side overnight, so the SUV ended up behind me the whole way. I finally made a turn to another main street where there is more traffic. Somehow he kept up and was pretty much tailing me. I called my boyfriend freaking out, almost crying at this point. He told me to stay calm and try to turn on another major street and not be on a small one just in case something happened. We hit an area with construction workers working on the road so the two lanes were closing. I was on the far left. He pulled up to the pylons to my right and rolled down his window. I'm pretty sure he was shouting at me at this point. His lips were moving, but I don't know what he said. He pointed at me to roll down my window. He looked angry and a little deranged. I sped off as soon as the light changed, but he was stuck in that lane because no one was letting him through. I was able to get home safely and my boyfriend met up with me in the garage. I was shaking, but thankfully it never happened again. When I told this story to my friends, there was questions of, well, if there was something wrong with your car and he just wanted to tell you, but there wasn't. No flat tire or open door. Gas cap was intact. To this day, I have no idea what he wanted. I am a young teen. I'm quite small. I'm female and I have bad anxiety so I usually keep my head down and stay away from situations. Well recently I've gotten a bit more chaotic and unwinded a bit so I've been doing more risky stuff. 
Anyways, I took my friends to the mall for a girl's day, and we were there from morning to night. My father brought everyone back home, and one of my closer friends decided to stay the night. So we get back to my house, and we put all our new stuff inside, and played video games for around an hour. Then I had the brilliant idea to go to the park. My friend agreed, so we got ready, and around this time, it was 12.40, almost 1 a.m., my dad hesitantly let us, but if the park had a closing time, we had to walk the block instead. The park ended up being closed, so we walked around the block. My friend was a bit scared, so she FaceTimed her girlfriend, and we listened to music on our AirPod and got some pictures. Ten minutes into walking the block a few times, my friend got off the phone, and we planned on going back. I have to explain what the block looks like. My house is in the middle. The park is in the corner, and a few family friends live near. So we walked down one of the roads one last time, and there was a party going on at one of the houses next to the park. When we originally walked by this park, a boy at the party called my friend Emo. So anyway, there was a truck next to the house facing the park, and three people were in the truck. One man, in his 30s or so, was still getting in the truck and looked at me for a few seconds. We waited for them to drive by while standing at the park grounds at the entrance, but the truck didn't move. My friend stopped to change her playlist on my phone while I watched the truck. Then after the men in the truck watched us for a few minutes, they pulled into the park inches away from my friend. I grabbed my friend's arm and pulled her and we ran fast. The truck took a U-turn and started following us, so I ran into a lady's yard with my friend, hoping that they would think that that was our house. They stopped for a little bit and ended up driving past. My friend and I ran back to my house and told my dad and didn't leave the house until the next morning. A couple days ago, I was walking the dog around my lake at my condominium, like I always do. It was around 6.30pm and the sky was getting a little dark. My dog is a golden retriever and she's very friendly with other people and dogs. She is 6 months old and rarely barks or growls at anybody. She actually loves being petted by strangers, but she is usually very calm regardless of if people pet her or not. Anyway, we were walking and suddenly, I turned around and saw a guy coming out of nowhere. The guy looked odd. He had glasses and he walked nervously. He was still far away from us, so I don't think he was nervous about my dog. As he got closer to us, I just stopped and moved to the side like I usually do when someone's coming up behind us. I do this so they can walk ahead of us and my dog stops constantly, looking back, moving its tail, looking forward to being pet. But instead, my dog starts getting restless and starts growling nervously while looking at the guy. I try to calm her down and smile at the guy, trying to be friendly. But the guy just looked at me with a serious face and started reaching for something in his backpack. At this point, my dog starts barking and I just get this bad feeling and shiver down my spine. For a second, I thought, what if this guy had a weapon or something? The guy kept walking, looking at me, while reaching his backpack as my dog kept barking at him. I apologized for my dog's behavior and tried to tell him that my dog usually doesn't behave like that, but the guy just ignored me. Finally, he just passes us and my dog stops barking, but is still agitated. I just sat down next to her, trying to calm her down, while the guy just gets lost between some houses instead of walking up the lake path, which seemed weird to me. Maybe I was just paranoid. Maybe the guy just didn't like dogs, which is fine. I try to be really respectful to people who don't like dogs. After he got lost from my sight, my dog just went back to her usual friendly self and we were able to finish our walk. But something really felt weird about this guy and this encounter has made me feel uncomfortable. This happened to me years ago when I was around the age of 19 or 20 and worked retail part-time at the mall. I was the closing shift that night and left around 10.30 p.m. to head home. I often took the inner streets, first the freeway, which included a small stretch of back road that was usually pretty empty. 
especially during this time of night. This particular night, I noticed a car about 10 minutes into my 30 minute drive home going the same way as me and at the time didn't think much of it. As we were approaching the stretch of back road that's usually deserted at this time, the driver behind me started flashing his high beams and slowing down and speeding up while tailgating me. I remember feeling panicked like they might hit my car. Eventually the car pulls up beside me and now I can see a middle aged man that's pointing towards the back of my car and then motioning me to roll down my window. I rolled down my window about halfway and he says something about how it looks like my tire is flattening and I'm going to damage my rim if I didn't pull over soon. I tell him I don't know how to change a tire but I'm not too far from home so I should be fine. But he's pretty insistent about it would only take a few minutes and that he would be happy to help. I know something is off because my car seems to be driving fine. I politely say I'm fine but thanks anyway and roll up my window. He drives next to me for what feels like forever, but it couldn't be more than a few minutes or so. At this point, something feels so off that I'm afraid to even physically look in his direction. I focus on the road the best I can, and eventually he slows down and moves to get behind me again. After a few minutes, we reached a more populated, well-lit part of town, and I see him make a U-turn. I get home and take a look at my tire, and it's perfectly fine. I have no idea if he followed me from the mall or what the man's intentions were, but I think it's safe to say they weren't anything good. I even had my dad check all my tires the next morning and the tire pressure on all of them was in the normal range. I still think of that night from time to time and it makes me nauseous to think about how different things might be today if I decided to pull over that night. I'm a new mom. My daughter means the world to me. This happened to me when she was almost one year old. We were in the fruit and veggies section of Fred's. It had been a normal day. Some people waved at her. Some smiled. A few others sent kind words her way. My daughter was enjoying interacting with passerbys, but then out of the corner of my eye, I see a man trying to communicate with my daughter. He made sounds loud enough to get her attention, but quiet enough that I wouldn't hear. I only saw it because he was making some weird kissy faces at her as he did it. Something about it felt terribly off. Usually people interact with her while making it very obvious to me, but this guy was making it an effort to stay just out of my eyesight while keeping his eyes on my daughter. I've never experienced anything like this before. I was alone and unsure what to do. So I just left the section of the store and tried to forget about it. Later on, while checking out, I saw once more that man. He was right behind me in the checkout lane next to mine, staring wide-eyed with a blank expression at my daughter. I froze. I recalled the cashier asking me if someone was making me feel uncomfortable, but I was so shaken up that I couldn't get the words out. She called an escort for me. An employee walked us out to our car as I manically scanned the row of cars. He loaded my car up as I buckled in my daughter and patiently waited till I locked the doors and drove off to go back inside. Perhaps I was overthinking things, but that sense of terror is something I'll never forget. I'm female. A few years ago, I think I was 21. I was going back home after a party. It was between midnight and 1am and I had to take the tramway to get back home. When I got in, I didn't feel very safe because at this hour, there are many people and a lot of them are either high or drunk. So I put my earphones in and began to listen to music, but I felt that something was odd. You know when you have this feeling that someone's looking at you, but you just can't see them? That's what I felt. So 20 minutes had gone by and I arrived at my station. There were a few people who stopped there, but I saw a guy looking at me and walking towards me. I get a little scared and try to walk as fast as I could, but I had one kilometer to make it home. Plus, there was no one in the streets except me and this guy. It was a residential area. I tried to calm down by telling myself that I was just paranoid. So I looked back and I saw that the guy was walking at the same speed as me. 
So I panicked and one of my earphones fell as I heard the guy next to me. I froze. I couldn't move. I was paralyzed. And then the guy asked me for a cigarette. I told him I had none and he left. It must be silly, but I scared myself for a simple cigarette. Please guys, I beg you, do not run after anyone to ask them for a cigarette, especially at night. This happened a few months ago. I'm a 23 year old male. I was driving home from a trip to the store while talking to my friend on the phone. It was around 9 or 10 p.m. I pull into my driveway, park, and talk to my friend for a minute while I'm sitting in the car. All of a sudden, the sketchy car pulls up directly behind me. There's no way I could back out without hitting the passenger side of it. It's dark, my driveway lights are kind of dim, and they deliberately turn off the lights of their car when they pulled up behind me, but I faintly spotted three guys in it. I'm feeling real creeped out at this point, so I asked my friend, what should I do? We both decided that I should wait it out a bit and see if they would leave. A few minutes go by and they're still there. Eventually, we figured the best plan of action would be to stay on the phone, calmly grab my bags from my trunk without breaking eye contact with the people in the car and walk to my door, which is only about 15 feet away. In retrospect, it would have probably been a better idea just to call my parents and ask them to open the door for me from the inside. I stepped outside, then grabbed my stuff from the trunk. The guy in the rear passenger seat of the car cracks the door open and the guy in the front passenger seat is staring me down. They're definitely assessing if I'm a viable target. I kept eye contact with them, but I felt like a deer in headlights. It felt like ages, but must have been two or three seconds at most. Suddenly, the guy in the rear shouts something to his buddies along the lines of, Oh fuck, it's a guy. And they speed away at like 80 miles per hour on a residential street. I was relieved, but mostly confused. I updated my friend and let them know that I was alright. Then I walked inside. I'm a male, 5'9", and slightly overweight with a baby face. So I don't exactly come across as intimidating to most people I meet. So I doubt I scared them off because of my appearance alone. I'm terrified to think what could have happened to me if I were female. It legitimately really messed me up. Why am I safe from these things? Meanwhile, my sister and my female friends have no choice but to keep guns in their car, get teeny cans of pepper spray for their keychains, and avoid being alone in general. It's a scary place out there. Whether you're male or female, always be vigilant. I used to think my neighborhood was relatively safe, but now I'm afraid of sitting in my driveway at night. My friend and I are both young females, small petite build. We had been drinking at the hotel and decided to walk the main strip, about a 20 minute walk at around 9.45. We were laughing, listening to music and just having plain fun at this point. Now this is when shit started to go south. Out of nowhere, a lady pops out in front of us. She obviously looks like she's on something. She's twitching, walking super funny, and she's on her phone which is important. So my friend and I step around her because she was initially going the opposite way. Then all of a sudden, she walks past us, going in our direction, and while she's getting ahead of us, she's looking back and speaking into her phone. I for some reason was already feeling kind of uncomfortable, so my friend and I slowed down to let her get more ahead of us and decided to go down another street because why not? The lady sees this, speaks into the phone again, and crosses with us. I was trying to give her the benefit of the doubt, thinking that maybe she's uncomfortable and feels unsafe and is trying to use us as cover, but my gut was telling me otherwise. So while she was walking in front of us, she's still frequently looking back and talking into the phone. So we cross the street again to put some distance between us. This time, the lady almost turns down a street where a man wearing all black walks out in the same direction we were going. The lady stops at this cross and just stares at us, then steps behind some kind of brush. The man went about 300 feet in front of us on the opposite side of the street 
and then turned around and walked back to the same street the lady was at. We were speed walking, so where they supposedly stepped off was now out of sight. My friend was local at the town that we were staying in, so she was already calling a friend who lived two blocks down to come get us. Around this time, I looked back to see both of them speed walking towards us. At this point, I'm trying to make it obvious that I noticed them by turning around, pointing, and yelling. Luckily, when they were about two blocks away, her friend arrived and we sped off. For some context, I'm a female, and this happened a couple years back when I was around 26. This happened in a big city. I was out with my dog, a little chihuahua, headed to a vet appointment. I forget what happened at this time, but it ended up being nothing serious. But I was pretty anxious and focused on getting to the vet as soon as possible. I was wearing a mask because it was in the middle of the worst part of COVID, and I was wearing a t-shirt with my university on it. I suddenly lock eyes with a guy on the sidewalk headed in the opposite direction and he comes up to me while I'm walking and goes, you went to this university? I said yes. He turns and started walking with me along the sidewalk the opposite way that he was initially headed in. Side by side he was explaining what a great school it is and how he's in grad school there. Somehow I felt that this was unlikely. He looked 30 plus and didn't seem to know anything about the college, not giving me any details. He starts asking me more questions, and at this point, I'm speed walking down the block, and he just keeps walking right next to me. My dog at this point is getting really antsy, and I'm incredibly uncomfortable, as I have no clue who this guy is, or why he's trying to walk with me on a busy sidewalk. Suddenly, my dog starts to bark and growl at him aggressively, and he doesn't seem to care and just keeps walking with me. At this point, it's been like 5 to 10 street blocks, with me trying to keep my dog from growling and barking, and him asking me questions. I try to explain that I'm going to a vet appointment, but I was nervous. Eventually, he goes, can I see you without your mask? I legit flat out say no, to which his eyebrows go up like he's shocked. He keeps pushing, and I keep flatly telling him no. Then he tells me that he wants to go get coffee with me. I decline it and tell him I have a boyfriend, which I did, and assured him that I'm getting engaged soon. My dog is still flipping out, barking aggressively at him, but finally after like 10 streets, after he realized I'm taken, dude departs and leaves me alone. Now I know the most likely explanation is the guy thought I was pretty, wanted to ask me out on a date, and he was awkward, but holy shit, please don't follow a young woman down 10 streets who you don't know. It's unnerving, and I still remember this years later. I guess he made an impression. I'm a 22-year-old female and was 18 at the time. In those days, I was a party girl, going out three times a week and drinking a lot. That time was wild. I decided to host a party. It was my first party and I rented a space in my village it was a cabin, on location for events, very cheap for locals. I organized everything with my 18 year old female best friend, let's call her Marie, and another friend, also 18, named Rose. We were having fun decorating and preparing the party. I was stressed out that the party was going to be lame. I decided to cope the stress with alcohol. When the party started and most people arrived, I was already tipsy. I invited people I knew from middle school and high school and some friends I made in college. Even though no one knew anyone, the party was great and people were meeting each other. I had a boyfriend, 19, who was coming with some friends. It was late summer so the weather was still mild and most people were outside talking, laughing and dancing. I had this middle school friend, let's call her Luna, who binge drank and threw up in the entrance of the cabin. She even hurt her foot, so she had some difficulties walking. At this point, I was drunk, but I wanted to help my friend. I asked if she wanted to be put to bed, and she said yes. I took her arm and guided her to my house. 
I live in a small village in the countryside, so it takes less than five minutes to get to my house. It was super safe. I used to wander alone in the streets late at night, 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. when I had insomnia and nothing ever happened. It was pitch black. We were the only ones outside. As we walked, we saw a white SUV, but I didn't think much of it. I came home, gave her some water, and let her sleep in my room. I was alone with my sister that night. I warned her of the presence of my friend and headed back to the party. I was not walking straight since I was intoxicated. I saw the white SUV parked near the farm. As I continued walking, a black car stopped next to me and opened their windows. I looked at a man. I still don't know what age he was. It was so dark. He said to me, I've seen this white SUV following you for a while. It seems dangerous. You should come into my car. I was drunk, but I directly felt like something was wrong. I just answered that I was okay and my friends were nearby. He insisted. He repeated to come to his car for my safety. My inner alarm went off as I was trying to walk faster and answered again that I was okay. Suddenly, I heard the car door open. He was not alone. I didn't think twice. I just ran for my life. I arrived quickly to the cabin. My friends were all drunk. One of my drunk male friends was complimenting Rose. They saw me come up in a hurry. The male friend looked at me and started to compliment me. I told him, Man, someone just tried to abduct me. He stared at me and told me that I shouldn't have left alone, that it was not safe. The party lasted until 4 a.m. People who didn't drink took their cars and left. The few others were inside the cabin and started to talk. One of my boyfriend's friends was mad on their Snapchat group because he forgot the knife at the cabin. I told them about what happened and they were all spooked. After that event, I stopped walking in the village late at night, but I hosted a few other parties. I have never seen this man in his black car again. Most people keep telling me how great the party was. A couple who met at the party are still together, but I still wonder to this day, what would have happened to me if I didn't react that spontaneously? When I was about 11 years old, my family and I lived in a large one-story house in the Wisconsin countryside. We lived on the top of a small hill and the back of our house faced a large forested area. We only had one neighbor within a mile radius and it was an old woman who couldn't really get around by herself. On this particular night, my parents were going to have a date night and left me to watch my two siblings. I definitely still think I was too young for this. They had given me my first phone at 9 years old so that I could watch my siblings when they weren't home. I remember it was fall time because I had my bedroom windows open to keep the room cooler at night and I could constantly hear all the leaves brushing against each other outside. My parents had probably left around 8pm and had already put my little brother, 6 years old, to bed. At this time, my brother had a huge fear of the dark and would refuse to leave his room after someone put him in bed and turned off the lights. He used to tell us that he thought someone would grab him from under the bed and try to pull him down if he tried to get up. My room was on the opposite side of the house as his. It shared a wall with the kitchen and mudroom. My sister had been sleeping in my room since we moved to this house and by the time this happened, she was already asleep next to me. I remember being scared to fall asleep for some reason. I think I was just nervous of not having my parents at home. But around about 9.30 p.m., I started hearing crunching leaves outside my window. At first, it was quite distant. It sounded like maybe animals in the woods, but then it got closer to the house and my windows. Eventually, I could hear the distinct sound of someone's jeans rubbing together as they walked and footsteps in the dry leaves. My windows were about five feet above my floor, so I could never see out of them as a kid without standing on a stool. I heard the person slightly bumping into our trash cans, which were right outside the front door. Then, I heard the terrifying creak of the front door as it was pushed open slowly. Since we lived in the country, my parents never locked the doors. That's just how it was. I froze, petrified. I quickly looked at my sister, who was still sleeping peacefully, and gently nudged her to try to wake her up. She was a deep sleeper, and I didn't want to make too much noise, so instead I let her sleep. 
I knew it couldn't be my brother, so I texted my parents to see if they had gotten home early. I figured that maybe my dad came in first. That's why we only heard one person. At this point, I could hear one person shuffling things around in the mudroom and just walking around in there. I looked through my door and realized I hadn't locked it, as per usual, and considered trying to get up and sneak to lock it, but what I heard next made me freeze again. There was this vent connected to my room and the kitchen, and through it I heard a person step into the kitchen and give a small sigh. I heard them open a couple cupboards and open the fridge for a while. Finally, I got a text back from my dad. My stomach dropped when I read that they haven't even started heading back to the house yet and why I asked. My dad called me and, thank god my ringer was off, but I decided to pick it up anyways out of fear. I had turned down my volume all the way and spoke as quietly as I could. I told him that I thought that someone was in our house and he freaked out and started asking questions, but I told him he had to be quiet because I was scared that the person might be able to hear me. My parents stayed on the phone while they got into their cars and started speeding back to the house. At this point, I asked them to mute themselves so that I could hear what was happening in the kitchen. That's when I realized things had gotten really quiet. I heard one of the cupboards start creaking shut, then light footsteps started making their way towards my room. My heart was pounding harder as I heard the person approach my door. I could see a slight shadow of their shoes underneath the door, but all they did was stand there. Scared that my parents would unmute themselves and I would be found, I hung up on them. It must have been a solid 30 seconds that the person stood there, not moving, not saying a word. Eventually, they just walked off. I heard them walk back through the kitchen, their jeans making some sounds as they rubbed together. While exiting the house, I heard the leaves crunch once again as they retreated back into the forest and that sound faded away. My parents got home probably 10 minutes later and stormed into the house, opening my door first and checking if I was safe. While I explained what happened, they doubted me and said I was probably just hearing noises. Needless to say, from that night on, I locked the door religiously. I was always unsure to where he might have come from or walked back to because even if he did walk through the forest, there weren't any more houses for nearly two miles. Though my siblings and I did find something in the woods when we explored it maybe a couple months later, there was a small shelter that someone had built made out of rusty corrugated metal and carpet squares. It had been flooded a little because of the marshy area in the woods it was in. There's a couple of empty alcohol bottles in it, but that was it. I'm glad I never came face to face with this person, but it still gives me the creeps to think that they might have heard me, but decided not to open my door anyway, and just left. Shadow, my 115 pound German Shepherd black lab mix, started to signal that she needed to use the restroom about 1 in the morning. Annoyed because I was almost asleep, I got up, put a hoodie on, and took her out with nothing but my phone for a flashlight. She started to do her usual sniff for 15 minutes just to go in her regular spot routine. I had my flashlight on because she is camouflaged by the night and I would like to know where she's at so she doesn't run off. Just as she starts using the bathroom, I turn away and notice someone. They're standing on the very edge of my yard. Looking back at my dog, I noticed she wasn't paying any attention to the person yet, so I called her to me and attached her leash. The person just stood there and watched me. I called out to them and said, You need to leave my yard. To which I got silence back. I cleared my throat and repeated myself, eventually attempting the third time just to change it to, Don't make me tell you again. You're going to leave my yard. Just as my partner was coming outside to see what the commotion was, they took a few steps forward, clearly intending to continue towards me. They caught a glimpse of my partner, backpedaled, turned around and left. As confused as he was, I was in complete shock. We've had to run this one person off a of property because they would bring the dog over to use the bathroom in our yard. I've seen their face, but it wasn't them. They haven't been back, but right before that, we did find footprints near our shed and windows of our home. Generally unnerved. Contacted the police, and they didn't do anything other than take a statement. Been told it will go nowhere until physical harm or a break-in happens. When I was around 10 years old, I had been invited to a sleepover for the first time at my friend's house. This friend, who I'll call Abby, lives pretty far away from me, so us hanging out always felt like a special occasion. 
I just started becoming brave enough to sleep away from my parents and because she was one of my oldest friends, Abby's house was going to be one of these trial runs for sleepovers. A little bit about Abby's family. She's the youngest of four kids. Her older brother is about 10 years older than us, has pretty severe autism and continues to live full time with Abby's parents. He's always been a bit of a wild card and I, as a 10 year old girl, always felt a little anxious around him. Anyway, there are three of us girls at the slumber party. We decided to sleep on the main floor of her house so that we could stay up late and watch movies that would eventually lull us to sleep. I had chosen the couch which was perpendicular to the wall of the window looking onto Abby's deck and backyard. The other girls had set up on the floor on a mattress together. They were cousins. We throw in a DVD and we fall asleep quick. Sleeping away from home has never been easy for me. I wake up frequently and sometimes can't fall asleep at all to begin with. This night was one of those times where, after clocking a solid two hours, something stirred me back into consciousness. Coming to, I noticed the bright light of the TV glowing first before my eyes adjusted and noticed something outside that wasn't there before. It was a person. A man, actually. He was sitting on the deck chairs and he positioned it to face directly towards where the three of us were sleeping. He hadn't noticed that I was awake, but seeing him made my heart race. I stayed totally still, watching him. It was dark, so his features were a bit ambiguous, but I could tell that he was studying us and smirking. Terrified, I watched him for a few minutes before turning myself into the couch cushion and closing my eyes. Some time passed, maybe a few minutes, maybe a half an hour. Finally, I mustered up enough courage to look again. He was gone. To this day, I have no idea who it was that I got into Abby's backyard and sat on her deck watching us in the middle of the night, but the image of him sitting there grinning still haunts me. For a while, I thought maybe it was her brother, but the guy had dark hair and dark eyes. Her brother was blonde. Anyway, thought I'd share this. Luckily, we all made it to the next morning unharmed, but that was the last time I ever spent the night at Abby's house. I'm a 27 year old male. In my childhood home, there was an island in the kitchen with bar stools. If you sat in the furthest bar stool to the right, you'd be able to see through the door that opened up to the garage. One night, when I was about six or seven, everyone else in the family was either in the bedrooms or in the living room watching TV. My dad worked nights, so he wasn't home. I was sitting on the bar stool furthest to the right, having a nighttime snack when I look over and I see an eerie white hand wave at me. All I could see was the hand. I was petrified. I didn't know what to do or say. The hand waved again and pointed down at the doorknob as if to suggest I unlock it and open it. After that, I ran into the living room and yelled to my mother. She called her neighbor over to investigate. We lived in rural western Kentucky, so it took a few minutes for him to get there. When a neighbor finally arrived, he looked around and couldn't find anybody. It had been raining all night, but we couldn't see any evidence of tracks into the garage or in the driveway. The same thing happened to my sister not long after. She was only a year younger than me. She told me she walked up to the door after the hand gesture and almost unlocked it, but screamed and ran to my mother. To this day, I hate to think about what would have happened if either of us would have opened that door. And I hate to think about who was watching to see that two of the younger kids were alone in the kitchen or how long they had been watching. My childhood home was a small 800 square foot two bedroom with a dormer upstairs room. My bedroom was along the side of the home, at the back, and because my brother and I shared it, my bed was literally along the front of the window. This was in the 1970s. I recall several times being woken up to tapping on my window, seeing a man-sized dark shadow looking at me and completely being frozen. My heart racing as he ran his nails on the metal screening. Usually, there was no light except for the street light three houses away that was blocked from the rear of our house. My eyes clenched and I would hold my breath and try not to move. Eventually, he'd leave. One summer night, he brought a flashlight and was shining it up and down my bed and all around my room onto my younger brother, but mostly on me. 
My parents didn't believe me in the morning, but I convinced them to allow us to move our bed upstairs. No more window on the ground floor after that night. Edit. I never put the two together until I had my own kids. I was constantly pulling the blinds and curtains closed and did a whole check multiple times before bed and even shot up after everyone was asleep to check before I slept and whenever I would wake up. I'd always look outside the windows too and my wife always asked me what I was looking for. I guess these childhood events actually still haunt me. By the way, ultimately, I think it was the lady who lived next door, son, who came to drink and visit her. He was about 10 years older than me and was always kind of creepy. An alcoholic, never married and moved from state to state. I'm guessing he was the peeper. Most of my money comes from babysitting. There's a pair of loving parents who's one years old. I watch every week. One day, there was a knock at the door. The mom had let me know that the lady was coming to pick something up, so I assumed it was her. I opened the door to a raggedy man in a stained white tank top. The moment I saw him, I froze. With just the door open and a crack, he asked if the dad of the kid I was babysitting was home. It was clear that he was up to no good, so I lied and said that it was only me and my older brother. The guy then stepped uncomfortably close to the door and asked if he could come in to check. I was alone with a one-year-old. I said that it wasn't my house and I couldn't let him in, but that I could take a message for the parents. He told me to tell them that guilty wanted them. I uncomfortably smiled and shut the door. I immediately called the kid's parents as I ran around the house, locking the doors and windows. I watched the guy take a picture of the house and leave. My uncle, whom I trust, showed up in two minutes with a weapon to protect me and the baby. After hearing what happened, police were called to patrol the area. When the parents got home, they told me that the guy had some issues with them and came looking to fight the dad. The scariest job I've ever had. This happened back in 2016 and I'm still getting over the grief. I haven't really shared this story with anyone yet, but I finally decided to share it. I'm not going to say where this happened, for privacy reasons. Even though I have since moved, I'm afraid that people related to those responsible might come after me. Anyway, at the time this happened, it was August, and it was in the evening. My brother and I lived in a small two-bedroom, one-bath home that sat on 10 acres of land. It was what I once considered my dream home paradise. We had everything I could have wanted, a good amount of land, two-car garage, a pole barn, and a very nice view from our back deck. Now here comes some important details to note. The house itself was a basic square with a back deck on the southwest corner of the house. It was notched in the corner of the house with two walls on either side forming the corner of the house. You couldn't see around the house unless you bent over the railing and you could only see the west and southwest away from the house. The garage was on the south side of the deck. Only a few feet away from the deck was a driveway leading to the garage, so you couldn't see anyone coming up the driveway from the back of the house. Anyway, it was evening and I was sitting on the back deck smoking a joint and my brother was in his bedroom. I was just outside enjoying the weather and the peace and tranquility of the area. Suddenly, that all shattered when I heard my brother shouting, followed by four loud gunshots. I immediately jumped and looked around the wall of the house towards the window of my brother's room, which faces our backyard, just in time to see three masked men hopping out the window. They were in black and in their late 30s, but they were wearing masks so I couldn't really see their faces. One of them looked at me and froze, almost like he was expecting me not to be there. The three then turn and run around the north wall of the house, towards the front yard. I threw my joint out and ran inside the house, through the kitchen, and down the hall to my brother's room. The door was opened and I went inside. When I did, I stopped dead in my tracks. My heart froze and my blood went to ice. There on the bed was my brother, laying there facing up motionless, with his eyes wide open, bleeding to death. Now what I did next probably wasn't very smart, but I ran to the living room, grabbed my M1 off the living room wall, and threw open the front door just in time to see a blue Chevy Caprice peeling out of the driveway. 
I fired three shots at them, one missing, one hitting the car's tire, and one hitting the back window. I must have hit one of the guys inside because I heard someone scream. Looking back, this probably wasn't a good thing to do since there's a house across the street and I could have accidentally shot the neighbor's house. I wasn't really thinking at that time. Anyway, the car sped off and I ran back inside and grabbed some towels to try and cover the wounds on my brother's chest while also calling 911. While trying to cover up the wound, I was telling the dispatcher what happened and I knew my brother was already gone. He had no pulse when I checked and three bullet holes in his chest. But I think I was in disbelief at the time. Anyway, since this area has an almost non-existent crime rate, you can bet your butt every sheriff and ambulance in the county was there in 15 minutes. I had to explain to the detective that was there what happened while trying not to break down crying. The sheriff and detective were both in disbelief since nothing like this has happened in this area in over 37 years. I'll spare you all the little details, but over the next three months, the investigation wrapped up, and here's what I learned. After the police had gone through my brother's phone, they found that he had apparently been getting death threats. Apparently, he had been hitting on a girl that was a gang member's girlfriend. The guy warned my brother to stay away from her, and even after he did that, he decided to get rid of my brother for good. Apparently, one night before he was killed, he received a message from an unknown person saying, I'm coming for you. Somehow, the guy found out where he lived and brought two guys with him to do the job. The strangest thing is we lived over 40 minutes from where the gang's territory was in the city. The guy was so aggravated at my brother, he drove himself and two other guys 40 minutes out into the countryside just to kill him. It really amazes me how far this guy was willing to go to make sure no one went near his girlfriend. So now let me say what happened to those three guys. One of them was the one I had shot as their car pulled out of my driveway and he apparently died while in the car. The other guy who was along for the job was caught during a traffic stop. He was dumb enough to take the same car out the next day and there was an alert out for it. Since there aren't many sky blue Chevy Capris, they left it easy to find. He was arrested and charged with murder. And since the prosecutor where the murder happened are way more strict, he was sentenced to death. The guy who orchestrated the whole thing was actually killed in another shooting back in the city the following week. They all got what they deserved in the end, in my opinion. I did have to go to court for the guy that I shot. But because he has no family that they could find and some other circumstances, I didn't have to go to jail. I did have a hefty fine though for dangerous use of a firearm due to the fact that I could have accidentally shot my neighbor's house and had to take gun training classes, but I didn't care about that. For almost a year, I didn't do anything except for mope around my house and barely even left my house. I never even went to my brother's room after that. I just left the door to it closed so I wouldn't be tempted to look in it. I was so devastated by what happened. I nearly lost interest in everything. I ended up packing up my stuff and just abandoning the house. I even left my brother's truck behind sitting in the garage. I couldn't stand being there anymore, nor did I feel safe there anymore after what happened to my brother. My brother and I were really close, and to lose a loved one so tragically and suddenly in your own home is devastating. It was sad because I really loved the house and my brother, and I honestly thought it would be my forever home. I just couldn't stand being there anymore. I moved 8 hours away and haven't been back to the house, and I honestly don't think I ever will. Even though I moved, I still won't ever forget what happened that evening. I'm doing a little better now and I have someone else living with me, but I definitely will be scarred for life from that event. I'm a 26 year old female. I recently moved into a duplex by myself away from the messy house situation with my four male housemates. It was an oasis of rugs, plants, and acceptable level of tidiness. One night, around 9 to 10 p.m., I was watching TV and probably smoking weed because I was bad for it then. When I heard a knock at the front door, I opened it. I know. And there was a really scruffy looking guy, maybe early 30s, standing on my porch. He seemed drunk or high and mumbled something at me about coming inside. 
unprepared for this kind of interaction, I dumbly said the words to the effect of, You're not coming in. I don't know you. Though he didn't seem to understand, he gave really off vibes. He then mumbled something about meeting someone at a bar and having drinks with her. And I thought maybe he meant to knock on my neighbor's door. A maybe 40-year-old sweet but pretty rough lady I'd met a few times. I pointed at her door and to my relief was right and he left. I locked and chained my door and pulled my blinds right down as my living room was fully visible from my porch. It should have been the end of it but I had a really uneasy feeling from then on like I was a sitting duck. I will mention I was a people pleaser and was too busy worrying about hurting his feelings to immediately slam the door on his face like I should and these days I would have. Fast forward six hours in the dead of night. I still had my living room light on, which would have been partly visible from the edges of my blinds. I was still up because stoner, and I think I just walked into my bedroom when I heard it. The softest, quietest, don't wake the neighbors knocking on my door. My gut fell out of my butt and I was rooted in one spot, looking unbelievably at my door as he gently knocked 30, maybe 40 times continuously. It was ages before I was able to move, to think, or do anything. I called my boyfriend and told him in frantic whispers what was happening, and I think he told me that I should call the cops. I did so in a pathetic shaking voice and heard silence. Too scared to move closer, I stood frozen half in my bedroom and half in my living room for an eternity until I believed that he was gone. The next morning my boyfriend visited and dragged me over to my neighbor. She told us he was a really weird guy she invited over and then regretted, later kicking him out. She didn't go into details but she was very concerned about him coming back to my door. My boyfriend made her text him and shared all the awful things that would happen to him if he ever knocked on my door again, which thankfully he never did. I'm a 24 year old female. I've been reading through these types of stories for a few years now and I'd like to hear your thoughts on something that happened to me. This is not the most exciting story you're going to hear and I can't explain why it happened the way it did. I am also really stupid and lack common sense in this story. I'm sorry. I used to live in an old Victorian house in Maryland and at the time of the story I was 10 years old. This house had been turned into a duplex that split the two floors and basically just rented them as apartments. I lived in the upstairs. There's a university nearby so we had a lot of college students and we also had a lot of drug issues in the area. People were always getting their houses searched or getting into fights over it. The owner of the house had told my family that the people who rented the upstairs previously had given him a lot of trouble and he had kicked them out. My family had just moved there for my dad's new job and I didn't have a place to live yet, so we were thankful that their contract ended so early so that we could take their place. If there's anything else the owner told my parents, it was not shared with me. I was homeschooled online as a child, so my parents would leave for the day to go to work while I stayed in the apartment and did my schoolwork alone. Maybe about a week after we had moved in, there was a slab banging on the door. I ran down the side stairs to open it and there was this tall, thick man dressed in black with a black mask over his whole face. The mask had holes for his eyes and mouth. As immensely stupid as this sounds, no alarm bells went off to me. This place was cold year round and I stupidly just assumed his gear happened to be black. Behind him I remember seeing a car parked next to the building that was still running. He just stood there silently for a couple seconds and I felt awkward so I said, Hi, can I help you with something? He continued just to stand there for what felt like forever before saying something like, I'm here for the mail. I'm smiling and saying something like, Oh sure, you must have just moved out. My dad already brought all the mail this morning. Let me go see if there's anything. So I turned around, left the door wide open, and ran inside to find the mail pile. I looked through it, but I didn't see anything that didn't have my family's name on it. When I went back to tell him the bad news, he was gone and so was the car. When my parents came home that evening, I told them that the previous renter had stopped by and asked for their mail. My dad had a fit and said that I shouldn't open the door while I was home alone, and apparently our mail comes from the owner since he separates it before bringing it up to each of the renter's box since we have the same address, so we wouldn't have gotten any of the mail that doesn't belong to us anyways, and the previous renter would already know that. He was furious with me for being a moron, 
and that was before he thought to ask what they looked like. I described the black suit and mask. I know enough now that I handled the situation entirely wrong and am beyond stupid. I'm not looking to get berated for it. I would actually like to hear what you think. If this suspicious guy had malicious intentions, why didn't he do anything? I was home alone. It was morning, so my parents wouldn't have come back until that evening anyway. I don't even think the other renter was home. I clearly didn't suspect anything from him and left the door wide open while I turned my back to him and ran inside the house. I am immensely thankful that nothing happened to me. I don't ever want to appear as ungrateful that this didn't take an awful turn. I just don't understand what protected me if that was actually the case. It was the first weekend in May 1997 when this happened. At the time, I was a sophomore at a local, private two-year college. Instead of living in the dorms, I lived at home as our house was right next to campus to the point that I was closer to a couple of my classes than students that lived in the dorms. Just to the south of our place was the overflow parking lot, which served both the church and the school. The school was about to embark on a remodeling project where it had enough construction to warrant parking a tractor trailer in the overflow parking lot basically perpendicular to my house. Two of my best friends were heading home the next morning, one for Iowa and the other for Virginia. So we decided to spend the evening as best as we could by watching movies. This was before streaming services were even a thing. The college was a hotbed of activity as people were packing up to head home with graduating sophomores getting ready for the ceremony in two days. As we were lounging in my living room, a couple girls we knew, one of which I was interested in, Suddenly rang the doorbell, asking to come in to wash their hands as they had been on a walk. Their hands smelled funny. The girl I was digging, named KT, stuck her hands in my face to which I recognized the distinct smell of shaving cream, so I knew something nefarious was afoot. We watched them leave via the dining room windows before I told the boys that they were up to something. So we left from the back door. These two girls had tried to trash my friend's room with shaving cream and toothpaste. Oh, it was game on. We ran into one of the boys' mod mates, an obnoxious guy who had no concept of boundaries. And I made the point of never letting the guy, let's call him JB, know where I lived as he was the type to just show up unannounced and not pick up on social cues when it was time to leave. The girls were hiding from a retribution and even JB pledged his loyalty to help us. I told him to keep an eye out. We would be back so we left him hanging in the common area under the girls' dorms. We slid back to my house, to which I told the boys to just be patient. The girls would be back. We set up, watching to the south from the darkened dining room, soon rewarded by seeing KT sneaking back towards the house. I told the boys the plan was to ambush her, so we crept out the back door. KT had disappeared behind the tractor trailer as she was obscured from my view. But to our dismay, there was a black clad figure laying on the ground just around the corner from the trailer where KT was hiding. My boys were next to me as I was cussing in whispers because I was 30 yards away from whom I thought was JB. He was laying with his head away from us so he couldn't see us without turning his body as he stayed perfectly still. He might have been 10 feet from the corner of the trailer where KT was. After a brief discussion, I said it couldn't be helped, so we continued on with our plan to ambush and scare KT. The three of us quietly padded around the backside of the trailer to find KT on her stomach, intently watching her house, trying to see movements. She was actually way closer to where JB was lying, completely oblivious to the fact that he was actually within five feet of her. She never heard me as I crept up behind her, curled my hands into a claw before grabbing her as I snarled. Fetal position instantly from her, which prompted howling and laughter from my two friends and myself. She was petrified. I caught my breath long enough to wonder where JB was, as I thought he would have joined us by now. Looking around the corner, there was no one on the ground, but you could tell someone had been laying there, even in the darkness. One of the boys, TC, said that the black clad figure jumped up and ran to the west. Odd, I thought, but JB was also a strange cat. After KT apologized for her early hijinks and I had detailed what happened, our merry band made it back to the campus to keep our eyes on her. We ran into JB to which I said, Dude, why did you have to run off? You could have stayed. JB replied, 
Uh, I don't even know where you live. The realization hit us like a ton of bricks. It wasn't JB laying on the ground, mere feet from KT. KT went white as a sheet, and all of us were suddenly creeped out by this random guy laying on the ground. It turns out during the summer, all around college, there were cases of houses being walked through with very little being taken, as if someone was casing houses, but no one was ever caught. I was in my room chilling at 3 a.m. when suddenly I heard someone calling my name from outside my window. Knowing no one would look for me at this hour, I naturally felt weird about it. So when I looked out the window and no one was to be seen against my better judgment, I decided to go down to smoke to see who it was. When I got down, I heard the same voice offering me a light and asking for a cigarette. I looked to where the voice was coming from. Standing there was a man who looked to be in his 50s. Weirded out, I asked. Who are you? He didn't answer and just said that he hadn't seen me in a while and then asked when I was going to go back to base. I didn't answer and asked again who he was. He just stared blankly at me. I asked again and he tried to grab my arm while telling me to say happy birthday to my brother. After that he just started walking away while saying I needed to clean my room since I leave in a few days. Mind you I never told him when I leave and my apartment was on the 10th floor and the window is almost never open. Just a weird encounter. This happened a few weeks ago, however scared the crap out of me and I learned something new about my home. I was off work and inside for the day. There were several knocks and the person kept ringing the doorbell so I eventually answered though I wasn't expecting anyone. I also live in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky, with only one neighbor nearby. A mid-30s man, seemingly having Down syndrome, parked at the very edge of my driveway, on the road, which alarmed me. He asked me questions about knowing anyone who used to live here. He asked if I was in high school, and how old I was, and if I was home alone. My fiancé has two cars, so thankfully, it looked like I was not alone, and I told him, no and no. He seemed scared off and ran to his car and sped off. Afterwards, I went to my neighbors and inquired about the previous owners and the man. They told me that there was an elderly couple with a son with a disability and the couple had hung themselves in the house. So double mind blown at this point and I'm scared to even answer my front door again. This only happened a few months ago, so it's fairly recent, but it still definitely scares me to think about. Picture this, it's 8am and I'm waiting for the bus at an otherwise empty bus station. At least it was empty until this guy came and joined me. He stood pretty far away from me, but was staring in my direction intently. For the entire 10 minutes that we waited together, his eyes didn't leave me. That wasn't the weird part though. If he was just staring at me, I'd be creeped out, but I wouldn't pay much attention because creeps are everywhere. It was the way that he was staring at me, with such intensity in his eyes, brow furrowed, and his mouth twisted in a slight scowl. He didn't try to talk to me, but when the bus came, I thanked God and got on as fast as I could. Here's when things got creepy. The bus was a double-decker and mostly empty. Yet he didn't get on, despite there only being one bus route that comes to that bus station. He couldn't be waiting for another bus. But anyway, I forgot about him until a few hours later. I was walking to grab coffee with a friend when she nudged me and whispered that there was a weird guy staring at me. I turned around to see for myself and it was the same guy from the bus stop in the morning. Despite me not knowing who this man was, he had somehow ended up at the same place that I was in. He was standing under a balcony, his hands in his pocket, and his face mostly hidden by a mask. He didn't try anything with us, but I could feel his eyes following me into the cafe. It terrified me, and I didn't feel safe for days. I never saw him again, but I still wondered how the fuck he knew which stop I had gotten off at, and if he was waiting for me to show up. The only conclusion my friend and I could come up with was that he had seen me in the spot before and followed me to the bus near my home, which makes this whole thing even scarier. A few
few years ago, about 2019, I was riding the bus one night to get home. There was this guy on the bus that was a little disheveled and dirty, reeked of alcohol, and generally acted weird. I was sitting in the back of the bus, and he sat near me and tried to talk to me. I was polite at first. I ride the bus a lot at night so a drunk homeless guy doesn't bother me and I have no problem making small talk with a stranger on the bus. Plus, I'm used to there being one or two sketchy people on the bus considering the route and the fact that it's late at night. When he tried to get flirty, I politely told him that I was not interested and put my headphones back in my ears and ignored him. He got a little frustrated and said some vulgar things, but I couldn't really hear him so it was fine. It's not my first rodeo in this kind of situation, and while it was uncomfortable and there's nothing okay with that sort of behavior, I rarely felt threatened. Most of the time, they are harmless, all bark, no bite, and I'm a big girl, as in tall and overweight. I know basic self-defense and always have an exit strategy when in scenarios that I don't feel safe. When people get like that on the bus, I find most of the time, ignoring them and acting like I'm not phased is enough to get them bored and they find something else to do. I only engage if they get in my face or start harassing other passengers, especially other women, kids, and seniors, or anyone who appears vulnerable, because I'm not going to tolerate that. The bus drivers usually don't put up with that either, if it escalates enough. Anyway, this random drunk homeless guy would have been one of many if it wasn't for what happened next. My stop was coming up and I was looking forward to going home. I was exhausted and so ready to get into bed. I pulled the cord indicator that I wanted to get off at the next stop and he gets up and walks to the front of the bus to talk to the driver and then laughs loudly. I didn't think much of it except I was a little weary thinking, please don't tell me we're getting off at the same bus stop. As the bus slows down, I'm walking to the back door to be let off at my stop. Instead of opening the back door, he opens the front door and lets the guy off. I ask the driver to open the back door and see him shake his head in the mirror. And annoyed, I walk to the front to get off the bus there and he closes the door before I can get off and start driving. Angry, I say, what the hell, that's my stop. And the driver replies, sorry, I can't in good conscience let you get off the same stop as that guy. Either you get off at the next one, or wait until we get to the transit station and take the bus the other way. Not getting it, I asked. Why? Because of what he said to me. I asked him what he said and the driver says, Nothing that I can repeat, ever. I am so sorry, but just trust me. The driver actually looks shaken and considering the tone in his voice and the look in his face, as frustrated and anxious I was to get home, I trusted him and took his word for it. I caught another bus the other way at the next terminal and watched the driver radio dispatch to get some peace officers and transit security to patrol the area at the next stop. Then we parked in the next parking lot near the stop when I finally got off and I was extra paranoid and on high alert as I walked the next couple of blocks to my apartment that night. Fortunately, with no further incident, I never saw that guy again and I'm okay with that. To this day, I wonder exactly what he said to the driver. It bugs me not knowing, but at the same time, maybe it's better that way. Either way, the implications are enough to have me freaked out. I'm a 19-year-old female, so this happened today and I'm still so creeped out by it. I was waiting by the bus stop to catch a bus home. I left college earlier than usual. But waiting for the bus, I thought I'd check some emails. All of a sudden, this man approached me. I didn't see him walking up to me because I was looking down at my phone. He says, in the most creepily monotone voice ever, Sweetheart, what time is it? Now, I know it might sound perfectly normal and polite to say it this way, but where I live, nobody would speak to you in English the first time they say or ask you something. They speak the local dialect and would only switch to a different language if you would tell them. And even then, I highly doubt a stranger would refer to you as sweetheart. Maybe dear, but that's about it. I was creeped out by the way he spoke those words, but I didn't want to seem rude, so I looked up at him anyway, about to say, it's 3.15, but I bolted as soon as I saw him. The man, around 40 years old, I guess, had a huge open wound on his cheek with dried blood smudged across his face 
and he was standing way too close to me, like within a foot. He wasn't panting as if he had been in a fight. He didn't seem to care about his face being bloody. He didn't seem to be in pain, and he seemed to be in perfect control of his body. Didn't seem to be drunk. Maybe he was, but it didn't seem like that to me. I don't know how to describe this properly, but imagine a man walking up to you with a huge gash across his face and asking you what time it is as if he knows you. I didn't say a word, just walked and jogged away from the man, and he left too. Because when I turned to look back at him, he was gone. I got on the next bus that arrived, didn't even ask where it went, just climbed on because there was no way in hell I wanted to spend another second at that bus stop. For reference, I am a 16 year old male. I have longish reddish dyed hair and I wear eyeliner and was wearing all black denim at this time. I got off the bus and parted ways with my friend and made for the bus station to go home. After I stood in the queue, it was super long. I got tapped on my shoulder and when I turned around it was a mid to late 20s mixed race guy. I took my earphone out cause he started talking to me thinking he was asking me for directions or something. He proceeded to tell me that I was cute and tells me that when he saw me he sprinted after me. His tone sounded off and I'm not really sure what it was about but it was like he was oblivious to how creepy that was. He then asked to exchange various social medias to which I said I had none. He also asked me my name and if I'm from around there to which I gave him false answers for both and said I only come here rarely to see a friend. He asked me how old I was, to which I replied 16, hoping to make him back off. It didn't. He asked me if I was single, to which I replied no. He then assumed I had a boyfriend, to which I said I had a girlfriend, to like put across that I don't swing that way. He kept following me up the line, and the only reason I kept talking to him was because I did not want to turn my back to him. I mean it when I say there was something badly off about him, and public error or not. I didn't want to end up getting touched or hurt or anything. Rather shoot the shit and come across as friendly to avoid him, maybe getting aggressive, than elevate the situation. Fortunately, as I was about to get on the bus home, he walked away. Maybe he thought it would make a scene if he tried getting on with me. Maybe he caught someone watching, or maybe he caught on that he was being a creep. I don't know. I'm just glad he didn't try to get on the bus with me. The last thing I wanted him knowing was where I went around. He confessed on sprinting after me, and I wouldn't put it past him to doing the same thing when I got off the bus, hypothetically, if he managed to get on with me. I'm a transgendered male, and at the time I was 18 and passed fairly well. I was dating someone online on and off for about a year and a half and finally saved enough money to get a Greyhound bus to get from where I lived to where she lived, which was 16 hours with a few bus switches. One of the buses stopped in Ohio, Cincinnati to be exact. This was the first time being out of my state ever and taking the bus besides the school bus and I was alone. I am a short guy around 5'2". It was probably around 4 or 5 a.m. when we arrived in Ohio. I sat down at a little cafe area and took my next bus, but there was this dirty, scrawny dude with a random license plate that sits across from me. He made a little small talk, then literally asked me if he could pay me for sex. I was freaking out already at this point, and I kind of froze and looked at the people next to me in hopes that they would help. I obviously tell this guy no, and then he asked if he could sell me. At this point, I get up and basically run as far into the crowd as I could and call my dad. The guy just appears and I don't see him again. The messed up part is I finally get to the girl and she tells me that her dad had a heart attack and I have to go, which I find out later was a lie. But I had spent all my money on the taxi to get from the last bus stop to her city, which wasn't cheap. And then I had to give her friend gas money to get me back to the bus stop. I didn't have enough for a room and my dad couldn't wire me any to get a room for the night. So I sat there at the bus stop literally until 8 p.m. for the bus because it was a smaller part of town and I had to sit outside because the bus station was closed. It was honestly one of the scariest and most terrible times I've ever experienced.
I study in a different city from the one that I live in. I have to do a 40 minute train ride every day to reach the uni I'm in. Last week when I arrived to the city, it was near 9am. I was thirsty and went to the local store in front of the train station. I got a water and bought some snacks. There was a man who was watching me from the moment I left the station till I crossed the road and talked to the guy at the store. I had no change so I pulled out a $20 bill. The guy saw it and instantly jumped to me, asking me to talk to him. I thought he was homeless and needed help so I shared the snacks I just bought since I thought he needed them more than I did. But the guy still stayed, told me to follow him around the corner and I blindly did. Suddenly, he kind of hugged me. The issue is I started smelling some kind of alcohol smell. It was very powerful that second. My head was in severe pain and I don't know why. I started having a nausea feeling and while he was holding me in a very weird way, he was asking me for my name. I told him to let me go and just take my food, but he didn't. I pushed him in a very powerful way to create distance between me and him and started running. The guy started running too, but I had to go through a crowded area and when I turned around, he no longer was. The headache was there for a whole day and the smell didn't go away from my clothes for days after. I didn't get robbed and I lost nothing, but that was very weird and I don't know if I was wrong to treat him that way. I was at the bus stop a few weeks ago and it was me and some other person. While I waited for the bus home, he said that my breasts are a fetish to him. I never met this person and did not flirt or initiate this conversation. It was broad daylight and I was a bit creeped out. He kept talking to me about them and how he liked big boobs. When I told him I was married, he said, So? Then demanded I sit, like not a general come sit, but he barked it. The bus came shortly after and I got on. He asked if I lived that way and I didn't really give him information. I already have bad anxiety around men and it's been worse since the encounter. I'm glad it wasn't night out and the bus came when it did. This happened a few years ago when I was 21 and had to travel by bus regularly. It was a normal day. I left my home, took the bus down to the city, and waited at the bus station for my next bus. Suddenly, a girl greeted me. She was cute, so I thought that I may be lucky, and I greeted her back. She asked if my name was Daniel, which was pretty confusing and scary. I said yes, probably already with some confusion in my voice. She asked if I took the bus often, how long the travel was, where I lived, and all kinds of weird stuff. It struck me as weird how quickly she just nodded and moved on to the next question. My younger self thought that maybe she was just in a rush or the kind of weirdo which talks fast. I even forgot during all these questions that she knew my name already, but she never told me hers. When the bus finally arrived, she said goodbye and just left. Didn't even take the same bus, which I realized after sitting down. Suddenly, the weirdness struck me and I realized how much she asked in a way that seemed more like a checklist instead of learning something new. A few days later, I met during the time my best friend. He was stressed, so I asked him what's going on. I knew he had some trouble with his parents, so I thought it might be something along those lines. He told me instead that his ex turned into a stalker. He never gave her a key, yet somehow, she suddenly stood in his flat when he got home from work. She messaged and phoned his parents in order to get an explanation to talk to him to accuse them of talking him into breaking up with her. She also visited him during work and made a scene. His boss being the person throwing her out of the building and threatening to call the police. I remembered the girl from the bus station. I described her even though I could only vaguely remember what she looked like. And he nodded and told me that was her while getting pale. I asked how she knew me and why she wanted to talk to me, which he couldn't answer. She knew my name because he talked about me once, but never told her more than that. We didn't learn how she learned so much about me and we never want to because he had it harder than me. He got terrorized at home by her, which drove him to the decision to finally call the police and get a restraining order. We never again talked about the situation because it was so creepy. 
The reason they broke up was her accusing him over and over again of cheating. She was the one breaking up with him, but also seemed to go mental at the same time. For the weekend, I wanted to visit my boyfriend. He lives two hours away, and I always go by train. I'm not easily spooked, but I always keep an eye out. One hour into the trip, it was around 8 p.m. then, I see two men getting on the same train compartment as me. I was sitting in the two seat, and the seat next to me was empty, and in front of me there were seats for four people, two pairs of seats facing each other. The men came in and became very loud, even though it was a silent compartment, but nobody said anything because they already seemed very suspicious from the moment they stepped into the train. Their eyes were fixated on me. They stepped through the doors and sat in the seat in front of mine, the four seat, and from then on they kept an eye on me while discussing things with each other in a language I did not understand. Like any other girl, I get stared at frequently, especially when I wear my hair down. It normally makes me feel a bit awkward, but I never feel unsafe when it happens. Until yesterday. But they were staring at me in every way possible. Through the chairs, standing up, sitting down, and bending over to get a good look through the reflection of the mirror, and getting up and walking past me. They were taking turns walking over to the other compartment of the train. The compartment was only separated from mine with a glass door. Every time one of them got up, they both started staring at me. Then one of them went away, and the other had clear vision of me and kept staring at me. He poked his head through the middle of the seats and offered me some chocolate, which I politely refused. Then the other came back, and five minutes later, the man who did not go away yet went away in the same way. They kept taking turns walking away, and every time one of them got up, the one who remained seated kept an eye on the other and on me. Each time they were sitting across from each other, they discussed things, but I could not translate it. They kept looking at me, and then started discussing it again. When I had 20 minutes left on my trip, a lot of people got off at one stop. It was just me, them, and one other male. The moment the doors were closed, the creepy man started walking through the doors to check if there were any people coming in, and maybe checking if there was security. I don't know why he did it, but when he came back, he scanned the train to see how many people were still there. From that moment on, both got in seats facing me. They would not stop staring at this point. As you can imagine, I was panicked and was stressed the fuck out. So I slowly turned around to look behind the glass doors to see if there were more people there that could maybe help me. And to my luck, there were more people. So I slowly and very softly put my jacket on. We still had 10 minutes left then, and I kid you not, not even two minutes later, one of the other men starts getting dressed too. He took his jacket and kept looking at me and fixating on me. This was where I really panicked. I already let my friends know what was going on and my boyfriend was already at the train stop where I was supposed to get out. Then I contemplated what the smartest thing to do was because there was an emergency number on the train that you could call or text if you feel unsafe but I had a gut feeling that this would not help me. So I got my bags, got up and walked through the glass door to the other compartment. I sat facing them so I could see what they were doing. They both got up and grabbed their bags and started walking towards me. Mind you, they were sitting closest to the exit, so there was no reason for them to take this route. I rapidly started to talk to someone in the seat next to mine and asked them if they could help me. I told them I was getting followed and watched by two men. He said he also thought that they were very suspicious and was getting scared for me. He asked me to sit next to him so he could keep me a little safer and distract the men or something. Then he distracted me a little bit and asked me questions about my life. When the two creeps saw that I was seated next to that man, they were already coming my way and were making their way through the doors to my compartment. They heard glass doors so we could see each other very clearly. I had not shown my fear, but I was shaking uncontrollably that they must have seen how scared I was. The moment they got to the door, they saw me getting seated next to the other man and the creeps exchanged looks looked at me, discussed something, looked at me again, turned around and went the other way. 
They are walking to the exit of the train, where again is a glass door, so we can still see each other. The whole time they were standing around the exit, they were looking at me with this very creepy and disturbing look on their faces. I'll describe it as, You got away, but you won't be lucky next time. That's how it felt. The man I was sitting next to was trying to calm me down. He told me he was not going to let me off this train by myself and would wait until my boyfriend would arrive. That was amazing and I felt comforted. But then the next stop came and we walked to the side of the exit and then came a realization. In the exit of the train, there were two other men standing there with the same kind of looks as the two creeps. They talked in the same language and they acted weird too. These men were probably the men the two creeps visited every few minutes. The men saw me exit, looked at me with that creepy look. But then the man kept me safe and made sure he walked with me and immediately they looked away. They also covered their faces with their hoods. The doors opened and I nearly sprinted out of there just as the other two creeps. Then the man that escorted me out waited for me until we found my boyfriend and then went about his day. We both could not thank him enough for keeping me safe. I thought I lived in a very safe country in Europe, but I think as long as you're a young woman on your own, you'll never be 100% safe while traveling or being alone. I hate thinking about what would have happened if I had not been helped by that man in the other compartment. I wish I could have thanked him with gifts or a nice gesture, but I don't know his name and will probably never see him again. To the man who saved me, I thank you all my heart. Two months ago on a cloudy, chilly day, I was waiting on a really crowded platform for a suburban train. It was late in the afternoon, and the other line that went into a similar direction had been closed down for the day, so imagine the platform to be packed. Suddenly heads flew around as there was a voice of a middle-aged lady screaming her lungs out at someone. Can't you behave? I can't believe it. Wow, okay this is what my body looks like, okay? She seemed groomed, but not chic, like many others coming home from their blue-collar jobs that had worked mostly in the area of the city. She was in work attire too, carrying a canvas bag with her lunchbox in it. It was clear that she was not bedraggled. Her hair was washed, her shoes were well-capped. She didn't look like your average troubled homeless or drug-addicted person. It became apparent that she was yelling at a young teenage girl, probably 12 or 13, who was accompanied by her mother. I'm sorry, she mumbled. Sorry, the woman snapped back. I do have the fucking right not to be stared at by people constantly when I'm in public. Now the mother hustled her daughter behind herself and stepped in, trying to defend her. Please calm down, she's just a child. That's not a child, that's a teenager who should already know how impolite it is to stare at people. The woman yelled on the top of her lungs with her eyes bulged out of her head. She rambled on about how sick and tired she was of people staring at her, how this was bad parenting, etc. Until the mother grabbed her now weeping daughter by the hand and fled from the platform. The woman's eyes beamed across the platform and locked with mine. I quickly lowered my gaze on my phone. Just a couple moments later, I heard her once again yelling at someone for staring at her. This time it was an elderly man who didn't even answer. Obviously this woman had a system. The man made a dismissive gesture with his hands and retreated into another area of the platform, passing me. That's when the crazy woman's eyes one more time caught me looking at her, turning her head on purpose to look at me. I figured she herself was staring at people and drawing their attention. When they looked back at her too often, she'd attack. I was really glad when my train arrived, but she entered with me and got in the same section mumbling curses about what are you looking at while i kept looking at my phone as if my life depended on it sweating and trying not to look if she was getting closer but not to look at her really i obviously was caught in the little game of hers she was out to get me after getting off i was waiting at a fairly empty stop for the other train i needed to get into she just walked circles and circles around me round and round wider and smaller and out of the corner of my eye, I could catch that she was piercing me with her eyes the whole time, trying to catch me the second I looked up. My stomach turned and my heart pumped like crazy. 
She hadn't harmed anyone, but I still wanted to avoid being attacked verbally by her. Finally, a man standing near us seemingly had grasped of the unfortunate situation I was in and started approaching us. When the strange woman suddenly walked off into his direction, screamed, fucking asshole, just a few centimeters away from his face and bolted up the escalator, stomping like an angry child and yelling obscenities. I don't know what her problem was, I'm pretty sure she's mentally ill. It seems she believed people kept staring at her for her weight as she kept hinting to her tirades that she was eager to catch them. I'm just glad our eyes didn't meet again and I hope they won't ever. This is a short story and I very well may have been in immediate danger but there's no way to know. I was 18 at the time. I lived in the suburb of a large city and attended that city's university. I did not yet have a vehicle and public transportation in my city is pretty shitty. Only buses but, it didn't, but they didn't go out to my neighborhood. So I had to take a charter bus to the city and then about three more buses to get to the university. During this time, I had got quite used to being catcalled and stared at, sometimes even followed for short distances. I always carried pepper spray, and since it was always broad daylight, I was never too concerned. But one day, I missed my first bus, meaning to catch the next one if I wanted to get to class on time. I would have to walk about five blocks down the street and turn right for three more blocks. About halfway through the trek, I noticed a very large, unkept man following me. He seemed very unstable. We have a lot of heavy drug users in my city, some more dangerous to the public than others. As I finally approached my stop, I grew cold, realizing that the man had also stopped waiting for the bus. I started to feel that detached autopilot feeling. I just need to get to school, then I'll be fine, I remember thinking. Just then, another man riding a bike rode past us, then looped around, stopped, and waited beside me when the bus got there, I got on the bus, then the big man, who sat not directly beside me, but in the road directly beside the row I sat on. Then the bike man put his bike on the front of the bus, which was going in the opposite direction he was riding, and got on and sat in the seat beside me. He did not say one word to me. After a couple stops, the big man got off rather abruptly, and when he did, the bike man also got off and rode his bike the way he came from. I was very scared, but then I think the bike man was looking out for me that day. I wish I could have thanked him for being there. I scared a little girl just a few months out of high school and a total stranger. Thank you, bike man. I hope you're well. I remember this event after reading a similar creepy story on here and thought I'd post it. I went to school with this guy. We never dated or anything like that, just friends but not overly close. I didn't see him for a few years after we got out of school, but we ran into each other when I was pregnant with my son. We hugged, talked for a while, and then we went our separate ways. Several years later, I was watching the evening news and I heard them say a familiar name. I immediately recognized the name of my old friend since it was fairly unusual. They said that he was arrested for killing his girlfriend he apparently stalked her, but was able to get her to come to his apartment to get her belongings. He then abducted and shot her. He drove around with her body in his car for four days. I don't mean the body was in the trunk either. Her body was in the passenger seat, and he would talk to her and take her places, such as visiting her father's grave. I was able to find an article from 1991 in the newspaper. This happened quite a few years ago. I was doing a summer program at college out of state when I was in high school. Basically, they had a high schoolers come from all over America and stay in dorms during the summer to take summer classes for three weeks to get a taste of the college experience. One of the dorms was reserved just for us and it had boys on floors two through four and girls on floors three to five with college student proctors on every floor to supervise. Floor one was a lobby and security guard where you entered the building. One night, my roommate and I were asleep in our room. 
We were all supposed to lock our doors, but us girls typically didn't because we like to shift rooms and sleep over with each other after lights out. So the entire floor was pretty much unlocked. I'm a super light sleeper, so when I heard the door open, it woke me up, but I couldn't see who was in the doorway with it being so dark. The person then quickly closed the door and left, which kind of felt weird, so I woke up my roommate and told them. We texted the proctor, then decided to fall back asleep. The next day we mentioned it, and a few other girls said the same thing happened to them. When the day security guard ran the footage, apparently the night security guard had peeked into all the unlocked female dorms, but only the females. He claimed that he was told by the dean that he could sleep in an empty room, but that was allegedly on floor 7, not the girl floors. He didn't come in, talk to anybody, or hurt anybody, but he also didn't open any of the male doors or the proctor's doors. Then, after making his weird rounds, he went to nap on the top floor. I don't know if he was fired or moved, but I did find this really creepy. I entered the student parking lot at my college campus. As I got out of my car, I see a man standing a few cars away. I start walking and this man says, Hey, remember me? I said, No, I don't. With a big smile, he replied, I remember you from high school. We were in Miss Smith's class. I never had a Miss Smith in high school, and I damn sure would have remembered this guy if he was in my class, since me and my classmates had been together for four years in high school. So I said, No, sorry, I have to go. He then asked me what high school I went to. I told him, and he swore he knew me. Again, I said, No, sorry, I don't recognize you. He then asked me for a ride to his class and that it started at 9.15. My college classes started on the hour, 8 a.m., 9 a.m., etc. My inner warning lights were going off. I'm getting weirded out and say, I'm sorry, I can't. I have to go to class. As I walked away, he said out loud, I guess I can't pull the wool over your eyes. A week later, the college campus newsletter said a man robbed a student at knife point. The student had given him a ride and the student had been asked the same questions by the man. Lurking on the subreddit has helped some memories resurface. This is the first experience I feel like sharing. I'm a 29 year old female. At the age of 20, I was working to get my cosmetology license at a small town beauty school. It was a modest school in a slightly run-down, dated building. The owner was a woman in her mid to late 60s whose husband, similar age, and son performed the property maintenance for the school. I didn't like being around the husband. I found him off-putting. I sensed an unpredictable vibe. He was quiet, but I always felt like he was leering at us girls. Rumors that he was always drunk. One day, he really gave me a reason not to like him. It happened during the end of day cleanup where students had to complete a list of chores. Right off the hallway with our lockers was a teeny break room that housed a creepy old closet that was used for storing cleaning supplies. The dimensions of this closet are important. 15 feet deep, but only as wide as its door, about 3 feet. Someone coming in to stand in the closet doorway while you were inside would have stopped you from exiting. A single shitty light hung near the door, so the further you went into the closet, the darker it got, approaching blackness. A vending machine is in front of the closet, obstructing its view, meaning that someone walking down the hallway cannot see the closet unless they actually come into the break room. I'm also 99% sure that the closet door couldn't be seen by the one camera in the break room. One day, I'm in the closet alone, looking for Swiffer pads or something. No one in the break room. Suddenly, someone appears in the closet doorway. It's the owner's husband. He steps into the closet and I just stare. Now, I have little to no rapport with this man. It's doubtful he even knows my name. Also, I was 5'5 and about 100 pounds. Dude was old, but he was able to body and bigger than I. Without any kind of greeting that I can remember, he says in a low mumble, 
I'll get you back there, pin so tight. As he finishes his sentence with either, you won't know what to do, or you wouldn't believe it. I can't remember verbatim. I'm trying to process his words while alarm bells are going off in my head. What did he just say? There's no one but us. We weren't even having a conversation, let alone a conversation that would match those words. I was so confused and nervous that I didn't say anything in response. I just pretend that everything is fine and that I'm focused in finding the Swiffer pads that I didn't hear him. After a few moments, he steps back out of the doorway and leaves the break room. Relieved, I got the hell out of that closet. I couldn't believe he said that. There was no context that would have made those words make sense. Also, I don't think he got anything out of the closet, so why would he go in there? The cleaning tasks are assigned to the students. The whole thing was only a minute, but it was unsettling. I'm glad he didn't do anything worse. I quietly told a few girls, but I was scared to complain formally. I was timid, broke, with limited prospects in this town that I had just moved to. I didn't want trouble, I just wanted to graduate. Upon hearing my experience, another girl told me that she also had an unsettling encounter with him, where he stated that it had been a while since he had a little girl in the closet. I've survived worse situations, and I have since learned how to stand up for myself, but I regret letting him get away with intimidation. Should have told him to fuck off. The way my college was set up was basically two large hills, classroom, admin buildings, libraries, etc. And the dorms and cafeterias were on the top of the other. In the valley between the two hills was where the gyms and sports centers were located. I was studying engineering and would often stay late in one of the study rooms until 1 or 2 a.m. One night I was alone walking back to my dorm around midnight and I saw this guy standing at the top of the hill. No one else was around and I was at the bottom of the hill. I had seen this guy on campus before and he always gave me the creeps. His eyes looked really unhinged and he often walked with jerky, almost frantic movements. Usually I didn't think too much of it. I assumed he was a student and maybe had some physical or psychological issues. A few of my classmates said that he had severe OCD and would do quirky things while out and about, but none of them had the same look in their eyes as this guy. I wouldn't say it was an evil look, but his eyes always seemed untethered from reality. I always got the sense that he was seeing something a lot darker than the rest of us. On this particular night, as soon as I saw him, I got a bad case of the creeps. He was coming down from the hill straight towards me. So I casually crossed the street to the other side of the path and he followed so that he would still be coming straight towards me. Again, I crossed the path and he did the same. I was getting nervous when suddenly some guys came out of the soccer field at the bottom of the hill. The creepy guy noticed them and when I moved out of the path, he didn't follow me. As I passed him, I noticed that he was staring at me. So I glared back at him to let him know not to fuck with me. After that night, I started walking a different route behind the tennis courts to avoid him. It was kind of risky since late at night, no one was ever around there. But I also began calling my parents on the nightly walks back home, and that helped too. I saw that guy a few more times on campus during days, but never caught him looking at me again. Hopefully my glare scared him off. I still have no idea if he was a student or just some weirdo hanging around looking to cause trouble. As there was another guy on campus who posed as a student, even though he was kicked out. He once cornered one of my girlfriends in the library trying to ask her out, and I think he was later arrested for refusing to leave campus. So maybe this guy was doing the same thing. I'm at a relatively small college campus in the Midwest. It's within the largest city and is about four blocks total. One evening while my roommate was home, I chose to go on a walk. It was a Saturday night about 6 p.m. around the beginning of February. If you're not familiar with the Midwest winters, that means it was pretty much pitch blackout. 
I enjoyed wandering around the various buildings on campus, even the ones I really have no business being in, because after all, it's my tuition that helps fund them. Now, on a Saturday night, I was expecting most buildings on campus to be locked, so when I tugged on the music building's door handle, imagine my surprise when it easily swung open. The hallway lights were on, but I didn't see anyone. I chose to go up the first set of stairs I found, all the way to the fourth floor, which was also the top floor. The stairwell itself gave me the creeps. I took pictures of it because it reminded me of one of those eerie, liminal space photographs that tend to freak people out. When I got to the top floor, it was dead silent. I felt a bit like someone would pop out of nowhere and yell at me for being in there. I crept down the hall, listening for footsteps. The hallways in particular wasn't one that branched out. It had two stairways at each end of it and a single elevator. I had a gut feeling that it wasn't safe and I had my pepper spray in my hand in case I did run into anything sketchy. Call me paranoid, but it was terrifying. When I got about halfway down the hall, I heard an instrument start playing. Now, I can't remember what it was, perhaps a bass instrument, maybe a piano. Either way, I knew that I wasn't alone and I wanted to leave. The stairs left me uneasy. Looking at the second set that I hadn't gone up sent alarm bells ringing in my mind. Something stopped me from going down those stairs, so I waited for the elevator. It took probably a good 45 seconds to get to me, and when it did it had a horror movie-like chime to it. It was slightly bigger than average too. It shook the entire way down, that awful chime ringing out as I passed each floor. When it finally reached the first floor, the doors opened. I saw a middle-aged man leaning against the opposite wall, staring right into the open doors, right at me. He was tall, not anything special. His eyes flickered to my hand, still gripping my pink pepper spray. Looking back, I'm glad I had it out already. I stepped out of the elevator and kind of nodded at him before turning to walk to the doorway I entered from, the one furthest from the elevator. It's important to mention that there was also another entrance right next to the elevator. That one led to a much darker, less walked area of campus. I make my way down this hallway, glancing back at the man every few seconds. He's staring after me, not moving. He doesn't get on the elevator. Once he notices me looking at him, he slowly turns and starts walking towards the door close to him, the ones I'm getting further and further away from. I continue walking and continue looking back at him. We reach our respective doors about the same time, which is odd considering how close he was to his in comparison to me with mine. Regardless, as soon as I put my hand on the door, I look back once more. The man has now turned towards me and began to jog towards me, sort of in the way runners do, not particularly fast, but enough that it would be easy for them to gain speed. Instincts kick in, alarms are blaring in my head that I need to get to the library where it's safe and populated right now. I push through the two sets of doors and begin sprinting. I don't look behind me anymore. There's a set of small steps before the library and I fall up on those. One of my gloves falls to the bottom of the steps and I rush down to grab it before running once more. I end up safe in the library and trying to calm my racing heart. I also realized I had lost a single glove at the same point. I get my mom on the phone and talk really loudly to her and make my way back to the music building to find it dropped about 60 feet from the entrance. I grab it and book it back to my room. I don't know what this man's intentions were. Perhaps he was trying to scare me because he knew I would be freaked out. Maybe his intentions were dark. Regardless, it was one of the most terrifying things that's ever happened to me. So when I was younger, I was doing this boring schoolwork and stuff until we got an intruder alarm, which doesn't happen often. We don't even practice it because it's such an uncommon thing to happen. The guy proceeded to walk around the school grounds, even as far as our gym room, and I happened to see him as I was seated next to the window. He had a puffy black jacket and a baseball cap. It was all pretty terrifying considering a thing like this has never happened before. 
Later that day, I overheard the teachers talking about him and how when they searched him, they found a kitchen knife in his pocket. Luckily, no one got hurt, but this just freaked me the fuck out. So I'm in high school and I sit with a group of emo gay kids at lunch. A while ago, there was this one guy who would hang out with us. I didn't think much of him, skinny white emo kid, until one day he kept saying that he was black. He wasn't, he's completely snow white. It was making slightly racist comments to the point where he pointed at someone and said, look, a monkey. That was when we exiled him from the group. Fast forward up to recently, he joined my ROTC class, which is basically military in high school. He makes dark comments all the time and dark jokes. Once there was a lockdown and we were really scared and he was sad that he didn't get to die that day. Meanwhile, I was ready to give up my life to save people. He said he liked ROTC and wanted to join the army because of the blood and violence. I have also heard him make jokes about shooting up the school. He does this a lot and it makes me very uncomfortable. I talk to my friends and it turns out the other girls are uncomfortable as well. He keeps talking about death and dying and killing people. I need to talk to my flight leaders about him because I generally feel like he might do something. Edit. He has been reported to my flight leader and I'm also going to tell my mom who is a guidance counselor at another school. Update. I just reported him to the police. I will also file a report to my school about him. It's in the hands of the higher ups now. Trigger warning for this story. I'm a 20 year old female. I was 13 at the time that the story takes place. It was the summer between 7th and 8th grade, which would make it the year 2016. And I just moved into a new city about an hour away from where I grew up. To help me make friends before the school year started, my mom signed me up for a day camp in the new town over the summer. At this camp, I actually did develop a small friend group, but the only one that matters to the story would be Jim. Male, 14. I'm gonna be honest, Jim was always more flirty with me than I was comfortable with, and I expressed that several times, but I always tried to minimize confrontation when I did so. Hindsight is 2020. I should have cut off the friendship when it was clear he wasn't respecting my boundaries. But damn it, I was the only kid and all my new friends acted like it was normal. Well, one day the rest of my friend group wasn't there. One was sick and the other two were siblings whose family had taken the day trip. Jim and I were hanging out alone in the gym. We were sitting off to the side talking, but the gym was full with other kids and counselors. He said he had a secret to tell me and asked me to lean in closer. As soon as I did, he grabbed me, pushed me down to the ground, and got on top of me. In front of the whole gym, he was trying to kiss me while trying to use the hand that wasn't holding me down to fiddle with the button on my pants. I yelled at him to stop, to get off of me. I yelled no, thrashed around, and made it as difficult for him as possible to do what he was attempting to do. But he wouldn't stop. None of the counselors gave it a second look. I thought that in a room full of people, no one was going to stop him. And I knew that if someone didn't, he was going to fully overpower me and follow through. I was trying to get him off of me when a group of four or five kids from a younger group who had previously been playing badminton saw what was going on and decided to take it into their own hands since no one else would help me. I want to stress to you guys that these kids were from six to nine years old. None of them looked older than eight. But these kids brought their little rackets with them and rallied around me. I heard a little chorus of voices yelling, Get off of her. Stop it, you big butthead. And one prominent, she said no. While I watched two rackets slide between our faces, they were trying to pry his face off of my face. The other kids took their rackets and just went ham on Jim, hitting the crap out of him. At first, he was focused on his goal that he just swatted at them, hitting the kids back, and continued to try to focus himself on me. But those kids were not letting up, and the combination of me thrashing and the kids hitting him made it a lot harder than he thought it would be. 
So after about five minutes of this, Jim decided it simply wasn't worth it anymore, got off of me and just walked away. I still think about this a lot. It was traumatic as hell for me. Not only that a friend of mine tried to do this to me, but that the adults in the room that were supposed to protect me completely ignored a blatant sexual assault attempt. It's sick to think that these young kids cared more about my autonomy than the adults. But at the same time, it gives me a little hope for the future to know that younger kids of this generation are taught to care about others in this way. Those kids would not be the age I was when it happened and I wonder how they're all doing at this time. I wonder if they ever think about what they did that day. I hope they know how grateful I am. I can't say I'm glad that this happened by any means, but in a way, I'm grateful that it gave me an opportunity to see the next generation in action and boost my faith in humanity. Trigger warning for this story. My college was very safe. The worst thing that happened was crazy drunk frat boys getting the police called for mischief. It was your typical campus fitted with those blue boxes where you can call for an emergency. Now, when I walk around campus, I often scroll through Reddit or Instagram. I know that's stupid, but don't judge me. I was a college student. Anyway, this particular night, it was dark out, but only about 7 p.m. There were lots of other students walking around, and the campus was pretty well lit. Yet, for some reason, I didn't go on my phone this time. I just had this feeling that something was off. I couldn't place it, but in the back of my head, I felt like something bad was going to happen. The walk continued normally and by the time I got back to my dorm, I began to laugh at myself. Now these were apartment style dorms that you entered through the outside via a pathway. The feeling from before returned and this time I was hit by a sudden feeling of intense fear, much stronger than before. I looked around the common area and noticed the light coming from my room. Something told me not to investigate, but instead I muttered, seriously, I forgot it? and went back outside. I felt a bit paranoid for the next few minutes, crouching down behind the window like a crazy person. I began to think I was just being weird when I heard footsteps. I slowly peeked into the window to see a man that I didn't know coming out of my room and pouring himself a glass of soda. He brought it back with him and disappeared again. I stayed there for what felt like forever until about an hour passed and I heard footsteps again. He was headed for the front door and I bolted to the stairwell. I climbed to the floor above and waited for a few minutes before returning. Sure enough, he was gone and when I entered the dorm room, I no longer had that bad feeling. I checked that place thoroughly and found nothing out of the ordinary until I lay down in bed a few hours later and felt something weird under the covers. I jolted up and turned on the lights to find a few condoms wrapped in plastic. I'm not sure what would have happened, but I'm fairly certain someone was waiting there to rape me. I didn't recognize this man from class, but he definitely was about my age. I don't know how he knew me, but the thought that I could have been stalked without realizing it struck me hard. I never saw the man again, and I never got the same feeling on campus. Somehow, I subconsciously knew that something was wrong. I have no clue how, and maybe there's an explanation but that bad feeling may have saved my life. I've read a ton of stories on the subreddit and finally decided to share my own encounter. I feel like maybe I should put a trigger warning for sexual assault and drug use. A little background info and context before I get into my story. I'm a 22 year old female, but this story happened when I was 18. Firstly, a few days before I turned 16, when I was a sophomore in high school, I was sexually assaulted by a guy who was 17, a senior in high school. For this story, I'll call him Connor. He was expelled from school after that happened, and I occasionally saw him around town. He would just stare at me, and it terrified me. I had, and still kind of have, really bad PTSD from it. I was afraid he would kill me for telling someone. My friend told the police and he was arrested and I've always feared his retaliation. Secondly, in my junior year of high school, there was this boy who I'll be calling Luke. 
Luke posted on Facebook that he was going to bring a knife to school and stab everyone in his path. He was caught before anything happened and expelled, and everyone at school referred to him as a G-Town Stabber. G-Town was the shortened version of our town name. Lastly, my best friend and I were very into drugs in high school. We smoked weed every day and would use harder things like cocaine, acid, or molly whenever we partied. Okay, now to the story. It was my best friend's 18th birthday right at the start of senior year, so her and I decided we were going to rent a hotel room and throw a party. We invited pretty much everyone we knew and shared on social media that we had alcohol and a hotel room and to message us for details. Before everyone came, we decided to drop something called Sally. Think of a drug that makes you hallucinate, like acid or shrooms, but the chill that comes from weed and the euphoria that comes from Molly. People said Sally was Molly's cousin, and it was like a mix of Molly weed and shrooms. We had never done it before, and we were high as hell. My best friend had decided to drink too, and ended up puking a little bit, so she wasn't as high as I was. I was hallucinating like crazy and just felt like I was on a whole nother planet. Eventually, a decent amount of people showed up. Some of them I knew, but some were friends of friends that I recognized but didn't know. As the night went on, pretty much everyone was intoxicated and decided they wanted to smoke weed. I felt like I was the highest I've ever been and didn't need to smoke, so I decided to stay in the room and enjoy the high and hallucinations. After everyone cleared out, I half noticed one person whom I didn't know. They had decided to stay as well. I didn't pay him much attention as I was incredibly high. I know that seems redundant, but it was significant at the time of the story. So anyways, I'm sitting there and this guy strikes up a conversation with me. After a few minutes of casually chatting, he mentioned his best friend and said, I'm pretty sure you know him. His name is Connor. I was about to shit my pants when he said that because he clearly knew who I was, which meant that Connor had told him about me. I instantly thought that Connor had sent him to the party to get me and that he didn't go out to smoke because he was waiting for his opportunity. I tried to act as casual as I could. I just said something like, yeah, I know him. He then said, you know the G-Town stabber? And I hesitantly said, yes. He then proceeded to pull a knife out of his pocket and told me that he was the G-Town stabber while twirling a knife in his fingers. At this moment, I felt like he was going to kill me and get revenge for his best friend. I tried to act as casual and text my best friend telling her that everyone else needed to get back their ASAP and told her what happened. They came back in a few minutes, but it felt like an hour. I can't imagine what would have happened if they had not came back and I have no idea why he would have told me he was best friends with the guy who sexually assaulted me or the fact that he was a G-Town stabber, but I know there was no good intentions behind it. He left shortly after everyone came back and I never saw him again. This happened to me about 14 years ago when I was 17. I was in the University of California I graduated high school early, so I started university early. I used to go to the local Starbucks by my campus in my free time to study because it was hard for me to focus at home. I remember this older guy used to come in a lot and just sit alone at the table, always facing me with one small coffee and he would just stare. It made me deeply uncomfortable, but I was too young to think about reporting it because I didn't really think there was anything to report. He was just staring, not approaching me or anything. In fact, I thought some of it was in my head. I began to notice that sometimes he would leave around the same time I did. With a Starbucks, the parking was mostly on the ground level of a free parking structure that was on the corner from the shop. It was usually super easy to get a spot right in front so you could actually see your car from the street in the structure. I usually parked there and I never felt particularly unsafe except when I realized he was following me out. I began to know what his car looked like and where he would park. 
it would usually be a little away from me and I would wait for him to leave before I went anywhere because I didn't want him following me. One afternoon though, I was heading to my car and I noticed that he was parked right next to me. The passenger side of his car was on my driver's side and it was very close. I didn't see him, but I remember just having this most awful feeling in the pit of my stomach when I realized he had parked so close. I rushed to get in my car and it was at the moment that I shut my door that I realized that he had been following me and approaching the driver's side of my vehicle. He had gotten as far as my door when I quickly locked it and thankfully I did it fast enough because he tried to open my door a second later. I immediately backed out of the spot and floored it out of the structure. I got caught at a red light outside the structure though, which gave this guy enough time to catch up with me in his car. I honestly don't know why I didn't call the cops at this moment. I remember trying to rationalize what was going on in my head and thinking maybe I was making a big deal out of nothing, even though the man literally tried to open my car door. I know, I'm stupid, but I was 17. If it were me at 31, you bet I would have driven straight to the nearest police station. Thankfully though, I was aware enough that I needed to lose him before I went home, so I turned into a series of residential streets to see if he would follow. He did. I just sped up and made a bunch of random turns until I was sure that I lost him. Then I drove home and never went back to that Starbucks again. I don't want to think about what would have happened had I not been quick enough to lock my door or lose him. This took place around 2005. I was going to my local college. I, female 24, was in the computer lab and some guy around my age sat next to me and introduced himself. I got creepy vibes right away from him. I could tell that he was interested in me, but he was being extremely pushy about it. I told him I wasn't interested in that way. I never had class with him, but he seemed to figure out which class I was taking and every time I got out of class, he would be standing outside the door waiting for me, or he would be sitting in the cafeteria eating with some friends, and he would move to the seat next to mine and start talking to me. My friends started to notice that he would follow us around too. One day he asked me what my career plans were, but he said he joined a company and would be making a lot more money than staying around in anything they offered at the college. He said that this company was having their monthly meeting that evening and that I should come with him to go check it out. I was broke and struggling, so I foolishly agreed to it. He picked me up in the school parking lot and drove me. It ended up being a BS multi-level company that I didn't want any part of. At the end, we drove away, and he said that he wanted to take me to a nice restaurant. He was all dressed up with strong cologne. I said that I can't go, that I needed to get back right away. He started acting crazy and saying, why don't you just go out with me? He started punching the wheel and screaming to himself that he was gonna kill himself. I was terrified. I said, well, if you wanna go out, you need to tell me ahead of time. I'm not dressed well and I've got a big test to study for tomorrow, etc." He seemed to calm down and said, okay, we'll go out another time. But I was done and I knew that I might have got hurt that night. I told my college counselor and he was given a strong warning to stay away from me. He ended up leaving the school and I never saw him again. This happened to me when I was eight, yes, eight, on the last day of school before the holidays. There's this kid in my class, we'll call him Dan. We didn't get along, Sometimes, if I dropped my pens, he would stomp on them. Then one day, our class held a party. Since we were kids, this meant play Twister and run around with snacks. The parents were in another classroom. The teacher had left the classroom for a bit. Then I noticed some guys were playing in the huge pile of beanbags. Being a kid and pretty naive, I asked if I could join. They said sure and explained the game. Basically, I was supposed to lay on the floor and they were to put some on me. Then I would jump up and startle them. I took my place and they started to heap the beanbags and I mean all of them. It was super tight and claustrophobic 
with no place to really move. By the time they were done, I was suddenly super nervous. It was dark, tight, and stuffy. I could hear my classmates talking and giggling, waiting for me to come up, but I never got the chance. Someone jumped on top of the beanbags. Dan, I would later learn from my friend Aria. Now, I was a really skinny kid and the complete opposite of strong, while Dan was way heavier than me and only added to the weight of the heavy bags. I was suffocating from his weight. I literally couldn't breathe. I was slapping at the beanbags and trying to find gaps with my fingers. Dan weighed the whole thing down, as you could imagine. Finally, I managed to make a small opening and stuck my nose through it, but the gap closed before I could take a breath. My chest hurt. I had to breathe now, but I couldn't. I tried to make another opening again, but it was really hard, so instead I screamed. I was scared, crushed, and horrified all at the same time. This sort of thing was unlike anything that had ever happened to me before. I finally realized the severity of my situation. Up until then I was in complete denial, but my mindset switched completely when I realized I was actually suffocating, that if he prolonged this, I could die. So I made the quietest and most choked scream as I was suffocating, which means not much air. Obviously no one heard, and no one seemed to realize that I was suffocating despite my persistent slapping and kicking. My movements were getting slow. I felt myself slip from consciousness. It was a terrifying feeling as I could feel myself slipping from consciousness and there was nothing I could do but keep fighting. I had no breath left to scream. Finally, I managed to make that small gap. At the same time, my teacher finally came back and saw me, ran to me and started yelling at Dan while throwing the bean bags off of me. The moment they were off, I gasped for air and bawled. Once I was done, my friend Aria came with me to confront his mom. We told her what happened and she said, Okay girls, I'll talk to him about it later. Sorry about that, Lily. Not shocked, not angry. She just stood there and we left. I hope he's not done that again. What he did to me was an accident, but honestly, he probably felt me kicking and pounding the beanbags since he was sitting on top of them. He was even one of the people who heaped the beanbags on me. I had also made it very clear beforehand that no one was to sit on them or place heavy items on them. As I said, we were all about 8 or 9 at the time, so this was probably by accident. Maybe as we disliked each other, he wanted to prank me or scare me, because I didn't believe that he would intentionally want to suffocate me. Still, he should not have been playing those games. I do think he apologized later on, but still, what happened, happened, and taught me not to play dangerous games like that. He did not do anything like that again, at least to my knowledge. Still wonder why no one noticed I was in trouble. Also, wonder who fetched the teacher, or if he just came in on his own accord. So yeah, that's my story. Even to this day, I get nervous when my friends or siblings start messing with pillows. I can't say it has traumatized me, but it sure gave me one hell of a lesson and a good scare for sure. I met a guy in college and ran one lap with him. He asked me what my name was and I told him. He was hitting on me, but I said no. Anyway, I was going through my emails a day later and he sent me a schedule of when we will run together. I was shocked because to find my email in the college email system, he had to have gone through everyone who has the first name in the system. He would watch me so intensely when I ran or shot basketball at the rec center. It was so intense, people actually noticed and told me. He would hide behind equipment and stare. That part was a little funny to me at least. His hiding was terrible. He kept hitting on me in person and wouldn't take no for an answer. He grabbed me by my arm forcefully on one occasion and another said that he was my boyfriend. Obviously not. It's funny because I told my best friend and she didn't think anything of it. But one day, my best friend texts me and says to come into the dining hall. I did. There's another girl. I found out that this guy has a restraining order placed against him by the entire girls soccer team. 
the restraining order was because he would use the same tactics against them. There's more that happened, but I'll just stop here. I'm 19 years old and living far from home in a studio room. When I was in middle school, I remember taking sex ed class. This must have been fifth grade because we had to watch this infamous video where we had to learn about our bodies, our reproductive organs, and had to watch a full video of a woman giving birth. I remember asking a female friend of mine an inappropriate question regarding the video we had just watched while walking in the hallway without realizing the vice principal was in earshot. He called me to his office to scold me until I explained that it was just a question revolving around what we had seen in class. He calmed down and then ended up chatting casually with me, a little too casually. Maybe in an attempt to seem cool and relatable, he explained to me he had a tattoo. I asked him what it was and he showed me the tattoo of an artistic looking fish on his shoulder. Even back then I thought the tattoo was corny as fuck, but it was fitting considering this guy was kind of dweeby. He then went on to tell me that the tattoo artist who tattooed him in New Hampshire went on to murder, dismember, two women a year later and was sentenced to life in prison. I have no clue why he thought it would be appropriate to share this with a middle schooler, but I was absolutely shook by the story for the following week and never forgot it. Edit. This is completely unrelated, but I also remember him joking about how fat his wife was. This dude was a real stand-up faculty member and general human being. I had a physics teacher in 11th grade that was cool for the most part, but definitely flirty with girls. I remember during tests he would do weird things like look over my shoulder to see what I was writing, then take an item from my desk to mess with. Weird, but not alarming. One time, I can't remember exactly what he said, but it prompted me to throw a pen at him. I didn't mean for it to hit, but it did, right on his head. I felt bad and apologized profusely. I didn't get in trouble, but I guess it became one of the many jokes of the year. After I graduated high school, he messaged me on Facebook, asking me if I wanted a job. I was in university at the time, focused on my studies, so I said no. He kept going, saying that it was a job at a massage parlor and it involved happy endings. I blocked him and didn't hear from him again. Anyways, now I don't feel so bad about the pen incident. Hey everyone, I've been a lurker for a while now and I've always wanted to post because I have so many crazy stories and this is surprisingly the least crazy out of everything I've been through. I'm now a 20 year old female, but I was in 9th grade at the time of this story, probably around 14. We had a really weird teacher for bio, everyone hated him, he was boring, mean, never smiled, quiet, and everyone dreaded his class. I've always had a lot of personality and I used to act out a lot. He was actually on the nicer side to me. Well one day we came to school to see that he wasn't there and we had a substitute. This lasted a few days, but trust me, we didn't mind. After a while, I guess the parents started talking and word got around as to why he wasn't at our school anymore. Turns out this man had a lot of child pornography on his computer. We didn't know the age range of the kids but we know it's bad. He had a lot. He was paying for packages and I'm almost positive he was trading with other pedos. Insanely freaked me out since I was one of the kids he was nicer to. I know for a fact I'm very beautiful and I was then too. It's crazy to think about why he might have been nicer to me. Can you imagine what these little kids had to go through for this? How many kids are stolen from their homes or born into abuse? It really creeped me out and no one saw this coming. When they raided his house, they also found a bunch of illegal guns. Hearing how much time this man got is going to make your blood boil. He got three years and banned from working with children. Our justice system is so horrible. 
Can you imagine sitting in front of a judge explaining why you purchased so much child porn and only getting three years? That judge must have had serious issues as well. I mean, really shame on them. Illegal guns alone get you three to five years, so it's insane that he only got three years. He could have faced up to 20. So I'm going to start it off by saying I'm non-binary and assigned female at birth. I also really love trade works as it makes me feel super manly. So stuff like working with heavy machinery, wood, or other forms of trades excite me. Today I started my masonry class that goes for four weeks, twice a week. Masonry, if you don't know, is really just brick block laying, working with mortar, and leaning the different branches of work for this trade. I was super excited. Some of my friends were there, and it was great. We were working in a shop on small, incomplete walls, smearing mortar so that we could prepare for block laying. Cue creepy teacher. We have two teachers to make sure everyone could get the technique down and learn how to properly do the work. Their names were Anne and Tom. At first, I thought Tom was sort of funny, and he's well up in his years. To get my attention, he touched my arm the first time, and I was very uncomfortable but just figured it would be a one-time thing. For context, being touched unexpectedly and by people I don't know seriously freaks me out to the point of panic attacks. I have no idea why. However, it was not the last time as he soon came back, this time from behind me. He placed his hand on my shoulder and I could feel how close he was. He said something about my technique in my ear and to get me to step aside, put his hand on my waist I had never had this experience with a teacher before, let alone one I hadn't even met. Shortly after it was lunch, I found the woman who had connected me to the class and explained that I needed her to tell him how deeply inappropriate and uncomfortable he made me. Long story short, it was passed to the boss's boss. I don't know exactly what was said, but I know that he was given some formal warning about touching students, especially without consent and he wasn't allowed within a meter of me or my work. I should also mention, most people in the class are men, and he never touched them or got that close. Needless to say, it was one of the creepiest teachers I've ever met. The teacher I had a weird experience with on two different occasions wasn't exactly someone that I would consider consistently weird or off-putting. He was a 30-something year old man who graduated from the same high school that he taught at. I think he played sports for the school back then and was probably a generally well-liked dude when he was younger. He also had two brothers who played sports around the same time and were probably as popular during their own high school years. I had him as a Spanish teacher in 9th and 11th grade and I remember many students that were in my class and his other classes found him hot or attractive. It was like the girls were just naturally drawn to his charm and the dudes naturally respected him because he was cool or chill with the bros. Sometimes it seemed like the teacher was aware of the girls liking him and would joke around and flirt back with them. Ironically, he also always loved to mention his two babies in class as well as his wife. I think most people enjoyed the fact that it seemed like he generally wanted to form a relationship with his students and get to know them. A rare few people disliked him because they thought he was weird for doing that. One of the things that he was very particular about in class was making sure that his students only spoke Spanish and not English to help us practice our Spanish. If he heard you speaking in English, he would call you out for it. One day in ninth grade, I was standing in front of my friend's desk and saying something to her in English because I don't know the terms in Spanish. My back was facing the rest of the classroom and all of a sudden, I felt someone grip my neck and squeeze it repeatedly, almost like a neck massage with one large hand. I was completely shocked and turned around to see that it was my teacher grabbing the back of my neck. He told me in Spanish somewhat aggressively to speak Spanish please and that was that. 
My friend, who was sitting in front of me and witnessed the whole thing, looked slightly horrified and confused, and we both exchanged what the fuck looks. Fast forward to 11th grade when I had him again as a teacher. He did it again one day when I was sitting in the corner with my friend, meaning that he definitely remembered doing it two years back and deliberately did it again two years later. It just never sat right with me because he seemed somewhat respectable and I never thought that he would do something like that, which could have been interpreted pretty badly. Usually when I see him laying his hands on people, it's to pat their back or arm as encouragement Never something like grabbing their neck as a pretend threat. What made it even more disturbing was that sometimes my friends would joke that the reason he singled me out was because I reminded him of his wife. Not based on looks, but because one day in class he shared a story about meeting his wife and said that he fell in love with her pretty much immediately, but that she hated him at first. So he had to work hard to charm her. My friend said that because it might have seemed like I hated him, or maybe I just didn't flirt with him like everyone else. I had a gym teacher that made me feel very unsure about myself and creeped out. I was in 7th grade and I had lost a lot of weight over the summer. I had spent 6 years with the same kids in my old school and wanted to start 7th grade with a new look so I was able to lose a lot of weight. This meant that I finally was able to move around and take part of gym class. Since I was now getting sweaty and in desperate need of a shower, I would take showers with the other girls in the locker room. Now, we girls used the same locker room all the time. There were about six different doors in and out of this building, including a private locker room for the gym teacher. But despite that, our male gym teacher would always walk through our locker room just as us girls had taken off our clothes and stood naked either in the shower or by our clothes. Remember, we were in 7th grade in Sweden. We are all about 13 years old. The gym teacher would always say, Oh, I'm so sorry, and would always walk through the room looking into the showers and quickly leave. This happened all the time. Eventually, us girls started to use the toilet where we could lock the door to simply use tissues to wipe our armpits and clean ourselves off without taking showers. And yes, we did tell the principal and some other adults. Nothing happened. Nobody cared. I just stopped taking part of gym class and quickly gained weight again. In 8th grade, I moved and got a new gym teacher, another male, but he never did something like that. To my knowledge, my creepy teacher situation never escalated, but here's mine. I grew up in Mexico, but I'm American. My first language is Spanish, but my English is as good as my Spanish. In the fifth grade, this made me my English teacher's teacher's pet, as I was called by my classmates. He would often ask me not to do classwork and just help him with the class, usually pairing me to whoever he felt needed it. He always gave me perfect grades, often without even looking over my work. He always looked for reasons to talk to me, and my whole class resented the favoritism. Multiple times I asked him to just let me do my own schoolwork, and he just put his arm around my shoulder, or a hand on my shoulder, and would say, not to worry about it. Here comes the weird and creepy stuff. School trips, sitting with him or near him, secret Santa, How convenient he got my name, and I got his. That year, he gave me a wallet. I don't remember what I got him, or more like what my parents got him, but I remember that blue wallet. I remember him taking me aside to give it to me, because I don't want other kids to make fun of you for getting a present from me. He was extremely interested if I liked it or not. He knew blue was my favorite color, and remembered I mentioned wanting a wallet. To my 5th grade brain, it weirded me out, but never really seemed like a dangerous situation. That was the first year for him working as a teacher at the school, and also his last. Don't know if he quit, or he got fired. I have no personal experiences, but these are a couple stories from my school. It's a pretty small school, but all three buildings are connected 
elementary, middle school, and high school. I had a fourth grade teacher who was kind of a jerk. Years later, he got into trouble for acting inappropriately with girls on his high school swim team. Apparently, he got drunk and assaulted one, or some, in a hotel room at an away meet. We also had a teacher I really liked. I'm not sure what he actually did for the school besides coaching little kids soccer. Kids young enough to have boys and girls all on the same team. I thought he was really fun and all the kids loved him. My dad was at my fourth grade graduation and he asked me about this guy. He told me to stay away from him. He didn't like him and he thought he was too handsy with the kids. Years later he got busted for a massive amount of child porn. Now, same school, but my 6th grade English teacher, he was fun, really great teacher, and rarely had to yell at us. He was also a soccer coach for the modified boys team. Years after I had him as a teacher, he got into trouble for lying to parents about taking young players to soccer camps for the weekends, when he was actually just keeping the kids at his house, only one kid at a time but I think it was just one boy in particular anyway. It was never disclosed what would happen at his house for the entire weekend, but that's obviously highly inappropriate, and he was fired. This happened when I was seven. I was living in upstate New York with my two slightly older brothers. We would often hang out down the street at our friend's house. Our friend was named Ben, and he was around our age. One late afternoon, my brothers and I went to Ben's for pizza and a movie. We spent most of the day there, so by the time we were done, it was pretty late, so it was dark outside when we decided to head home. When we left, we saw a woman standing across the street from Ben's house. We were a little weirded out, but it seemed like she was minding our own business. At this point, we were still in the driveway, about to leave when this lady looks right at us and sprints in our direction. Ben's mom always had her car parked in the driveway, so we sort of book it back around the car to try to hide and get away. She continued to try to follow us around the vehicle, and she kept trying to switch which direction she was running around the car in an attempt to get us. The whole time, she was laughing manically like a witch, saying how she wanted to catch us we were freaked out, of course. She only stopped when Ben's mom came out of the house and asked what was going on after she heard the commotion of the cackling witch lady chasing after us. The laughing lady sprinted off and was never seen again. Ben's mom walked us home that night. This is a long story, so bear with me. It's all true, and I'm happy I'm still alive. It was in the summer of 1997. I was a grad student in Northern California from abroad. Not an immigrant then, just a foreigner getting a degree and planning to go back to my old country afterwards. At the time, my girlfriend was still back home abroad since we both expected me to return to Europe after graduation and maybe, though unspoken at the time, possibly get married after. So she visited for a summer vacation Let's do a car trip down to Southern California. Let's take the coastal highway down to South Cali, see Santa Barbara, Monterey, LA, Venice Beach, San Diego, and even drive down to Baja. The whole tourist enchilada for two 20-somethings visiting oh-so-cool California. My then-girlfriend, and this description of her physical features is entirely serving as preparation for what's to come that day. So F off, perverts. She had perfectly shaped thin legs, curved body, long hair, and was generally speaking quite attractive. She was also borderline paranoid, which I knew already, and she had already given me plenty of headaches when she had dragged me into conflict situations where she demanded I defend her like a man when the situations had been actually completely provoked by her. Hence my tendencies not to immediately jump on the thought of getting married Frankly, I wasn't sure about the marriage part, but I knew that then, and went along with her demands and plans as usual that day. We were nonetheless in love and all that, but me perhaps a little less than her. So we drive down to South Cali from the Bay Area, 
and eventually my old rusty but beloved clunky 80s convertible I had cheaply acquired took us along the beach road to a motel in San Diego. Let's pick a motel near the beach, she said, so we can just jump out and swim in the morning. Let's check in, get dinner somewhere, and drive around town to get a feel. Okay, what she wants goes. She pointed to a motel along the coastal road. There was one after another, but she knew what she wanted, so she chose. This is the one, she said. Let's park and see. The vacancy sign was lit. The parking spots in the motel courtyard were all but empty. I drove in and parked. I had driven the whole day and she could see that I was tired. I'll drive later, she said sweetly. I was grateful. She goes into the motel counter while I unload our suitcases. As I'm coming in with the suitcases to the reception, she is talking to a youngish, tall, dark, blonde guy behind the counter. Not bad looking. He is looking her up and down with small eyes, clearly checking her out. Looks at me, then turns around, grabs a key from the board and says, I got the perfect room for you. He leads us up the stairs. The motel built like a chain of rooms lined up, front all looking towards the ocean, doors towards the motel parking lot courtyard. He takes us up to the room, smack in the middle of the long building, second floor. The entire motel seems empty. I'm tired, but why this room, I'm wondering. Schlepping the luggage, why not downstairs, or at least on one of the ends? The view is the same everywhere. As we enter, I notice a smaller door next to our motel room door, which says, service personnel only. Our room is right next to it, built narrow, but big beds and a bathroom. And on the left wall, just across from the beds, a giant mirror which was on the wall that connected to the service room. The guy nods and leaves us to it. As soon as we're alone in the room and he has left, I turn to my girlfriend and say, Don't you think this is weird? She says, What? I point to the mirror and then take a closer look. Yep, it is built fixed into the wall, not hanging on the wall. I find this extra creepy. She says, Don't be paranoid. Okay, maybe. I gotta get something out of the car anyway. So I step outside, only to see Mr. Motel Room just stepping out of the service room, locking it behind himself, and heading downstairs. Once I was back up, I took a big textile blanket and hung it over the mirror. Maybe I'm paranoid now too, or maybe not. If he was a peeping Tom, he didn't get anything. We take a nap, and later, as we head out for some food and check out the town, night is drawing near. The motel parking lot is now two-thirds full. We were early. Good. Girlfriend says. I feel foolish and swear to myself to be less paranoid. She usually is paranoid enough for the both of us. That mirror though. Never mind. So we spend the evening having dinner, driving around, until finally we decide it's time to go back to the motel. It is dark and it's way before GPS so I consult the map we have. I sit in the passenger seat, glad that she's driving, while I try to read the map of San Diego in the light of a feeble, teeny keychain light. We are driving roughly back in the right direction to the motel, somewhat parallel to the beach boulevard we need to be on, but I realize we might have gone too far. As I stare at the map in the dim light, she looks in the rearview mirror and suddenly says, that fan is following us. I look up, surely now that she's the one being paranoid. Behind us, one lane to the right, is an old, silvery, blue van. A bit run down, with darkened windows. I swear, she says, he's been behind us for three blocks at least, and took the same turns, and is not passing us even when I'm driving slowly. I look around, there is hardly any traffic in this direction. As we roll on, I seriously doubt her. My rational mind telling me that victims rarely even get picked randomly. I try to calm her down, look at the map again, and get an idea. Look, I said, we actually have to take a U-turn to get down into the lane that takes us back towards the beach boulevard with the motel. Looking down the road to the next traffic light a block away, there's no cop here, taking a legal U-turn at the next light. 
Then we'll see. She nods. I know, she's a way better driver than me. She has at least three more years of driving experience with stick shift in narrow European streets while I was just learning to drive in California. We approach the next traffic light, a clear, no U-turn hanging from the next light, that eerie silver blue van behind us to the right, and the light turns red. And girlfriend, gone race car driver, puts the pedal way down, motor howling, and shoots over the red light in an illegal U-turn to go in the opposite direction. And the van? I kid you not, it sped up, shot into the lane behind us, and did the same thing, wheel screeching on the pavement. Then they accelerated full throttle to catch up, its lights glaring into our rearview mirror, blinding like hell. Hit it, hit it, hit it, I mumbled, now panicking myself, and my girlfriend accelerates, the van behind us staying on our tail. We shoot down two, three blocks, the van right up on us. More cars join in our direction though. Behind us, the traffic gets denser and the lanes merge into one. Now the van is still behind us, but close behind the very creepy van are three or four more cars, all speeding, all pretty close to each other. We can see their lights. We are back on the boulevard where our motel is, one lane road, many fairly closely parked cars on our right with just the occasional gap or entries to the parking lots and a concrete barrier to our left. No room to go but forward. We were moving really fast, easily 60 miles per hour. For sure, way past the speed limit here, but so was everyone else. How did we shake this van? Surely we shouldn't lead them straight to our motel. My super driver girlfriend suddenly hits the brakes and veers to the right. The van had no choice. It cannot break or it will get hit by the cars behind it. And it passes by on the left, immediately followed by five speeding cars tailing it, all in one fast line. While my girlfriend swoops the car perfectly in what feels like a tiny pigeonhole of a parking spot. We can't stay here, I muttered, after we came to a stop and catching my breath, totally stunned by her skills. I know, she says, and she hits the pedal again, shooting out into traffic. But now we are behind the van, safely at least, eight or nine cars behind it. They can't possibly know. Just 200 yards further down came our motel. She took a swing into the parking lot. We parked and rushed up to our motel room, the one with a creepy mirror. I looked back the whole time, whether anyone had seen us. Nothing, just a pleasant summer evening wind, the sound of traffic going by. I didn't sleep much that night and neither did she. Just another tourist summer night in San Diego. Today, I think the thing that triggered the creeps in the van was, I had a rundown car with Northern California license plate and they must have seen my girlfriend driving. They might not have even seen me, or if they did, just a silhouette. So they might have assumed that there was one or two women, lost, far from home, driving around at night. I hear San Diego is wonderful, I'm sure it is, but that entire day felt like an intro to a slasher movie. I'm an 18 year old female. I was young when this happened, probably 9 or 10. Some of the details are a bit fuzzy. At the time, I definitely didn't find it to be a big deal. Only recently I've been thinking about it and realizing how creepy the whole thing was. My mom believes it's one of the scariest things to ever happen to her and that she generally feared for our safety at the time. We were driving late one night and it was just me, my mom, and my dad. Eventually, we had got a bit turned around. I think this was around the time iPhones were relatively newer to my family and not the best quality. So my dad pulled into a bar to ask for directions. It's completely dark out and he gets out of the car with it still running and goes inside. A couple guys are standing on the porch of the establishment and they are eyeing me and my mom alone in the car. After a couple minutes, one of them comes out and seems to be coming towards our car but goes into a truck next to us. He fiddles around with it for a few seconds. Then he gets out and makes it seem like he's going back on the porch with his buddies. Instead, he turns last second and sits in the driver's seat. He's clearly intoxicated. He's older, maybe 50s or 60s. 
The car is still running, mind you, and nothing is stopping him from doing something reckless, like changing gears. He starts talking to my mom, and it's clear that she's uncomfortable. He says something like, Ugh, I just want to go for a ride. And my mom is nervously playing along, probably in an attempt to placate him, enough so he doesn't try anything. My mom mentions a couple times that my dad is just getting directions inside and that he'll be back out any second. Eventually, the man gets out and my mom locks the doors. His buddies are all laughing and continue staring at us. When my dad comes back out, the drunk guy stops my dad and says that he's just joking around with us. I know when my dad got back in the car, my mom was furious because she hadn't wanted to stop at the bar in the first place. He definitely didn't see it in the way she did. He took it as a harmless drunk guy and that it was fine because nothing happened. Looking back, the situation had so much more potential to go wrong. Me and my mom didn't have anything to defend ourselves and there was nothing from stopping him from driving off of the car with us. It's amazing the things we brush off at a young age and only later realize how dangerous it could have been. After listening to a podcast that talked about this forum, I decided to share my story as well. Keep in mind that my friend and I that I'm mentioning in the story were only 12 when this occurred and this was our first time that something like this happened to us. We were terrified. So this whole story begins when I was around 12 years old and takes place at a two-story shopping center that is wall-to-wall with our local IKEA. My friend and I had been walking around for a couple hours buying a few things and looking around in stores. We were tired and decided to take a break and sit down for a bit. We sat down by the entrance on these two soft chairs with my friend sitting on the right. Behind me to my left was a bench. On this bench there was an old man just sitting there. He looked to be in his later 50s, early 60s and at first I didn't think much of it. I was just thinking he had to rest his legs just like us. So I gave him a smile to be polite and didn't think much of it. I continued talking to my friend who, like I mentioned before, sat to my right. Suddenly, I get this feeling like someone's watching me. I then turned around to see that the man was staring at me with a large smile on his face. I get uncomfortable and just as I'm about to turn to my friend and tell him that I want to leave, my stomach drops as the older man pointed at me. Then he slaps his lap, trying to symbolize like he wanted me to sit on his lap. I observed his movements and looked up to meet his face. He was now doing this certain movement with his tongue. I froze and my survival instincts kicked in and told me to run to find a security guard. I turned to my friend and said that there was a pedophile and that we needed to run. My friend turned to the old man and saw him doing the movement with his tongue towards me again. I saw how panic struck my friend's face and we stood up and started to run through the crowd of the other shoppers deeper into the shopping center. I turned my head back to see that the man was still observing us and was still doing the movement with his tongue. I shouted at my friend to run into the jewelry store in front of us. We tried to calm ourselves down and by doing this I told the female cashier that her hair was really pretty. We continued to run up to the upper floor to look for a security guard that could help us, but we couldn't find anyone. So we decided to walk over to the entrance. We were still on the upper floor, so we could have the high ground on the old man if he was still sitting on the bench. We looked over the railing to see if the man was still sitting on the bench, but he was gone. We had lost him. I was still standing in fear that we no longer knew where he was. My friend had then turned around and had seen him walking towards us further upstairs. She told me we ran downstairs and out the entrance. We didn't stop until we arrived to my grandparents' place. We run to my grandparents' apartment that is relatively close to the shopping center. When inside, we told my grandparents what happened. And to this day, I still fear what could have happened if the older man had caught up to us. Just a quick backstory. I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island, and everyone who's lived there knows that it's very busy and noisy all day. The buses, traffic, and businesses everywhere, but at night it gets very quiet and very eerie at times. 
This story is about an incident that happened to me when I was 15 and I got my first job at McDonald's. This gives me chills every time I think about it. So anyway, I was 15 and just got hired at McDonald's down the street from where I lived. It was perfect because I could get to and from work without worrying about getting a ride from my parents. While working there, I met some kids my age that I became close with. Unfortunately, they weren't the greatest of kids. They were very rebellious. They would clown around at work, act disrespectful to customers, typical 90s punks. I slowly started to become like them. I began disrespecting my parents, which was totally not like me. But I was always in there that didn't have many friends, so I wanted to fit in. Side note, I was very sheltered growing up and didn't really get around much because my parents were very overprotective. One night around 10 p.m., I finished watching Monday Night Raw and went downstairs to grab something to eat. I opened the fridge and heard my dad's footsteps. He wore those slippers that tapped loudly on the tile floor. Chris, I've asked you all day to take out the trash. They come tomorrow, so do it now. Now normally, I would have taken it out the first time he asked me, but now I was getting a little older and became a smartass and didn't think it should be my responsibility anymore. I work now and go to school. You take it out. I replied. My dad's eyes got wide as I've never spoken to him like that before. He leaned in and said softly, As long as you live here, you will help out. Now take out the trash or leave. I called his bluff and rather than just simply taking out the trash, I rebelled like the dumbass teen I was. Fine, I'll leave. If you're going to kick me out for that, don't bother looking for me. I'm done living in the stupid house. I said as I opened the door and slammed it. I walked towards the McDonald's to see if any of my friends were there, and they weren't, just the maintenance guy finishing up cleaning. Of course, of all nights, it was raining, so I had to find somewhere to stay dry. There was this bridge with the overpass a little ways down the street, so I started walking towards it. The whole time, I was regretting what I did and wished I just took out the damn trash. I was finally getting to the bridge and I climbed the hill to a little section in the corner to stay out of view. I remember in school learning to go here in case of a tornado, so I knew it was safe. I patiently and stubbornly waited, assuming my parents would call the cops, which in my mind would show me that they cared. An hour goes by, nothing, no sirens, no cars were even on the road. It was getting pretty cold out, but I promised myself I wouldn't give in. I crossed my arms over my legs and fell asleep. I woke up violently from a semi wailing on its horn over the overpass. I looked all around and was confused. How long was I out here for? I looked towards the McDonald's and saw an old man in a gray suit sitting at the bus stop. It was weird. He was sitting still, facing forward. I assumed it must be like 5 a.m. since he was waiting for the bus. I stood up very upset that my parents never tried to find me and began to walk to the bus stop. Now I'm a very outgoing person and I trust my gut. As I walked closer to the old guy, I didn't get any negative vibes. He slowly turned his head as I approached and looked at me and smiled. Not a creepy or uncomfortable smile, a genuine peaceful smile. I smiled back and decided instead of going home, maybe I can vent to this guy and get some advice. I asked if he minded if I sat down. He smiled again and gestured towards the seat. Is everything okay? He said with concern. Yeah, I just ran away from home. My parents don't respect me anymore and how much I do all day. I began telling him the story and I noticed as time went by, he was becoming more and more anxious and his smile began turning into a frown. He began to start breathing loud and cut me off dead sentence and said, You need to go home now, with a stern voice. I was confused. I figured maybe his bus was coming soon and he wanted to say that before he left. I looked down in frustration because that's not what I wanted to hear. I suddenly felt a strong grasp on my arm. He grabbed me and looked at me dead in the eyes. His eyes were terrifying at this point, bloodshot and wide, and I was shaking in fear, totally thrown off guard by his complete switch in persona. He was literally shaking like he was afraid of something. He kept looking down the street and then back into my eyes. You need to go home now, he screamed at me. 
At this point, the guy started to scare me, and I stood up and nodded, and he let go of my arm. Nervously, I started walking back to my house. I figured my mom was already up making coffee, so my plan of sneaking back into the house and hiding in the basement was not going to happen. Just to see if she would be up, I looked at my watch. It was 1.30 a.m. My heart stopped and my throat became dry. Why was this man at the bus stop at 1.30 a.m. when the buses aren't running? I turned back towards him to look at him. He was gone. Now I was scared, confused. I needed to get home. I used my spare key to get into the house, opened the door quietly, and everyone was asleep. I slowly opened the basement door and made my way downstairs to the storage area in the back. I buried myself under bags of clothes so they wouldn't find me. Figured I could get some sleep. The image of the guy kept popping up in my head and I was so freaked out, it just made no sense. Just then I heard loud sirens passing by. Not just one, multiple bursts of sirens coming every 10 seconds or so. I smiled thinking I won. My parents had called the police to look for me. My plan worked and now I would make them worry until the morning and regret kicking me out. I made myself a little bed and covered myself up to stay hidden and fell asleep. I woke up to hear my mother sobbing upstairs. I looked outside the little basement window and saw daylight so I figured I'd go upstairs to get my apology. I opened the basement door and walked into the kitchen. My mother was sitting at the dining room table with her head in her arms. She immediately looked up at me and gasped. She stood up and ran over to me and hugged me so tight. I thought you were dead. She muffled into my jacket. I slowly pulled away and looked at her, confused. Why would you think that? I asked. What she said next sent chills throughout my entire body. She said last night around 1.40 a.m., a drunk driver crashed into the bus stop in front of the McDonald's. It was completely destroyed. I started breathing heavily and realized that the man saved my life. If he didn't tell me to leave when he did, I'd be sitting there and would have been killed. So many emotions were running through me and I didn't know how to handle it. So I just hugged my mother and immediately began to cry. I apologized and realized I missed the old me. I almost got myself killed for my own stubborn stupidity. I dropped those friends and got a new crowd at school. And from that point on, anytime the trash was full, I just took it out. I don't know who or what was at the bus stop, but I thank you for saving my life. Whether it was just a lucky coincidence or right place right time kind of thing. But no matter what, all I know is, if it wasn't for him telling me to go home, I would have been sitting at that bench for the rest of that night. When two of my friends were juniors at college back in 2018, we decided to sneak into Playland Park in Rye, New York. One of the friends of mine grew up in Rye and had done it many times before. So while I was nervous about getting arrested for trespassing, I felt a bit reassured that the park wasn't really monitored at night. At 1am we drove and parked our car next to the large fence in an attempt to scale it. It was rather difficult and required us to step on each other's hands to get over, which gave me intense anxiety about how we were planning to get all three of us back over the fence on our way out. After both of my friends got over the fence, I attempted to chicken out and wait in the car, but finally decided to join. After several minutes of struggling, I made it over the fence on my own and we began walking up while lighting up a joint. It was pitch black at this point. Almost all the lights in the park were off. We approached the water flume ride, which went up about 150 feet and then dropped into a steep slope. Alongside the ride, there was a staircase for technicians and employees, which my friend decided to climb for a better view. At this point, I chickened out and decided to stay at the bottom out of fear of heights. As they ascended the stairs, I looked across the park and noticed something very strange. We weren't alone in the park. Several hundred feet from us was a pond with what appeared to be a small boat or raft and four people riding inside with flashlights attached to their head. What was even stranger was the fact that there were two dark figures swimming in the pond looking for something underneath the water. I could barely make out the silhouettes of these figures, but after a few minutes I noticed that they could see us and began mobilizing their boats in our direction. 
I frantically started whisper screaming to my friends who were all the way at the top of the water ride and could barely hear me. At this point, the boat had reached the land and the little lights on their helmets were heading in our direction fast. My friends finally raced down the stairs and we began sprinting as fast as we could down the boardwalk that was dimly lit and back towards the way we came from. As we sprinted down the long, straight boardwalk, I realized that we were completely visible and started to accept the reality of being caught and arrested. We somehow rounded the corner, got back to the fence, and climbed over it safely. We hopped into our cars and dipped out immediately. I couldn't believe we didn't get caught, as the figures chasing us were no more than a few hundred feet away from us when they spotted us. Still to this day, I wonder what the hell those people were doing swimming in a pond in an amusement park at 1.30 in the morning. My friend had told me that kids had drowned in that pond before, making me wonder if they were searching for a body. I googled any article I could find to no avail. My friends and I are still totally puzzled about this experience and can't think of a very logical explanation. Just thinking about it now gives me the chills. My girlfriend told me that two weeks ago she was waiting in line at a convenience store with her friend in Chinatown, New York City, and this large, dapper-looking man came over to them. He complimented her coat and commented on how expensive it must be. She said, thank you, and they chatted for a little longer. The man explained how his suit was just a shitty Brooks Brothers suit, but she noticed he had all sorts of expensive jewelry on. When my girlfriend and her friend explained that they were students, he kept making assumptions about how they must be rich and their parents are paying for everything. My girlfriend was starting to feel uncomfortable and began trying to distance herself from him. He asked them if they had jobs and they told him no, as they were students. After this, he went on to tell them what he does for a living without being asked. He said, I do all sorts of odd jobs, this and that. I mainly have these guys that work for me though. I find them off the streets and feed them and give them a place to stay. I'm waiting to meet up with them now. He referred to them as his minions, which made something at first seeming wholesome, very unsettling all of a sudden. He then told them that he had just had his wallet stolen and needed $400 for something. I don't remember the reason. He told them that he could pay them back in a week, but he needed the money that night. My girlfriend politely declined and at this point was very uncomfortable. She started walking towards the door to leave and said, Nice to meet you and good luck. They both walked outside and sat on the bench just outside the convenience store. As they were sitting and discussing this strange interaction, they saw the man exit and stand outside about 10 feet away, waiting for a few minutes, looking at his phone. He then met up with the other two men and they chatted for a few minutes, then walked in the other direction, and the other two men walked into the store and started holding it up with knives. Absolutely shocked and frozen, they both watched as the cashier put her hands up, then emptied out the cash register. The two men ran out of the store in the same direction as the man in the suit walked. They were both about to call the police, but saw the cashier already was. They waited at the bench until two police cars showed up and they walked in to tell the officers what they had just witnessed and tried to help identify the robbers and the men they had just met. I wonder if this is a common thing in terms of organized crime to pay homeless people to rob or commit crimes. So this happened around March 2021 I was 15 and my sister was 17. My sister wanted to take some shrooms because it was nice and sunny out. I decided to tag along and just hang out with her. My sister and I went across the street because it was a big grass trail that leads to another yard plus our family members can see us from the windows. We live in a two story. The left side of our house, there was actually an alleyway that's made of gravel. We were just having a regular conversation, talking about random shit. My sister is sitting in front of me, which means my back is facing the house. All of a sudden, I see a man who is just standing there, staring at me. 
Mind you, he's like 30 to 45 feet away from me, so the chance of him seeing us from there is low because the grass is pretty overgrown. You really have to look and walk back and forth. I'm watching him and he starts walking towards us. It freaked me out the way he noticed me. I had seen him walking and looking forward like any other person on a walk. But he randomly stopped and he looked right at me. Like, bro, how the fuck? I look at my sister and I'm like, hey, we have to go like right now. She was so confused because she was obviously tripping. I said, there's a man coming over here. We have to go. He starts hiding behind a car that belongs to my neighbor. It's right in front of the tall grass trail. I could see his dirty ass dusty boots. So I knew for sure that he was waiting to do something. So now at this point, he is on the grass and we are already in our gate. I ran upstairs to my aunt's room because there's a window on the left side of our house. We watched him walk down the alleyway and I noticed he had something in his hand. It was a knife. He turned around and walked towards the direction he came from. I have never seen him since. I always wonder what could have happened. Scary world. I was 19 at the time and I was waiting on the docks for a friend. I was alone and smoking quietly. A man approached me asking me for a cigarette. I gave it to him. When we finished smoking, he approached me. He started hugging me and I pushed him away. I said to him, I gave you a cigarette. I didn't ask you to touch me. Leave me alone. You make me feel uncomfortable. He kept getting closer as I pushed him away. He stuck to my ear and started whispering sexually, directly into my ear. It paralyzed me mentally. I pushed him away, but he wouldn't let go. I told him to leave, but he didn't listen to me. He was saying sexual things about me. I ended up freaking out and telling him I was going to kill him or kick him if he came near me again. He kept going. Those 30 minutes were really long and he was really chasing me around the docks. There were two or three people nearby, but no one intervened to stop him. This all stopped when my friend got to the train. Sometimes I hear his whispers in my ear, and I don't like it. It's a traumatic experience. This happened about five years ago when I was attending college in a small, rural town. I'm a female. I was 21 at the time, and I lived in a duplex with two roommates in a neighborhood. We had a house on both sides of us. We never really saw our neighbors much or talked to them until it was maybe 3 or 4 a.m. I was just getting home from my boyfriend's house. I pull to the driveway and start walking up to the door when I hear, Help me. Please help me. At first, I was startled and bolted towards the door, but then I realized that someone might actually need help. So I slowly walked back out front and noticed an older woman laying in my neighbor's yard. She calls out to me again. Please help me. I think I broke my hip. I fall off the porch. I walk over to her and ask if I can call an ambulance. She says, no, can you please just go inside and get me Dr. Jones? I'm just going to preface this by saying I know my next actions are not smart, but I wasn't thinking clearly at the time. So, I walk inside the house and start calling out for Dr. Jones. While inside, I notice the open bedroom door with a light on and a mattress on the floor, which I assumed was the woman's room. I walk farther back into the house calling out for Dr. Jones and eventually he comes out of the back bedroom. He looks just as startled as I was. I tell him the situation and he follows me outside and helps her. They thank me and I go into my house. The rest of the time I lived there, I never saw either of them again. Still one of the weirdest things that's happened to me. When I was 19, I was hanging out with my then best friend at her and her boyfriend's apartment. Things were getting super weird there after we smoked some weed and we were just sitting on the couch. I don't remember my interactions. I was totally zoned out but I remember ending up in their bedroom where my best friend and her boyfriend were trying to talk me into a threesome. 
Me being in a long term and serious relationship with my now husband at the time, I was not okay with the idea and I was really uncomfortable. I left and was crying while driving. I was literally sobbing so I pulled into a gas station to calm down because I wasn't in the best condition to drive. I had an old Santa Fe so my doors didn't all lock. As I was crying, someone hopped into my car with a bag of things and just stared at me for what felt like five minutes. Then was like, oh, sorry, and jumped out of the car and then went into another car. I was left confused and now crying for a totally different reason because this stranger who I'm thinking is about to rob me or worse is staring at me while I'm slightly staring at them wondering what the fuck I'm supposed to do in this situation and also really uncomfortable for a whole number of reasons. Probably more funny than creepy, but creepy and uncomfortable for me in the moment. When I was around seven years old, my parents rented out our basement to a young couple. Things went smoothly for the first couple of months for the most part, save for the occasional loud party here or there. They were nice enough and would even leave their door open for my siblings and I to wander in and out of and use their basketballs, badminton rackets, and that kind of thing whenever they were home. They would let us come and go as we pleased, although we didn't do it so very often because my parents weren't comfortable with the idea, of course. As time went on, they started getting a bit out of hand, throwing loud parties until all hours of the night and disturbing the neighbors, sketchy people coming in and out. My parents suspected they were growing marijuana in the basement, as the house constantly smelled like weed all throughout. My parents did end up finding a plant being grown in the closet under a lamp, and they evicted them immediately. This was when weed wasn't legal at the time. A few years went by until a family member, who works in corrections, came over one day. They began talking to my mom about our former tenants. They asked us if we ever knew where they ended up, and she said she didn't. The family member then told us that a man was brought into the facility that they worked at, who looked and sounded familiar because they weren't able to place him. They suspected that the man may be our ex-tenant, who was actually being held on charges of sexual assault and murder, but they aren't sure if it was him or not. Eventually, my mom was able to confirm the identity of the man as being our ex-tenant. He was arrested for assaulting and murdering his ex-girlfriend with his father. My parents didn't tell us this until years later but it was pretty wild news considering how many times he had invited my siblings and I, without hesitation, into the basement whenever we were out playing in the yard. I was about 13 years old. I lived in a quiet, rural lake community. My parents, aunt and uncle, were going away for the weekend, so my cousin, who was 15, stayed over at my house for the weekend. He brought over his Xbox and a bunch of games and we stayed up all night playing and chilling in my room. My room was small with a single twin bed, so we ended up sleeping downstairs on the set of couches in the finished basement. I get woken up by my husky at around 8am. She was acting like she needed to go out, but this was strange for her to do. I rubbed my eyes, still half asleep, and started up the stairs to let her out. When I grabbed the doorknob, to my surprise, the door pulled right open. As groggy and dumb as I was, I think to myself, weird, the knob must be broken. I open the door, clip my dog onto her lead, but she won't go out. I coax her out, annoyed because I only got a couple of hours sleep, and when I turn to go back inside, I notice the jam is completely destroyed. That's when everything hit me. I have no idea what to do. My cousin is still asleep in the basement. I don't have a cell phone. Are they still in my house? I quietly listen for any kind of movement. Then I go back down to the basement and wake my cousin up. We stupidly decide to go up and look through the house. Thank God it was empty. It was also empty of all of our video games, movies, and valuables, and that kind of thing. I call 911, then my parents. Police arrive, but they don't do much of anything except say, tough luck. It took me a few hours to settle down, when I finally realized that the fact that this person or people watched me while I slept, had we stayed in a small room with a creaky door, I almost certainly would have woken up and faced the intruders. 
my life could be very different. It still gives me the chills 16 years later. This encounter happened to a friend and a co-worker of mine about 15 years ago in a suburb of Los Angeles, California. My friend, who we'll call Jody, lived with her parents and older brother in a house in a pretty nice neighborhood. They didn't really worry about crime or break-ins and that kind of thing. One night, though, at about 2 a.m., Jody was woken up by a loud knocking at the front door. She jumped out of bed and ran into the hallway where her parents and brother were coming out of their own rooms. The knocking, now a pounding, continued. Stay here, her father said, and he made his way toward the door. All of a sudden, there came a muffled male voice shouting, Help me. Help me. Jody and her mom grabbed each other in fear, and her dad looked out the peephole. There's nobody there, he said. He looked out the front window, where he could see part of the front door and porch. He still didn't see anyone. He walked back towards his family when the loud knocking began again, this time even more frantic. Again, a voice shouted, Help! Help me! Jody's dad went to the phone and called 911, and while he was talking to the operator, her brother had walked up to the front of the house. The pounding was still going on, getting faster and faster until it was a constant banging. Help me! Help me! Oh God, help me. Jody, in tears of fright by now, looked over at her brother, who was standing in the family room, which was located to the left of the front door. His face was white. He made an arm gesture for them to join him. Jody, her mom and dad, hurried into the family room, where they immediately realized why her brother's face had gone pale. The pounding and shouting was coming from underneath the family room floor. The police arrived minutes later, and it turned out that some guy in his 20s had gotten all out of his mind on crack that night. He had somehow made his way into the opening of the crawl space under the house, located underneath the family room window. They never found out exactly what his intentions were, but they assume he was trying to find a way into the house to rob it. He then got disoriented because he was so high, and then he freaked out, hence the pounding and shouting. The story gave me goosebumps the first time she told it to me. So two summers ago, I was hanging out with my boyfriend Adam and our friend Luke. We were planning on going to another friend's house but had some time to kill before they were off of work. Luke mentions kind of suddenly that he forgot that his co-worker Tim gave him money earlier to pick up weed for him and that he was supposed to go drop it off at Tim's house. First of all, thanks for mentioning that before you got in my car, but I didn't bitch too much and just asked for the address. The GPS directed me to a higher-end gated community on the other side of town. From working at a place that dispatches delivery drivers to this community all the time, I know that you usually need some kind of code or something to get in, but the guard at the front just bust us through with nothing more than a puzzled look when we said we were heading to the Smith house. Weird, but okay, whatever. Then we get to the house. All the lights are off. There are no cars in the driveway. We triple check the address and go to ring the doorbell. No answer. We ring again and still no answer. Luke is trying to call Tim. Adam is trying to call one of the guys Tim said he was hanging out with. I'm peering into the windows starting to get a bit weirded out. That's when I notice. There's no furniture with inside of the front window. The entryway has no coat rack or table. The kitchen at the end of the hall has no table. The sitting room off to the side didn't have any couches or anything. There were pictures hanging on the walls, but they appear to be mostly landscapes or paintings. No family pictures or anything personal. By this time, both the boys announced that no one had answered their calls or messages. I say I think we should leave, and that Luke can give Tim his shit at work the next day. Before I can even start my car, though, Tim messages Adam, not the person he sent on this errand, by the way, and he says, Hey, just go around the back and come in through the basement window when you get here. What? I tell them that's the sketchiest thing I've ever heard, that we should leave. 
But they insist it's fine, and that's just how Tim sneaks his friends in and out of the house if he doesn't want to wake his dad up. This still makes no sense to me, considering it's like 8pm. Neither of them actually hang out with Tim outside of work, but off we go around the house. At the back of the house, we reach one of those light shafts that are common in lots of houses with basements, the ones that let light down to the underground windows and look kind of like a drainage pipe. Basically, my boyfriend drops down this hole and knocks on the window. Tim answers it and says he'll be out in a minute. He then promptly closes the window. Adam climbs back out of the hole and the three of us are standing there waiting. So now, we have three adults standing in the dark backyard of an empty house in a gated community, trying to drop off weed to my friend's co-worker. I don't like this at all, but after a minute, Tim and another boy I don't know emerge from the hole. They make the swap and then Tim reaches out to shake my hand and says, Hey. Billy needs a ride home. You got him, right? Again? What? Before I can argue, Adam and Luke say it won't be a problem and offer to give me gas money if I need it. So the four of us pile back into my car. I got a second out of earshot to ask Adam who the hell this kid was. He informs me that Billy's older brothers were two friends of mine at the time. That did ease my mind a bit. Trying to avoid awkward silence. I ask him in the car how his brothers are doing. He simply said, What? I tried to clarify. You know, Ken and Ben. I knew them in high school. Isn't Ken in England or somewhere? And again he responded shortly. Oh, yeah, okay. So much for that. But he did direct me back out of the gated community and through the regular neighborhoods, asking to be dropped off at a house a few miles away. While I was never close enough with his brothers to go to their house, I'm relatively positive that they lived in an entirely different neighborhood. And to add to the creep factor, in the two years since, I've gone to Tim's house several times, in an entirely different town. I asked Adam about it one day, and the only explanation I got was that Tim's dad lived in the gated community, but Tim lives with his mother most of the time. I have no idea what was really going on in that house, but I don't think I want to know. So a couple of days ago, I woke up around 4.20 to our fire alarm going off in our house. This is not a normal fire alarm either. It's a piercing, extremely loud one that even our neighbors can hear in their house four houses down. So I bolted awake and woke up my boyfriend to let him know as well. I went to the panel downstairs to turn it off, and I saw that it said there was smoke in the basement. Okay, no big deal. It's happened once before, and it was mostly just a false alarm that time. So I put in the coat to turn it off. This all took about five minutes, because my sleep-deprived brain couldn't remember it. So I had to look it up on my phone. I know I need to check the basement to make sure everything was okay. I grabbed a kitchen knife just in case, and because I'm a slightly paranoid person, plus being startled awake already had me on edge. So there are two ways to get to the basement. You can go outside and go through the cellar doors, and an additional locked door to get in, or take the elevator down in the house. Our landlord, whom we live with, put in the elevator when he bought it for his family that were in wheelchairs. It's basically the size of a closet and has a small gate that you slide close for a door. So I took the elevator to the basement, opened the gate, and when I went to open the door to the basement, I turned the knob, but it felt like someone was holding onto it on the other side so it wouldn't turn. I immediately let go, slammed the gate to the elevator shut, and pressed to go to the second floor where our bedroom is. When I get up there, my boyfriend sees me and asks me what's wrong. I'm literally standing there with wide eyes in my bathroom, clutching a huge knife to my chest. I told him what happened. He immediately gets up and says to stay there. Thankfully, the fire department arrived a minute later, so he and our landlord went to go talk to them. They went down to the basement, both through the elevator and through the cellar, but there was no one down there. However, our back gate was open, and we know it was closed before we had taken the trash out earlier. They didn't find anything, and the next day we went through together, 
and made sure everything was locked. But now I'm just dealing with the fact of what could have happened if I had tried to force the door open, or if the person down there hadn't thought to grab it. I've never been great at being concise, but sharing this is helping me feel a little less anxious. A few years ago, my mother asked if I would go to her house and let the exterminator in. She told me not to leave him alone and to follow him around the house and ask questions. I wasn't sure what kind of questions she meant, but sure, I can open a door and follow someone around the house and annoy them. So the exterminator arrives and I follow him from room to room, asking whatever questions came to mind. Stuff like, have you been getting a lot of calls for stink bugs? Did you ever need to get a rabies shot? What's the largest thing you ever had to exterminate? For an hour, I followed this man around while he patiently answered my ridiculous questions. He said he enjoyed our conversation. Two days later, I'm watching the news, and I see that the body of a local doctor was found bound in her basement. Her corpse was lit on fire. The very next day, the news flashes a photo of the man arrested for the murder. He looks very familiar to me. And then I get a full body chill. It turns out the doctor was having an issue with mice and called an exterminator. The same one my mother called. The day after I asked this man, what's the largest thing you ever had to exterminate? He apparently snapped because the doctor was rude. She asked too many questions and talked down to him. Many years ago, I got my first bachelor apartment. It was a basement unit in a two-story walk-up on the edge of my town's campus. So naturally, it was an eclectic mix of wealth and poverty. I was somewhat closer to the latter. This place was tiny, with a mattress on the floor against one wall. I could lie on the floor, feet against the edge of my mattress, and touch the far wall with my fingertips. So there wasn't much space. The kitchenette was to the right of the apartment door, and there was a tiny bathroom in the back. One night, at around 4 a.m., I heard growling, and because my apartment was so small and I was so close to the apartment door, and because it was so dark, it sounded like the growling was inside of my apartment. It sounded like there was an angry, hurt animal growling on the other side of my living room, and in the pitch black, that was truly terrifying. I lay there under my blankets, terrified. The growling went on for almost 30 minutes and would get louder and more angry, then taper off a bit, then get louder, angrier, and higher pitched, like a wail or a shriek, and then stop. Finally, I heard the scratching on my door and the growling stopped. There was nobody in my apartment. Never was. It was my next door neighbor, and apparently she believed she was possessed. She did this a few more times. She would lie on the floor outside my apartment door in the hallway, out of sight from my people so I couldn't see her. I could only hear her growling and speaking something that wasn't English. It was always well into the night. I had no phone and ours were the only apartments in the basement, as the rest of it was for the furnace and water heaters and storage. So when I wanted to go out, I had to pass her apartment, which started becoming a bad time. Every time I needed to leave home, it got to the point where I had to tiptoe past her door, because if she heard me, she would rush to her front door and start banging on it, shrieking and cursing until I was far enough away that I could not hear her. I spoke with the landlord about it, and he said she was. Fine. She was a lovely, quiet woman who mostly kept to herself. Of course, because we were the only tenants on that floor, nobody else heard what was going on, so it was her word against mine. About a month after speaking with a landlord about her, she set fire to her apartment cooking toast. She just put bread on the burner and forgot about it and set a small fire. Nobody was badly hurt. The building was evacuated and she went to the hospital with smoke inhalation, but she was released the next day. When they went in to assess the damage, they discovered that she'd written on every square inch of her apartment walls in small, neatly written cursive handwriting. Vaguely religious, scripture-style verses, apparently in an attempt to keep the demons contained. I moved out at the end of that month and never looked back. 
and I heard through a friend that she was diagnosed with a severe schizophrenic disorder. She was put on a heavy course of medication to deal with it. To this day, I wouldn't know her if I passed her in the street. I never once saw the woman who became feral and laying on the ground shrieking outside my apartment door. I only heard her, and she scared the living shit out of me. So this happened a few months ago. I'm a sophomore in college and was traveling down to my hometown over break. I was having some relationship issues with my stepmom, so I didn't want to stay at my dad's house the night I arrived at my hometown. So I phoned a friend of mine from high school and asked if I could stay at his place. I knew from social media that he was still in town, and I have stayed at his place before, so I knew there would be a place for me to stay if they would allow it. My friend, who we'll call Z, seemed like a pretty normal guy. We weren't best friends or anything, but we got pretty close by the time we graduated. We would occasionally text or hang out if I was in town and catch up, reminisce on the times we spent in orchestra or in English class. When I called, he seemed extremely enthusiastic. Z's a normally upbeat guy, but this time it seemed like he was getting a brand new car. I didn't think about it at the time. He said I could sleep in the guest room, so I headed over. When I got to his house, he was just as excited as he was on the phone. He was bringing up stuff to do, like getting high and watching weird movies or playing video games. Z's parents weren't home, so he really wanted the opportunity to smoke. I was pretty tired from the drive, but since we rarely see each other, I thought a bit of bonding couldn't hurt. We played Smash Bros, smoked some weed, and just chatted for hours. It was longer than I wanted, but I was having fun, so whatever, right? By the time it was getting late, at around 2am, he started asking some pretty weird questions, like if I ever wondered what it was like to kill someone, or if I thought anyone would miss me if I was gone. This, along with some pretty normal questions, like if I had a boyfriend or how my parents are doing, or if I'm making any friends at school, gave me such a weird feeling. I was confused in the moment, but it didn't hit me until after that Z could be assessing me for something bad. The weirdness of it all made me just want to go to bed. We stopped the game and both went into the basement where his room and the guest room were. We say goodnight. I go to my room and get ready for bed. I'm having trouble sleeping, just insomnia that I've had for a while, so I stay awake for around an hour until I hear some movement outside my room. The walls were pretty thin, so I could hear footsteps walking past my door and up the stairs to the main floor, and back down quickly after. What struck me as odd was that I didn't hear the basement door open. It creaks when it opens. The light didn't turn on, so I was confused what Z was doing. I heard him go back to his room, but I had this odd feeling just ever since I met him this night. He seemed a lot different than he's ever been. I decided to look him up on social media and Google to see anything out of the ordinary. Everything seemed normal, until I found his Tumblr. It was linked to his inactive Twitter account that I found on my Twitter contact list. His Tumblr was, well disturbing. There were graphic drawings of mutilated bodies of humans and animals, links to suspicious looking websites that I didn't dare click on, posts and stories about murdering, cannibalism, and torture. There were photos of guns, knives, and axes, which after looking closely were all taken in his bedroom. The last post, around a week prior, was a text post from the account saying he wished he could find someone easy to kill like a homeless person. I was immediately filled with dread. I knew he was going to do something. He must have gone up the stairs to lock the door. I packed all my things, and luckily I packed lightly. I then opened a small window at the top of the bedroom's wall. I started desperately climbing through, and as I was pulling my legs through, he opened the door. It was dark but the streetlight illuminated enough for me to see he was carrying something long and skinny, so it was probably a knife. He didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. I just turned around, hopped in my car, and drove as fast as I could to my dad's house. I immediately blocked him everywhere and reported his Tumblr account, but not before telling the police. 
They said they couldn't do anything as the guns were registered under his dad, and he hasn't actually done anything yet. Nevertheless, I told my other high school friends not to hang out with Z anymore. Ever since then, I've been creeped out whenever I meet new people. Just the realization that someone I knew so well could underneath be this person who could hurt me so bad. Who could kill me. I don't know what you're doing now, Z. I'm not sure I even want to know. But I hope you're getting help. In 2019, me... My boyfriend, my best friend and her partner, stayed at an Airbnb in Sandusky, Ohio for a convention. There were several red flags about the place, but it was much cheaper than a hotel near the convention hall, so we opted for there. The first red flag happened as soon as we arrived. The owner greeted us and made a point to tell us that his house was directly next door, as in, if there weren't any trees, he would have been able to see into the windows of where we were staying. Okay, so he had a few houses on his property. No big deal, right? Wrong. It only got worse from here. Per instruction, we were forbidden to go into the basement under any circumstances, unless there was a tornado. Being the curious young adults we are, we opened the door anyway and we were going to investigate. We stopped in our tracks as soon as we saw the direction the stairs were facing, directly towards the owner's home. In the darkness, it was a faint electronic glow. We quickly shut the door and barricaded it with luggage. Again, the owner's home was so close, there could have easily been something connecting his house to the basement. A little weirded out at this point, we went and looked at the rest of the house. It was a nice and spacious place with a narrow staircase to the second floor, where our bedrooms would be. We selected our rooms and began to unwind after the long drive. In my boyfriend and I's room, there was a single random sprinkler in the middle of the ceiling. It looked out of place. We were tired from the trip, so I didn't think much of it back then. But looking back now, there's a high chance it was a hidden camera. Things only got weirder from here. We were gone most of the day at the convention, and when we returned, one of the outside doors that was definitely locked was unlocked, and it was slightly ajar. My friends and I collectively shared a look of panic and closed and locked the door. My best friend's partner suggested that maybe the owner needed to get something out of there while we were gone, and it's possible he didn't close the door completely on the way out. We made sure all of our things were still there, and then we soon forgot about it because we discovered something more pressing. The locks on both bedroom doors were now ineffective. We told ourselves that they were already like that and we just didn't notice it, but I'm not sure if I believe that. On our second to last night, my boyfriend and I were both restless over what had been happening at the Airbnb in the day's activities, so we decided to try to find something to watch on TV to take our minds off of it. We were flipping through the channels of the TV, when suddenly we came across a Windows 10 lock screen, and no computer in sight. I opened the cabinets and looked around trying to find a computer. The dress of the TV was on was too heavy to move to look behind, but seeing where the wires were positioned, they could have very well gone through the wall and into the basement. We were too frightened to see the basement for ourselves to confirm or deny our suspicions of surveillance and the owner's interference and who knows what else. Needless to say, we left as quickly as possible the last day there and we did not look back. In 2007, when I was 12 years old, my family and I took a trip to Key Biscayne, Florida, with some of my cousins and family friends. Naturally, while at the resort, my cousins and I would all hang out at the kids' club, where there were always a bunch of kids to hang out with, epic chicken fingers and ranch dressing, and fun games for us to play. There was a director of the kids' club who watched us and facilitated all the activities. His name was Dan. In retrospect, Dan was a major fucking creep. He was around 40 years old, super tall and skinny, and was balding badly. The worst part is that sometimes he had us call him Dan Dan the Animal Man. For a side note, these sort of memories leave me in awe of how naive and blinded to danger I was as a kid. If I ever met this guy now, I literally wouldn't want to get within a 5 foot radius of him. And there I was as a 12 year old, 
thinking he rocked. Time is a wonderful thing. Anyhow, I digress. It was made clear to all of us that for unknown reasons, Dan was leaving the hotel in a week. None of this faced me. On our last day at the hotel, I lost my cell phone. It was a bright blue chocolate cell phone. I quickly told my parents I couldn't find my phone, and considering this was already the second phone I lost that year, my mom yelled at me and told me if I didn't find the phone, I'd be grounded. I hurriedly ran around the hotel looking for my phone, and along my way I went to the kids' club to see if anyone had found it. The room that was typically bustling with kids and activity was eerily quiet and empty. Dan was sitting on a couch all by himself. Hey, Dan. Did you by any chance see my phone? I asked. Dan responded, Yes, I found it and put it in the lost and found in the basement. Come with me. Thinking absolutely nothing of this, I mindlessly followed Dan as he led me around the back of the hotel. We walked for about three minutes and arrived at the foot of his stairwell going into the basement. We were standing at the back of the hotel in a strange area and no one else was in sight. It's down here? I asked, confused. I was staring down a long flight of stairs leading to absolute darkness. The walls were made of unpainted concrete. It looked no more than a storage area, let alone a basement with a lost and found. Dan nodded and held the door open for me, motioning for me to head down the steps. Something in my twelve-year-old self suddenly woke up. I'm not sure if it was instinct, fear, or fucking luck but I immediately knew I had to get the hell out of there. Before Dan could say or do anything, I blurted out, Never mind, I think I left it with my mom, and I darted away from the stairwell and back to the hotel lobby. I was so shaken up, because something about that situation didn't feel right. I knew he was going to hurt me, and as a kid who wore rose-colored glasses and was overly trusting of others, this really meant something. I tried to compose myself and figured I'd investigate a bit more. I walked up to the concierge of the hotel and asked them where the lost and found was, because I'd just lost my phone. The nice woman at the front desk told me that lost and found was right there, at their desk. She then asked me what kind of phone I lost, and after I told her it was a blue chocolate flip phone, she smiled and pulled it out of the box under her desk. Someone turned it in here earlier, she said, and then she handed me my phone. Wait, you're telling me that Lost and Found isn't in the basement, I stammered. No, sweetie, the hotel is under construction and the basement is just being rebuilt. There's no electricity down there or anything yet. This scared the absolute shit out of me. I couldn't shake the feeling that this man was dangerous. At the time I was sharing my hotel room with my cousin, and she was the only person I told. Considering she was eight at the time, I think I really freaked her out. I'm now 26, and I think back to that moment. I wonder what if. What would have happened if I went down in the basement with Dan Dan the Animal Man? It truly feels like one of the most critical junctures of my entire life. I'm so happy I knew to get the hell out of there before it was too late. I recently contacted the hotel to inquire about past kid club employees named Dan from 2007, just to see if he's still around or on a sex offenders list, or maybe in jail. I even told HR this whole story, but they still refused to give me any information about it. They sounded pretty sketchy about it. I will continue to do research. You've Googled yourself at some point or another. Admit it. There's nothing shameful about it. It's not worse than what I did. I searched my name on the dark web. Don't ever make that mistake. I was 19 years old then. Liv, my girlfriend, and her family were kind enough to let me live in their guest bedroom at the start of the year. They liked the fact that I could fix most of their computer problems. Liv is a great person, and what she saw in a hacker who could never survive for long in a 9 to 5 world is beyond me. Their house was in the suburbs only a few blocks away from the library and coffee shops with free Wi-Fi. These locations were convenient for my burgeoning career as a digital outlaw. 
I used these resources until I was able to move out and get a small apartment of my own. After a string of demanding jobs and abusive bosses, I found financial independence. I did this after I learned how to buy and sell things I shouldn't have with the use of Tor Browser. I engaged in illegal transactions such as ordering counterfeit money and stolen IDs. I discovered that there is a large market for manufactured psychedelics. I often went to the skate park to sell those items off the neithermost landscape of the World Wide Web. Business was good. A young man with years spent in the foster care, I sought out activities which gave me the sense of control. A childhood of not having any will do that to you. The ability to navigate the online world to get almost whatever I wanted afforded me a sense of power. It was all going well until one evening in July. I sat in the second level of a Barnes & Noble bookstore in the corner next to the self-help section. I always did my best work there. This place was starting to go under and I did not have to worry about the influx of patrons. Despite having a disguised IP address, I never wanted to risk a raid at home. The items were always shipped to a PO box instead of my unit number as well. In retrospect, these were all flimsy safety measures. They still gave me a sense of comfort, even if they were a tad delusional. I made sure there were no cameras mounted where I sat. It was a small place out of the way of the general public. Hiding in plain sight was always my preferred method. I drank strong coffee out of an oversized styrofoam cup. After 15 minutes of searching, I grew bored. I typed in my name, Joshua Wells. An input of my identity on that part of the web should be an indicator of how successful and arrogant I had became. I did not expect Wikipedia to be among the results, but it was. The third link down. The first one involved a ghost tour in New Jersey. The guide had a similar name. The second one was a gore website I was not interested in. While I may have been a thrill seeker, I was not out to consume media which capitalized on hurting others. I clicked on the third article link because of the title. It was about a television show. It read, The Short Life of Joshua Wells. At first, the title didn't startle me since there are plenty of other people with that same name. Recaps of 10 episodes were on the page. The first paragraph illustrated that the series did not continue past one season. I read the summary of the first episode for the sake of passing time. Episode 1 Joshua's father is a known and feared gang member. His mother is a helpless addict. She attempts to use her own son as a drug mule on a plane flight from Boston to California. She has hopes of making a profit by dealing narcotics to a major criminal enterprise on landing. The authorities intercept them. Their son goes to CPS. He goes to a safe harbor for kids. The synopsis struck me as very close to home. Who wrote it or directed the show was not listed, but it did state an air date. The month and year matched the era which an identical set of circumstances had befallen me. The name of the center I went to was even called Safe Harbor. I was too young to remember much, but the facts were precise. I gulped and tried to shrug it off as an unusual coincidence. I read the second story summary. Episode 2 we follow Joshua on his 15th birthday. He goes to a juvenile detention facility for the first time after he attacks his teacher by throwing a desk at him. Although he missed, the instructor still presses charges since he didn't like that student much. He befriends a troublemaker on the inside named Ian. They escape, but not before a massive brawl with the other teens ensue inside of the facility. It ends with the two captured. I felt the hairs on my arm stand up. It was uncanny on how similar these events were to my own experiences. A slight dizziness overtook me, but I went on to the third, unable to keep my eyes from skimming. Episode 3 Joshua is free. Joshua decides to break and enter an old man's upper class home after scouting the place out for days. His goal is to take as many Rolex watches from the top drawer of the old man's dresser. When he enters the house, Joshua discovers how the owner did not take his vacation cruise trip as planned. 
The man was asleep in his bedroom until Joshua wakes the victim by accident. Joshua runs away. He gets chased by the homeowner outside, where the elderly man dies from a heart attack in the street. I felt my chest tighten. It was all true, but I've never shared that story with anyone before. It was one of my most guilt-ridden memories. I read the next two. Episode 4 Joshua has nightmares of the old man crawling out of the ditch and choking him to death. He complains about the night terrors to one of his counselors who recommended a doctor. He ends up selling anti-anxiety pills after he doesn't like the way it makes him feel. A girl he asked out overdoses and goes to the hospital. While she survives, he feels terrible, but not enough to stop dealing. He takes his earnings and buys a PC. He takes lessons on how to breach other people's privacy from a group of credit card thieves he met in the mall. Episode 5 Joshua discovers a dark web. He uses it to hustle low-level street drugs at first. He later reads headlines about some of his accomplices getting arrested. He still continues to engage in illicit activity. I look at the air date for episode 6. It was a 24 hour period I was living through. Episode 6 Joshua goes into a bookstore to poach their internet and try and make some money. He doesn't realize there's a man with a shaved head in a Carhartt t-shirt below him perusing the sci-fi aisle. That stranger is actually an undercover FBI agent. The government worker has a microphone and a camera attached beneath his shirt. He is surveying for the perpetrator, even though he has not singled out who he is looking for yet. An arrest commences where they tackle, punch, and taser Joshua. They place him in handcuffs. My hands shook. I stood, gripped an Eckhart toll volume to appear less suspicious, and opened it. I lean my head over the railing to stare at the ground floor below me. A man who matched the description given by the article was there. His shirt was baggy and hid what I knew to be a gun at his hip. He held a paperback in his hands. I pulled out my phone. I pretended to have a conversation with an imaginary business associate about stocks. I folded the laptop with my free hand and went down the escalator. I strolled to the back where there were stacks of hardcover tomes on history. I found an unsecured door and walked through it. I was in the warehouse. Unopened boxes were stacked all around. I did not spot any workers and made a run for the rear entrance. I sprinted down the wide alleyway between the building and rows of motels. I passed an art gallery and liquor store before my heartbeat slowed. Along the way, I found this closed vegan restaurant the place was black on the inside, but the neon sign still glowed. A picnic table sat on the lawn out front. I stationed myself there. I opened my laptop again and connected to the free Wi-Fi without issue. I scanned the rest. The remaining episodes were all future time periods. I wiped the perspiration away from my forehead as I read the rundown of the next episode. Episode 7 Labeled a dark net market operator in the media, three of the seven charges thrown at him led to convictions. This includes conspiracy to traffic narcotics. He gets out early after he agrees to cooperate with different agencies. He becomes a consultant for cybersecurity awareness and a social engineering expert. Following a keynote speech given out of town, he comes home. His girlfriend Olivia and her family have been murdered. My eyes strained and I felt my breath grow shallower. Episode 8 Joshua navigates her house. The walls have dry blood. Every corner is vandalized. Olivia's throat is slit. Her body is over the couch in the living area. Her parents had socks stuffed in their mouths and deep stab wounds on their stomachs. Joshua calls the police. He's treated as the number one suspect in the media for days on end. He is finally cleared, but the psychological damage is too much to bear. I pondered the words. Though I was still young, it is true that life meant everything to me. Episode 9 Joshua goes to a psychiatric ward. He stares at the padded walls as though they were going to converse with him. 
Detectives do visit him with the hopes of gleaning some kind of further information. They tell him they know that the aftermath of the massacre he stumbled upon was the work of an active serial killer. The murderer has remained unidentified. Episode 10. Joshua leaps out of the window. He breaks his ankle. An adrenaline dump allows him to move across the field onto the nearest highway. He goes out into traffic. A long-haul truck carries around him and takes out a line of vehicles. He goes to the nearest lake where he weighs his own pockets down with stones. He waits until nightfall and walks out into the abyss. The last image we see is his hand breaking the surface of the water. Starlight glints on the skin before his fingers submerge below the surface. His last few swallows of water create pockets of bubbles which rise to the top. I absorb what the rest of my existence would look like. Four black SUVs pull up and circle around me in the parking lot. Men in black suits and the undercover agent from the bookstore. They run right at me. Even though I do not resist, they still throw me on the ground. They just locate my shoulder and kick me in the jaw a handful of times before they cuffed me. I did get time reduced in prison after I agreed to cooperate to catch people like me. After my release date, I have tried to revisit the link without luck. I failed to understand how the article existed in the first place. I have read how high-level stress can open the insights and portals into the unknown. I would bank on the latter, though sometimes I think it isn't for me to know. I do not want to give in to what the destiny has written for me. My escape from the bookstore has given me the confidence that I can change the outcome of the dark web prophecy even if only for a little while, or did I only extend the inevitable for a fraction of time? Fate, especially in regards to our stories as individuals, is not written in stone, it is malleable, I tell myself. This positive thought is the only thing which keeps me going. I should visit Liv's house now. She has not answered my text all morning. A few months ago, my best friend Jeremy called and asked if I could come over. He told me about this crazy new side of the internet that he had found. I absolutely had no idea what he was talking about. He was always up to something mischievous though. Even as an adult, he still had the enthusiasm of a child when he became excited. Because of that, it was always hard to tell him no. I could tell that this seemed important to him, so I told him to just come over and show me what the hell he was talking about. He came over to my house later that same day. He showed up with a flash drive. He was so excited, he didn't even take his shoes off. He ran over to my already open laptop that was sitting on my living room table and immediately plugged the flash drive in. He had that obnoxious smile across his face. It was that same smile he made when we were kids, the same taunting grin he made right before we were about to do something our parents would be furious about. So much for saying hello. You should really knock first. What if I was naked? My voice was playful. Shut up and come sit down. Oh, and I'm sorry for just barging in like that, he said just as playfully. Whatever, you're definitely not sorry. I'm going to make us some tea and I'll bring it right out. I smiled as I walked away. About 10 minutes later, I came back out with two mugs full of freshly brewed tea. I sat the tea down on the table in front of my couch and sat next to Jeremy. I looked over at my laptop. My eyes immediately fixated on the screen. The flash drive contained a whole different operating system. I watched my laptop boot up and start running an operating system I'd never seen before. My eyes then shot a gaze at Jeremy. What the hell is this? Is this going to mess up my computer? You know I can't afford another one if this breaks. Most importantly, I need it for school. All my schoolwork is on there. You? My voice was sharp, but before I could finish talking, he cut me off. You worry too much. Just relax. I tested it out on my computer, and everything went fine. Just wait for it to boot up. We'll return to normal once I power it down and remove the flash drive. His voice had a reassuring tone. Yeah, fine. Whatever. I said reluctantly. After about 10 minutes of us just sitting there watching this foreign operating system load, 
It finally finished. The home screen was a solid shade of blue and there were only two icons. One was a web browser, the other was some sort of VPN. In the corner was the search bar. I tried typing all kinds of words in it, but nothing came up. Eventually, I was done clicking around, and Jeremy just took over the controls. He opened up the web browser. It was a search engine I had never seen before. Actually, it was a search engine I had never even heard of. I watched him manically type in random numbers and letters into the search engine. Before I could even ask him what he was doing, he hit enter and a wiki page popped up. Towards the middle of the page was a list of links. They all had different names. The credit card company, Guns Are Great, and The One Stop Shop were the names of some of the links. Most links had extremely illegal titles and definitely led to illegal activities. Some of them were just downright disgusting and disturbing. I'd rather not go into details about those links. Jeremy quickly identified what he was looking for. It was a link called The Gore Store. He was always into that kind of stuff. I never understood why. Gore was just really fascinating to him. I myself could not say the same. It had to have been fake anyways, right? I just wanted to get it over with, so I sat quietly and just waited for the page to load. Once the page loaded, my screen was filled with obscene images of mutilated bodies. There were videos of different people getting killed in different ways. It was insanely graphic. He showed me two 30 second clips before I had to run to the bathroom. I could hear Jeremy's laughter as I viciously gagged over my toilet. When I came out of the bathroom, the gore page was gone and he went back to the wiki page. I watched his eyes dart around the screen. It looked like he was trying to find something in particular. Before I could even ask what he was doing, he let out a, aha. What is it? I'm not sure this whole dark web thing is for me. Maybe we should just turn it off. Before I could even finish my sentence, he cut me off again. Look what I found. It's pretty cool. I think you'll actually like it. I reluctantly agreed and sat back down on the couch beside him. The computer cursor was hovered over a link simply named Eyes. I was convinced it was about to be the most nauseating thing in the world. I pictured dangling eyeballs or blood-filled eye sockets. It had to be something along those lines. He could tell I was unprepared and he immediately clicked the button after I gave him a slight nod of approval. I was not expecting what I saw. There were eyes all right, normal eyes. It looked like a business page for selling contacts. It appeared professional and there was nothing strange about it, except for the fact that it was a seemingly normal business page on the dark web. I had a look through their section and ended up asking Jeremy to buy me a pair. He already had the correct form of currency in some sort of account. He thought it was funny, of course, and bought them for me without a second thought. I thanked him and we talked about what they were going to look like. We were both excited. After Jeremy left that night, he took his flash drive with him. He explained that he was going away on a business trip and that he wouldn't be back for a week or two. He said he sent the package directly to my house, but to call him if there was any delivery issues. The estimated arrival date was three weeks from that time anyways. I figured he would be back by then. That way we could experience unboxing them and me struggling to put them in together. He did find the website and pay for them after all. Two days later, I was surprised when I opened the front door to get the mail and saw the package at my front door. I quickly got the mail and took the package inside. I remember thinking this couldn't be the contacts. It was way too early. I grabbed the box cutter from the kitchen and started to slice open the package. There they were. The bright green contacts that had a slight blue fade were in the little box. They were beautiful. I know I told Jeremy that I would wait, but I was too excited. I took them out of the box and soaked them in the contact solution that came in the package. I looked in the mirror at my dark brown eyes while the contacts sat in the solution. I smiled at the fact that my eyes were about to be a completely different color, even if they were only temporary. I always wanted brighter eyes. I had never put in contacts before, so I expected them to be quite tricky for my first try. 
To my surprise, I put them both in with quite ease. It's safe to say I gave myself a pat on the back. I was thoroughly impressed. It was like I had been doing it all my life. They slid right into place and didn't budge or slide at all. After looking in the mirror for who knows how long, I decided to call Jeremy and tell him about it. He didn't answer. I figured he was probably working and that he would eventually call me back. I looked back into the mirror, stunned by my new eye color. I started taking pictures to update my social media platforms. My self-esteem skyrocketed. When I was done obsessing over my new contacts, I decided I should probably make dinner. I lived by myself and I always made way too much food. I'd use the leftovers for lunch, so it never really went to waste. That night, I decided to make a whole lasagna. It was one of my favorite meals, and I figured I could give some to my elderly neighbor as well. I put a pot of water on the stove to bring it to boil. As I was pulling out the noodles, something caught my eye. It was like a quick shadow flew by my peripheral vision. I stopped and looked around, but I saw nothing. I remember thinking it was strange, but not uncommon. I thought it was just my eyes playing tricks on me. I finished prepping and lined up the cooked noodles on a sheet of aluminum foil. I opened a package of raw meat to cook in an already hot pan. As I went to open the meat, I glanced over at the noodles. This time, I was looking straight at them. A wave of horror washed over my face. The noodles had turned into maggots. They were swarming all over the aluminum foil. I watched as some of them wiggled themselves off of the counter. Each time one of them hit the ground, I flinched. They were big. They were about as big as the top of my pointer finger. I grabbed the broom and the garbage can and swept them into the garbage. I took them outside to the garbage bin immediately. After that, I had completely lost my appetite. I decided I needed to take a bath to calm down and recollect my thoughts. I made some tea, lit some candles, and filled the bathtub. I slowly got into the bath as the hot water touched my skin. It was quiet and peaceful. I finally had time to think. I closed my eyes and let my head rest against the back of the bathtub. What just happened? I'm definitely not seeing things. Those maggots were real. How in the world did my freshly boiled noodles turn into maggots? Didn't make sense. I whispered my thoughts out loud. When I opened my eyes to gaze at the relaxing setup I had put together, I jumped out of the water. My bath water was a deep shade of red now. Every candle I had lit went out. I quickly wrapped myself in the towel and turned on the main light. The candles weren't lit, but the bath water was clear. I didn't care. I wasn't going back in there. I dried myself off and put on some fresh clothes and went back into the bathroom to brush my teeth and hair before going to bed. I turned on the sink and grabbed my toothbrush. Right before I started brushing my teeth, I looked up into the mirror. I felt a knot form in my stomach. I was holding the toothbrush in my mouth, but my reflection wasn't. I watched my reflection sway back and forth. The closer I leaned in, the further my reflection would back up. It giggled as I watched my own reflection tear out my eyeballs. My reflection's eyes were dangling so low that they touched its mouth. It licked one of the eyeballs and one of the contacts flipped on its tongue. It started to chew it like it was food. Each chew sounded like broken pieces of plastic. I watched blood starting to form in my reflection's eyes. I couldn't take it anymore. I washed out my mouth and ran back into my bedroom. I sat down at my vanity and tried to take out my contacts without looking into the mirror. I thought that it would be easy to remove since it was so easy to put in. I was wrong. No matter what I did, they wouldn't budge. Not even a little bit. I tried pinching it, moving it, pushing, and sliding it. Nothing. After 30 minutes of nothing but severely irritating my eye, I gave up. I straightened my back from the bent over position and looked into the vanity mirror. My reflection was laughing at me. I covered all the mirrors in my house until I could figure out some way to get the things out of my eyes. They were a pretty natural color, so if I went out in public, no one would even notice that I had contacts stuck in my eyes. I was also skeptical to call a doctor at the time, considering I received the contacts from the dark web. I decided to try to rationalize things. 
I realized I sure didn't want to sleep with them in, so I had to stay awake as long as possible until I found a solution. I went into my living room to watch TV. It was the only place in my house where I couldn't see myself in some way. My house looked slightly abandoned, all the blankets draped over everything that could cause a reflection. I leaned forward to grab the remote that had fallen on the floor. Upon picking it up, I felt the sharp pain throughout my entire hand. I immediately dropped the remote and looked at my aching palm. Every inch of my hand was ridden in cuts. I watched blood drip from my hand onto the floor. I looked down to find the remote on the ground still. The buttons stuck out and came to a sharp point. They were sharper than a newly opened razor. I kicked the remote as hard as I could. I heard it crash against the wall and hit the floor. With my hands on my head, I heard the TV turn on. It was playing a show I couldn't recognize. I lifted my head and looked towards the television. It was me. I was on my own television. The quality was grainy, but I could make out what was happening. The television showed me walking across the street from our local grocery store. On my way across the road, a huge truck came at full speed. In the blink of an eye, the truck hit me and I watched my lifeless body drag across the sidewalk. Then it turned back off. I didn't know what to do. I was scrambling around trying to figure something out. I ended up calling Jeremy. He seemed a bit concerned, but honestly, it didn't sound like he believed me. It's like he thought I was joking around. He ended up just hanging up on me, thinking I was pranking him. When I hung up my phone, I slammed it down on my hallway floor. I had been sitting there since the television situation. Tears filled my eyes and I heard my phone vibrate against the wooden floor. I picked up my phone and saw a text message from my unknown number. Go outside, is all it read. I tried calling the number back. Of course, it didn't work, considering there was no number to begin with. The caller ID just said, unknown. At this point, I was trying everything. What more did I have to lose? I walked past my kitchen and glanced over at a bowl of fruit I kept on the counter. They were all black and rotten. I didn't stop though. I wanted to make it to my front door. I didn't plan on actually fully going outside, but a peek wouldn't hurt. At least that's what I thought. Before I could even put my hand on the doorknob, someone started knocking. Package delivery. The voice was deep and foreign. I opened my door just a tad and there stood a delivery man. His eyes were wide, really wide. They looked dry like he hadn't blinked in hours. He had slash wounds across his entire face and down his neck. He was incredibly lanky and tall. He reached out his arm to hand me the package, and I realized he was missing six fingers. The wounds looked incredibly fresh. Blood soiled the entire box. Just leave it, I'll get it, I said quickly. I slammed the door in his face and locked every single door in my house that led to the outside. Once I was sure he was gone, I quickly grabbed the package and pulled it into my house. Everything around me was slowly decaying, even the people outside. I eventually made my way back to my room. My stairs were littered with nails sticking directly upwards. I tried to avoid as many as I could, but I still stabbed the bottom of my feet multiple times. There were countless bloody holes in my feet. I left a crimson trail wherever I walked. I walked into the bathroom that was connected to the bedroom once more. I pulled off the cover and looked at myself again. This time, my reflection was still laughing, but pieces of my flesh dangled from different areas of my face. My neck was snapped and I had a noose around my neck. My tongue salivated black, looking tar and my eyes were completely hollowed out. I hadn't slept in three days. I'm afraid to go to sleep. What if I wake up and my entire house is embedded in barbed wire? What if the floor is completely made of shards of glass? What if everything around me turns into the ultimate death trap? I'm absolutely terrified. I'm not taking any chances, especially since I brought the box inside. I ended up opening it. There's another box inside. This box was slightly cleaner, but had a message scratched along the top. It was barely legible, but it read, Open it to find out when your untimely demise will fall upon you. Clock's ticking. Again, I figured I had nothing to lose, so I opened the second box. This time, the box contained a handwritten note. Not all eyes are meant to be a prize. 
The context you contain will show the other side. You can live with a vision or you can choose your demise. I left you a gift. Now you can decide. I've been sitting here for hours now. All my food is infested and moldy. I need to go to the grocery store, but I keep looking at the gift that sat below the note. I never really thought this would ever be an appropriate gift for anyone, but I can't help but gaze at this already tight news. I knew going on the dark web was a bad idea. I used to be a process server and I have a lot of interesting stories from that job. I have a couple that really scared me. This is one of the stories that really scared me. The experience that confirmed that I should always trust my gut. I went to an apartment building to serve someone who lived there. When I was walking up to the building, there was an older man sitting on the bench right next to the front door. He had a cane next to him. He was friendly and said hello. I said hello back and initially, my guard was down, so I started some small talk with him. I attempted to open the front door, but it ended up being locked. So I explained to the man that I was a process server and I was attempting to give some papers to someone that lived in the building. He started going on about how he had a daughter my age and that he wouldn't be comfortable with her being a process server because it wasn't a safe job. He also said, it must be extra unsafe for me because I'm so small. I was 5'2 and at the time I was 110 pounds. I instantly started to feel like something was off. I also thought that maybe I was being overdramatic because this was an older man who has to use a cane. I felt like it was almost rude to be cautious of someone like that. I still had a job to do and I wasn't going to let this deter me from doing that. So I asked the man if he was willing to let me into the apartment building. He said he would. It seemed like it took him some effort to stand up and walk towards the door with his cane. So I started to feel like I had been overreacting. The man opened the door for me and I walked into the building. I was about to go up the stairs but the man insisted I take the elevator. I started to feel very uneasy but for some reason I agreed to take the elevators anyway. I thought the man would leave me alone if I took his suggestion. I started to walk over to the elevator and he followed me. He continued to talk to me. He asked me about my job and life. I was trying to be vague. When I got to the elevator, the man also got onto the elevator. At this point, I froze because I didn't understand why he had followed me. The man was standing closer to the back wall of the elevator and I was standing closer to the door. I didn't want to make eye contact with him in that enclosed space alone, but I was watching him in the reflection on the shiny metal door. I asked him why he got into the elevator with me, and he said that he was watching out for me. When the man said this, I could clearly see that his head was facing me, and it moved down, staring at the floor where my feet were, and then slowly up like he was looking at my body from top to bottom. I started to feel claustrophobic and that I needed to get off the elevator now. The elevator door opened and I practically jumped out. I told the man that he needed to stay there because I wanted to respect the privacy of the person that I was serving papers to. I then told the man to have a nice day because I felt like that was what I needed to say the whole time to end the conversation without him continuing the conversation. The man just nodded at me. I get off the elevator and begin to walk down the hallway looking for the right apartment number that is listed in the documents that were in my hands. I continue walking and I feel this sensation like I'm being watched, but I don't want to turn around because I'm too afraid that I'll see the man standing there. I end up having to walk around the corner and further down the hallway. The feeling of being watched goes away and I know it's because there's now a wall between me and whosoever's eyes I could feel watching my back. I get to the right apartment and knock on the door. There's no answer. I knock again, but this time much louder. Then I wait about 30 seconds and give the door four sturdy knocks before waiting patiently. I couldn't hear anyone in the apartment. No TV, no pets, no microwave running, just nothing. I finally believe that this person's not home. I accept a fee. I'm a little annoyed that I went through all of this just to arrive at this person's apartment and them not even being home. I start to walk back the way I came from. I turn the corner of the hallway and what comes into view makes my stomach sink. The man is standing there, one hand on his cane and the other hand hovering in front of the elevator button. I keep walking while a bunch of different thoughts are running through my head. When I start to approach the elevator, the man asks, how did it go? I simply answered, they weren't home. The man says, 
I've been waiting for you here. There's something about the way this man said this. I knew I shouldn't get on the elevator with this man again. I basically did a drive-by and started walking fast past him. I told him, have a nice day, I'm in a hurry. I didn't even wait for a reply and continued to move quickly past the elevator towards the staircase. Once I reached the stairs, I'm not sure why, but I started running down them. Once I got down the case of stairs, I heard a loud, wait. I looked back once and I could see the man on top of the staircase. He's now carrying his cane and he began running down the stairs after me. He wasn't using his cane to descend down the stairs and he was moving way faster than he had previously. I turned away and ran as fast as I could down the stairs without falling down. I started to jump down two stairs at a time. I knew that he was close behind me because I could hear his loud feet as he was running down behind me. I reached the bottom of the stairs and almost ran into another resident of the building. I apologized and felt panic when I realized that the guy was probably right behind me. I looked behind me and the man was using his cane again to get down the last few steps. I looked back at the other resident and they had a puzzled look on their face. I mumbled, have a nice day, and booked it out of the apartment building and straight to my car. I didn't check to see if the man was following me, but something in my gut told me that the other resident present had helped me. When I reached my car, I practically jumped into it. I slammed the car door and locked it right away. I started my car and pulled out of the lot quickly. The parking lot required me to drive past the front door of the apartment building. I looked over to see if there was any sign of the man, and there he was. He had stepped outside of the front door and was standing there, leaning on his cane and smiling at me driving by. He then gave me a slow wave. I don't know why, but I gave him a tight-lipped smile. For some reason, I still felt like I had to be nice, even though something obviously really messed up just happened. But at least, I was in my locked car, driving away, and he had no way to catch up with me. This happened shortly after bars were reopening, after COVID lockdowns. I went to a dive bar near 82nd Ave in Portland, Oregon. A real shithole, but they were one of the only bars that had karaoke that early after the lockdowns eased. I sang my song and walked over to the bar for a drink. I'm chatting with the bartender when this man approaches me. I'm a large man, 6'2", a little over 200 pounds, but this guy dwarfed me. He was probably 6'6", and easily 280 pounds or more, probably around 30 to 35 years old. He was huge and muscular. He was wearing a face mask, very common, but he was the only one in the bar doing it. He had been wearing this mask long enough that it was dirty, and the part of the mask in the front of his mouth was visibly wet from saliva. It was pretty gross. He had very cold, dead eyes. He asked me if I lifted weights. I did and questioned me about how much I could bench and squat, etc. He came off socially awkward immediately, but no big deal. He then bragged about how much he could lift. He could bench something like 350 pounds, he said, and at one point he even did a bodybuilding pose, flexing his arms on both sides and encouraging me to squeeze them. I played along and did. He seemed weird, possibly on the spectrum, but shady dive bars are filled with weird people, so I indulged him and let him talk. The convo continued, and he said some more strange things, which I just tried to listen to non-judgmental. He told me that he used to be a professional baseball player and police officer. He told me about his drinking habit and how he drank 25 beers that day. Not impossible for a dude that size. At this point, I feel like this guy is very strange, probably completely full of shit, and he even makes me a little uncomfortable. I maintain a calm demeanor because I was also curious of what else he had to say. That's when he shifted to talking about women. He said he noticed how I talked to the female bartender, how we had a nice rapport. He asked me about how I talk to women, what kind of things I talk about, and then came the first red flag when he said, but how do you get them to trust you? I tried to keep a straight, non-judgmental face, though that was a rather alarming question. At this point, I didn't think that he was dangerous, but I didn't feel good about teaching someone how to behave to gain someone's trust. I also felt like I needed to keep him talking. So I said generic things about being honest and caring as opposed to things to do or say. Then it gets weirder. He asked me if I like anal sex. I said, I don't know, as at that point I had never tried it. He tells me that he likes it a lot. 
It's his preferred kind of sex. Then he continued, saying he likes to go to the mall and pick up young women, 18 or 19, he said, which is right on the edge of legal, and I immediately wondered if he went younger. He said he'd buy them things and then try to get them to come back to his truck where he'd have anal sex with them, implying that it was consensual, but I had my doubts. At this point, I'm convinced that I'm talking to a psychopath and a rapist, and alarm bells are going off like crazy, but I wanted to get him to admit to a crime so I could try to tell the authorities something substantive. Then the final straw that made me lose my cool. He looked at me and said slowly, I've done bad things. He looks down. I've done some really bad things. I'm freaking out inside, but I want him to tell me. I ask him as cool and non-judgmental as possible. What kind of bad things? But my body language must have communicated that I was neither cool or non-judgmental. And he shut down. Convo ended shortly after. I went home that night and looked up the name he had gave me. Surely a baseball player or a police officer would have some kind of online record but nothing came up. I'll never forget that encounter, and I regret not figuring out a way to ID him and failing to keep my cool enough to get him to admit to a crime. I wonder if he's still out there luring young women to his truck. Be safe out there, y'all. I live on a main road in a kind of sketchy area. Not completely unsafe, but an area I've posted about before on here because some creepy stuff happened to me, but this is one of the creepiest. I had gone out around 6 for food. It had recently snowed and my city sucks at sidewalk plowing, so it's an arctic expedition walking through the deep snow and ice. As I trudged through, I passed a man that lives in the neighborhood that can sometimes act strange. He walks oddly and can be pretty creepy at times. He passes me one way, I pass him the other, and we go our separate ways. After I got my food, walking back, I thought I saw him coming my way. I quietly, out loud, said, Oh man, not him. But then, that slowly faded away. The person walked off the path towards a church on the street. This church has a big LED sign that you can hide behind. As I got closer, I realized it was a younger man, about my age, with a gray hoodie and beige cargo pants. He was acting strange. He walked like a Disney cartoon character and his face had a big smile with eyes shifting at a million kilometers per hour. Then I saw as he looked at me approach, quickly pulled his hoodie over his head and stepped behind the sign, obstructing my view of him. I don't know if he saw me see him, but I realized what might be going down. I just stopped on the path. From the snow, it would have been too much to turn around and head back. My boots were getting stuck in the slushy, snowy path. I waited a few moments and he must have realized that I knew because he came back out from behind the sign and went up to the church windows. The church is also a community center and there's a room facing the street that kind of looks like a dance room with a large mirror. He took off his hood and started fake dancing around in front of the window. He kept looking back as if his little distraction would have been enough to end my interest in what the fuck is happening, but it didn't. It disturbed me more. When he realized this, we made a sort of shuffle around each other. His smile disappeared and he kept trying to inch his way towards me but got bogged down in the same slush that I stopped in. After I got away, I just watched him as he put his hoodie up again and walked away normally towards the restaurant. This area gets stranger and stranger every day. I've had a few creepy things happen to me in my life, but this one I still think about how things could have went wrong very fast. I'm a 20 year old female. This takes place back when I used to live in southern Indiana. Like seriously, in the sticks. It was a weekend night and my best friend and I were coming home from our graveyard shift at a local waffle joint. She decided to get her dog from her house so we could stay at my place for the night. That's important later. So we start heading out into the country where I lived, and to get to my house there's a long narrow dirt road you have to go down about a mile in or so. We see a truck's headlights. We get closer and it's a nice truck, probably like 2018 at least. He's parked to where he's sideways, blocking the whole path. Confused, I get out to ask if he's okay. He looked hopeful when he saw me at first. 
I'm just waiting on a friend to come get me. My truck's stuck. He smiled at me, and I noticed his pupils were nearly completely dilated. He looks back at my car and sees that I have someone with me, and looks at the dog sticking his head out the window. His smile fades. He says, pit bulls are mean and nasty. He quickly turns around and gets back in his truck. I go to my friend and I'm like, put this shit in reverse and use whatever hood ray skills you have to get the hell out of here. So we take my poor 95 caddy that really shouldn't be driving on dirt road anyway and back all the way back down the road to get to the main road. Relieved, we take a different road home. Then lo and behold, the same guy is parked on the road, standing off to the side smiling, just looking at our headlights. We're completely about to shit ourselves and we gunned it the rest of the way home. I don't know how he got there before us or what his intentions were, but I'm thankful I wasn't alone being my naive college girl self. I was at a friend's wedding where I was close to a lot of people there. I saw a friend of mine that I sometimes jump on in a playful manner and asked him for a piggyback ride, just being goofy. He agreed and was sort of dancing with me on his back. All of a sudden, I feel someone reaching behind me and grabbing my groin, not even my butt, which would have been inappropriate enough, but literally a full handful of my crotch. I jump up and look to see who it was with a what the fuck as I did. I see that it's a woman I've met a few times, but barely know. I don't even remember her name at this time. She scoffs at me for being upset about it, kind of chuckles and says, Relax, it's okay, I've seen you naked, before rolling her eyes and walking away like it was perfectly reasonable to grab an acquaintance junk without warning them or consent. When I was in college, I was out and about with my then boyfriend. We had gone to dinner and went to Walmart to get the typical college food so we could survive a Sunday in. I was dressed up in a casual dressy fit. We decided to split up while shopping, maybe to shop quicker, but I don't remember what the exact reason was. I was wandering the grocery aisles when I noticed a girl who was about my age. In a friendly manner, we casually smiled at each other and continued on shopping. It didn't seem weird at first, but I kept noticing her in the same aisles as me, and a big, muscular man was never too far behind. Eventually, I texted my boyfriend and asked where he was, and continued shopping. Next thing I know, the girl approaches me and says that she loves my jacket. I say, thanks, and try to move on. She stops me and says something along the lines of, Hey, you look my age and seem really nice. I just moved here for a new job and company my friend and I are starting. Then she tried to ask me questions about where I was from. I was vague and untrusting with what I said, noticing that this isn't normal. Then she said, I'm looking for more people like you and I to work for our company. It's kind of a warehouse job and I would love you to be one of the bookkeepers. You should give me your number. I said, that's so nice of you to offer me a job, but I am not a desk person and I already have a job I love. She said, that's a bummer. I thought we might work well together. Well, would you want to give me your number so we can hang out? I would love to have a friend that could show me around the city. At that point, I realized I wasn't getting out of this situation until my boyfriend showed up or I just gave her my number. Eventually, I rattled off a fake number and said, hey, I'll catch you later. I gotta go. Then I walked away praying that my boyfriend would be near so we could get the fuck out of there. While I was looking for him and trying to call him, the girl caught up to me and said, I tried calling you but it says the number was out of service. As I tried to come up with a quick excuse and say, maybe you typed it in wrong, she saw that my iPhone was in my hand unlocked. She quickly snatched it away and called herself on it. I was so flustered and mad at her that I snatched my phone back right away. When my boyfriend came around the corner, he instantly recognized that something was up and said that we needed to go. When the girl saw him approach me, she looked disappointed to see him and stopped trying to interact. We ended up buying nothing and leaving. That night, we called our parents and the police. The police said that they didn't think it was anything ill-intended, but I was sure it was probably trafficking. I was going to switch my phone number because I was scared. I blocked them and turned off all location access on my phone. I was too scared to go anywhere alone for a while. I even told my coach so she would know. 
A couple days later, I got a text from a random number. It was the girl. She sent me a picture of my best friend who was out drinking downtown with some of her other friends. The text said, I met your best friend. She gave me your number because I told her that I was looking for new friends. She showed me a picture of you and I said, what a coincidence. I met that girl the other day and lost her number when I got a new phone. About two minutes later, I got a text from my best friend. I gave your number to a girl who wants to make friends around here and is asking people to join her business. Since I moved this week, I thought of you. I freaked out that she was with her and told her to get away and not to leave alone with her. I stayed up worried until my best friend got home. She said she was fine, otherwise I would have gone to go pick her up. The next day, my best friend apologized and told me to block the number. My friend in her friend group tried to ditch her, but she kept showing up to the bars that they were at. She said the girl was relentless and texted her all night trying to get my friends to go hang out at her place. My friend also said that when she asked about the business, the girl wouldn't give her many details other than it was a warehouse somewhere, would pay her great, was in town, and if she wanted a tour, she would take her. We never heard from this girl again. Today, I'm listening to a podcast and they mentioned different sex trafficking tactics. Two were vague jobs. They would pay you well, but need you to come meet them to give you more information. And a new town girl who desperately needs friends. I have been thinking about this all morning and I'm glad I felt uncomfortable and my friend didn't go with this girl. But I'm mostly mad at the cops for ignoring my concerns and saying it was nothing. When I was 16 years old, my best friend and I made a dumb decision to get matching tattoos from this older man who was doing tattoos illegally out of his home. He is well known in the area within our age group for giving cheap tattoos to minors. He recently had gotten out of prison for giving minors tattoos and not practicing under state guidelines. Needless to say, I don't know what the fuck we were thinking, but hey, when you're a rebellious 16 year old, dumb as fuck, and have the chance to get a tattoo for $20, I guess any and all common sense flies out the window. So we set up a time to go over to get our tats. I don't remember exactly what time we went over, but I remember it was already dark, so it must have been late evening. It was just three of us alone in his house. I remember feeling very eerie being there. Something about him and the energy of his place felt very off, but being a dumb teen I was, I chose to ignore those feelings and go through with it anyways. We were there for about 30 minutes, got our tattoos, and then left. Fast forward a few months later, I see his picture and name on the news. At first, I thought he got busted again for illegal tattooing. Little did I know, it was so much worse than that. He had been arrested for one of the most heinous crimes someone could commit. Turns out, he bought an old police car, a cop costume, handcuffs, and would go out to parts of Portland that prostitutes frequented impersonating a cop to arrest them. He brought them back to his house and chained them up in the garage where they wouldn't be heard. There, he would reportedly sexually assault them and torture them. I was absolutely sick to my stomach when I found out. I can't imagine what these women went through and I still really don't want to know the details. This was all happening around the same time that we went to his house, so the chances that one of the victims was there around the same time that we were could be a possibility I thank God that nothing happened to us, but there's also a part of me that feels guilt. What if someone was screaming for help while we were there and we just couldn't hear them? Why didn't he kidnap us? We would have been perfect targets. Every time I look at the tattoo, it's a horrible reminder of what could have happened, so I'm planning on getting it covered up. Thankfully, all of his victims were alive and I hope and pray that they're able to recover from this horrible act. Always trust your gut. Update, he had a whole setup where he would record his acts. I was told that there were multiple victims, but it looks like only one had been confirmed to be taken back to his home. Who knows how many more victims there were. Sadly, the demographic of women he was targeting are less likely to come forward. Turns out he didn't get a life sentence after all. Dude was somehow able to get a plea deal and is serving 30 years. I'm disgusted thinking that he'll be free again one day.
This happened back in the 80s, so very much the pre-cell phone era. I was in high school at the time. One night after dinner, my mom suggests we take a walk around the block to walk off dinner. My dad and brother were watching TV and opted to stay home, so it was just us girls. We lived out in the fringe of suburbs in a subdivision that was semi-rural. By that I mean there were houses but no street lights or sidewalks. Everyone had septic tanks and there was no sewer service, etc. The houses were all well back from the road and the lots were wooded. Anyway, we're walking around the block, which is about a mile and a half in total. We're almost back home. It's pitch black that night, no moon, and we had our flashlights to use as needed. Without it, you couldn't see much past a foot or two around you. We mainly used them to signal if a car went by, but there wasn't really anyone around, so we had them switched off and were just walking and chatting. Just as we turned the corner onto our street, we suddenly heard footsteps behind us. This was a bit weird as we had just came from that area and we hadn't seen or heard anyone walking around the street or coming down the driveways as we passed. We figured it was just some neighbor also out for a walk and we hadn't noticed them in the dark. So I turned around to look and switched the flashlight on to see who it was. They immediately switched the flashlight on too so I could only see their light and not them. They said nothing, kept walking, but the footsteps behind us sped up now. They sounded heavy so we thought it was a man. We sped up. He sped up. I turned the flashlight back and he turned his on once again in silence. We were too scared to call out and now we were approaching our driveway. As we got there, I pushed my mom in front and told her to get up the driveway, which was steep and long. Once she had a start, I sprinted up after her. As I did, the footsteps veered away to the other side of the road and just kept going. Nothing was ever said by this person, and normally people here waved and spoke out when walking or even driving by. When we got up to the house, my dad said it was probably just a neighbor, so my brother and I got in the car and drove around to see who it was. No one was out there. We went around the roads and no one was walking on them. There wasn't time for him to leave the area. Either it was a nasty neighbor getting off scaring us and then ducking into a house or whoever it was came out of the woods behind us and then disappeared back into them. We had just moved back to my home state and my husband's birthday was coming up. I went to the local Dollar Tree to get balloons and a card but this location didn't have helium for the balloons. I typed in the next available location in maps and drove there. I wasn't familiar with that area so when I arrived and it was a pretty sketchy part of town, I told myself to be quick and vigilant. I made a note of all the cars around and I parked as close to the front as I could. When I went inside I made a note of every person inside too. I was carrying my knife and pepper spray. I had no bad vibes, no creeps lingering, thought I was in the clear. I got my balloons and card within five minutes. Nobody new entered the store. I get outside and no cars have changed in the parking lot. I packed the balloons in my car, got in, locked my doors by default right as I turned my engine on, and a car out of nowhere speeds up and blocks the whole front end of my car at an angle. The guy starts motioning me to roll down my windows. I try to ignore them and plan my escape, but a car was on my right, another car was backing up, so I couldn't reverse. The guy kept pulling in closer at an angle to box me in and kept throwing hand gestures for me to roll down my window. When suddenly the car to my right moved, I whipped my wheel to the right as fast as I could and pulled out inches from scraping my car on the creep's car. I only lived about 10 minutes or so away, so I drove around for 45 minutes, taking all different roads to be certain that I wasn't being followed before finally going home. My adrenaline was so high, I really was surprised because I had no idea where that car came from. So this was a few years back when I was walking home from my friend's house after hanging out with her after school. It was around 9.30pm in the summer so the sun had set for the most part. It was relatively dark but still bright enough where I could make out things around me. I was stoned and was walking very slowly down the road to my house which was about a 20 minute walk away from my friend's house. 
The majority of my walk was spent on a straight, quiet suburban street that was very familiar to me as I had done this walk plenty of times before. After about five minutes of walking, I noticed the first and only car drive past. It was an old, beat up, white Honda, which I didn't take much notice of until a few minutes passed and it drove past again. Still, I wasn't concerned and continued my walk admiring the cracks in the pavement or doing whatever else a stone 14 year old does on a walk. Another minute passes and the car drives past again, this time more slowly, and I feel my stomach drop. I couldn't make out who was inside, but I knew something was off. I've always been very timid, so I tried to convince myself that it was just paranoia and that I was just being dramatic until it drives past again about two minutes later and parks maybe 10 feet in front of me. As I approached the car, I kept my head down, but I hear, Hey there. And sure enough, I look up and there's this rough looking man who you could tell from just the appearance alone smelled like stale cigarettes and body odor. He was sitting in his driver's seat smiling at me. The lack of teeth and dirty shirt this man had on gave me a horrible vibe, so I just gave him a smile back and continued walking. I look up and notice he's driving alongside me. He asked if I had directions to the nearest gas station. I stopped and pointed in the general direction and told him where to go, that I was less than a five minute drive away. When out of nowhere, he just started to laugh. I kind of just stared in confusion and fear as he squinted his eyes at me like he was trying to get a better look at my face. Then he said, I'll take a guess, but I could tell from those eyes you've been smoking pot, little miss. I kind of just laughed and tried to walk away when he said, come back, so I stopped in my tracks. Why I didn't just keep walking is beyond me, but I turned around and he pulled out a rather large bag of weed and asked if I want some. I tell him I'm okay and I have no money and he says something along the lines of, I don't need your money, take it. I reassure him that I'm fine and I don't need it and try to continue walking, but nonetheless, he continued driving alongside me. He then asked me if I needed a ride home and tells me that it's too dark to be walking alone, which really frightened me. He continued trying to convince me to get into his car and I became more and more unsettled. I began looking for the closest house with a light on and after finding one I tell him, this is my house, good night. I walk up the stranger's driveway and walk straight into their home. There's a middle aged couple sitting in the living room and they looked extremely shocked and equally angry. I just started to sob out of shock and relief and apologized profusely. I explained to them what just happened and the very kind lady assured me that I did the right thing and gave me a ride home. Looking back, I probably should have knocked, but I was scared, under the influence, and still a child, and the homeowners were very understanding. Still one of the scariest things to ever happen to me, but I'm glad I trusted my gut and got away from the man whose intentions seemed anything but pure. I consider myself lucky that I got away. Yesterday, my 8-year-old daughter and I took our pup out for her 2 p.m. walk, just like every day. Being on schedule is good for my dog, yet I may have to switch it up now. But a guy in my complex asked me to take a picture of my dog for his friend, and I said sure. So he runs down and started a whole photo shoot. He told us all to get in the picture, which we ignored. No need to take a picture of my 8-year-old. You got permission to take a picture of my dog. He kept saying, oh, I can get a better picture than that. Here I was just getting more and more uncomfortable. Like my dog is high energy. She wants to get going and so do I. Finally, he seems happy with the picture and says to wait, he has cookies. It wasn't clear if they were for my daughter or dog, but I was done with this interaction. I said, no thanks. My daughter has a kid's party to attend. He looked defeated and asked me if I was sure. I said, yep, gotta go. And we hustled out of there. This could be innocent, but it really felt odd, and I have a very unique looking dog who always has her face in the window, so it would be very easy for him to pinpoint where I live, and everyone has keys to our first door since we live in the same entrance as the basement storage. We still have two locked doors after the first door, but I feel unnerved. We live like a one minute walk from this guy's house. I just want to see what you guys think about this. Is it weird or am I just paranoid? Update, today my husband was walking our dog and he passed two guys. 
They crossed the street and sped up, walking towards my husband. My dog kept looking back and pulling my husband, so when they got close, my husband flipped out his switchblade, and they turned and quickly walked away. I don't know if this is related at all, but some of you suggested the original creepy dude might be trying to steal my dog, so I don't know if that's what they were hoping to do, but it's sending shivers down my spine. My husband didn't even look back at these guys, so he can't tell me what they look like. I've heard this story so many times, but I've honestly never thought it would happen to me. Last night, I was doing some Christmas shopping alone at TJ Maxx. I'm a 35-year-old female. I rarely go shopping alone, especially in the evening. I usually have my kids or my husband with me. I am browsing around aimlessly, kind of just all over the store, not sure what I'm going to get. I see this young guy, probably early 20s, skinny with glasses. Don't think anything of it. Went to a different spot and see him again. He's in the same aisle picking up stuff and looking at it and putting it back. No cart or anything. My red flags were not raised yet. Then I see him a third time in a different area doing the same thing but now he's stopping and texting someone. My senses start to perk up a little bit like okay this is weird but I'm not nervous yet per se but I am more aware. Then it happened again and this time, I knew something was weird. He was following me all over the store and has nothing to buy. I start to kind of zigzag through the store and I find a coat that I want to try on. At this point, I was very wary, but I was also thinking of being ridiculous and paranoid. But I just had a strong sense that this was not normal. I went into the dressing room for about 15 minutes, hoping I would lose him. I came out and I didn't see him for another 20 minutes. I was relieved, thinking I was definitely being paranoid and he probably left. I go to check out after almost an hour and a half of shopping with a cart full of stuff. I was the only one online. I get called to cash out. I turn around and this man is immediately behind me in the checkout. He came out of nowhere. He had one item, a cheap little decoration. At this point, I'm full on panicking. The cashier could tell that I was being weird and very distracted. At the risk of sounding crazy, I almost didn't say anything, but I told her that I think this man was following me. She was extremely empathetic and didn't seem very surprised. She was like, I'm so sorry, I will have someone walk you to your car. I was so thankful for her kindness. The man checked out with his one item and left the store with the older man who I didn't see before. The older man had nothing that he bought. The parking lot in this door is a huge dark plaza. I did not want to go outside alone. I just knew it was a very bad idea. The cashier asked another employee to walk me out. She was younger than me, but so sweet. I apologized profusely. It was sleeting and cold rain and she had no coat on. She said, I don't care if it's downpouring. I would still walk you to your car. It was so sweet, really. She walked me all the way and waited until I pulled out and drove away. The whole time, I was shaking like a leaf. Like I said, I've heard that this has happened to other women, but I kind of thought they might be paranoid or exaggerating. This is extremely scary, though. The more I think about it, the creepier it gets. He followed me around the entire store, and everywhere I turned, there he was. I have no idea what his deal was, but this was so unsettling. My husband freaked out and does not want me to shop alone anymore. I don't really want to shop alone anymore either. If I had not been paying attention or dismissed my bad feelings, something bad may have happened. As a woman, being aware of your surroundings is so important. I'm a thin, athletic white guy. 5'9", not the most intimidating presence, but I happen to have a nice bulky coat on that probably added some uncertainty. Anyway, it's 2.30 a.m. or so, and it's my favorite time to do laundry. There's a 24-7 auto electric laundry mat right next to my apartment. While there's employees there during the business hours, there's roughly an eight hour stretch where I'm the only one who will be in the building. I occasionally see an old timer around 4.30, 5 a.m but usually only on Sundays, which I avoid. It's literally a half mile from my place. I zip down there. 
It's a cold night, well below freezing. I toss in my clothes, soap, and swipe my laundry card on my way to grab gas, milk, deposit at the bank, and back to my apartment to bring some things inside from my car. I do some dishes and I decide to head back down. I'm usually playing video games while running laundry or just procrastinate. My stuff will sit there for an hour sometimes. There's no one there to say hey, but not this time. It was just shy of 3 a.m. and I get a notification that my laundry is done on my phone and I'm seconds from the laundromat parking lot. I pull in and scan the parking lot. No one's here. I proceed to walk to the front door and immediately notice someone came into the building from the far side door. A guy maybe six feet with two hoodies on, both hoods up, most of his face concealed. It's unlocked and often used when the place is busy, but there was no car there. There's a bathroom in the place. As I walk to the machines, which is about dead center in the building, I thought this person had quickly bolted back outside. Then I nosed him again. I think he had ducked still just by the door. Mind you, we had two islands of laundry machines between us. He starts up near the wall, which is on my left. I'm watching him at this point. I was hoping he just needed to use the bathroom, but he hurried past it. Not a run, but a very quick walk. Now he's on the opposite side, nearer corner of the laundry machine strip, maybe 15 feet away and just out of my line of sight for a moment. I didn't want to trigger this guy or appear scared, so I continue shoveling my wet clothes into the laundry cart. The adrenaline begins trickling, hairs on the back of my neck goes up. Before rounding the corner and crossing back into my vision, he had hesitated. I eventually turned my head to rotate back and he kind of popped into the picture. He glanced over and we made eye contact as I reached into my coat pocket to fist my keys. He continues up the aisle and makes a left out the side door. I have a little blade on my keys so I popped it open and proceeded to toss my shit into the dryer while scanning my surroundings the entire time. Eventually the time came to go outside. The front doors are automatic, so I had both hands free. I literally walked out of the place, wielding a knife, shaking with adrenaline, but it was a ghost town. I proceeded to my car, went home, drove my wife into work, and I waited until 6 a.m. to grab my clothes. My conclusion is that I'm nearly positive that this person scoped out the laundromat. My machine, all of them, have digital timers for current wash, this guy entered the building within a minute of them going off and me pulling into the lot at 3 a.m. at night when it's 20 degrees outside. Coincidence? Maybe. But I was scared either way. Okay, for starters, this happened in July of this year and it still freaks me out. I was 23 when this happened. It was a hot afternoon and I was going home from my boyfriend's house, who lives about a 15 to 20 minute walk from my home. Since it was scorching heat, I was wearing my bike shorts and an oversized tee with sneakers. As I'm getting about 10 minutes away from my home, I put my headphones on and decide not to rush as I didn't want to get there just yet because I was enjoying the fresh air. As I'm going across the street, a man in a truck who was also across the street began catcalling me. I ignored him and waited for the light to change. As I waited, he began getting increasingly more aggressive and overall just wouldn't shut up. The light changes and I make my way across the street. He then proceeds to honk his horn as I'm walking by and says, Hey, I'm talking to you. Why don't you come with me for the night? I'll treat you real good. I immediately told him to leave me alone and continued on my way, but as I'm walking, he follows me with his truck and keeps trying to get me to go with him. I call my boyfriend and tell him the situation, and he FaceTimes me to see the car and the person who was following me. He then tells me to go into the store and stay there. I do as he said, and not even two minutes later after I walk in, the man walks in. He was looking for me. He spots me and I immediately go to the person behind the counter and tell her the situation. She offers to let me go in the back to call the police. I told her yes and waited. 
He walks up to the front of the store and asks the lady if she's seen anyone with my description. She immediately says no, and if he's not going to buy anything, to please leave, as she had other customers. He begins huffing and puffing, saying that he knows that he saw me, and once again she says to leave, and that if he doesn't, she will call the police. That got him, and he left. About five minutes later, my boyfriend arrives and tells me he's going to take me home, as he feels it's safer. I didn't argue and we leave the store. As we walk out, the man is right there. He looks at us and said, Oh, so you're going to tease me with a boyfriend? Typical. My boyfriend immediately goes into protective mode and gets in the man's face and tells him, If I ever see you again, if you ever breathe in our direction again, you'll regret it. He then proceeds to punch the man in the groin and walks me back to my house. Sometimes I really hate being a woman. Several years ago, I walked a handful of blocks up the street from my partner's house to a convenience store to buy something to drink. It was around 11 p.m. and I was trying to slide in there before the store closed. To set the scene, he lived in a transitory neighborhood that was chock full of abandoned houses and crime, with a few occupied residents and businesses scattered around. There were zero streetlights for illumination. Looking back, the nighttime excursion to the store from my place to his was absolutely idiotic on my part. But after living in that environment for years, you just became accustomed to it. Anyway, it was one of my many foolhardy nighttime store trips. My partner by then would ask me not to do it, but I just ignored that. I wanted my drink. So dumb of me. I got a few blocks up the street in the usual darkness got my drink and left the store to head back. Outside the store, a guy was standing near a trash can and hissing everyone who came out, asking for money, cigarettes, etc. I told him I don't have anything and started to cross the parking lot and head back, but this guy sprang after me like a freaking rabbit and grabbed a hold of my arm. He started aggressively demanding that I go to a party with him and trying to steer me down the pitch black side street just beside the convenience store. He was probably 6'7", crazy tall and super thin, with dreads all over his face, making it hard for me to see what he looked like. His fingers bit into my arm, and it felt like it was pinching a nerve. My heart was pounding like crazy right now. I was used to brushing off this type of behavior, having lived in this neighborhood for several years by then but this was way more aggressive than anything I've faced so far. I shook my arm out of his grasp, told him that I was heading to my boyfriend's place, and it was only a few blocks down the street, and that he was waiting for me. I said sorry in an attempt to placate him and took off speed walking down the street at top speed. He called after me several times, and then I heard quick footsteps as he decided to follow me down the street. By then, I could feel my heartbeat in my eyeballs, my mouth had gone cotton dry and I was almost hyperventilating with fear, trying to stay quiet so this asshole wouldn't hear me. I had this feeling that if I showed fear or looked back at him, it would cause him to react violently right away, so I just put on a burst of speed and tried to outwalk him. However, my 5 foot 5 legs were no match to his crazy long stride and I could hear little pieces of rock and concrete crunching under his feet as he closed in on me. I literally felt like my heart was going to leap out of my chest and explode from fear. I tried walking even faster, but I could hear the guy right behind me. I could hear his breath in my ear as I got this overwhelming feeling that he was going to grab me any second, maybe with a weapon, and try to force me to walk wherever he wanted me to. The neighborhood is pitch black so there's no real traffic, not at night. If he wanted to force me to go with him, I'd be powerless safe from trying to run from him, but with his height advantage, I knew he would catch up fast. Then I could finally see my boyfriend's driveway and him standing on the end of it, waiting for me. He had a terrible feeling and already worried constantly about me walking at night, so he went outside to wait for me. I saw that he had a crowbar in one of his hand, his usual defense weapon. He kept it near his front door. And then my nerve broke and I started sprinting towards him. The tall dude behind me started to run after me. 
I reached the place where my boyfriend stood and squeaked out, Help! Or something like that. I dove behind him and cowered, waiting for the tall dude to pull a gun and shoot us both or start struggling with my boyfriend. It didn't happen. He gets right up in my boyfriend's face, standing way too close to him, and asks him for a light. My boyfriend gives him one, holding the crowbar aloft in the other hand so that it was very visible. Then I grab a hold of him and yank him into the house, locking the door and absolutely losing it, sobbing and freaking out while trying to choke out what happened. My boyfriend goes looking from the window and sees him kind of standing around and then leaving. He saw him here and there for months afterwards, up at the store or walking down the street. Unsurprisingly, I'm sure, I never took another nighttime walk and I still have nightmares about it. Several years ago, I was in the midst of an acrimonious divorce with my then husband. Full of crazy allegations and typical angry filing centered around custody of our child. As with many divorces, friends and professional colleagues seemed to pick one side or the other. In my case, there was one sort of professional contact who reached out after hearing about the divorce, who offered to be a witness for my case because some of the experiences he related that I had been previously unaware of regarding my ex-behavior out at networking events. After the initial call, he started calling me semi-regularly, just making sure I was okay. This wasn't someone I knew well prior to the separation, and he was much older than I was, but claimed to have experience with divorce and custody. So I figured it was a good idea to be polite and not alienate him since his testimony was important per my lawyer. I kept things friendly, but I always had a weird feeling about him. After a few months, he called one day that my son was very sick, and when I told him I couldn't talk and explained why, he offered to run to the store for me, which I honestly appreciated. But after that, he was dropping by the house uninvited, or he would stop by with cookies for my son, etc. Again, I kept telling myself to keep things polite. The divorce was coming soon. Don't make this guy mad. He had called me out of the blue, and I was worried at that point that I was walking a very fine line, being polite, but clearly not interested. And if he got mad, he might decide to testify for my ex and say who knows what. During this time, he had also helped me set up my security cam my dad had mailed to me. And at one point, I needed someone to walk my dog and he had offered to do it for me. He used and returned a spare key the same day. One evening, he showed up while I was painting and assisted sticking around to help. Just after that painting day, he came around uninvited and unannounced with magazine photos of decor and started carrying on in this manic way about how we needed to finish decorating the house. I was so weirded out that I made an excuse to leave. I started ignoring his calls and took my son and dog to stay with my parents for several weeks to avoid the drop-ins. I only came home for the custody exchanges. I came home a few weeks later thinking he would have gotten the hint and it was a quiet day. The following morning I took my son out to the zoo and we both came back hot and tired. I put my kiddo down for a nap in my bed and decided to close my eyes with him. I woke up maybe an hour or so later and it took me a moment to realize something was off. As I'm blinking off the sleep, I realized there was a rose bush sitting on the bedside table that I most definitely did not put there. There was a post-it note on it, something about planting in my yard. I started shaking immediately because I recognized the handwriting and stood up and splashed some water in my face and decided whether to call my parents or the police. I didn't want any trouble because of the divorce. As I stepped into my bathroom, I realized the mirror was covered in post-it notes, all with super creepy messages that were intended as love notes, but which all scared me. I was still waking up and trying to figure out how these notes could possibly have gotten there. My front door was definitely locked, but as soon as I went room for room, there were notes everywhere. I mean hundreds of post-it notes covering the walls, in my cabinets, there was even one inside of my coffee maker. I started grabbing all of them and putting them into a pile. When I got one from the kitchen that made my blood run cold, it said, You're cute when you think no one is watching you. 
and I realized there's a security camera pointed right where the note was left, the one he had helped me set up months earlier, when I didn't think he was a psychopath. I called my parents in hysterics, sent a bunch of photos, and my dad insisted that I should not call the police, remember the custody battle, but that he would drive over, change the locks, and put a chain on the door. We also immediately changed the password on the security cameras, which had initially been installed to document if my ex tried to break into the house. So there's one on the front porch, but three inside the house, including my bedroom. This man was apparently hearing everything going on inside my house for months. The security cameras, I realized that he was just paying attention to my passwords when he was setting up the system, but the only way I figured he got into my house was that he must have made a copy of the key the day he had it. And because my dog had gotten to know him, he wouldn't have barked to warn me, which also scared me. I'm absolutely horrified. This man must have been in my house for a long time. There's no way he could have put that many notes up that quickly. And he was right next to my face and feet away from my son while we were sleeping. And somehow thought that was okay. I left and stayed with my parents for a few days, afraid of what he was going to do when he realized that he was now both physically and digitally locked out of my house. When I came home, my son had to go to his dad's for the night, and I was home alone. I was on the phone with another friend from out of town. About 10 p.m., the man showed up at my door, pounding on it, trying the locks, screaming obscenities, and demanding to be let into his house. Gone were all the niceties. This was someone completely furious and derailed. All I could do was hide in my bedroom until he left. It felt like hours. This was St. Patrick's Day, so I'm sure he had been drinking. After that, there were several other times that someone would start knocking at my door in the middle of the night, always when my son wasn't home. I think he was crazy, but not that crazy, and figured out if I called the police, he'd get in more trouble if my son was there, but he knew the schedule, so I know it was him. He tried reaching out using fake social media accounts several times, always getting blocked, Years later, I discovered he friended my mom on Facebook and was, therefore, still able to see photos of us that she posted or shared. And there was a huge argument when I saw a conversation they were having about me and how he could get back into my life. I sold that house two years later, still finding new notes as I was packing, and I'm more than relieved that he no longer knows where I live. I don't post pictures of my new house online, not the front anyway and I've changed the privacy setting on all my social media accounts. I avoid all the places I used to go, the networking events he attends, and I stay under the radar as much as possible. I can never bring myself to play back the security camera video because I was traumatized enough and didn't want to see how much danger we could have been in. Hopefully he never sees this post, but you know who you are. I hope we never cross paths again. Okay, to start, at the time I was 19 years old. I'm a female. I was working an early morning job at Safeway. I would leave the house around 5.30 every morning. It was during the winter, so I would often wear a blanket to my car and sit in it for a while while it warmed up. So one day my mom stopped by and parked in front of this man's apartment, which happened to overlook where my car is parked. He got super upset she wasn't in a spot and that was the first time I ever noticed him. He looked about 70 and had a gray beard, was pretty tall and white as well. Anyway, she ended up moving her car and nothing else happened that day. But I think that's the day he noticed me and my roommate, who was also 19 and female. The two of us lived there and though I've always been borderline paranoid, I always stayed aware of my surroundings. Soon after the encounter, I noticed when I would go to work, I had to pass near his apartment. His light would suddenly be on every morning at 5.30 a.m. when I would leave. I didn't think much of it and continued on, though I started to notice once I'd get into my car, he would be outside walking around and pass my car, which I definitely flagged as weird. This continued for a few weeks, but soon enough I noticed his lights would be on and his blinds would be all the way open. Very weird considering it was still dark, 5.30am, and he didn't do this prior. Anyway, I stayed alert and started waking up my roommate when I left just in case something weird happened. 
Side note, at this time, my roommate had a car that wouldn't lock. We didn't live in the best area, so she didn't keep any valuables in her car. Just random stuff, including a high school picture. One day, someone broke into her car and didn't do anything, but left her picture on the seat facing upwards. We always found that weird and didn't know who did it. Fast forward. One day, I was super paranoid at this point. I was convinced he was going to approach me or do something weird. It was a gut feeling. I was walking to my car. I had my back face towards his window in order to get to my car. I was talking to myself, saying nothing's going to happen. You're safe, etc. Then my brain told me I needed to turn around. So I did. He was at his window, blinds wide open, staring at me. When he noticed that I turned around, he moved out of sight super fast. I got freaked out and got into my car and locked it. I then called my roommate to tell her what just happened and tried to leave as fast as possible. While I was getting situated, he was walking behind my car and I was trying to stay calm. I ended up leaving and I don't know where he went. After this encounter, I changed my shifts to afternoon due to safety and me and my roommate decided to move. Never had anything happen since. Anyways, always creeped me out and I wonder what would have happened if I kept working mornings or stayed in that apartment. This is not my story, it's my aunt's but still scary as fuck. This all started in fall of 1998. I don't remember much as I was 8 but I do know what my aunt told me and now that it's been so long it's probably safe to tell. She and my now ex-uncle lived in a small one-bedroom apartment in a fairly nicer area of town. There was definitely some more crime-ridden areas not far away, but their complex was gated and you needed a code to get in. Anyway, around early October, quite a few people, including my aunt, started reporting seeing a suspicious man around the complex. He was caught looking in the windows of people's apartments and their cars, as well as storage areas. Management was able to confirm that he didn't live there. This all happened until around Halloween when things really went off the rails. According to my uncle, he caught the man snooping around my aunt's car and decided to confront him. The man ran away. Again, this is hearsay from my uncle. When he ran, he dropped a bag that my uncle brought to their apartment. He wouldn't let my aunt open it and claimed he was going to turn it into the police which we thought he had, as one day, there is no longer a bag. Months go by and this man is still creeping around, but only near my aunt and uncle's apartment, cars, and storage area, but nowhere else. My aunt had called the police many times, and by the time they would show up, the man was always gone. It's now January 1999. Here's the part I remember as I was at my nana's when it happened. My aunt called my grandpa in hysterics. She caught the man with his face pressed up against the glass of her bedroom window watching her while my uncle was on a work trip. When he realized that he was caught, he tried to break open the window and get inside. My grandpa grabbed his 45 and headed out to the car with my nana and I following him all the way begging him to let the cops handle it and if he's going to go anyways to leave the gun at home. Well, he didn't. It took quite a few hours for my grandpa to finally return home. But when he did, this is what he told us. This man was in the apartment complex dealing drugs. My uncle stole his supply and refused to give it back to him or pay him for it. We later found this out because he was using it himself as well as selling it. So he was planning to kidnap my aunt, among other things, to get his money. I like to say that this thing made her divorce him, but unfortunately she stayed married to him for 10 more years after this. Last week, this man approached me on my way to work. I work in a big facility, so it's not strange that I didn't know him. He started by complimenting me, but in a way that made me feel really uncomfortable. He was telling me things like how I smoke good, and I'm so beautiful, and he watches me all the time. He said he wishes he could see me more often, and wants to get to know me. To which I replied that I have a boyfriend and I'm not interested. He laughed at me and said, 
that my boyfriend doesn't have to know and that he wants to take me to dinner. He then asked for my number, followed me right to my car by this point. There was no one else around and I started to feel scared as I have some trauma centered around men and telling them no. I just wanted to get away, so I unfortunately gave him the number. I didn't give him a fake number because he handed me the phone in the call screen and had me type my number so he could call and I was scared that he would test it. I had a panic attack in my car before I went home and hoped that that would be the end of it and that I would just block the number. All weekend he didn't text, but I got a call from the same number three times. I don't know if it was him as he didn't give me his number. When I walked into work this morning, he appeared out of nowhere and started talking to me like we had a secret relationship or something. I don't know how he found out what time I start because I've never seen him when I've come in before. I don't think I can report it to HR because I'm stupid and haven't been able to actually tell him that he's making me uncomfortable. I don't know if this will persist, but I'm scared leaving work alone now. I'm a 21 year old female. One Saturday morning, I decided to go to my local Goodwill. I am disabled and suffer from chronic pain. I use a cane on my good days and a wheelchair on my bad days. Luckily for me, this was a good day. I parked out front and got out of my car and immediately noticed a man sitting in the far corner in front of the Goodwill. As I was walking into the Goodwill, he shouted, Miss, do you have any extra time for me today? I had never seen this man in my life and didn't really want to engage with him, so I politely said, No sir, not today, I'm sorry, and continued walking. He shouted something else at me, but I couldn't make out what he said and was afraid if I stopped and asked, then he would try to engage me in a conversation. I ignored him and continued walking. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw him begin to stand up. I walked faster and entered the Goodwill. Thinking I was in the clear, I began walking around the front of the store, just looking at some items. My heart dropped when I glanced through the front window and saw him walking briskly towards the entrance. I immediately thought he might be following me, this happened to me before at Goodwills. Every time, I wound up in uncomfortable conversations where I had to continuously decline the advances of men that I was not really interested in. It's got to the point where I wear a fake ring when I go out so I can say that I'm married because sometimes they accept that answer better than simply saying that I'm not interested. In that moment, the disability left my body because I picked up my cane and booked it to the nearby rack of ball gowns and hid behind them. Through the gaps, I observed him storming around the store and start to look through the aisles. I was scared because he looked angry, maybe because I ignored him. I didn't want to be rude, but I thought I made it clear in a polite way that I didn't want to speak to him. I don't think that's wrong of me to want to go thrifting without having to engage with the random men. A kind woman nearby came up to the ball gowns where I was hiding and pretended to inspect them. She whispered, Are you okay? I said, I think that man in the blue is looking for me. She said she thought so as well. I asked her if any of the nearby dressing rooms were open. She pointed to the one that was open and when I saw the man with his back turned, I dove underneath the door and locked it behind me. I called my boyfriend from the dressing room in tears and asked him to come to the store. Soon I heard a knock on the door. The kind woman had gotten her manager. She told me that the man had looked through all the aisles. He walked out, grabbing his bag, and left the area. They closed the dressing room I was in and let me hide until my boyfriend arrived. Then, one of the male employees and my boyfriend walked me to my car. That was the end of it. Nothing really dramatic happened, and since we were in public, I don't think my life was in danger, but it was an unsettling experience. I hate to think of the possible confrontation we might have had if he had found me. And I'm just so thankful for the Goodwill employees and the kind woman who helped me out that day. So I live in a pretty sketchy area where there's a shit ton of homeless people. Some shootings have happened and there's been times where people have gotten kidnapped. I can't deny I'm a pretty attractive girl. I'm 17 and around 5'4". I do appear a bit older to some people 
especially because I have tattoos and whatnot. The point is, men tend to approach me a lot, especially older men. I'm sort of used to them staring and catcalling me, but I've never had anyone follow me before. On the weekend, I decided I wanted an Arizona iced tea and some snacks, so I asked my mom if I could walk to the liquor store. It's about a five minute walk, so it wasn't far at all, but there's a lot of homeless people and prostitutes who just hang around the path, so obviously you're going to be a bit on edge. I have three sharp knives that I always carry on me just in case anything happens whenever I'm out. Nothing usually happens. I've walked to the store a handful of times, so I was pretty comfortable, especially since I had my pocket knives. I got onto the sidewalk and made eye contact with two men who were kind of eyeing me. It threw me off immediately, but I just kept walking. The parking lot was kind of full, so I felt kind of relieved. I eventually got inside and got my snacks and I noticed one of the guys had come into the store right after I entered. I didn't notice this until I realized he was following me through the aisles and I instantly felt my heart drop. I seen him hovering over items as if he was looking at them but he just didn't want to come off as suspicious to anyone. Since there's five other people in there, I get in line and he's right behind me. At this point I'm shaking and my mind is racing. I paid for my snacks and I started walking towards the door, but my gut knew something was wrong. Like really, really wrong. I'm very intuitive and sensitive to energy, so I felt this times 1000. I instantly turned last minute and started looking at gift cards right by the door while the guy walked outside so I assume he left. I called my mom and explained what happened and she came to pick me up in her car. She got there and I walked outside, but I didn't realize the dude was waiting there for me. He purposely stood on the left side of the door so I couldn't see him anymore. I got in the car and my heart dropped when I noticed the whole parking lot was empty, and there were the two men waiting for me. He walked up to his friend and started saying something in his ear, and then they both just stared at me for a while while we drove off. This shit scared me to my core. It's happened to me a couple more times, but this is the only time that there are two people instead of one. This happened a few years ago. My friend, 19 female, and I, 18 female, were at our local convenience store. We both had guys we were seeing at the time, and we both needed condoms, so we bought two boxes and paid together. The cashier was normal, but the guy behind us kind of smiled and laughed at us. He was probably about 30. We left and didn't think anything of it. We got in my car and I drove a town over, about a 10 mile drive. We used to drive around aimlessly for something to do, listen to music, you know. We got to this next town and pulled up to a red light. Suddenly we realized that the guy next to us was trying to get our attention. I rolled my window down. It was a guy that had been behind us at the store. He said something like, What? I'm not invited to the party? And laughed. My friend and I looked at each other and were basically like, what the fuck? We drove away as soon as the light changed. That was the end of it. It was a long way to go to make a bad joke and make some teen girls feel uncomfortable. So I'll admit, this is pretty mild compared to other stories here, but it was creepy enough to make me nervous. I was walking to work this morning, and I passed by a park where a few homeless people tend to conjugate. As I'm walking, I hear, Hey. I glance over to my right, and there's two guys sitting on the picnic table, maybe 50 feet away, and a few other people milling around a little further away. I wasn't sure who the hay was directed towards, so I kept walking. Then I hear, hey shorty, I ignore it. Then it was, hey shorty, come here. I called back, I gotta go to work, an excuse that happened to be true. I didn't think much of it until I got a block past the park when I heard faint voices behind me. I looked and two guys were walking behind me. I assumed the same two guys since there's no one behind me previously. It didn't seem like they were trying to catch up with me, but I picked up the pace and crossed the street to a gas station. I wandered a bit through the store and picked up a few things for lunch, then went in a line to go pay. Just then, the two disheveled guys walked through the door, 
saw me and they were eyeballing me so hard and kind of whispering to each other. This is when the nurse really started screaming because I immediately knew that these were the guys from the park and they were both big guys. Not fat, but very tall and husky. I'm 5'2 and they were easily 6'2 or 6'3. I check out and went over to the door and on my phone acting like I was waiting for a ride or something. But really, I was watching them and waiting for an opportunity to leave safely. I kind of half-heartedly browse around, not actually picking anything up. And the second they were out of sight, behind a shelf, I booked it out of the store. I immediately got out of sight of the store windows, weaved between a few buildings and crossed a couple streets so I was a few blocks away pretty quickly. This way, they wouldn't be able to look down the main street to see where I had gone. I was about a half a mile before I got to work and I made it without incident. And I made it without incident. Could have been nothing. They might have been planning to go to the gas station anyway. But my gut is telling me otherwise. I think I was somewhere between 10 and 12 when this happened, but I remember it pretty well. I was a very adventurous kid, still am now. I was always outside, wasn't at the house too much, especially around this time as my parents were going through a divorce and everything was about them and as children were somewhat neglected. We lived in a really nice little suburban neighborhood that had a lot of trees and curvy hilly windy blocks that was quite a lot of square mileage. Basically, we had a lot of space to explore. I was with four friends during the summer. It was the middle of the day and we were walking back to someone's house after playing baseball or something. Two of us had scooters and went ahead a little ways with the other two trailing behind walking. At one point, our scooter friend gets to the end of the block and turns around to wait for the slow pokes just walking. And I remember getting a strange feeling, but at the time, I didn't really know up from down, so I barely recognized it. They're both looking back at us kind of concerned, which I think triggered that feeling. One of them shouts, Guys, run! I look at my friend like, why would they want us to run right now? He says it again with more force and gave me a sight fright. Run! Alright, we start running full speed towards them. Really wasn't that far away, maybe 100 feet, and stopped when we got to them. Why did you tell us to run? A car drove by us slower than normal with purple tinted windows and turned around the corner and disappeared. Apparently the car had slowed down and was pulling over. Someone had opened the door and it seemed to my friends that they were getting ready to grab us. I don't remember seeing that part happen, but I do remember a very eerie vibe of the car, so I'm fairly certain that it did. I thought I remembered the same car parked in a nearby driveway, like it lived there and it was there a lot, but I was never sure if it was that exact car or not. Anyways, there's my creepy story. So this happened almost 20 years ago when I was a young 15 year old girl. I had an older neighbor who taught the drums and was friendly with my family. I would take drum lessons from him once a week. He only lived like a half block down, so I'd always walk, and his family lived at the end of the cul-de-sac. Well, one summery day when I was walking home, at like 4 p.m., broad daylight in a quiet neighborhood, there was a strange man standing across the end of the cul-de-sac. He had on a big cowboy hat, odd for the area, and some facial hair. I don't know, he was maybe in his 30s, and he was just staring at me. He was watching me as I walked down the cul-de-sac and crossed the street, and once my back was to him, I could hear him following me. My heart sped up. My drumsticks seemed like weak protection, and I was wearing thin little flip-flops. I remember thinking if I had to kick him, they weren't going to help me at all. Less than a half block away from me was a more busy street, and I remember thinking if I could just get to that street where people would see, he'd be sure to back off. But his steps sounded closer and I could taste the panic knowing I wasn't going to make it. I ended up running to a house where I kind of knew the family and I knew the mom with young kids was probably there. I pounded on her door, tried to open it myself in panic. She opened it and I spilled into her house and locked the door, told her what was happening 
and let my heart calm down a bit. After being in her house for 15 minutes, I asked if I could hop her back fence to go home since it would cut a block out of travel. But when we slid back the drapes of her back door, the dude was leaning up against the fence, right against her house, where he could see both the front door and the back door. She ended up loading her kids into the car and driving me home, and later had her husband ask around. Turned out the dude was living with his mother and had just gotten out of jail. Not sure what the charges were. All I know was my stomach had been twisted into knots, and it's the first time I tasted fear like that. I don't know what would have happened if he caught up to me. I'm scared and trying to calm down by writing this. At 6.30 this morning, I went to walk one of my dogs. I live in an apartment that resembles a townhome and I live on the ground floor. As I'm walking my dog, I pass by a row of cars and all of a sudden my dog stops and starts huffing and puffing at this one truck. No one was in the truck, so I thought it must have been a squirrel underneath it or something. When all of a sudden my dog's attention changes and there's a man that pops up from underneath or behind the truck, I couldn't tell. I immediately turn around and start speed walking back to my apartment. I wasn't wanting to overreact because hey, it might be his truck and maybe he's doing something to it. But then my dog keeps huffing and puffing behind me and when I turn around, I can see the man clenching something in his right hand and barreling towards me. I immediately take off in a sprint towards my apartment and make it back safely. I immediately woke up my boyfriend and within the 30 seconds it took him to go outside, the guy was gone. I'm a 23 year old female and when this happened I was 21 and with three of my best friends. It was supposed to be a fun trip with friends, a chance to explore new places, take in the scenery, and make some great memories. But as we drove through a remote stretch of highway, I couldn't shake this feeling that we were being followed. At first, I thought it was just my imagination, but as we continued down the road, the same car stayed behind us, always at a distance, never passing us. It was a dark sedan with tinted windows, and I couldn't make out the driver or any passengers. I tried to stay calm and reassure myself that it was just a coincidence, but my nerves were on edge. We eventually stopped for gas and snacks, and as we pulled back onto the road, the car was still behind us. Now I knew something was up. I mentioned it to my friends, but they brushed it off and said I was just being paranoid. As the miles passed, I grew more and more convinced that we were in danger. The car was still behind us and I couldn't shake the feeling that whoever was inside was watching us waiting for an opportunity to strike. Finally, I had the chance to take some action. I pulled off the road into this crowded parking lot hoping the other car would just drive past. But my fears came true as it pulled in behind us. I knew we had to do something quickly so I raced through the parking lot, probably going faster than I should, and quickly turned the car around and headed back up the way we came. The other car followed us for a while but eventually turned off to the side of the road and disappeared from sight. We were all shaken by this experience and ended up taking a different route to our destination. I don't know what the other car's intentions were but I'm grateful that we were able to avoid any kind of confrontation. From now on, I'll be much more careful about who's following us on the road. I'm an 18 year old female. It was a beautiful day outside and I decided to take a walk to the park to clear my head. As I walked down the trail, I noticed someone else was on the path behind me. At first I didn't think much of it, assuming it was just another person enjoying the park. But as I continued to walk, I realized that the same person was still behind me and didn't appear to be stopping or changing direction. I tried to shake off the uneasy feeling and continued my walk but the person's president continued to make me feel uncomfortable. I turned the corner and waited for a moment to see if they would continue to follow me, and sure enough, they did. As I walked faster, so did the other person. I could hear the footsteps getting closer and closer, and my heart started to race. I don't know what I was thinking, but I decided to turn around and confront them. 
but as soon as I did, they turned and ran away. I felt relieved that the person had left me alone, but also frightened by the experience. I wonder if they had been following me for a malicious intent, or if it was just a strange coincidence. I quickly made my way back home, making sure to look over my shoulder frequently. This experience left me feeling uneasy and aware of my surroundings whenever I went for a walk alone. I made a mental note to be more aware of my surroundings and to always trust my instincts when it comes to my personal safety. I was in the mall shopping for some new clothes when I noticed a man following me from store to store. At first, I thought he might just be browsing the same stores that I was, but as I made my way through the mall, I could tell that he was getting closer and closer. I tried to lose him by turning into different aisles and going to different stores, but he always seemed to be a few steps behind me. I started to feel uneasy and my heart began to race as I realized I was being followed. Every time I would turn around, he would dart off to a different area in the opposite direction, making me even more suspicious. I immediately went to mall security and explained the situation to them. They took me seriously and sprung into action. They patrolled the mall trying to find the man who had been following me. After a few hours, I was contacted and they identified the man and detained him for questioning. It turns out that he had been following me for quite a while and had a history of stalking and harassment. I was so grateful that the mall security took me serious and were quick to respond. This experience has left me shaken, but I know I had done the right thing by speaking up and seeking help. I have not been back to the mall since. I've got a pretty creepy story for you. It was so bad, I ended up leaving my job for another shortly after this happened. Trigger warning, underage person being harassed, sexual comments, harassment. I don't go into detail and hopefully I cover everything. Now that we got that out of the way, let's move on to the information. Like the title states, I was 16 when this happened. I was also working at a place where dreams go to die, Walmart. I absolutely hated working there, but thankfully, this encounter was a straw that broke the camel's back. Now, another thing I should mention, I look a few years younger than I actually am. I have a baby face, so even though I was 16, I looked about 13. It was during the day when this incident happened. It was a pretty slow day. I had spent most of my shift wandering around, helping where I could, as I was already done with everything in my department. I was in the middle, heading back to my area, when a man approached me. He was a bit of a creepy dude, but I didn't want to be rude by not helping him, even though everything in me was telling me to walk away. Anyway, creepy guy was asking me to help find a gift for his niece. I asked him if he had any ideas what he wanted to get his niece. He said he wasn't sure, so I took him to the kids section so he could choose something. While he was browsing, he started asking me for my name, if I lived in the city, how old I was, those sorts of things. I obviously wasn't overly keen on providing this information, so I was pretty vague when answering. Other times, I completely avoided the question altogether and redirected the conversation to his niece. It was evident that he wasn't really interested in discussing his niece as he provided one-word answers and went right back to his intrusive questioning. He started asking me more personal stuff, like if I had a boyfriend, if I had sex before, etc. Now, I was horrible at communication when someone crossed the boundaries. I hated confrontation and my managers sucked donkey nuts. They would give me hell for the stupidest shit which made me really anxious whenever I had to talk to them. As a result, I did everything I could possibly do to avoid talking with them. Anyway, I asked him if there was anything else he needed. I just wanted to hurry and end this whole interaction, but of course, he told me he needed a card and a bag to put the gift in. I directed him to the card section. All the while, he upped the creep factor and began asking me extremely personal questions. He also was now giving me compliments. He'd tell me how beautiful I was, how I had such a great looking ass. Keep in mind, I don't look a day over 13, and yet, 
that didn't seem to stop this creep from making these crude remarks. While he picked out a card and bag, I kept my distance, but I remember he kept giving me the best I can equate to his bedroom eyes. It made me sick to my stomach, but I figured he would eventually get everything he needed and he would be on his merry way. He eventually got his card and bag and asked me to lead him to the till since he didn't know where they were. Obviously he did, but I just sucked it up and directed him to the checkouts. When we got within walking distance of the till, I politely excused myself and felt relieved that I finally got rid of him. Unfortunately, he ran ahead of me and asked me for my number even going as far as making this horrible comment. I like my girls nice and young. They can just keep going and going. You and I will have lots of fun. Not the exact word for word, he said. Nobody needs to hear the real thing. That made my skin absolutely crawl. I told him I didn't have a phone. I did, of course, and it was sitting in my vest pocket. He thankfully didn't seem to notice, but I was beyond paranoid that he would spot the phone and call me out on my lies. Despite being repeatedly told that I, in fact, did not have a phone, he kept insisting that I give him my number or my social media where he could contact me. It got to the point where I was backing away from him because he would get so close to me, I could smell his breath. Unsurprisingly, he didn't take this hint and kept inching towards me. Want to know the real punch in the gut? I had a couple of my managers walk past. They definitely saw the guy harassing an underage employee and they did fuck all to help. I was getting desperate. No one was coming to my aid, which made me feel hopeless on top of it. I thought I'd never get rid of this guy. My saving grace was when my manager was walking through the front door right before the creep got handsy with me. My manager was my absolute favorite person. He was pretty intimidating, used to serve in the military. He was also a pretty big fella, pretty muscular, and could probably break me into half with one hand, but he was a gentle giant. Whenever customers got rowdy with employees, he'd intervene. It was always hilarious to see people who were red in the face deflate the moment they saw him approaching. I spotted my manager and gave him a look of desperation when he glanced over at me. I can't tell you how relieved I felt when I saw him make a beeline for us. He placed himself between me and the creepy dude and slapped on his customer service smile. He asked if he could assist the creep since I was supposed to be on my break. I happily took the hint and practically ran to the back of the store. I went to the staff room and was shaking from the adrenaline and was on the verge of crying. I was in the staff room for about 20 minutes before my manager called me to his office. He asked if I was okay. I said I was shaken up, but fine. He assured me he'd have me working in the back for the next week just to ensure that if that creep came back looking for me, he wouldn't be able to find me. He then told me that the guy kept asking where I went, what my number was, what my name was, but my manager told him he couldn't release that information. My manager literally escorted the guy out of the store and watched him drive away before coming back in to talk to me. I never did see that guy again. Then again, I left that previous job shortly after that encounter. I got another offer to work with my best friend at her dad's restaurant after I told her what happened, which I happily took. I admit, I was a little sad to leave, mainly because I really did adore my manager, but my hatred for Walmart and the fear of that dude was ultimately what pushed me to leave. So to the creepy guy who harassed me, let's not meet again. And on the off chance we do, I owe you a punch in the teeth. I'm a 24 year old female. This happened at my previous job and it's a bit long. Howard was the senior in my team. One day during chit chat, he asked me to recommend some colognes to him. As I know a lot about perfumes and fragrances, I recommend some, and then he asked me to help him buy it. I suggested it's better to try it out in person before buying any colognes, but he insisted many times that I buy my recommendations for him, so eventually I did. After I bought it, I whatsapped him the receipt. He texts back, Thanks, I'll treat it as a gift from you, lol. 
He ended up paying me back later, so I just took it as a joke. The manager of my previous team, Alfred, asked me to grab a drink after work another day as he noticed I was frustrated at work lately. He also said I could invite more people if I wanted to. So I invited Kate, my closest friend in the company, who's also on Alfred's team. Kate suggested that we invite one more colleague as she believed it would be better to hang out with a group of four. I think for a bit and invited Howard as he had worked under Alfred before. I told Howard that Alfred wanted to buy us all drinks. I have drinks with Kate and another colleague, Aiden, regularly after work, so that was the first time I hung out with either Alfred or Howard. After the drinks, we decided to take the last scheduled subway home. Only Howard and I lived in the same direction. I knew he lived near stop A from previous chit chat, which is 10 stops before my stop. I live quite far away from the subway station, an hour walking distance, so I planned on taking a taxi after I got off at my stop. After we got on the subway, Howard started to say some things that made me uncomfortable. For instance, he asked when he could become as close to me as Aiden, or whether Aiden had ever been to my apartment. To be honest, I wasn't even that close to Aiden, and we were more like work friends. I was annoyed by all the questions, but I thought to myself, but I thought to myself, it's just a few more stops till his stop. I'd have my peace soon. But Howard didn't get off at his stop. I asked him about it, to which he replied that he had some errands near the next stop tomorrow morning, so he'd be staying at a friend's house. So the next stop comes up. So stop B is just the next stop before my stop. Luckily, Howard shut up, probably because of the lack of my response, and I just looked at my phone in silence. I just noticed Howard was still there when I was about to get off at my stop. He followed me off the subway and offered to take a taxi together. He said that he would drop me off at my place and then go to his friend's place, which would make no sense at all as the two drop-off points are in completely opposite directions at my subway stop. I declined by saying I planned to walk home, he didn't know where I lived. Then he offered to walk me home. I said it's an hour away and persuaded him to just get on the taxi outside my subway stop. He finally budged and called the taxi through the app, which shows the estimated fare. I overheard him murmuring the amount, which was definitely more than just traveling from the subway station to where the other stop was. More like traveling back to his stop that he lives at. I suspected the stay at his friend's house thing because he had an errand in the morning was a lie just to follow me home. A week later, Kay told me that she overheard Howard insinuate to Alfredo that we were in a relationship. I was crept out by Howard but didn't want to bring it up to Alfred as he didn't ask me about it either. A month later, Alfred invited his team and a lot of other people he previously worked with to dinner to celebrate the end of a project. After the meal, Alfred asked me where I was heading to as he knew I have two apartments. Kate and Howard were walking with us. I told Alfred that I'm going back to my apartment in the same direction of Kate's, which was the opposite direction of Howard's. Howard joined in the conversation and said that he's going in the direction too as a friend of his was hosting a party there. Kate and I were pretty doubtful. On the subway, Kate asked him where the party was and Howard said it was at stop C, which is exactly at my stop. So Katie and I pretended we had to go other places to hang out, and I was not getting off at C. Howard got off at stop C eventually, and I rode with Kate to her stop, and then got on another subway back to C. I avoided him as much as possible before I eventually quit. I worked at a corporate headquarters as a receptionist after they announced a very political divisive celebrity as their new face. This was a very unpopular decision with some people and threats were frequently called into headquarters after the ad campaign had rolled out. Around this time, I was closing up my building on their main campus one night alone. It was after dark and I was locking up my desk. For example, the company headquarters is not open to the public, 
but people do not really know this and it's common for people to wander in and ask if there's any points of interest to see because it's an extremely popular brand. Most people coming to the front desk are employees or contractors or have meetings scheduled. There are turnstiles and no one can get past reception without clearance. You have to have a reason to be here. If you're wearing a competitor, you can be asked to leave. A man in a gray jumpsuit walked up to my desk and told me he would like to speak with the CEO. Obviously, he couldn't just walk in and immediately speak to the CEO. I asked him if he had a meeting scheduled with him. He said he didn't, but added that he had some business to settle with him and would like to have a sit down with him and listen to some things he had to say. This obviously set off immediate red flags. I told him that, unfortunately, only his assistant could set up meetings and that I didn't even know if he was in, etc. The CEO wasn't even in my building and the brand has hundreds of receptionists so there was literally nothing I could do. So I just offered every possible excuse and said that I could take his contact info. The man then came behind my desk to swivel my computer screen. I could then see he was clearly armed. He spent a few moments arguing that he knew that I had the CEO's phone number and office location and did not to play dumb. Finally, he leaned over me, told me that he was going to step outside for five minutes, and by the time he came back, it would be wise for me to have the CEO on the phone or in the lobby, or that I better be able to walk him into his office directly. Fortunately, we have those emergency buttons like the banks do. I hit mine, and security was called to my desk. I explained the situation, and they went looking for him. I guess when he saw security come out, he took off running into the parking lot, jumped over the landscaping, and got away. Security escorted me to my car that night. They pulled the CC footage later, and when I saw it, it was so creepy to see his body language and his proximity to me from another perspective. He had his hand placed where his gun was concealed the whole time. Another creepy thing. Even with his threatening language and demeanor, he was smiling and being weirdly flirty in that condescending scary way, like trying to be charming so I wouldn't feel justified escalating things or calling for help maybe. I'm still so unsettled when I think about what could have happened if I made the wrong move during the encounter, or if security wasn't two buildings over on the campus that spans miles. Every single nerve in my body was telling me that I was in danger and him running seems to have confirmed it. About an hour ago, my manager and I were closing shift at a store in a small town in the north off the main road across rented control apartments. I was working at the register as usual and watching people come in around 10 minutes before close, watching who came in so that I could make sure that they left. There was this guy that came in that I randomly hyper fixated on. He walked down the main aisle towards the bathrooms and went out of sight. I don't know why, but I, I wanted to make sure that he left. Customer after customer came and went, but five minutes to closing time, he never left. My manager went to the bathroom, and I stayed by the register until she came out and went to the office. I walked around the first few aisles in the front towards the door and didn't see him. My manager came out and wanted to buy some things right before we were supposed to close. I told her that I saw a guy come in but didn't see him leave. I felt really uncomfortable and disturbed and thought it was just because I had been listening to this insanely creepy podcast, The Black Tapes. But after she checked the whole store and I went around to check with her, we saw that he left a basket. We went into the office after I grabbed my stuff and we checked the cameras several times. We saw him come in, we watched the cameras again, forwards and backwards, every camera outside and inside, right by the exit and incoming door. He never left. We decided to leave after about a half hour and called the general manager. I never saw him leave. The cameras never recorded him leaving. I've been terrified since it just happened.
I apologize if this is long. I just can't stop thinking about how I feel at work since all these things have started happening and I don't know if I'm being too harsh or not as I've experienced something like this before in my life. So my new manager started at my work. He seemed pleasant enough and nice, quite funny, and I get on well with him. But then I started seeing two different sides of him. I noticed he was quite flirty in a joking way with my other colleagues, but I just thought that that was his sense of humor, a bit strange, but nothing I was concerned with. Then as time went on, I noticed he began to get closer to me and started to touch my shoulders or arms for a few seconds while talking to me and showing me things around work. I work at a retail shop. The first times, I thought nothing of it as it wasn't noticeable enough for me to be uncomfortable but I began to notice it was every time he was speaking to me and there's just no need to touch my arms for a few seconds while talking to me about work. It invaded my personal space, but at the time, I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I didn't know him well and I didn't want to make it awkward. But the thing that made it weird to myself was that he would always make it apparent and obvious if he touched me. He would always apologize and say things like, Oh sorry, I know people don't like it and sorry i'm getting close there and just announces the fact he touches me and gets close to me at this point i'm just questioning why he mentions it and brings it up to the surface if he didn't think it was a problem then why would you speak about it at that point i thought it was odd but there was nothing he did that was over the top if you will he had not made any sexual comments or touched parts of my body that was my space only and we had worked alone plenty of times, and he didn't do anything out of the ordinary, just some weird comments about being sorry for touching you. Then my boyfriend told me to watch it because every time I work with him, there's something else that happens where I think, oh no, not again. The more I've worked with him, each time something else happens and it becomes a noticeable pattern, then this happened. My manager and I were looking over the work board talking about the orders for the rest of the week. I said the wrong date accidentally for an order and he looks at me and pauses, laughs, and then wraps his hands around my neck facing me for a few seconds and says, Oh you Mary, what do you like? Then removes his hands from my neck. I laugh it off really awkwardly as I was taken aback that he touched my neck. It was quite a shock so I didn't really process this happening but I have not had anyone touch me like that in my life. This was the first red flag for me, but I still didn't think much of it and just thought it was one of his one-offs. A few weeks later, we're discussing the upstairs of the shop floor when we were alone. He's showing me the days off he has given me. And I say, thank you. That's very nice of you to do. Then he looks at me and says, can I get a cuddle for that? And smiles. We were standing side by side to each other. So I hesitantly say, yeah, sure, because I didn't want to be awkward. After I gave him a side hug, he shakes his head for a few seconds, laughs and says, Oh, not a cuddle. I mean a hug, you know what I meant. And I just continued to laugh awkwardly, as I just don't know what to say. Later, we were discussing work on a different day and looking into the storage box. I again said something wrong about where something was placed, and he pauses and looks at me, laughs, and says, Oh my Mary, you deserve a slap on the bottom for that. I really awkwardly laugh. He looks at me to wait for what I have to say in response, but I didn't say anything as I felt too awkward to say please stop or anything else. I really didn't know what to think. That is all he's done to me personally and the touching my shoulders or arm casually is what he has done multiple times. I've discussed it with my other colleague and she had the same experience with the touching and we both think it's weird. I've also started to notice the comments he makes to customers and he's quite forward and creepy with them. For example, we have some free chocolates on display for customers to have and these were heart-shaped chocolates. My manager is serving someone and says, I'll help yourself to chocolate if you like. I promise I'm not hitting on you, haha. <laughs> I heard that and thought that's such a creepy comment to make and I know if I was the customer, I would not like to be spoken to like that. 
He is also very hot and cold and has been quite rude to me before during work to the point where I had to go upstairs and take five minutes to myself to collect my emotions and not say something I would regret. I won't go into that as it's not particularly relevant, but sometimes he's kind, but other times he can be very short tempered and rude to myself and customers. I'm trying not to overthink this, but lately it's all I'm thinking about as I don't know where the line is or what to say to him. Everyone tells me to report him and say something, but I'm really stuck on what I should do. I have officially confirmed I do feel creeped out by his behaviors and can't ignore how I feel anymore. Any advice, or is this even an issue? Edit, I forgot to add the thing that made me write this post. When we were closing together recently, he started to talk to a young girl and said, she's similar to you. The girl came in inquiring about a job posting. He made a comment saying she's lovely, but then he started talking about what she was wearing and says, she's wearing these jeans that had multiple rips in them. It went all the way up from her feet to her thigh. Oh no, not that I was looking at her legs. I don't mean that. And he would stumble while saying that. That to me was very, very odd, and I was uncomfortable with that comment. I've started writing all the incidents down. Update, I told my area manager this morning. He was incredibly supportive and listened to every word I said. He actually says the dates don't entirely matter. The fact it happened is enough to go grounds on. He's going to give me a call on Monday to discuss further, and he said he's going to tell his hierarchy at HR, and then we'll go from there. I was petrified to say anything, but he reassured me that he was glad I told him, and all of this was inappropriate. He also said I shouldn't have to come to work feeling this way, and he said, as my manager, he should know that this wasn't correct, and it's nothing I should be blamed for. I feel so much better after telling him. I'm just now thinking of the conversation afterwards and all that, which gives me anxiety, but I'm so glad I told someone. I'm a 27 year old female. I used to live in a small town where everyone basically knew everyone and people in the smaller towns in the area. In 2018, after I had lost my job, I was going to a place where 16 to 30 year olds learned how to look and apply for a job and a lot more. There I met a woman who I'll call Y. One day, Y started to talk to me about a friend of hers who lived out of town with her mom, her dog, and her creepy German stepdad. Her friend told her that she desperately wanted to move out because her stepdad makes her so uncomfortable. Her bedroom is right next to their bathroom, so she would usually put her clothes on in the bedroom. But now she does it in the bathroom because he looked at her inappropriately when she walked to her bedroom. According to Y, you could see the bathroom door from the living room. Her stepdad would get off the couch and try to spy on her. I had a gut feeling that this wouldn't be the last time I heard of him, and I'm sad to say that was right. I broke up with my ex in 2019, but shortly after that, I got a job at a thrift store taking care of jigsaw puzzles and board games. 2020 came along, and I became so lonely that I downloaded an app that was aimed for finding friendship. I started talking to this guy in January who said he was 26 or 27 and that he was from Germany and lived in the same exact town that Y said her friend did. I thought it was odd, but out of curiosity, I talked with him some more. He said he had moved to Sweden with his wife and their dog. Insert red flags here, but he's looking for someone to talk to because they're going through a divorce right now. He wanted to meet and perhaps go for a walk in the forest near his house talked about his hobbies. He liked his motorcycle and other things I've forgotten about by now. This is also important. My creep meter was pegging and I ghosted him hard. Eight months later, when I was laying a jigsaw puzzle, I heard a man with a German accent come in. I felt something was off, but I continued to do my job. For obvious reasons, we didn't have a lot of people who worked there at the moment, and this made me the youngest woman there. I was 25 at the time. My male boss was going to do something before he showed him the place. While my boss worked, this guy roamed around and asked if he could sit down and talk to me. 
I said okay, because of course, there could be more than one German person, even in a small community. Remember all the important things. Yes, he told me almost all the same things again. He wasn't the age he said he was. He was as old, if not older than my father, who was 53. The color just appeared in my face and I started to scratch my neck in fear. He started to trauma dump on me. He talked about how he had sex with a young girl in Germany, got her pregnant, and was forced to leave Germany because of this. Apparently, she gave birth to a son, and his son reached out to him when he was older. His son told him that he was gay, and the creep is now blaming himself for making his son gay. He talked about his dad's alcoholism and other things I can't remember now. He also asked if we could eat together, but I declined. HR came into our working room, and she called my name. I turned my head, and she clearly saw that I was afraid. She said she needed to talk to me. I only nodded, stood up, and walked over to her, still scratching my neck. We walked to the other room where I sat down on the sofa, and she asked me if I was okay. All I could say was, I'm afraid of this man. And when I had calmed down, I gave her a short version of what happened, and her eyes widened. It was close to closing time, so she asked if I wanted to go home, and that she would make sure that he left 10 minutes after I had gone home. My apartment was only 5 minutes away. I didn't even look at her once. I was so frozen in fear that I only stared at the wall while continuing to attack my neck. After a few minutes, I only nodded. She walked me to the employee entrance and stood there for a while while I walked home. I saw the damage I had done to myself when I arrived home. My female boss wasn't there until Monday and unfortunately HR wasn't there that day. My boss came over to my desk and said that she had spoken to HR and she wanted to hear it from me. I told her exactly what happened and I also told her that I had heard about him before. Her response was these exact words. I've heard of him before because I have an old friend who unfortunately is in a mental hospital right now. She told me that he is the kind of person who likes to attack young girls, thin, vulnerable, and insecure women. I fit that description. My fear turned into rage. I just looked at her and said, are you crazy? You know what type of man he is. You knew that I'm working here and you still hired him? She said that she had talked with the male boss who also knew about him and they had decided that people can change. I said that I agree, but he has already shown that he's not willing to. She decided to make him work during the weekends and forbid him to come into work during the week when I was there. Of course, he showed up anyways. When HR was there, she would tell him to go out, but when she wasn't, you could clearly tell that he was looking for another victim or for me. My bosses are lovely people, even though they're severely confused. I should have reported them, but it's too late now. I moved to a city that's more than two hours away, and he doesn't work there anymore. Edit. Sorry, I forgot a very, very important fact. The thrift shop I worked at hired people who are in vulnerable situations and are desperate for a job, and they still hired a predator knowing that fact. Hey guys, I was just reminded of this really scary incident involving a manager at one of my old jobs I had. This happened about 5 years ago when I was 20. I believe he was around 42 or so, give or take a few years. To paint you a picture here, the manager in question, who we'll call Tim, was a short Viking-esque guy. Red beard, red hair, bright blue eyes, stocky built, not muscular though. Tim was also a heavy smoker and known racist piece of shit. He dropped the n-word at least four times a week for shock factor during conversation. During conversations, he would also refer to indigenous people as Indians. He stopped when he found out that I was Métis and confronted him about it. He was mostly bark with a little bite, but still someone I was cautious around nonetheless. He also had a girlfriend who was also 20 at the time. She was like an alternative reality version of me. Like me, she was a bigger girl, size 24 to 26 ish, piercings, tattoos, the works. I looked like the replicate tall version of her. It was surreal. 
He never outright told me that he had feelings for me, but on several occasions he commented on how much I reminded him of his girlfriend and would ask if I was into women in three ways. I'm bisexual, but he didn't know that. I gave vague answers every time he asked something of the sort, but one day he made an off comment about bisexual women being greedy, to which I reacted negatively to. He put the pieces together from there. A couple weeks went by of him asking me questions about my interests, my hobbies, what I do in my off time, my favorite music, etc. Normally I would chalk this up to office banter, but with the creepy undertones I had a hard time engaging with him about my personal life. At this time, I had also started seeing my now partner of five years. When my boss asked again what I was doing after work, I informed him that I was going to see my boyfriend. This sent him into another question tailspin. He asked me how we met, how long we'd been dating, where he lived even. It was really unnerving. Once again, I kept the answers vague, but this time I went on and on about how much I loved my partner and how excited I was to have such an amazing partner in my life. I wanted to be crystal clear that I was not interested in my boss. That same evening, as we were closing, he told me about his favorite music. He specifically mentioned a band called Immortal Technique and a song of theirs called Dance with the Devil. I shrugged as I wasn't familiar with the song, so he put it on the store speakers while we swept and closed the cash. For those of you who are not familiar with the song, it's a very graphic and disturbing song that has a rather intense twist at the end. If you like that song, that's your taste, whatever. But personally, as a woman, I find it difficult listening to graphic depictions of extreme violence against women, period. Tim turns up the music to almost a deafening level while I count the cash and get our computers closed up. As he's sweeping, he's actively and loudly rapping along word for word, dropping end bombs of course, all the way through. He hadn't been looking at me until the later half of the song, where the lyrics begin to depict a woman being raped and killed by a group of men. It's visceral, violent, terrifying. Tim turns to me at that point of the song and stares into my eyes while pointing and dancing to the lyrics while rapping along. He was making violent gestures while doing this, motioning a head stomping gesture with his hands, thrusting during a rape, etc. I quickly closed cash faster than I ever had in my life. I felt like I was in danger at that point. I grabbed my bag and jacket as the song finished. He turned it off and goes, Isn't that something? It's poetry. The storytelling is just amazing, isn't it? I remember my whole body was tense. I muttered, not my cup of tea, and left. I should have given him my notice right then and there, but I was in a rough employment situation and couldn't up and leave. After that, he actually stopped scheduling him and I together very often. And about a month later, I gave my notice after finding a better job full time. He was furious when I left, of course. The company actually ended up closing that location a few months later because Tim lost it, according to our common connection, a friend of mine, a worker of his. This friend of mine also told me that he upped and moved to the other side of the country to be with his ex-wife. What made me remember this story was that a few months ago I was running errands in the outskirts of my city. I happened to stop at a random Taco Bell and guess who walks in with a very young looking woman on his arms? Tim. I was with my partner who also recognized him. My partner and I were already seated at this point. Tim looked at us like a deer in headlights and booked it out of there faster than a kite in the wind. Before he left though, I noticed that he shaved his head and got some suspicious looking tattoos on his arms. When he turned around, there was a distinct white power symbol patch on his jacket and his girlfriend's jacket too. So not only was this guy a creep, but also a predator and now a white supremacist. I don't go into that area anymore unless I'm accompanied by my partner at all times. Tim is very much a part of my past, and I have no desire to run into him ever again. Feels good to get this off my mind and onto paper, so to speak. Working as a waitress, people often treat you badly. 
For every 25% tipper, there's 10 old guys who leer and tip 10%. I usually made it through my shifts okay, but one customer interaction truly creeped me out. It was a slow night and this older couple got seated in my section. The wife seemed spacey, but nothing too weird. When I came back to their table to get their drink orders, she was slowly rearranging the sad little fake flowers we had for decoration. I joked about it, some line about her messing with my arrangement. She looked up at me, wide-eyed. I'm a florist's daughter. She was still moving them around and looking at me, and I left with her drink orders. I came back with her drinks and she's done playing florist. I asked her what they want to order. And while the husband is speaking, she interrupts him, repeatedly, to order soup. Same tone each time. No indication that she even hears him speaking. I ask her if she wants that served first, as an appetizer. She stares at me, repeats the same sentence. The husband cuts in and confirms that they want it as an appetizer. I leave and put in their orders. Later, I stop by and ask how their food is. The wife grabs my sleeve right at the elbow and pulls me towards their table. She compliments the food, but at this point I'm feeling uncomfortable. Her grip is pretty strong too, so I repeatedly tug at my sleeve to get away. Finally, they're done with their meals and I ask them how everything was while clearing their plates. The wife is very pleased and is still staring at me, wide-eyed and blank. Then she says, I never got your name. I usually don't tell customers my name unless they ask, so I tell her. She stares at me, unblinking, then asks, Do you know what it means? My name is very common, so it's a weird question. I'll say it's biblical. She continues to stare, then she says, It means beloved by God. That was my daughter's name. She grabbed my sleeve again. I know she was beloved by God because he took her back so soon. She's still staring at me in a weird, wide-eyed way. Then she smiles. The husband is quiet, unbothered. And I kind of stutter and get out of there. Maybe she was still grieving or on something, like heavy-duty mood stabilizers. She had less than one glass of wine, but I was really convinced that I was going to drop dead after that conversation. It was so ominous. I didn't feel physically threatened, sure, but it was the creepiest conversation I've had with a stranger. This occurred around 1999, 2000. My best friend and I were avid outdoor adventurers and amateur pot growers. We would frequently find secluded places in the woods that allowed for ample light and shade for the plants to grow and that would not allow them to be found easily. One particular day we went to an annex of trails located near a New Jersey State Park trail system. The trails weren't in the park but I had hiked them before and knew they weren't that frequented. We had gone out that day with our seeds partially sprouted in moist paper towels. We parked the car on the trailhead and started to hike in. We covered a mile or so and then we ventured off trail into the woods. We found a clearing, planted the seeds, and tied a few barely visible ribbons off to mark the way to spot our plants to check on them in the future. My friend and I got back on the trail and started walking back to the car. When my friend noticed a man in the other direction just staring at us. He was probably in his 30s or 40s, bald head, normal clothes. We didn't think much of it for the most part, but we definitely kept looking back as anyone would have with someone behind them in the woods. We saw he was walking 60 or so feet behind us. It seemed weird, but it was probably more so due to us having anxiety since we planted the seeds. We picked up the pace, but the man seemed to pick up his pace as we weren't gaining any distance. At one point, we just decided to get off the trail and let him pass. We turned off the trail and walked into the thicket of sticker bushes, which I remember vividly getting shredded on. We got deeper into the woods and heard cursing. When we turned around, the man was coming through where we entered. It was at that moment that we actually became scared. Mind you, we were two young, strong 19-year-olds, but a man following you into the woods is damn creepy. We kind of made a U maneuver and outflanked him and came out of the woods a bit further down the trail. Once on the trail, we ran. 
As we were running, there was a fork in the trail and my best friend went right and I went left. I realized my mistake as my buddy was going down the correct path and I wasn't. So I turned around and started running back towards the fork to follow my friend. As I was running towards the direction we came from to get to the fork, I could see the man running towards me down the trail. He was a distance away, but not far enough in my eyes. Survival mode kicked in and I ran as hard as I could. I caught up with my friend who was walking at that point. I screamed that he's after us and we both booked it all the way to the car. We got into the car shaking and out of breath. We backed up and started to get out of the parking lot when the man appeared at the trailhead. I always wondered what that was all about. Did he want to kill a couple of 19 year olds? Was he also doing some illegal things in the woods and wanted us gone? My buddy and I still laugh and talk about that day 22 years later. I'm so glad I found this subreddit because I love remembering this story. It's the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. Also, this was in ninth grade. There was this huge state park right outside of the town I lived in. My friend and I would go down the trails every now and then. We had been walking for maybe 10 minutes when we realized there was an older woman not far behind us. I only really noticed because of how out of place she looked. Like she came straight out of the old folks home and just was dropped into the woods. We were joking around about how creepy she was and sped up to put some distance between us. But every time we did, we looked back and still be able to spot her. We did this probably three times. We still thought it was funny though. We ended up running down the trail until we got to a small bridge. We hopped off the bridge into the creek and then went around the bend. We could still see the bridge from where we were. We were cracking up the whole time when we saw the old lady again. We had run for a good couple of minutes, like she shouldn't have caught up to us that fast, and it was like she had gotten off the trail because she was standing on the bridge looking around. I think that's when we stopped thinking it was funny. As soon as she left, we took off running the other way. That was it though, nothing happened. I just always thought the whole thing was creepy. A few months ago, my girlfriend and I were on a drive back home from a late night concert about 1am. We were basically in the middle of nowhere and I decided to pull off at a random rest stop to use the bathroom. I figured at this time the only people at this place would be either truckers and other people in the same situation as me. I got out of my car and walked up to the building and as soon as I stepped inside there was a few weird things that I noticed. So this place is laid out with two men's rooms and two women's rooms, two vending machines, one in both corners on either side of the restroom doors. When I walk in, there were two people, both of them standing directly in front of each of the vending machines. Both just staring at the vending machines, not reaching to get money or actually attending to buy something. So I walked past these people and went into the first restroom. I walked inside and I was the only person in the restroom using the urinals which is laid out in a U shape. A few seconds later someone else walks in, an older guy, maybe 50 or 60, working class looking guy. He walked over and started using the urinal right behind me, about a few feet away. Nothing about this was very alarming at first but being a careful person that I am, I already have my pocket knife open in my hand, in my front hoodie pocket. Once I finish up, I go to wash my hands and walk out the door to the first restroom. As I walked out, I realized I also had to take a shit. So to avoid being awkward, I walk into the second men's restroom, taking a note that these weird vending machine people were in the same exact spot. I go into the first stall and try to go about my business when I hear someone else walk into the restroom and go into the stall right beside me. Keep in mind, there are about six open stalls away from mine. I thought that was very weird, so I looked down and immediately recognized the work boots as the guy in the first bathroom. This guy just walked in and I wasn't even in there for two minutes. I immediately got up and left the bathroom. I started to speed walk out the building and I noticed from outside, looking back inside, he also quickly got up and was heading towards the outside doors. I hopped in my car, waking up my girlfriend, and told her I would explain in a minute. I put the car into reverse and whipped out of the spot. 
As I was shifting into drive, I looked up and saw this guy only a few feet away, standing next to his old beat down truck, literally staring me down as I started to drive away. I stared directly back at him and saw him make a really creepy, mime-like surprise look at me. I was really tired and confused, but I still don't know what this guy was planning at the rest stop in the middle of nowhere at 1am, or if the vending machine people had anything to do with it at all. This is one of the only times I've experienced something like this, and I felt actual danger. If anyone has any similar experiences or ideas of what this may have been, I would love to hear it. I'll preface this by saying that we were 12 or 13 at the time, and my friend and I often snuck out of either of our houses during sleepovers for late night walks. This was the basis for this terrifying encounter, and it stopped us from sneaking out after dark again. My friend lived opposite of a huge forest, so her house was the preferred choice to sneak out of and us to roam the night because the forest was more scary and thrilling. We always took flashlights, food, and blankets so we could camp out for a couple hours before going back home. Well, on this fateful night, we inadvertently fell asleep instead of staying awake, so my friend suddenly jolted me awake from sleep. It was past 3 a.m., a lot later than we usually snuck out at. We grabbed our essentials and crept out the back door into the cold, dark night. Frost crunched underfoot as we crossed the deserted road and we reached the entrance to the forest. We noticed how pitch black and completely silent it was, unnervingly so. We turned on our flashlights and stepped onto the uneven path into the forest. The light illuminating the trees swaying in the icy wind. We stepped on fallen leaves and bark as we made our unsteady but familiar way into our favorite part of the forest. Our cold breath was the only noise to invade the deafening silence. We reached a small hut we constructed one afternoon, made entirely of sticks, purely for the purpose of having shelter for our campouts. There were times that vandals or other kids damaged our hut but for the most part it stayed intact. On this occasion it was completely destroyed, a sign of worse to come. We were just deciding to call it a night and come back later in the day to repair the hut when we heard it. This loud shrieking giggle that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. My friend and I jumped up in shock and looked at each other like, what the fuck? We were completely freaked out. The eerie and unnatural giggle rang out again, contradicting the silence and making my entire body break out in goosebumps. Someone is in here, my friend whispered at me, looking utterly terrified. We gotta go now. Her voice of rationale made it even more scary and unnerving that someone was in the forest with us at 3 o'clock in the morning. We just looked at each other and took off running in unison our footsteps navigating the path as naturally as we could from muscle memory. Our uneven gasp of air punctuating the giggle that seemed to be following us, getting closer and closer. Our flashlights went up and down with the fast movements, illuminating random patches of trees and bushes as we finally saw a small sliver of light as we came through the forest entrance. Running out of the forest, we didn't stop until we reached the back door of my friend's house and almost collapsed in a breathless heap of relief to be safe. Then my friend's eyes went wide and she nudged me, pointing a shaking finger across the road. A haggard woman, middle-aged, was standing at the forest entrance, giggling, the awful horrifying giggle, and was waving over at us. We screamed and ran inside and looked out from my friend's bedroom window through the smallest gap in the curtain and could still see the woman standing there. Worse yet, she was staring right at us as if she knew we were there. We could tell she was giggling that hideous appalling laugh. She turned very slowly and walked back into the forest again. We never went back to that forest, nor did we go out after dark again. I was about 30 years old and my girlfriend and I decided to go camping for a couple of nights in a spot that she knew of in British Columbia. It wasn't any sort of official campground or anything, 
but it was a spot that you could pull over and park on the side of the highway to get into it. So we did and then we trekked in with our gear into the woods that were between the highway and the waterway. After about 20 minutes of walking along a well used trail, we got to an area where there were a few old foundations from abandoned buildings, including at least one with an intact set of concrete stairs. This spot also opened up into a nice little beach on the ocean and had a nice space to set up the tent beside the trail that we had been walking along. So within a half hour the tent was set up, a fire was prepared, and we had chopped up enough wood for the night. I decided to have a look at how much further the trail went, and my girlfriend took her journal down to the beach to write. I wasn't gone very long, as within a few hundred yards the trail came to an abrupt end at the base of a cliff. It was maybe 40 to 50 feet high and ran out into the water in one direction and out of eyesight in the other. I did try to follow it inland, but the forest became quite dense very quickly, so I had to stop within 30 minutes of exploring. I headed back to our camp and headed down to the beach. My girlfriend and I spent the rest of the afternoon there, and around 6 p.m. we went back to our site. I started up the fire, we cooked some dinner, and had some wine. So far, this was a very nice little getaway. After tidying up everything and letting the fire die down, we got ready for bed and slipped into the tent to sleep. For whatever reason, I grabbed the axe from the stump that I had used to split the firewood earlier and brought it into the tent. Not something I normally did previously when camping, maybe because of the unofficial nature of this campsite. As is usually the case when camping, I fell asleep almost immediately. The exercise and fresh air do that to me every time. While asleep, a storm system had rolled in and it started to rain, heavily. Being the good Cub Scout I was, I had taken the time to spread the tarp over the tent so none of the rain was hitting our tent and much of the wind was blocked as well. We were nice and snug, but the storm was making some very loud sounds which made it hard for me to fall back asleep. Around 2 or 3 in the morning I was pulled out of a light sleep by what sounded like footsteps coming down the trail. By this time of night the storm had mostly passed and the only other sound was light rain hitting the tarp. I half sat up and through the tent material I could see a light coming down the trail matching these footsteps. That got my attention really quickly. Who the fuck would be out here in the middle of the night along a trail that is well off the beaten track and ends about a football field or so past where we are. Suddenly the light and the footsteps stop moving and the light goes out. What the fuck? Now it's one thing to be out here walking along in the middle of the night, but why would you feel the need to turn off your flashlight? The footsteps resumed towards us, but now at a slower speed and softer. I reached over and grabbed the axe. Quietly I took the cover off of it and slightly nudged my girlfriend. Don't say anything, but someone's approaching the campsite on the trail. She gave me a quizzical look, and I just shrugged my shoulders and nodded in the direction that the person was coming from. Almost immediately she picked up on the sound of the footsteps, which were both closer and slower. We looked at each other with freaked out expressions. I showed her the axe and she looked relieved. The footsteps had stopped very close to our tent. For about 5-10 to 10 minutes there was no movement from outside, although we could hear whoever this was breathing. Finally, I called out and said, Hey, whoever's out there, do you need any help? Once I said that, the flashlight turned back on and was shined against our tent a few times and around our campsite a few more. Abruptly, the person began to walk down the trail again in the direction of the cliff. Very quickly, they were out of sight down the trail, so I took the opportunity to get my jeans and boots on in case there was some sort of further weirdness when they came back since there was nowhere for them to go once they got to the cliff. After about 20 minutes of waiting, they still hadn't returned, so I got out of the tent and started a fire. My girlfriend got dressed and came out to join me. After another 20 to 30 minutes, we made some coffee and sat there, keeping warm by the fire. We sat there till the sun came up. No one ever came back down the trail. Once it was fully bright, I took the axe and made my way along the path until I got to the cliff. No sign of last night's visitor to be seen, 
I slowly made my way back to the campsite, looking carefully to each side to see if there was any trails I missed. We packed up immediately and left. To this day, I have no idea who this person was, where they came from, or where they disappeared to. Needless to say, I never went back to camp there again. Ten years ago, my wife and I planned a hike at Mount St. Helens on Mother's Day. It was the last weekend to hike to the summit without permits. The mountain is still covered with snow at that time of the year, typically. So the tradition is that everyone hikes up the mountain wearing a skirt, which actually made climbing easier. And once you reach the summit, most people either ski or sled down the mountain. We were offered a chance to play some music the night before in Seattle. So we were late getting started in the morning. In fact, we were the last ones to start up the mountain. Well, it was a beautiful sunny day and pretty warm. We struggled to reach the summit because the snow had melted so fast that even snowshoes barely kept us from sinking and sliding. We knew that the daylight was going to be running out soon and quickly started sledding down the mountain. We were by far the last people on the mountain. There really isn't much signage, but we knew where we needed to be. Right before the tree line is the turnoff that is crucial and easy to miss in the snow, especially if someone is skiing or sledding. We picked up our sleds and start the final hike to the car through the woods. Just then my wife's cell phone beeped after finding a signal and we laughed that she had left it on the entire hike. We continued on until we ran into a couple hiking back up the hill. Very unusual. They stopped and asked if we were the last hikers on the mountain and we said yes. The woman started crying and told us they had reached the summit and her mother wanted to ski down ahead and would meet them at the car. When they got to the car, her mother wasn't there. They couldn't reach her by phone so they were climbing back up to find her as it was getting dark. We told them that we had just gotten a signal on my wife's phone and before they continued to please call their friends waiting at the car. They called. Their mother was still missing. We were all scared at this point. As we were talking on the phone, their friends said they saw a car and her mother got out. Everyone rejoiced. So the mother skied down the hill, missed a turnoff, and ended up eight miles down on a snow-covered road that was rarely used. Someone was on the road and gave her a lift to the car. If we had ended the call earlier, they would have continued up the mountain and would have likely been lost. About two years ago, me and my family moved from New Jersey to Florida for a fresh start. Before I start my encounter, I want to iterate my mental state at the time because it contributes to how I acted at the time of the story. So the night of the move, my mother had just got a call from a close family friend. She had just become pregnant and had started to have complications and feared she had lost a baby. My mother, being the awesome woman she is, went over to help and watched her young son, can't remember his age at the time, and calmed my friend down and told her to go to the hospital to be sure and get it checked out. She and her husband rushed to the hospital and luckily she hadn't lost a baby. But it wasn't until 1 in the morning until my mother got back and I was still up waiting for her to get back. So yes, we were dead tired the next day when we packed up everything for the long trip to our new home in Florida. Well, my father, who had slept through the whole ordeal the night before, was not. But that's just me bitching. Anyway, I'm driving my mother while my father is in another car, and I'm not exactly happy about the move. So tired and upset, we continued with our trip. We had always driven from New Jersey to Florida for years and never had any really weird experiences out on the road. I'm not sure about my parents, but they never talked to me about anything creepy in my 22 years I had been alive and had traveled with them. And trust me, they love to tell me stories, and I do too. So when this happened, I was totally unprepared for it. What happened the night before certainly didn't help. So we stopped at one of the many stops on our way to Florida, and I think we were in the Carolinas or somewhere near there when we stopped. Now if you ever traveled by car, a rest stop is a place kind of like a civic center rest area. These places are for travelers who either needed a minute to stretch, go to the bathroom, 
or a place where they can safely rest for the night in their cars. These places are usually well lit and have vending machines for anyone who needs a snack or drink. It was late, maybe 9 or 10 at night, and we stopped to stretch our legs and go to the bathroom. I wanted a few snacks so I asked my mother for a few bucks. She gave them to me and I entered the little enclosed area that contained these machines. So I'm standing there, alone, picking what I wanted when this woman comes in. She's a short, skinny older woman who dressed nice with bleach blonde hair. When I glanced at her and smiled politely, she came right up to me and held her hand out to shake and introduce herself. Dumbfounded, I shake her hand back and stupidly told her my name. After that, she launches into this tale about how she lost her wedding ring, had a head wound, and her car was out of gas and she needed some money and other things that I honestly can't remember. I'm just standing there listening and trying to figure out a way to get out of this situation. Now you have to understand this was literally the first time anyone has ever approached me at one of these stops. Mostly because I don't think I have the most friendly face for people to approach for help. Even though I'm a girl, I'm taller around 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, taller than most girls at least broad shoulders, and I resemble my father, who doesn't have the most welcoming face either. But me, I'm a bleeding heart, and I never want to be rude to people. But in this situation, I would have been if it hadn't been out of the blue. When I'm in situations that are new to me, I tend to freeze up and can't think straight. I don't know how to act or what to do in these situations. As you can guess, I'm a big introvert and socially awkward, but I don't have a problem telling people to fuck off. But in this situation, I'm outright panicking and just want to get away from this weird woman. And I say weird because the head injury she mentioned, she didn't have one, not even a bruise, and she was talking so fast and non-stop, I couldn't even tell her I couldn't help her or even try. For some reason at that moment, being polite was more important than getting away. So I'm standing there, exhausted to my bones, about to shove the little money I have at her. When my mother walks in, my badass mother comes right over and says what I can't say and tells me to come to her. The woman takes a step back and I realize how close she was. I hadn't even noticed that she was steadily coming closer as she was talking. She tells my mother how beautiful and nice I was when really I looked like a greasy mess as I don't really care about my appearance when I take a road trip. My mother doesn't really respond and she has me by my arm walking towards the bathroom, asking if I'm okay. That woman got the fuck out of there and goes the opposite direction of where she said her car was. Looking back on it all, at the time I thought she was just weird, and I was certainly weirded out by all of it, but I just thought whatever. But after listening to YouTube, Let's Not Meet, and the such, I realized how lucky I was two years later that that situation hadn't escalated. I think the reason why she approached me was because I had a wad of money in my hand. They were folded and it looked like I had a lot more than I really did. I probably only had six bucks on me. And because it was probably obvious to her how tired I was and how much of an easy score she could have gotten. In my tired, grumpy state, she probably planned to rob me. So if any of you reading this, I hope you aren't planning on traveling alone. But if you are, be careful of people, even completely normal looking ones. You can never be too careful, especially all the people looking for an easy score. So weird woman who was lying through her teeth, wanting the six bucks in my hand. Let's not meet again. When I was roughly 13, a very close friend of mine invited me and my sister to come to her and her sister's birthday party at a campground. Megan and I were walking around the campground, just messing around, with our sisters following somewhere behind us. The adults knew what we were doing, and we live in a relatively small town, so they knew most of the people at the campground, so it wasn't weird for us to be allowed to walk around the loop. We passed the camper when we were nearing the pond they had there. Megan said she knew the people who were staying there, and they had a girl who was close to our age and she had a brother. We stopped by and asked if the girl wanted to walk with us. She accepted and we were off again. 
I don't remember the girl's name, but she kept on mentioning her brother and how he told her that he thought I was cute when we stopped by the camper. We walked to the pond and probably played in it a bit, then started walking back towards the girl's camper. When we get there, she said to me, Wait, my brother texts me. He wants to talk to you. He comes out and tells me I'm pretty, and we exchange numbers. The next day, we're texting when I asked him his age. He was 19. I tell him I'm 13, and he says, It doesn't matter, and I can still be his girlfriend. I remember feeling weird after that. I just ended up blocking him after a few days of him texting me and me hardly replying, hoping that he would stop. On Sunday, my best friend, my boyfriend and I went camping, about 20 miles from where I live. We got there around noon and set up a spot. My boyfriend and I had to sleep in a tent and my best friend in the car. We were having a wonderful day and a good time, drinking and smoking weed and eating lots of good snacks, just sticking around. It got dark and super cold, so we went to the car to warm up for a bit and listen to some music. My boyfriend had a lot of Jamerson and some beers and really wanted to take the flashlights and explore the small mountain next to our site. I'm an anxious person and even more when I'm inebriated, so I'm panicking a bit but he assures me that it would be a quick walk and we had service so I knew I could call or text him. He comes back about 20 minutes later. We got into the tent and he says, shit didn't feel right. I asked him what he meant and he said that he wasn't alone out there. Now, he's had a slew of supernatural experiences throughout his life so it's not uncommon to hear these things from him. He said we were okay because he talked to him. He just kept repeating, if we respect his lands, he'll respect us. There's so much more in this world than this life than just us, but we're safe. If we respect the land, they will respect us. He basically reiterated the same point in different ways. Then he would smile and try to assure me everything was fine. I told him he was scaring me because I do believe him, but because he was also drunk, it seemed like he was almost in a dreamlike state. We lay down to get warm because it was fucking cold. I started hearing footsteps and scratching around the tent, but nothing was there. After a few minutes, my anxiety got the best of me and we packed up and went home. I'm not sure how much he remembers and I'm too afraid to ask. My 25-year-old female friend from college told me a harrowing story that happened to her and her friends in high school. She is from Buffalo, New York and often went on camping trips to local upstate campgrounds. When she was a senior, her and four of her friends went to a campsite fitted with rows of cabins on the water that people could rent. As the sun went down, the girls noticed that their neighbors a few cabins down, a group of guys similar in age, were playing music and grooving around the campfire, drinking beers. One of the guys asked them if they wanted to join. When they got over there and started hanging out with the guys, everything seemed completely normal and they were having a fun time. As the night progressed, one of the guys started getting blackout drunk and eventually pulled out a revolver that he said belonged to his dad. He started waving it around and playing with it. This obviously freaked everyone out his own friends included. Eventually, he started pointing the gun to his head and laughing while his friends were yelling at him to put it away and how it was not funny. The girls at this point were fairly disturbed and told the guys that they should get back to their cabin and said their goodbyes. When they got back to their cabin, they all talked about how freaky that was and expressed concern for the drunk guy. They then moved on to other topics of conversation and forgot about it for the time being. A few hours later, sometime in the middle of the night, they heard a loud bang coming from the direction of the neighbor's cabin. Shortly after this, a barrage of cop cars showed up on the scene. One officer came to my friend's cabin and started asking them questions about the cabin they visited earlier that night. My friends asked the officer what happened. He explained that the kid had shot himself in the head in front of his friends. 
They were unable to discern if it was suicide or accidental. My friend to this day still has PTSD over this incident and explained that's why she rarely goes camping anymore. I know the story may sound fictional. A lot of people don't believe me when I tell them, but I can assure you that the only other person involved also witnessed what occurred that strange night. This happened 11 years ago with my ex-girlfriend. It actually changed her relationship for the worse, and we ended up breaking up a few weeks later. Nonetheless, I still remember this like it was yesterday due to how unexplainable it was. My girlfriend at the time wanted to surprise me with what she said was an overnight surprise trip. I obliged and felt like a pretty lucky guy for her to do something that required so much planning. After packing a duffel bag full of clothes and toiletries, we left for what I thought was a resort or some kind of hotel stay. Two and a half hours passed when we pulled off the main road and headed down an off-road path. I asked her if this was a camping trip and she replied, yes. To be honest, I was a little disappointed, as I didn't really like going camping, and not to mention, I wish I would have known to pack my hiking shoes. I didn't complain, of course, because it was still a romantic gesture. Fifteen minutes on this road, we finally pulled into a camping ground. The first thing I noticed was that there really wasn't anyone around us. It made sense, though. This is really far off the beaten path. I was actually surprised her car made it that far, considering how harsh the road was. Anyway, we make a fire pit and she cooks dinner. Everything is going just fine and we're really feeling each other. We of course take out the tent as the sun goes down and we're vibing off each other. Yeah, it's what you would expect would happen as we begin moving things along as young college age kids do. This is where the first strange occurrence happens. I hear scratching noises on the side of the tent. I try to remember if we set our tent up next to brush. Maybe the wind was causing branches to rustle against the tent. Oh well, that's the woods. Maybe it's a bird or something else. It stops rustling and we continue chilling as if nothing happened. Then things escalate in a strange manner. It's like the wind stopped and the environment became silent. We both felt super uneasy, causing us to sort of get knocked out of our playful mood. She laid next to me as we were trying to concentrate on listening to hear if it was a bear or some other animal in the area. Then it happened in an instant. Something like an explosion hit our tent tremendously hard. I could compare it to say if a log was thrown like a batting ram against the side of the tent. I say this because it literally pushed the material in forcefully and felt dangerous. A surge of adrenaline lit through my body as I felt like something violent was outside the tent. I never knew if I was a fight or flight guy, but I guess my next action gives me some idea. I yelled aloud, give me the knife and the flashlight, as I scrambled up to unzip the tent with tools in hand. My first thought was that I was going to confront some psycho that was messing with us with a baseball bat or some kind of battering weapon. I kid you not, I launched myself out of the tent, stood up in a flurry to confront my attacker. A few breaths pass as the cold feeling sets in. I do a 360 scan to nothing but silence and darkness. Maybe it was a branch that fell on the tent. There was absolutely nothing on the ground where the thud was heard and fell. Hello? Hello? I yelled again. And again, no response. Until a moment later, in the silence, a chill shot up my spine. Get the keys and get out of the tent. I said in a frantic tone as my girlfriend listened and now joined me. I looked at her car that we arrived in and noticed it was about 30 yards out by the Saudi off-road path. She didn't even need to know what I was thinking as we both just started speed walking towards it. You might think at this point that I'm just overreacting, but truly I cannot describe the terror that washed over me when I looked out into the darkness after investigating the tent. I could feel like something was watching me, and to top it off, it was eerily silent. I know she confirmed my suspicions when she started for the car immediately without question. Our instincts were telling us to get the hell out of there. 
The walk to the car was unnerving, and it felt like a football field away, but we finally got to the car. With keys in hand, I took the driver's seat. After turning the key, it led to some relief that the engine started. Instinctively, I locked the doors and turned the headlights on. We sat for about three seconds, trying to rationalize what just happened, when my girlfriend started exclaiming, My laptop is moving. Something is in the tent. She said this because she brought her laptop to serve as a lantern after dark. We, of course, left it in a hurry, as well as other items. I saw what she saw. It was being rustled around 30 yards away. Without further hesitation, I put the car in gear and started down the rough road. As I tried to calmly drive her car down the dirt path, quickly but carefully, the strangest thing happened next. A loud piercing ringing noise from inside the car's cabin. I turned the radio on and off. I checked the windows. I asked my girlfriend if her car ever made such noises, which she replied, no. I asked her again if she could hear it, as maybe it was just me being under stress, and she said, Yes, I hear it. I don't know what it is, in a confused, panicked tone. Now, I wanted to write this off as a car problem, but if you were in there with me, you would describe it as some kind of bell, continuously ringing. It didn't sound like any car noise I had ever heard. My next instinct, as I grew up a pastor's kid, I just remember praying for about 10 minutes or so, as I convinced myself it was something supernatural or demonic. We endured the screech for about 10 grueling minutes, and as to my relief, it ended suddenly. It didn't fade out or just go quiet. The loud ringing literally stopped in an instant. I can't describe the feeling in the car when it stopped. It's so strange to look back and remember that I felt internally that the ordeal was over once the ring stopped. Everything felt normal. The panic, the chills, all of it went away in an instant. We ended up going down a road another 45 minutes and finally stopped at a trucker's diner. We slept in the parking lot, or at least she did. I was still on edge from the adrenaline dump I just went through. In attempted at bravery, the next day we went back to the camping site as the sun was up. We investigated, but saw no tracks or anything except for the contents of the tent tossed about and still accounted for. I was hoping they were missing so we could write it off as people screwing with us and plundering our tent, but that didn't seem to be the case. We were packed up and gone in less than 10 minutes as the area still felt weird. Haven't been camping since. I would go again, but next time I want an RV or at least a relatively known location with others around. This place was in the remote mountains of Payson, Arizona, far from civilization. Edit for people asking why this led to a breakup. For starters, after struggling to stay awake on the drive home, after hardly sleeping in the diner's parking lot, I was a bit cranky and mad about her dragging me out camping when I specifically told her I didn't like camping. She didn't take my statement well and said I was ungrateful. To her credit, she planned a nice gesture, unbeknownst to her, that we were going to get haunted. She also kept saying that she wasn't going to give up on camping and that I should give it another shot. I felt that that was insensitive as I told her repeatedly that I'm not interested in going out again and that also I wish she would have communicated that that was what we were doing ahead of time so that I could have brought a gun or something other than a little knife. It probably wasn't right of me to act like the incident was her fault, as it wasn't. The reality was that we had only been dating for about a month and a half, and I felt like I was trying to fit a mold of a person that she wanted to marry. As she made comments about she wanted her kids, family, to go camping together and whatnot. So plunging me into the deep end and wanting me to go again even shortly after the incident, moving too fast for me. Also, a hiking incident happened a month later that broke the camel's back. This was when we were on a break but still talking to each other, but it solidified our breakup. It wasn't a haunting, but it was scary and dangerous as she didn't tell me that we were going mountaineering and not hiking, loose rocks falling, free climbing up 50 foot semi cliffs, nothing I was prepared for. She deserved a great outdoorsman and that wasn't me.
This was about four or five years ago, back when I lived with my mother in a shed on a farm surrounded by woodland. Our farmland was part of a larger piece of farmland that was split up and sold off. So we did have neighbors, though they were roughly a kilometer away from each other. We loved it because of the privacy. It wasn't like there was nobody nearby that I couldn't go to if I needed help. That though is what had me fiercely walking alone at night between the hours of 7 and 8 p.m. sometimes, fluctuating from earlier to later depending on the day. Sometimes I even went on a walk at 2 a.m. because I was restless and couldn't sleep. Looking back, this was incredibly stupid and after this incident, I never walked after 6 p.m. ever again, always making sure there was at least some sunlight left when I set out. The route I always took was a road circuit the first part was in the open, in front of the other farms, including my own. If anything happened, at least one person would have noticed, and reception was pretty good, so I would have been able to call someone. The second half, on the other hand, was concealed by about 200 meters of woods between the farms and the back road, stretching a full two kilometers at the back of the farm. And it was during this part of the walk that I had my creepy encounter. It was late at night. I can't remember what time exactly, but it was pitch black with the exception of my torch light. I was about to approach the turn in the loop that would bring me out into the open again when I heard it. Help. 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 It was a monotone voice repeatedly asking for help. It didn't seem panicked in the least. I took my headphones out and turned my music off to make sure I was hearing correctly, but it didn't stop. Help. Help. A very stupid part of me almost responded because for some reason my first instinct was, oh no, someone's in trouble. Like a naive kid, even though I would have been around 16 or 17 at the time. Of course, my brain kicked in and I realized that approaching that voice was just about the stupidest thing I could do. So I started quickly backing away. Unfortunately, my cat followed me on the walk and wasn't backing away with me. She was walking towards the voice, softly hissing. I remember desperately trying to get her to come back towards me without alerting the voice to my presence, just in case it hadn't noticed me yet. But I was getting scared and didn't want to stay there a moment more. So I ran forward, grabbed her, then turned around and bolted it back towards my house. I don't know if it was stupid for me to turn my back to the voice as I was making so much noise while running that there was no way they didn't know I was there and I had no way of knowing if they had given chase. I was so fucking terrified the whole time. The image of someone cloaked in the shadows chasing me entered my mind even though I couldn't hear anyone behind me. I never once slowed down until I was back safe and sound within my house. It doesn't end there though. Despite how terrifying it was, there was still a part of me that was concerned about whoever it was, because what if they really needed help? I asked my mother to drive us to the location, another very stupid decision considering what we found, that being nothing. We called out and called out, but nobody answered. We didn't get out of the car though, luckily neither of us were that stupid. We drove home having seen nothing and no one but it still bothered me the next morning, so I had my mother drive us over there again and we searched the immediate area. Nothing, no indication that someone had been there. There was no body, which admittedly was a drastic thing to search for. I don't know if I would prefer this outcome, because at least then I would add a face to the voice. But no, we found absolutely nothing, and to this day, I have no idea who that voice belonged to and why they were calling out for help. My mind has naturally come to some chilling conclusions and theories that leave me unable to sleep. Rapist, kidnapper, serial killer, all the classic horror stories, but I guess I'll never really know for sure. This may be more of a near encounter, but it was still unsettling. My partner and I decided we were going to go hiking on a trail in a national forest area yesterday. It was a fairly remote area and we drove a variety of dirt roads to get there. 
But we were excited to hike during the beautiful times of the year with the leaves changing. The trailheads had some small parking area which was approximately 200 feet before the river crossing and bridge. As we pulled into the parking area, we noticed about five people on the other side of the river embankment across the bridge. They were all standing there in a neutral stance, spread legs, arms straight out, either facing the direction or the opposite direction, with their feet nearly touching. It was difficult to tell the distance, there's maybe a slight gap in the road for a car to pass through, but they took up most of the road. They were wearing all black and it looked like they might have had black masks on too, as we couldn't see any color or features indicative of faces. As we pulled into the parking area, my partner and I pondered what was going on over there. We stared at them for about 10 seconds and we discovered that they were completely motionless, like statues. At this point, both of our guts were raising alarms, and we decided to hightail it out of there. As we drove away, they continued to stand there motionless. Thankfully, no one followed us. We're still trying to figure out what happened there. Was it a hunting group? If so, why weren't they wearing orange? Was it a teenage group playing a prank? Was it just our overactive imaginations? Just as a friendly reminder, there is a problem of people disappearing in national parks and forests, so be sure to stay safe and vigilant. My boyfriend and I camped through California, and we stayed at a campsite near Santa Barbara for two nights. The first night, it was just us and another camper across from us, and the second night, it was only us at the campground. There wasn't much near the campground, and it was like a 30 minutes drive into Santa Barbara. It had started raining around 2 a.m., which woke me up a little bit, and I was just laying there trying to go back to sleep. I was almost asleep when I heard what sounded like a car crash. I laid there for a second, and then decided to ask my boyfriend if he was awake. He answered, so I asked him if he heard what I heard. He said yes and he decided to check it out to make sure they were okay. We get out of the tent and grab our flashlights and start walking where we thought we heard the wreck happen when a person hops back in their truck, turns their lights on, and frantically leaves the campground. This freaks my boyfriend and I out because the person was driving the wrong way through the campground without headlights on towards our campsite, and we were the only ones there. The camp was lined with large rocks and that's what he ran into. The fact that he was creeping right past the campground like that makes me and my boyfriend believe that he had bad intentions. We didn't sleep much for the rest of the night. So I live in a cul-de-sac in a suburban neighborhood with a medium-sized wooded area behind my house. My bedroom is literally next to the back sliding glass door and every night I can hear something large moving around back there. All my cats and dogs are inside, so I know it's not them. It'll be slowly moving around back there, and then stop. I'll say something loudly, and then it'll start up again. Sometimes it will move even faster, which makes me go back inside. I don't believe it's a wolf because I've only had one encounter with one in my 12 years living here. Usually I hear wolves howling at night, but it's always from far away. I've been back in those woods during the day and seen nothing, not even a snake. It only happens in the dead of night. There's a legendary Bigfoot-like creature known as the Flintville Monster that has been spotted since it was seen and shot by cops in the 1970s, but that community is several miles away. I don't know what it could be. This happened to a group of friends and I on a camping expedition for a reward program. It was the second day and we were coming to the end of a six hour walk. We were walking across a small country road. The nearest house was pretty far behind us and way out of earshot. 
At the end of the country road was a bridle way that ran perpendicular, probably about two miles from a nearby village. As we were approaching the bridle way, an unmarked white van came up the road, and instead of stopping, he pulled in front of us. The width of the van was about the size of the country road, so we couldn't get past. He rolled down his window and started asking us questions. It wasn't uncommon for the locals to ask us questions or give us words of encouragement, but this guy didn't sit right with me. Being an all-female group, and not to mention, all of us were incredibly exhausted. This was a concern of mine. I brushed it off since I didn't want to worry anyone else. I figured I'd just watched too many true crime documentaries. He asked us what we were doing, as many people had. We explained the award program that we were on. His questions began relatively normal and small talkish, but then began to get more specific. So you're camping out tonight then? We replied and said we were. We replied and said that we were, ready for him to drive off so we could continue our route. Where's your campsite? This sent shivers down my spine. This may not have been anything sinister, but it was none of his business. I feigned ignorance, as if I didn't know where the campsite was, and gestured vaguely in the opposite direction of the site. Again, I was expecting him to shrug this off and just go about his day, but no. Surely you know where your campsite is. This is when one of my best friends blurted out the name of the campsite. I froze for a second, but luckily he didn't hear this. He began to ask us questions like, is it near, is it that way? What does it look like? This was far too specific for my liking, so I maintained that I had no idea. Eventually he began to drive away, looking strangely disappointed without saying anything. Waited until he was down the road and we continued walking, a little shaken. We made it back to the campsite and reported it to the counselor. I didn't get any sleep that night. Maybe I was overreacting, but I dreaded to think what could have happened. It finally started raining here, so I took my 14 year old son out mushroom hunting over the weekend. It was later than we normally would go, and the sun goes down much earlier. But we were taking a trail to the river and back in the hopes of finding turkey tails or chanterelle mushrooms. We took the wrong turn and ended up going through a big field, which the trail would take us back around to the main trail to the river. As we walked towards the main trail, the last group of people had left, and it was just me and my son. We walked along and out the thicket side of the trail. We walked along and out the thicket side trail came this weird man. He had his dog with him that was alert at his side. He was staring at us as we walked closer towards him. Then he started waving at us, this really weird slow wave. I was immediately uncomfortable and got goosebumps, but didn't want to be impolite. So I half-hearted waved back at him while staring back, telling my son to slow up a little. I didn't want to actually meet up at the junction. After a full minute of us dawdling, the guy slowly turned and began to walk down the trail towards the main trail. I was warily walking, didn't want to go too fast, and we stopped to look at some plants. So the guy and his dog got further down the trail, which curved to the right and continued down on two blocks to the junction. I was thinking, if this was a creepy let's not meet, this dude would be waiting around the corner. And sure enough, he was just standing at the junction, off to the left towards the parking lot, and to the right was a half mile trail to the river. The dude was just standing there, with his dog, staring at us, not moving at all. Both my son and I were like, holy shit, let's keep wide to the right. And saying that he looks old, we could run faster than him, and just planning for the freaky deaky, just in case. He kept staring at us, so as we approached, I asked if he was okay, and he just kept staring back. He had greasy hair, teeny round glasses, a blue windbreaker, 
plaid long shorts, about 50 years old. His dog was a small beagle mix. He didn't answer me at all, just kept staring. We turned to the right and walked about a block. I had my phone cam facing me so I could watch him over my shoulder and the only movement I saw from him was slowly shifting his direction to continue to stare at us. I didn't say anything else to him. It was moderately unsettling, his stare, made more so by the lack of response, emotionless face, weird teeny glasses, slow wave at us. He did leave because on our way back, he was no longer standing there on the main trail. So hey, freaky deaky, far zombie dude. For sure, stay in the thicket and let's not meet. This happened to me today. I had a couple friends decide to go hiking in a local forest, but this time we decided to take a different route for variety. We walked for about an hour. We were a little over a kilometer deep in the forest. Nothing unusual happened until at one point. We started hearing some weird sounds and music like a religious ceremony. We got freaked out and decided to start heading back. On the way back, we heard a bunch of other weird noises. But at that point, our minds were probably playing tricks on us. After the earlier encounter, we got home safely. I checked Google Maps in the direction where the sounds came from, but there was nothing but more woods. I don't know what happened, so I'm asking if you people have any possible explanations. Trigger warning for adult content and attempted sexual assault. So this happened a few weeks back. As I'm sure most of you know, Facebook now has a dating component to it. I was matched with this guy who seemed pretty chill. He was older than me, 27, and I had just turned 23. But in my mind, four years age difference isn't really a big deal. We talked for a day or two and decided that we would meet up for a drink and get a feel for each other in person. When we met face to face, he looked older than just 27. He had quite a bit of gray mixed into his facial hair, but I figured it might just be one of those people whose hair turns gray earlier in life. No big deal. We have a few drinks and chatted for a bit. He again states that he's 27. He was nice, but he wouldn't stop staring at me and was feeding me compliments with every other sentence that came out of his mouth. I was flattered he was saying those things, but naturally it made me uncomfortable. I decided it was time for me to head out shortly after that since I had to be at work at 4.30 in the morning. He walked me to my car and we started discussing his. It caught my attention due to the fact that it was a 1970 Camaro. He then offered to take me for a drive in it at 10 p.m. I declined due to the time and the fact that I had only known him for less than two hours and he wants me to get into a car and go to a random drive at night. That wasn't going to happen. I really enjoy watching documentaries about serial killers, reading creepy encounters, and let's not meet stories. The last thing I was about to do was get into a vehicle with an unfamiliar man who will take me God knows where. I know what kind of danger that can subject a person to. He was very persistent about it, but I wouldn't budge. So I got into my car and left for my drive home, which was about a 45 minute long drive. By the time I got home, I received multiple texts from him, probably at least 15. Most of those texts stating about how he already missed me, wants to build a future with me, how he's never fallen this fast for anyone in his 38 years of life, Continuing with further compliments. That's when my stomach dropped. He just stated that he's 38 years old. That's not what I was told at the bar or what's on his profile. I replied to him, inquiring whether or not it bothered him that he was 15 years older than me. It bothered me for damn sure. He states that it didn't and that he prefers to date younger women around my age. I didn't respond and went to bed. When I woke up the next morning, I had multiple texts and five missed calls, voicemails from the dude. Not gonna lie, I straight up ghosted him and blocked him from every form of social media I had, as well as his phone number, which is a real asshole thing on my part, but he really creeped me out. He was super charming, but way too pushy, and was giving me some Ted Bundy vibes. 
So shout out to Facebook for introducing me to the creepiest person I have ever gone on a date with. Hey guys, I need some advice. For about three months, I've been experiencing hacking from what I assume to be another tenant in my building. It began with hacking my Bluetooth speaker. I would be listening to something while doing some housework, and the next thing I would know is my device would be disconnected, and the hacker would start playing some very creepy and inappropriate music via the speaker. The main song that would play is Fucked With An Anchor by Ailstorm. A song that I never heard until this. If you choose to listen to the song, you will see why this immediately freaked me out. I would try everything I could to turn it off, but they would put the volume on full blast, playing it over and over again. This happened on two separate occasions. After this, I stopped using my Bluetooth speaker to prevent this from happening again, until they hacked into my PlayStation and began playing the same song, again on full volume and continue to play after I tried to press pause or exit the music app. I then unplugged my PlayStation and have not used it since. Finally, yesterday, I had asked Google a question via my Google Nest device, and straight after, I heard a ding on the device, signaling someone else was controlling it, which is only possible if I grant access, also the case with all the other devices they hacked so far. Straight after the ding, the hackers started playing the creepy music again. Different from last time, it was an old song with a very creepy undertone and the only words I can remember is, times are getting hard boy. I straight away unplugged my device to stop the music and I have stopped using the device altogether. The reason this had me freaked out more than the last few times is the fact I was on the phone with a friend at the time talking about some personal things I had going on Therefore, I believe the hacker is able to hear me. I'm unsure whether this is due to him being a direct neighbor of mine or whether they hacked my devices to listen to me. I'm completely stumped with what to do now as I've contacted my landlord and all he said was that he would send a warning email to all the tenants, but I need to contact my internet provider for further action. I should have mentioned this earlier, but I live in a student accommodation and to make it cheaper, everyone uses the same Wi-Fi, but I have separate logins. So the reason it's so easy for them to hack into my devices is due to using the same Wi-Fi. I then contacted the internet provider and they said they can't do anything about it. I don't know what to do anymore. I have now had to forfeit the use of three separate devices to ensure this stops happening, but they continue to find a way to hack me. I feel incredibly unsafe and uneasy in my apartment. Becoming paranoid, someone is listening to me or watching me. I feel as if I'm going crazy. So please, give me advice. My roommate, Emma, had been swiping through Tinder for weeks. She was hoping to find someone interesting and genuine to go on a date with. Finally, she matched with a guy named Mark. After a few days of messaging back and forth, they agreed to meet up at a trendy bar downtown. The evening started out well, with Mark greeting her with a smile and compliment. They ordered drinks and started chatting, sharing stories, and laughing together. Emma told me that she felt at ease and enjoyed Mark's company, finding him charming and attractive. But as the night went on, Emma started noticing things that made her uncomfortable. Mark would occasionally touch her arm or shoulder without her permission, and he seemed to be drinking much more than she was. He also started talking about himself more and asking fewer questions about her. Despite these red flags, Emma decided to give him the benefit of doubt and agreed to go to another bar with him. Once they got there, Mark suggested that they go to a secluded area outside and talk privately. Emma hesitated for a moment, but Mark assured her that she was safe, and she reluctantly agreed. As they sat down, Mark leaned in and tried to kiss her. Emma pulled away, telling him that she wasn't ready for that yet, but Mark persisted. His demeanor suddenly became aggressive and intimidating. She felt trapped and vulnerable. She told me that she realized it was too late, that she had already put herself in a dangerous situation. Luckily, she managed to escape from Mark and quickly left the bar, but the fear and anxiety stayed with her long after the day ended. 
She couldn't shake the feeling that she had narrowly avoided a dangerous situation and vowed to be more cautious when meeting strangers from dating apps. It's important to remember that meeting someone from a dating app can be risky and it's crucial to take the necessary precautions to ensure your safety. Always meet in a public place. Let someone know where you will be and trust your instincts if something feels off. Emma is now dating a guy named Brad and they seem good together and I'm glad she won't have to go on another date from a dating site. I had been using Tinder for a few months and had gone on a few successful dates, so when I matched with Josh, I thought nothing of it. He seemed charming and funny in his profile, and we hit it off immediately. After a few days of messaging back and forth, he asked me on a date to a local coffee shop. When I arrived, Josh was already there waiting for me, and he looked just like he did in his pictures. We ordered our drinks and started talking. He seemed interested in me and was asking me a lot of questions about my life, which I appreciated. I felt like we had a real connection and we talked for hours. As the evening wore on, he suggested that we go to a nearby park to walk and continue our conversation. I hesitated at first, but he seemed trustworthy, so I agreed. The park was quiet and peaceful and we talked and laughed as we strolled along the paths. Suddenly, he stopped walking and turned to face me. He had a strange look in his eyes. As I felt a little pang of fear in my chest, without warning, he lunged at me, grabbing me by my arms and pinning me on the ground. I struggled to break free, but he was too strong. I screamed for help, but there was no one around to hear me. His grip tightened, and I could feel his breath on my face as he leaned in closer. I was terrified and thought I was going to die. But suddenly, he stopped and just let me go. I I'm sorry, he said, his voice shaking. I don't know what came over me. I scrambled to my feet, my heart racing. I didn't know what to do or say. I just wanted to get away from him as quickly as possible. I ran to my car and drove home, shaking and crying the entire way. I reported the incident to the police and they arrested Josh a few days later. It turns out that he had a history of violent behavior and had been stalking me for weeks before our date. I was lucky to have escaped from my life and I'm never using Tinder again. This experience left me traumatized and scared and I knew I couldn't take any more risks with my safety. I had been using plenty of fish for a while and I'd gone on a few decent dates, but nothing had really clicked yet. So when I got a message from Mike, I was excited. He seemed like the perfect guy, charming, funny, and we had a lot in common. We chatted for a few days and decided to meet up for drinks at a bar near my house. When I arrived, Mike was already there, talking to a few guys at the bar. We got a table off to the side and we ordered drinks and started talking. He seemed interested in me and was asking me the basic questions you ask on our first date. Felt like we had a real connection and our similarities were really crazy. As the night went on, Mike became increasingly flirtatious and touchy-feely. I was enjoying his company, but I started to feel a little uncomfortable with how much he was invading my personal space. When he suggested we go back to his place, I thought about it for a few minutes, but he was so charming I eventually agreed. We took an Uber to his apartment and things quickly escalated. We started making out on the couch, but then he became very forceful and began touching me in ways that I didn't want. I told him to stop, but he wasn't listening. I tried to push him away, but he was too strong. I started to panic and wondering how I was going to get out of the situation. Finally, I managed to break free and ran out of his apartment as fast as I could. I felt violated and shaken and knew I had to call the police and file a report. I called them right away and gave them Mike's information. A few days later, I found out that Mike had a history of sexual assault and had been in prison before. I was horrified and grateful that I had gotten away from him before anything worse could happen. This experience has scared me and traumatized me enough that I will never use any online dating again. 
Just because someone seems perfect online, it doesn't mean that they're a safe person. Every once in a while, the thought pops into my mind and I realize how stupid I was and how much worse things could have been. Ladies, be safe out there. I'd been using social media for years and thought I was pretty savvy when it came to online interaction. So when I started talking to someone on Instagram who seemed like the perfect guy, handsome, successful, and just smooth, I was excited. We chatted for weeks and quickly became close. But as time went on, I started to notice some inconsistencies in his stories. He would tell me all about his job one day and then change his story the next. He also refused to video chat with me or meet in person, citing work obligations and travel. I started to feel like something was off, but I was so invested in our conversations that I ignored the red flags. One day, he finally revealed to me that he had been using someone else's picture and identity to talk to me. He was actually a woman who had been pretending to be a man for months. I was shocked and hurt. I couldn't believe I had been fooled by this person. The woman then revealed that she developed real feelings for me and wanted to continue talking, even though she lied to me about who she was. I felt manipulated. I didn't want anything to do with her and cut off all communication. The story doesn't end there. Over the next few weeks, I started to receive messages from unknown accounts. They were threatening and aggressive, and I didn't know where they were coming from. I eventually discovered that the woman had been using multiple fake accounts to harass me and tried to get me to talk to her again. I was so scared and didn't know what to do. I didn't want to involve the police, but I also didn't know how to make it stop. It took weeks of blocking and reporting the accounts before the messages finally stopped. This experience left me feeling empty and scared. I realized that even though I was careful online, I could still be taken advantage of by someone who had skills in manipulation. After this happened, I deleted my Instagram and have no interest in being online anymore, which is a good thing because I have a full-time job and going to school, so I guess there's that. So a few days back, I went to a mall a bit far from the house, and things were really going good for the day, but then I was at the KFC in there. Someone on Grindr with a blank profile messaged me while waiting for my food. I shrugged it off, and he didn't send me any pictures, just a message saying hi to me, and asked me if he'd give me the best blowjob I would ever have. Seeing that I'm in a public place and absolutely do not have the mood to be horny, I didn't reply and proceeded to eat my meal. After eating, I left the mall while bringing the items I bought from there and waited for a ride to go home. It was dark around 8 p.m. so I had to be vigilant on my surroundings. While looking out on the road, the same guy messaged me and asked me where I was currently. I saw his distance from me was only 70 meters away, 230 feet from where I was standing this is getting a bit worse, so I closed the app immediately and proceeded to continue ignoring him. Around five minutes later, a guy stood beside me trying to act unsuspicious, even though my gut feeling was telling me something's wrong with him. He looked like he was in his late 30s. I'm 18 by the way. He was a bit bigger than me, both height and weight. I started to have goosebumps while standing next to him and it only got worse when he tapped my shoulder and asked if he could suck my dick off. I froze, having no idea what to do, while extremely anxious. But then I suddenly punched him in the face when he started to grab my crotch and tried to unbutton my pants. I then pushed him off of me hard enough that he laid on the ground, and I tried to run as far as I could. I then saw him chasing me afterwards. Luckily, a taxi drove nearby and I rushed inside as fast as I could. I knew that he had to be the guy that was spamming me messages on Grindr because his Grindr profile tells me that he was literally one meter away from me. I blocked their profile and logged out of the app. What I realized is I wasn't logged out at the time, therefore my location was exposed and I have a profile picture on the app with my face, meaning it was easy for me to be identified there. Also, the location of the mall is shitty and there isn't a ton of lights around. 
It's surrounded by shitty looking houses and roads. Worse, there wasn't much people around where I stood at the time, and it was also very dark, meaning I wasn't able to identify the man correctly to report him to the local authorities. I joined a Facebook group where people would post ads for butchering equipment. I had this old meat slicer that was no longer in use. As I was getting ready for work one morning, I got a message. It was around 6.20 a.m., but that didn't seem to bother this very passionate potential buyer. He asked a few questions about the meat slicer and seemed to be frantic, like his life depended on this machine. He requested a video call a few times to make sure the machine was working properly, which I rejected as I was getting ready for work. Then he found another ad I posted, an old typewriter. Apparently, he was also interested in that. He asked me about the price, if it was functional, etc. Standard questions. We had texted for about 20 minutes when he asked if he could call me to seal the deal. I gave him my number, to which he said, I can't call you. We're not on the same network. Can I call you on Facebook Messenger instead? So he did. I picked up and asked if he could hear me. No response. I looked at the screen and, well, let's just say I found it impressive that someone managed to participate in a semi-normal conversation and buying butchering equipment and a typewriter at 6.40 a.m. while jerking off. Years ago, I worked at a local casino. A lot of customers could be kind of weird, but this one guy in particular, who spent a lot of time flirting with me, seemed alright. So I agreed to go on a date with him that upcoming weekend. We met earlier on a Saturday night at his friend's house for a casual barbecue. Everything seemed nice, food was decent, but I did notice my date taking an obscene amount of jello shots. Later, we all agreed to go to a bar and hang out. My first red flag should have been the fact that my date tried to force French kiss me and stuck his tongue down my throat. Stupid me, blamed it on the alcohol. I know, I know, but I was young, insecure, and just didn't read the situation well at the time. We get to the local bar, and all was okay until they invited me to another party that would take place a few days later. I had other plans so I politely declined. My date's mood immediately changed and he became very hostile and angry. Within seconds he began yelling at me, telling me that I was a whore and that he knew what whores like me did at other parties. I was completely baffled. He kept screaming and becoming more violent and went on and on about how inappropriate it was for me to decline his invite and how I was just trying to fuck other guys. At this point, I started to freak out and decided to leave. He followed me out into the parking lot where he proceeded to yell more obscenities. I told him that I was not going to talk to him anymore and tried to get in my car. Then things got worse. He suddenly grabbed me by my shoulder and shoved me into the side of my car. Then he took one hand and grabbed me by my neck. While still yelling, he attempted to choke me and called me a whole mess of more bad words. I screamed and told him that he was hurting me and that I would call the cops if he didn't immediately let me go. I was actually amazed that he backed off. I jumped into my car and drove away as fast as I could. I can easily say that I've never been more frightened in my life. The next day at work, I immediately went to the security officers, which were run by the state troopers, and reported the assault to the officers. Since this guy was a regular visitor at the casino, I was not going to take any chances of running into him again. They pulled up his long criminal record and lo and behold, charge after charge of assault, stalking, and even kidnapping. I completely freaked out. They put him on a blacklist and when he showed up at the casino a few days later, he was arrested and forbidden to come there ever again. Unfortunately, a few days later, I found out from some of my female co-workers that they knew he was crazy and had a history, but they didn't want to tell me because I was a new girl and would figure it out myself. I was livid and felt totally betrayed. 
Not only that, but I was paranoid that he would come back after me because I had him banned from the premises. He was consistently calling and texting me, leaving threatening voicemails on my phone that lasted almost a year. And it gets worse. Less than two weeks after this, another girl I worked with ended up getting kidnapped by another regular. She was not so lucky and was held hostage for three days in this dude's basement. He had been coaxing her and gaining her trust for two years. Luckily, she was found and recovered well. As soon as I found out, I quit and walked out, never been back, and will never set foot into another casino. Edit, thank you for all the kind words and responses to this. I've been waiting to share this for a while. It definitely helps to write it out and reflect. All I know is many years later, look out for another and stand up for what is right. You just never know. So about seven years ago, I had an online date who after I told him a second date wouldn't happen, decided to show up at my place of work. Needless to say, I was extremely hesitant to dive back into the pool of online dating. In fact, since then I can count on one hand the number of men I've dated from online. But my sister and best friend have both met men over the last year on the app that connects through Facebook. It's used to help filter out catfishes and also tries to find mutual friends of friends that would match what you're looking in for a partner. So over the last month, I've been talking to guys here and there, but hadn't actually found one I was ready to move beyond text with. Then this guy came along. We chatted in the app and he was really nice and seemed safe. After almost three weeks of daily texting, I agreed to a date. For the first time ever, I did not stalk his social media profile because I wanted to stop self-sabotaging. I tend to dig so deep that I know too much before the date and have already made my decision that there will be no second date. Yes, I'm extremely paranoid. So I show up to the first date and it's okay. He's mostly quiet and kind of shy, but polite. I know I have a big personality and can dominate conversations, so I decide to give him a second shot. As the week leading up to date two goes on, I start getting apprehensive and tell myself not to sabotage this. I realized because I didn't want to stalk his profile, I didn't know his last name, so I text him and ask. He seems hesitant to tell me. He asked me what I need to know, so I respond jokingly that I typically ask before the first date so I can know who my murderer is, but we're beyond that, so now I simply want to know who I'm dating. It takes him a while to respond, but he sends it finally, and then doesn't text again for a while. I keep my promise to myself and don't social media stalk him. I tell some of my friends who start to seem hesitant about me seeing him again. Date 2. I show up to the restaurant, my choice, and it's pretty empty so there's plenty of parking right up front. I park and wait. I see another car pull in. He drives past all the open spots, my car included, which he knows because he walked me out after the first date. He parks over at the side of the building, gets out, walks past my car, and texts me that he saw me in the lot. It seemed a little awkward, but I ignored it. We enjoy the date and spend an hour and a half talking until the restaurant closes. We discussed where in the city we live, general direction and the fact that we lived in those areas our entire lives. We also discuss social media and he claims to not have a social media account. This should have been a red flag since the app takes place on Facebook. Although the conversation was much better, I wasn't sure if I was ready to tell him I wanted to see him again, so I figured I would just go home and think about it. He walks me to my car but walks uncomfortably close behind me. I ignore this and turn to give him an awkward hug and said goodbye. I don't open my car until he walked away. I leave and get out on the road and head home. There aren't many cars in the area as it's a heavily restaurant laden area and most are closing for the night. I get to the main road I need to turn down to go to the direction I live in and I notice a car behind me also gets in the turning lane. 
At that time, I wasn't going home because I was going to make a quick stop at the grocery store to grab some items I needed for dinner the following night. The light turns red and they sit extremely far back. I look in the mirror and I realize it's him. No big deal. I'm sure it's just a coincidence that he's going this way. There are other stores this way as well. I refuse to become paranoid and overthink things. So I get to the intersection that the store is at and note that he's still in the far lane. So I hop in the left hand lane to turn into the store and notice he cuts over two lanes to get behind me. That seemed odd, but maybe he just didn't know where the entrance to the shopping center was. Still, really odd coincidence that he'd be coming this way, especially without sending a text or something, acknowledging that he was behind me when we were the only two cars on the road. I pull into the store and note that he pulls into a row before I do and decide to loop around and pull back out onto the service road. I slowly drive back onto the main road Noticing, he gets out of his car and scans the parking lot. Not a casual scan like, is there a better parking spot, but a prolonged, where are you scan. I get back out on the road and drive all the way to another out of the way grocery store that I actually used to work at. Knowing it's a safe place and in a more heavily populated end of the town with some friends who will be there to make sure I feel safe. Needless to say, I haven't heard from him since, and I think he knows I know. It took me a while, but I found his social media. His first name was not what he told me. I dug through my text with him until I found a screenshot that he sent me of an Instagram page, which listed mutual followers. Another red flag, I should have remembered that he obviously had an Insta. I started digging through the accounts listed until I found one that's not private and finds his profile. This leads to the ability to reverse Google image until I found his Facebook which has a different first name and city that is nowhere near where he claimed to live. Time to delete my dating profile again. The story is really reaching back to a time before all the dating sites were really a thing, and way before smartphones and apps were the center of our lives. Back then, before everything was so simplified, I used to be a long-time member of a certain IRC. For the kids out there, that's Internet Relay Chat Room. These were chat rooms that were more or less embedded on websites, and they were pretty much anonymous in the fact that all you really had to have was a display name and not much else. Hell, most of them had a feature that would let you join in as an unnamed guest, and the rooms would sometimes be filled with guests 04235 and such. They were a lot of fun, and I kind of miss those days, but nowadays the internet is all about look at me specifically, so... The idea of anonymity being a core concept is relegated to pretty much just the dark web. Now, despite the fact that there was this layer of anonymity with IRC chat rooms, it was actually quite common to quote unquote find love while chatting with these people. There was a direct messaging system too, so you could have conversations one on one, and you could get to know the person on the other end pretty well even if there was no way to confirm literally anything they told you or said. I'm certain that some of the people I spoke with that were interested in me were probably 60-year-old guys pretending to be women in their 20s. And that's okay. I could safely say that this was a long time ago, or that that was the old me. <laughs> now, there was one person that I spoke with in these chat rooms that I actually did have a bit of a relationship with, albeit only for a couple of months. Her username was the title to an Evanescence song, with some X's and numbers thrown in the mix, but I can safely say that her actual name was Taylor. Taylor was a year older than me at the time. I was 21 and she had just turned 22 when we met and had started speaking. I don't remember why we started talking one-on-one, -on -one, but we did. And after a while, 
things seemed to get to a point where we both wanted to start a relationship. Now, long-distance relationships back then were a bit different than what they are in 2023. Long-distance phone calls were expensive, and cell phones had set text and talk minutes, so it wasn't like you could be as close to the other person as you can in the current year. Because of this, we had our IRC conversations, and we also had emailed each other a few times. And, before anybody mentions that Taylor was probably one of the 60-year-old men that liked to roleplay as a young woman, I actually knew that Taylor was legit. We had sent pictures to each other, including pics to prove that we were real. This was essentially a picture with the date, time, and our username written on our hands in Sharpie, and covering one of our eyes. Yes, things were that complex back then. You had to be creative to come up with something that was difficult to fake, to prove that you were who you said you were. Now, all of this is to say that Taylor was gorgeous. She was exactly what you would think of when I say, 22-year-old girl with an Evanescence username that likes to talk in IRC rooms dyed black hair, bright blue eyes, liked the color black on everything, had a few face piercings, and let me tell you, I instantly fell in love with her. I even told her that she was literally the girl I was looking for in life, and she thought that that was the funniest thing ever. From there, we did say that we were dating, actually. We would chat every night, send pictures of ourselves through email, and while things never went past PG-13, this was the happiest I had ever been in my life. We had our little relationship for almost three months on the dot, and everything seemed great, until there was a stretch of time that she just didn't log in. I didn't see her in our chat rooms, and I would email her, but she wouldn't reply. I was genuinely upset thinking maybe something happened to her, maybe she wasn't really as interested in me as she had claimed. I was almost heartbroken, thinking I had messed this up, and that this was a once-in-a-lifetime thing that I had just ruined. I kept emailing her every night, just hoping she would see them or maybe send a response like, oh, my internet was out for a few days, sorry about that. Or, I was out of town. I was basically holding out hope that she would say anything to bring it back together. And then, I did get a response, but it was a rather strange one. It was just, hey, hop on IRC. It actually made me almost giddy to hear from her again, so I did what she requested and logged in. Immediately, she sent me a DM saying hello. I replied, asking how she was and if she was okay, she completely ignored those messages and just said, What's your address? I want to send you something. I have to pause here to say that I was dumb, and I was in love with this girl, so I didn't hesitate at all in giving this random internet person my address. Nowadays, I would be lambasted for doing something so stupid, and rightfully so, but back then... There really wasn't this concept of internet strangers are not your friend. So I responded to her, told her my address, thinking that this was maybe the start of us moving into something a little more serious. And of course, the response that I got back was not what I expected, nor what I wanted. The message that I got back from Taylor was clear as day, and I actually remember it word for word. <laughs> This is Taylor's husband. Stop messaging my girl, or else you'll be next. And that was it. What I would be next for was anybody's guess, but this was pretty clearly a threat. I mentioned that she never told me she was married, and then mentioned that she and I were really good friends, and if he was really her husband, I would respect that. After a few moments of silence... They logged out of the account, leaving me confused, 
devastated, and just overall feeling kind of betrayed. That was the last time that I ever spoke with that account. They never logged back into the server, and Taylor never responded to any of my emails. So, that was effectively the end of my relationship, but not the end of the story. About two weeks later, I actually got a package at my house. The return address just said Taylor. There was no address or city or anything like that, it was just her name. I hesitated to opening it, thinking that it was going to be something messed up, and, well, it was. When I opened the box and moved all the packing materials, there at the bottom of the box was a kitchen knife, and on the blade of the kitchen knife was a hard, crusty, brown-red substance that I assume was blood. I immediately called the police, asking them to send an officer to my house because I had gotten a package with a potential murder weapon. That was a really fun story to try to explain to the officer when he got there, not going to lie. I had to tell him that I had met a girl on the internet, and that we were dating, but then her real-life husband had threatened me after I gave him my address, and then today the package showed up. I feel like if I had to tell this story to an officer this year, it would be less strange, but back in 2003, it was like explaining foreign concepts, and they had a lot of questions. I ended up having to go to the station to pretty much be interrogated, and after answering questions for about four hours, they decided that I was probably telling the truth, and they took the knife, saying that they would look further into it. I don't know what they were looking into. All I had was her first name, online username, and a picture of her. <laughs> I have no idea if their investigation ever went anywhere, nor do I know if that blood was human. But it was definitely sent to me as a threat, and it told me what he meant when he said I was next. All of this was 20 years ago, and looking back, I do kind of miss the old internet. Hopefully this can trigger some nostalgia for your older audience and maybe educate your younger audience on how things used to be. Remember kids, don't tell strangers where you live, or you may end up with a bloody knife in your mailbox. The story takes place when I was 19 years old. At the time, I was dating a guy, 19 male, and had been for only a couple of months. My parents had left on a trip to visit family in the United States. I grew up in Mexico. I decided to sneak my then boyfriend into my house and spend the weekend with me while they were gone. I never would have expected what happened. My parents had left me their car, and my boyfriend used to be a professional level bodybuilder and trainer, and knew a lot of shady people. One night, he tells me this friend wants to meet up in the city, an hour's drive from the town we lived in. As I was the one with the car, I was down to drive him and meet his friend. We meet in a shady bar in a so-so part of the city. I was instantly uncomfortable with this guy. He was too familiar, too comfortable, too obnoxious to everyone, myself included. All of a sudden, after a private talk outside between him and my boyfriend, my boyfriend, who I'll call A, approaches me and says that we need to give him a ride back to my place. I'm sorry, I'm not comfortable with this. He was a bit nervous and tells me, quietly, to hush. This isn't someone that we could afford to offend. I asked him why he can't drive, to which he told me he's too intoxicated and needed a private setting to talk to him. As dumb as I was, I ended up agreeing. I was very uncomfortable and had this terrible feeling the whole way home, which my boyfriend drove. We get home, they sit outside, and suddenly this man starts demanding I cook him dinner. I was a very obstinate teen. I hated and still do being told what to do. As I begin to deny him, A looks at me, a bit pale, and shakes his head. I go in, fuming at the order and feeling bossed around in my own home, and make a simple dinner. 
After the dude left, I learned from my boyfriend that he was the head narco of our city. I mean, the head honcho. I was livid that he brought this guy to my family's home. He was very pushy and without words, slightly threatening, so I very much feel like I had made a mistake. It very well could have ended terribly for me. My wife passed away after many years of battling an awful disease. We were married for 13 years, and after several months of not being able to find my footing, I made the decision to move out of state and start a new chapter to force myself into beginning a new life. I was immediately validated by starting my first job in over 8 years. Things slowly began moving forward, and after prodding from my friends, I signed up for a mobile dating app. I met a couple of people I didn't really have a lot of chemistry with. The first date I went on was cordial, but not of any consequences. She wound up asking me to fix a laptop she had. The second person I met called me and we decided to meet for Chinese food. Since I don't have a car, I walked about 5 or 6 blocks, but not before it started to rain. She had already sat at a table and was waiting for me to arrive. We exchanged pleasantries, and soon it's all about her divorce and why she lost her kids and all the legal proceedings of her case. And then she would pause, clap my hand on the table, turn her head, lean in a bit and say, But nothing compared to what you went through. Tell me about your dead wife. Like clockwork, she would ramble on about the craziest stuff, about how they're all trying to get her. And then she stops the crazy babbling to ask me details about how bad it felt and my poor wife's decline in condition. I had only put on my profile that I was a widower, nothing else. It was at that point that I got seriously weirded out, deep in my gut, fully weirded out. What I couldn't figure out was if she was trying to mimic what she thought a sensitive person would be like. Or was there a possibility that she wanted to know those painful graphic details for other perverted reasons and made short work of the entree and paid the entire check? She called me on my phone a few times and I made several excuses why I was unable to meet again. I got a couple of calls from a blocked number that didn't say anything but they stopped after a month or two. I'm blessed and remarried but I'm so grateful I noped the F out that night and never mess with that lady again. This happened back in March. I met this guy on a dating site, and let's just call him Jay for the rest of the story. Anyway, we chatted for a while on the site and exchanged numbers and chatted for about a week or two until he asked me out. Even before we met up, he just gave a creepy vibe and was asking some really weird and sexual questions. But I'm the type of person who gives people chances. Anyway, the day of the date, and from the moment we met at the Starbucks, it went downhill from there. He was very creepy and trying to touch or hold my hand, asking me strange questions, and just making me feel uncomfortable. Saying that he was going to take me on vacation, and that we were going to have a blast. In my mind, this dude had lost his marbles. I kept looking down on my phone to see if my cousin was on her way. She was my left home, but there was no text. At that point, he was like, why don't you sit in my car? I was looking at him like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? So I responded, I don't think so. Thankfully, my cousin texted me that she was outside, so I told him. He was like, oh, I cleaned out my car and was going to give you a lift home. I didn't say anything to him on our way out. We just stood there and he tried to come closer to me. I asked him, what are you doing? And he's like, I was going to kiss you. Anyway, I said bye to him and get into my cousin's car. And her son is in the back seat and he's 11 years old. He goes to his car and my cousin takes off and next thing you know, my cousin turns around and says he's following our car. I started to panic for a moment, but my cousin kept going down the street. I told her to turn to a gas station and see if he keeps following us in there or if he keeps going straight. Thankfully, he kept going straight. 
Anyways, everything was okay after that and I never went out with him again. I actually have two dating stories that should be pretty quick, hopefully, and they're not necessarily horror as in scary, but they're horror in the sense that they were horrifying and turned me off online dating pretty much altogether. I don't think much backstory is really needed for me, beyond the fact that I was in my mid-twenties, have never really had luck with meeting people that I care to really spend time with, and I wasn't exactly picky with who I swiped match on. When I say that I wasn't picky, I mean that as long as they were a guy above a 2 on a scale of 10, and didn't throw out any major super creep vibes, I was pretty willing to give them a try. I know that this may sound pretty dumb to some people, but I'm the kind of person that is really willing to give anyone a shot to see if we vibe, if that makes sense. Anyways, on to the first date story. I had matched with a guy named Jake on one of the apps, and he seemed like a pretty straightforward guy. His profile was your basic mid-twenties dude that was into tech and fitness, two things that were actually bonuses for me. He and I spoke for a while, sent a few photos, had a few phone calls, and he was pretty much the most average guy I've ever spoken with. I was totally okay with average. In fact, that's kind of what I was looking for more than anything. We agree to meet up for lunch at a small diner-like restaurant, and we set a date. The day comes, I show up first, and I get the table for the two of us. As I'm sitting there, just waiting, I get a text from Jake saying that he's had some car troubles and that he's going to be a few minutes late, but... He was 100% not ghosting me. That was fine with me. I get it. I've had my shares of why won't my rust bucket start moments. I tell him I'm at the table, and that it's totally fine, that I understand, and so forth and so on. After about 20 or so more minutes, he finally does walk into the restaurant and to our table. But he looks like he's having a panic attack. He's sweating, it was early spring so it was still pretty chilly outside, and he just looked distressed and disheveled overall. He sits down, and immediately just kind of looks like he's lost all sense of the situation. Like something has happened, and he's freaking out. But he can't make it not obvious that he's freaking out. I ask him if he's okay and what's going on, and he kind of just starts looking at me like he's about to start sobbing. As soon as this happens, I hear shouting. I see several cops running into the restaurant, telling him to get down on his knees and subsequently arresting him. It took me a few minutes to convince them that I was already there at the restaurant, and that I was not with him prior to the minute he walked in. Thankfully, the host and server could vouch for me on this. As come to find out... On his way to the date, Mr. Jake had actually hit someone with his car and then kept going. I don't mean like he sideswiped or bumped somebody else's vehicle. I mean he literally hit a person and ran over their leg, causing major injury and then kept going to meet up with me at the restaurant. I'm assuming I was supposed to be an alibi or I guess I would have been if he hadn't already been being followed and looked for by the police. So, obviously, that date ended pretty quickly with him being shoved in the back of a police cruiser, and me just staring at the floor like, what the hell am I doing with my life? Thankfully, the waiter was sympathetic, and she didn't make me pay for my drink, which was nice. I guess at least I got a free Dr. Pepper out of the situation, the second one is one that's not necessarily scary, but it's still what I would consider a dating horror story. It was, once again, a story where I met up with a guy that I had met on one of those dating apps. This one was a dude named Chris. Chris's profile was a bit above the others that I looked at on the apps, because Chris was actually really attractive, and he was all about staying fit, 
as he claimed he was former military. Now, I've never been with a military guy, but I do know a few of them. My brother, for one. And I have found that most of them are fairly tolerable, and even pretty fun to hang out with. Talking with Chris went pretty smoothly, at first, though he seemed to have a really strict I-can't-chat-with-you-before-8pm kind of schedule about him, which, admittedly, had me initially concerned that he may have been a married man looking for an affair. I figured I would at least see it through to the first date, and see if I could spot an indentation on his ring finger, or try to ask him what it was all about. I mean, it could have been that he had a job that he worked until then and couldn't have his phone with him. Or maybe he just had other adult responsibilities that he had to see to. I was willing to be patient with him and to get answers, so we scheduled a date for dinner. That 8pm rule made it kind of hard to do anything else, and I was looking forward to it. Once again, I was early to the date, and I got a table for us. Then, when he finally shows up to the date, he walks in with another woman. I was a bit confused and taken aback, thinking he really had the audacity to bring someone else to a date like that, but it was even more awkward when he sat down and said, It's very nice to finally meet you in person. This is my mother. This man literally brought his mother on the date without warning me. Now, mind you, if his mother had needed his care or been disabled, I would have had no issue with it, assuming he probably would have informed me beforehand. But this woman was quite fit, and definitely able to take care of herself. And she was definitely there because she wanted to be there. Which was even weirder. At no point did Chris stop and think or act like this was a weird thing. He just kept up the conversation as if she wasn't there. Then, it hit the apex of, oh my god, this is so freaking awkward, when it came time to order. He tried to order one thing, and his mother told him no, then told the waiter something else. When the waiter walked away, he tried to tell his mom that he wanted the other thing, almost whining like a little kid, but she told him that it was too fatty and that he needed to watch his carbs. I just kind of sat there like, what? Was this woman really ordering for her adult former military son like this while he was on a date with another woman? Again, I know that this wasn't scary, but it was definitely my, nope, I'm done with this moment. The entire date was so strange, and I pretty much ghosted him after this. I tried to think that maybe I was just being shallow about the whole thing, but it was too much. Chris was actually my last date through any of those apps, and I kind of just embraced being single for a while, for reasons that I think are pretty obvious. When I was seven years old, my mom and father got divorced. This event prompted her to move and follow her career in a different small town, which would pay better as she was now a single parent. On our long 12 hour drive to the new location, we stopped on the way in this little town, which is very hippie with lots of art and little shops. My mom said that we were gonna meet up with her friend Paulette. I guess they went way back in her college days and recently got in touch after a decade. We end up going to this East Indian restaurant where we would meet for dinner. This slender, somewhat fragile woman walks in she was very tall, over six feet, big frizzy, curly brown hair with blonde streaks in it. She was Caucasian, wearing a colorful shawl with feather earrings and with very pale blue eyes. She looked like a mosaic tapestry or something. She walks over to the table and gives my mom a big greeting and a big hug, makes her way over to my older brother and shakes his hand. After that, she comes around to my side of the table. 
I let my hand out to her, and she just stood there, expressionless, with her mouth partly open with a blank gaze, just staring at me. It briefly made me uncomfortable, and then a flick of a switch, the spark ignites in her face. She makes a huge cat smile, kneels over, and hugs me tightly. She goes back to sit with my mom, and they catch up while we eat dinner. My mom gets the bill and says to her in the parking lot, You can just follow us. We get in the car and my mom explains to us that she is actually coming over to live with us for a while. She followed us for the next several hours. We get to our new place and unpack our necessities. As we had a moving truck hired for the rest of the stuff, arriving in the morning. There is a bunk bed already set up at this place for me and my brother. It is fairly late into the night, roughly 11 p.m. when we arrived. My brother and I set up sleeping bags. I take the top bunk. My mom says goodnight and I fall asleep pretty quickly. I wake up around 1.30 a.m. I guess the patio deck light got turned on, which was right beside our bedroom. I gazed out the blinders and I could see the back of Paulette's curly hair. She was sitting on the deck, cross-legged, smoking a cigarette. I didn't think much of it and laid back down until I noticed the light from the window gets partially blocked. I look behind me with my head still on the pillow. I see the unmistakable outline of Paulette's shadow facing my window. She was there for a few minutes. I didn't want to lean up, I just pretended to sleep. Her shadow moves and I hear the front door close. The patio light turns off after a few minutes. I reposition myself facing the wall to go back to sleep. As I begin to drift off, the door in my room opens, slowly, and I quickly turn my head around. It wasn't my mom, it was Paulette wearing a nightgown. I turn back to face the wall and close my eyes. She gently makes her way to my bunk. I feel her fingers in claw formation start to comb the back of my hair, running her nails on the back of my scalp. I keep my eyes closed tightly, nearly holding my breath, trying not to give a sign that I'm awake. I smell some essential oils, like lavender, and she starts rubbing oil on the back of my neck and pinching the back of my neck muscles, sometimes holding it and releasing. I began to kind of accept what's happening because it didn't feel all that bad after a while. I actually ended up falling asleep after my initial confusion. I wake up in the morning my mom is off at work and Paulette is waiting at the table with cereal for me and my brother. She puts some chocolate chips in my bowl and not my brother's. My brother and I make small talk. She was very giggly and seemed to be trying to make us feel comfortable with the new situation. My brother heads back to his room to set up his GameCube after his cereal. I was a slower eater than my brother so I always was the last at the table. As slowly as I ate, she was sitting there watching my every move. Once I finished, I said, thank you, and grabbed my bowl to bring it to the sink. She places her hand on mine and says, I gave you a neck massage so you wouldn't pee your bed. I know a lot of younger ones pee their bed when they sleep in unfamiliar surroundings. I looked up at her and said, I've never peed my bed before, but thank you. She continued to massage the back of my neck for the next few nights. I ended up telling her that I'm comfortable here and there's no need for you to do this anymore. She reacted to that with a sigh, but acknowledged it. I started elementary school the following week, which meant going to bed earlier, around 8 p.m. Her and my mom would stay up much later than my brother and I to drink wine. I always waited for them to go to bed before I used the washroom at night to go pee because my mom would kind of scold me for being up so late on weeknights. Once things got quiet around 11, I'd sneak out and tippy-toe to the washroom. This was my ritual for the next few weeks until Paulette started doing the same exact thing at the same time, every time. Every night when I used the washroom, it just so happened that Paulette needed to use it too and she would blaze down the hallway across my room when I opened my door. I'd go back into my room and wait for her. It started happening so frequently that I would just go outside to pee from the back mudroom door. This started to piss me off, no pun intended. I'd open my door as quietly as I could and then sprint to the washroom. This seemed to be effective for a while. 
One night, I get up slightly later than usual, around midnight. I was a little more careless with the noise because I was half asleep. I open the door and Paulette's door opens instantly. She barges out into the dimly moonlit hallway, completely naked, and starts walking quickly down the hallway. I was already so far down the hallway, I couldn't turn back to my room. I jumped behind my mom's jade plant and squished my knees to my chest and tucked my head down. She whizzes straight by me, so fast I felt the wind push my hair. She stays in the washroom for almost an hour, with the door opened a crack, lights off, in silence. I stayed there beside the washroom, tucked in the corner beside the plant, not making a sound. I hear the washroom door open completely, and she starts pacing up and down the hallway. I kept small behind the plant until she goes back into her room. I brush this off as a complete accident. It was just unfortunate timing. But now, every night going forward, she would literally sprint down the hall, naked, if I made a single noise, creak the floorboard, or open my door. About two months into this, my brother and I were sword fighting with tree branches outside. He ends up clipping my forehead, causing it to bleed pretty bad. Paulette sees it happen. She walks up to my brother for what I thought would be to scold him. But no, she stomp kicks him in the head with her boot, causing him to fall back on his back. He gets up off the ground crying and runs into the house. She grabs me and starts cradling me, rocking me back and forth. She's shaking so much that she's vibrating, repeatedly asking me, are you hurt? In a shaky voice. Anyway, my mom finds out through my brother what happened and decides that she needs to leave. Her final day, she made a point to see me one-on-one -on -one in the driveway before entering her car. She knelt down and said, I hope I can see you in a different life. You remind me so much of my husband. Goodbye. And starts bawling her eyes out, hugging me. I asked my mother who her husband was. I guess he was a Marine who died in Afghanistan a few months prior to her moving in with us. My mom said she would frequently say how much I reminded her of him on a daily basis. My mom hasn't spoke to her since. I never told my mom about the massages or anything to this day as she was already exiled and I felt that it would just cause more drama. My best friend and I grew up in a sleepy wannabe New Jersey Central Florida town and were outcasts. We met in 6th grade when I overheard her talking to another classmate about Bionicles, my 11 year old self's passion. We became fast friends and soon were inseparable. Soon began the gauntlets of sleepovers, birthday parties, and family gatherings. We were practically siblings. She was the first person I came out to as bisexual. As in turn, I was the first person she told about being trans. Her home life was tumultuous, though I can't say mine was any better. We often had a habit of taking refuge at each other's houses. Like I said, we became like siblings. Her father was an alcoholic, strict, and prone to physical discipline. Her sister was a stuck-up girl who soon gravitated towards the hicks and jocks when we entered high school and her mother was a pseudo-vegan hippie love child held over from the 80s. When I was 23, and she was 22 at the time, we had another long night sleepover in order to let her escape yet another fight with her mother. She had recently lost her job at Walmart, and I was going into my first shift at Taco Bell the next day. On the drive home the next morning, she excitedly told me that since she now has her own car, she would be applying to pizza places that were in need for a driver. I was proud. It was the first time she had hunted a job on her own, as I'd usually been the one to coax her into applying where I was working. Not that she ever lasted very long. My first day of training goes quite well. My coworkers are friendly and try to get me to talk more. My manager likes to playfully embarrass me by trying to get me to talk hood to the other coworkers. Being a training day, it wasn't a very long shift, but I had been up pretty early in anticipation, and this was my first day on a job in a few months. I got home around noon and informed some of my internet friends that my first day went well, and around 5pm I start to go to bed, drained from a good day. As I'm preparing to lay in my bed, I get a steam message. 
her lamenting another fight with her mother, asking if she could come over. Now, I had started to grow a bit weary of their fights on their end. I began to repair my relationship with my family and a few friends, and I had given her advice many times on how to better approach things. In my infinite wisdom and eagerness to sleep, I left the message unread and drifted off to slumber. Around 8 p.m., I am awakened by her bursting into my room in panic. Having just been ripped from a dream, I am groggy and disoriented. I drag myself into the bathroom to relieve my bladder and come back to my room to find her rocking back and forth on my bed. It is at this time that I notice that she is covered in blood, so I ask her what happened. She informs me that she just saw someone murder her mother with a knife. My mind goes blank. In the deepest part of my mind, alarm bells are ringing. Isn't the rocking back and forth a little bit overdramatic? Why didn't she call the police? But this is my best friend. I've known her for over a decade, and we were the only two people in the world we could count on. I suppress these feelings and go to inform my sister and stepfather. My mother had passed away a year prior, and it was roughly a month to the anniversary of her death. We were all in a dark place, antisocial as always. It was the only way we knew how to handle emotional issues. When I informed my family, they immediately go to the same place I did, though they were far more vocal about it. I offer excuses I know myself were flimsy, and return to my room, phone in hand, I convince her to call the police, and I can hear the explanation and details over the phone. A man in the black ski mask. When the cops arrive, she swears up and down that it was most likely her father. They send cars over to check the crime scene and take her statement. I ride with her in back of the cop car over to the sheriff's office. It gets to be around 2 a.m. Her sister was brought in, as was her father. I have work the next morning and request to be taken home by an officer. It takes me a while to get to sleep. The next day at work, I'm quiet until my manager asks me what has happened. I inform him but decide to work the rest of my training shift. When I get home, my sister informs me that she had confessed. Her mom had threatened to kick her out for not being able to find a job and she enraged had taken a kitchen knife and stabbed her repeatedly. My mind froze like a bad computer and I turned my face to the monitor. I was in a Discord call at the time, and all I could weakly say was, my best friend just confessed to murdering her mother before hanging up and laying down on my bed. Her trial started on the 7th of this month. I don't know the results, though my grandmother tells me that she took a plea deal for life in prison rather than the death penalty. Part of me wants to contest that to demand that they take the death penalty for ridding this earth of such a peaceful and caring woman. A larger part of me was just glad that she was being punished. Natalie, you are my best friend, my sister, my platonic soulmate. But please, let's never meet again. I'll start with some brief context. I lived with an abusive male partner who didn't value my safety whatsoever. He would get really mad if I didn't leave the door unlocked and we lived in a not so great part of town. He was way older than me. I was barely 18 at the time and he was 26. Neither of us owned a car. He worked at a Waffle House and I was getting sick constantly so keeping a job wasn't easy for me. He liked drugs and alcohol and he traumatized me in regards to both blamed me for his usage and would assault me while on it. When I finally got the courage to leave for the last time, I did it while he was at work. I begged my mom to help me get my necessities, stuff with emotional value and some clothes. Instead, she called the cops. There was a warrant out for his arrest and she got a police escort just in case. As soon as he got out, he immediately started messaging me from different new numbers threatening to murder me and my family if I didn't go home with him. It didn't matter how much I blocked him, he kept at it. I was scared, but I thought for the most part I was safe. After all, he didn't have a car. I was wrong. About a week into this, he and his gun-owning friend showed up. He banged on the door and was screaming. His friend owning a gun is important because he repeatedly said that he and said friend would shoot us. 
My window was on the second floor facing the street and my stomach dropped when he saw me. I immediately dropped and army crawled to my little brother's room and hid in the closet. His window was facing the backyard. I guess my monkey brain felt safer there. I was the only one home and was scared that if I breathed too loud, he would hear me. I was terrified. I didn't want to call the police because I thought that he would hear that too, so I silently texted my mom. The police arrived about 20 minutes after my mom said that they were on their way. He and his friend were taken into custody after the same friend had gotten him, gotten him out on bond. Friend did have a gun. He didn't. Bottom line, I was able to get a restraining order. I am strictly sober and definitely in therapy after that. This is my first Reddit post and it's going to be heavy. It contains mention of physical and mental abuse. So this is a trigger warning for everyone. I'm an 18 year old female. I met my ex, male, 22, in February of 2020 but didn't end up dating him until I was closer to my 17th birthday because he still lived with his girlfriend. He told me that they were just friends and he didn't like her like that and I didn't find out till later that they were actually still doing things together and meeting him was the biggest mistake of my life. Everything started off great as every relationship goes. I sent pics because he was my boyfriend, so you know. And of course, I let him save them for later use. Another big mistake. I noticed that they were still texting and went through his phone and he was saying that he still loved her and missed her. I was deeply hurt and called him out on it. He apologized and said that it would never happen again. I told him to text her that we were dating and he did. She was pissed. She stopped paying for the house and helping him pay his car payments. And at this time, he had quit his job at Taco Bell and refused to do his new job Ubering because I need to practice League of Legends because I want to be a pro league streamer. So I worked my ass off and ended up losing my job because the manager didn't let me work without a doctor's note. So I was stuck working his job while he played games. Before I met him, I had 4000 in my savings. He ended up using my card to pay his phone bills, car payments, the apartment, daily weed, fast food, new league accounts, and fucking CSGO knives. He kept losing his accounts due to telling people to off themselves and using F and N slurs, but the worst was yet to happen. I found out that he was using an old tablet to excessively watch porn, set up dating accounts, and have different Instagram accounts. But on these accounts, he was pretending to be a woman I called him out on this and told him I wanted to leave. He freaks out jumping around and screaming and crying, saying that he would change and I trusted him. As time went on, things got worse and I was scared to leave and by the end of this, you'll see why. He had shoved me to the wall and got into my face screaming, you stole my car keys because you don't want me to work because you're jealous of other girls. Which was stupid because he had thrown his keys at me during a different argument. But one day I went through his iPad and found that he was actively not just sending but selling my pictures from when I was 16 and 17 and he was doing the same with his other ex. I started to try to get my stuff together and put Gorilla Glue in his charging port to get rid of that filth I just saw. When he found out that it no longer charged, he was livid. He started screaming and getting in my face. I tried to go around him and grab my things. But when my back was turned, he pulled me down to the ground, wrestled me until he was able to put me in a chokehold. I was sobbing and just accepting that this was going to be the end. But before I blacked out, he let me go and I started gasping for air and gagging from the excessive coughing. He just stood over me and laughed at me. I tried to crawl away, but he grabbed my leg and started dragging me out of the apartment. I kicked, trying to get him off of me which just made him pull me like a dog playing tug of war. He eventually dragged me out, keeping my wallet, keys, and all my valuables. So I just sat there begging for my stuff so I could leave and just go home. He came outside and pulled me down the apartment stairs by my leg and I was left with extreme bruising and some cuts. I did end up calling the police, but they did absolutely nothing. 
Fast forward, he had to move because he had nowhere to stay or live after being evicted from the apartment and I had gotten a new job. One day it was particularly cold and I went to get a shirt out of my car and there he was. He was sitting in my car on his phone. I had left my door unlocked cause I work in a good area. I would called him a cheater and told him to leave. He got out of the car and was starting to go around the back so I jumped in and tried to lock the door from the back seat. He ran over and pulled the door open and started trying to pull me out of the car. I started screaming and kicking him. Thankfully, a customer saw this happening and called the police. They arrested him and told me to go home for the night, which they ended up firing me for. Unfortunately, he got bailed out and while he was in jail, he had given out my phone number to other people there. He walked four and a half hours to my house after he was released and he was looking around my backyard when my neighbor saw him and called my dad. My dad got in his truck with his gun and waited for him to come out of the gas station. He eventually did but ran off. He harassed me saying that he was going to show up to my graduation and ruin everything and has gotten to the point of making multiple fake accounts on Snapchat, Instagram and TikTok pretending to be me and his other ex. And as of today, January 1st, 2023, he still pretends to be high school girls selling our pictures and making fake accounts. I'm a 35 year old female. My ex friend, 36 male, let's call him Will. I met him early in middle school through a mutual friend. I always kind of got a feeling that he liked me, but we were never super close and he never made any kind of actions, so I let it go. Fast forward to a few years ago, we bonded over our love of watching professional hockey games. I moved to the city for college and he remained in our hometown four hours away. In the meantime, he married a very nice woman who I've met a few times and even brought her to the city for one of our periodic visits. Sometimes in the summer, we would go to baseball games. One year, we traveled to a neighboring city to go to an on-the-road hockey game. The city was two hours from my house, so we came there. We drove, watched the game, saw the sights, and drove back to my house later that night. He crashed on my couch and left the next morning. Here's where it takes a turn. I let Will know that I could take over driving if he ever got tired. He later told me that there was a couple times where it got dicey out there, but he didn't say anything at the time and drove the whole way. He also tailgated constantly. Needless to say, I felt unsafe in his car. A few days later, I posted a pot of chili I made on Instagram. He told me through three different mediums, Facebook, Insta, and text, that he would love to come over for dinner and could be there ASAP. Keep in mind, it's a four hour drive between our houses that coupled with the fact that I knew he was having marital problems. His wife had been in a traumatic car accident before they met and she was still struggling with health issues so sometimes she can't fully engage and that I've always had a feeling that he liked me made me uncomfortable enough to ask for some space. Surprise, surprise, he didn't respect my boundary. I posted on Facebook warning our friends about his behavior and blocked him, told him not to text or contact me again I have since moved and he has no idea where I live. I made it clear to friends not to tell him and they've all understood and said that they've noticed some erratic behavior from him. Fast forward another few years. Out of the blue, he tags me in a year in review post in which he took a photo of him burning the book I wrote from a brand new username that I never known about thus I didn't have blocked. I blocked this one and posted another message to my friends who offered a lot of great help and advice. Since he hasn't made over-overt threats or physically stalked me, I can't legally do anything. But joke's on him, he already paid me for the book and hundreds of the physical copies still live in the world, as well as the master docs on mine and my publisher's computers. I worked at a store that was very close to my house, so I walked home every day. The map of the story is, there's my job, my friend's job, a traffic light, a small park, another traffic light, three abandoned stores, and finally a gas station. The only busy part of this route is the gas station. One day I was leaving work and it was starting to get dark. 
When I left, there was an employee fixing the electrical box of the store that my friend works at. I glanced at him, not thinking anything of it, and waved to my friend. She smiled through the glass door and I continued on my way. It was just another normal day. When I was exactly in the middle of the park, I glanced quickly over my shoulder, because I'm an anxious woman, and saw the electrician who I just passed walking behind me. Everything I'm going to tell you happened very quickly. When I looked back again, his eyes were fixated on me and he had no expression on his face. All the alarm bells were going off in my head, so I started walking at a faster pace. More out of paranoia than real fear, than real fear. So I looked again, this time more slowly, and I noticed his steps increased in speed just like mine. His expression had also changed to anger and impatience, like a hunter frustrated because the little rabbit ran too fast. I think deep down our survival instincts know when someone wants to do something bad to us by just looking at them. I haven't started running yet. I don't know if when I looked back the third time, my fearful expression gave me away, but instead of walking, he began to almost run and walk at the same time. His strides became so long it was awkward to look at, and so I ran. I had seen this a thousand times on the news. The park was empty. It was just me and him. I knew what he wanted to do. I had my phone out of my hand, but the adrenaline was telling me to keep running and running. I ran the light and crossed the street, still not daring to look back. Maybe he was right behind me. What do I do? I thought after arriving to the abandoned stores, he would have given up. So I looked back one last time, and there he was, still not running, just walking super fast in a weird way. The adrenaline made me run even faster, and when I looked again after a while, he had suddenly stopped. The guy just stood there, his angry expression also fading away. His face looked blank. It was like he was staring into nothing, but his eyes, his eyes were still fixed on me. At this point, I was already approaching the gas station, and he was just a small silhouette that didn't move. My heart was still racing and my hand was shaking so badly I could barely type the password to my cell phone. I kept walking and looking back every second. He didn't move an inch. I started to get paranoid, thinking that maybe he really was an employee, that maybe I was imagining things, that he wasn't really following me. It's like your brain just starts to justify the situation, so you stop suffering. When I was already at the end of the gas station and the adrenaline was slowly decreasing, my boss called me and asked me if I arrived home yet. I said no. He said that my friend next door was worried about me because there was a crazy man pretending he had tools in his hand and pretending to fix the power box. She said she was too scared to tell him to stop and just watch the weird mimicking for a while. But then I passed by and he turned and followed me as if he was literally waiting for me. My friend was so scared that she started to record the man in case something happened and was ready to call the police. After the episode, I changed my route I did to go to work and even started to use a bike. Guys, don't forget to always stay alert of your surroundings. I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't realized as quickly as I did that he was following me. He would have reached me in seconds. I'm a 26 year old female. I live in a flat building in a good area. It's a long, windy cul-de-sac, so there's not too many cars coming in and out unless it's people leaving or coming from work. My boyfriend is away to Thailand for a month and we usually take our dogs out together at night. I went myself, which I was fine with. I usually feel safe. Last week around 8 p.m. I left my flat to take my dog pee. My dog is extremely excitable, especially around other people. She just had her space surgery. She has a cone on her head and stitches that have to heal. I was waiting for my dog to do her business when her car pulls in and drives slowly past me. The guy did a friendly neighbor nod towards me and I did a smile back, you know, to be polite. The guy parks at the front of the building 
and I'm on the other side of the car park on the grass with my dog. I'm watching my dog trying to get her to hurry up because I'm freezing. I look up and the man is stood outside his car staring at me. Freaked out by this, I turn my attention back to my dog, keep looking over my shoulder and he's staring with his creepy ass smile on his face. I looked away again for a second and he was walking along the road slowly towards us. I'm a really friendly person. I can be paranoid and aware, as any woman should be at night, but something about him made me feel scared. He was walking so slow as if he wanted to talk to me, so I hid behind a van telling my dog to hurry up and pee. I can't see him anymore which terrified the life out of me. All I heard was footsteps coming towards us. The guy peeks his face around the van and my dog goes nuts. She's jumping around barking aggressively which she never does with people but this guy doesn't take this as a reason to leave. My dog is showing that she doesn't want his presence but even though she's doing this he continues walking towards us slowly. I start backing up and say to him please leave as she just had surgery and she's too excited. In the most quiet sinister voice he asked what's your name? I couldn't really hear him he kept repeating the question. I eventually understood what he was asking. Meanwhile, my dog is still absolutely going nuts at him. I say again, please, my dog just had surgery. You need to walk away, she's too excited. Ignoring me again, he walks towards us asking my name, so I start walking away from him. He ponders for a minute, still smiling. Creepy, may I add. He eventually backs up slowly, still facing me. I swear he did this for at least 20 seconds. He walks back to his car, looking over his shoulder at me, then stands back at his car and stares for another three minutes. I pretend my dog is doing something when she is really just being a pain in the ass and just standing there. I look up and he's gone. I'm shaking, sending my sister voice notes about what's going on and she's telling me, just go inside. But she doesn't realize I'm frozen in fear. Eventually, I see a woman and her son rock up to the front door, so I half jog over with my dog to go inside the same time as them. The front of our building has a glass door. I glance in, and the man is standing there, waiting for us. I told the woman, this man has been following me and my dog. I'm scared, and she walks in with me. The man sees I'm not alone and walks right past us out the building again. I run into the lift with my dog, get in and lock my doors. I decided to tell my two male neighbors about it as my boyfriend is away and they agreed to run downstairs if I ever need them. I took a picture of his car and registration plate as my twin sister gets the train home late at night after work and I want her to be wary of him. Well, today I was out with my dog at 11 a.m., just doing our usual walk around the block. We walk into the building and as we're heading into the lift, I see the guy peek his head around the corner. He's looking for me. Then he starts walking towards me. At first, I didn't recognize him, but then he smiled his creepy smile and I realized who it was. He said, hi. So I said hi, then beelined it for the lift. He came towards me and my dog again. I pressed the lift button, just watching it come down from the sixth floor. He comes and stands closer to me. Again, my dog goes nuts at him. He asked me what my name was. He has an accent. He asked me again when I didn't understand what he was saying. I asked, what, my dog's name or mine? He goes, yours. I froze and said a fake name. He started to move closer. I had no time to pay attention. The lift was about to open and I could run away. He told me his name. I replied, nice to meet you. And finally the lift door opens. I walk in and press my button to my floor, hoping that he'll leave me alone. He ran behind me as I walked in and went, I'd like to see you again. What the fuck? Shivers ran down my spine. I was creeped out. I replied that I had a boyfriend, but thanks. As I said this, the lift doors were closing and he tried to stick his hand to stop the lift from closing. 
Thank God they closed on time. I'm only on the next floor up, so I was afraid that he was going to run up as he could see what floor I got off at. I stopped for a moment and almost pressed a different floor, but I just wanted to get home and lock the doors. The lift opens and he's not there, so I beeline it to my front door. There's a glass door to the stairs, and I swear I thought I saw him coming up. I ran inside and locked the front door. I was so confused by what just happened. Next thing I do, message everyone with an update. They told me to phone the non-emergency police number, even just to get it on record. So I did that, and the police arrived at my flat at 3 p.m. I explained everything to them, and they said I could either A. Get the police to go to his front door and tell him to knock it off, or B. Next time he does something like that, tell him to leave me alone and if he doesn't, phone the police and it would be considered harassment. But for now, the police couldn't do more, which was fair enough. I didn't want to anger him at this stage, as it's not a crime at this point. But why can't he just leave me alone? I've clearly shown that I'm not interested. It annoys me so much that I can't even leave my house looking ugly as hell without someone being desperate for any female in the immediate area. I hate saying something's going on when it isn't, but I just have a terrible gut feeling. Update. I hadn't seen the guy since the last incident, but I saw him today. I again was out taking my dog to the toilet around 1pm. As soon as I left the main door, I looked and the guy was sitting in his car. He clocked me. I started walking past his car when he got out and said hi to me. I completely ignored him and walked on by. I was preparing myself to shout at him if he kept following me or talking to me. I went over to the grass and the guy is standing in his car staring again. I'm a bit further away so I text my sister letting her know that he's at his car watching me. She didn't reply so I phoned one of my male neighbors and he quickly got his shoes on and says that he was coming downstairs. I look back at the man and he seems to have his phone out recording me. I start shaking, working myself up to the point of confronting him and telling him to leave me alone. The next thing I know, my sister bolts out of the building and fast walks over to me and my dog. She says as soon as she came out of the building, she saw him back inside his car with the door fully open and his back was turned to her because he was watching me, so she saw it this time. He looked at her briefly and watched her walk over to me. He starts staring at us both. That's when my male neighbor got outside and walked over to us. The man continued watching as I told them both I think he was waiting for me to go back into the building because why would he just be sitting there? My sister had enough of it. She told me and my neighbor to take the dog for a walk and she stormed over to the guy's car. She said, Excuse me? and he was shocked. She stood right in front of his car and explained that he needed to leave me alone, that I'm not interested, that I told him that the dog just had surgery and he wouldn't leave, which is unacceptable. She also said that I had already mentioned that I had a boyfriend, so he needs to leave me alone. He just stood there and mumbled a few times. She said he looked frightened. She walked back into the building so we took the dog for a walk and when we got back, he was gone. Probably got out of his car and ran back into his flat. I mean, he made me uncomfortable, so she did it to him. Now, if anything else happens, I'm phoning the police as they would then say it was harassment. I also contacted the leasing agency and sent them an email with all the details so they're aware. Thank you again everyone. Feel much better now, and I'll keep you updated. I'm a female, and I was in my mid-twenties at this time. I was working late one night at a secluded office about one kilometer from any other buildings and surrounded by a forest. I occasionally stayed late and would be the last car in the parking lot. This night, I locked up, walked down the trail to the parking lot, and as I exited the trail, I noticed there was another car in the lot. Despite the large size of this parking lot, it was parked directly next to mine. 
There'd be no reason to park in this lot unless you worked in the building. A man stepped from behind the car, looking at me. He was a white man, probably average height, slender, with brown, medium-length curly hair. He was staring at me with his chin down and a very serious, predatory look. I stopped walking. He was probably about 10 to 15 meters away from me. I debated returning to the office, but if this man had bad intentions, I doubted I could run back, get my key out, and open the door without him catching me. I decided to walk to my car and act normal. I said, hello, how's it going? In a calm and confident tone while walking towards my car. He walked a semi-circle around me, just staring at me without a change of expression. I kept him in my line of vision and made it to my car, unlocked it, got in, and locked the door very fast. He just stood there. I drove home feeling a little spooked, but wrote it off as just a weird encounter. Maybe he was high, who knows. I called the site security. Normally they would be at the main building, a kilometer away, and don't actively patrol where my office was. I told them about the encounter and they said they'd go check it out. I never heard back, nor did I follow up. I went home. I live with roommates and we never lock our doors. One was out of town and the other one was at work until late and would usually stay over at her boyfriend's, so I didn't expect anyone. I went about my evening routine as normal and got ready for bed a few hours after the whole parking lot encounter. Just after I had gotten into bed, I heard footsteps coming up our old creaky wooden stairs. The footsteps continued down the hallway towards my room, but stopped just short. The floors were creaky in this house and you could hear any movement, so no sound meant someone was standing next to my door for what felt like 30 seconds. I was totally silent and had 911 typed out on my phone ready to call. I heard a cell notification from where the person was outside my room and then footsteps went back downstairs. I texted my roommate. The one that was at work called me confirming it was not her and that yes, the other one was still out of town. I asked her to stay on the phone with me while I checked the house. I went into all the rooms upstairs, nothing. Went downstairs and the front door was open. I closed it and locked it and checked the rest of the house including the creepy basement. All clear. I heard back from the other roommate. Neither of them was expecting anyone. I dismissed it as someone who was drunk. It was Friday. Walked into the wrong house. I had heard a story of a friend of a friend who did that once and woke up in his neighbor's place. This all happened in 2014. I thought it was a little weird that both of these incidents occurred on the same night, but never connected the two. It was during my last month living in this place before moving across the continent. Fast forward to 2020 when I watched Unbelievable, where a serial killer talked about how he stalked his victims and I was often in their house multiple times before doing anything, and sometimes stalked people and never actually did anything. The more I thought about it, the more I think I was targeted by someone who knew my patterns. Perhaps someone who was planning something for the first time and couldn't go through with it. Do you think these two incidents were connected? Or did I just have two weird but harmless encounters in one evening? Hey everyone. So in 2020, I met this guy at a mall that I worked at. He owned one of the stores at the mall. It was a tech store to repair phones. Anyway, I would see him often because the office was close to his store. To be specific, right across from each other. One day he came up to me and asked for my name. We made small talk and we exchanged numbers. We started seeing each other until one night. I was so tired from work I didn't want to go to dinner with him anymore. I'm a single mom and I get burnt out easily. I told him I didn't want to go anymore and he said, No, get ready. I already made the reservations. I said flat out no, because I was exhausted and I'm the type to refuse to be forced into doing anything and being controlling is such a turn off. So I was already getting ready to dump him. I said no firmly. He responded saying I'm on my way. 
And I said, well, I'm not going, so waste your gas if you want to. I didn't think he would come, but of course, he came. He showed up to my apartment and was nonstop honking outside. He was calling and texting me nonstop while honking. I threatened to call the cops and he didn't stop. I called the cops for a noise complaint, and as soon as he heard the sirens, he sped off. I remember waking up the next morning to 60 text messages and 100 missed calls, saying, I can't believe you stood me up. I love you. What is wrong with you? I just wanted to spend time with you. The list goes on, but it really made me see him in a different weird creepy light, because how do you love me if we've only been dating for two months? We weren't in a relationship at all, at least in my eyes we weren't. Yes, we did have sex already after the first two weeks of seeing each other. What scared me was I remember when, after we had sex, he said he was a virgin. I'm starting to believe he actually was because of how things started to escalate. After he told me that he was a virgin, I didn't have sex with him again. So out of the two months, we only had sex once. He's Muslim, and his parents are very strict and crazy. He would sneak out to see me all the time, even though he was already 24 at the time. So after that night of him honking, I broke it off with him and called him a psycho. I told him I don't ever want to see you again. Now, we're in 2023, and ever since 2020, to now, he goes through weird mental states, where in certain months he will blow up my phone, but I'll do it once out of like six months, basically out of the blue. I never respond. Until one day in October, he sent an apology saying I'm sorry. I've moved on. I know I was acting crazy. Blah, blah. And that he wanted to be on good terms as friends and asked if he can take me to dinner to make up for what he's done. I thought he was being honest because I hadn't heard from him in months. And I said, okay. So I went to dinner with him. Biggest mistake of my life. Because before we got the food, he literally got on his knees and begged for me to never leave him again and that he was in love with me. I'd never been so scared or freaked out in my life. I sat in silence to keep my cool and stood silent because I didn't know what he was capable of anymore and I didn't want him to snap. I said, I don't feel good. Can I go home? And he drove me home. Once I got out of the car, I was so relieved and promised myself I would never talk to him again. I never spoke to him again. Ever since October of 2022, he has been texting my phone once or twice a week, asking to go to dinner, and I never responded because he makes me so sick to my stomach. I moved, thank God, so he doesn't know where I live, but recently he's been texting me to go to dinner. The last text was December 30th, and prior was the week before. It's just been very consistent. But recently, on Friday, January 6th, 2023, two days ago, he took a picture of me while I was working and sent me the picture saying, that's you. It scared the hell out of me, because how could he know where I worked? I just switched to a different salon, and he didn't know the salon prior I worked at. At least, I don't think he do. I've only been at this salon for two or three weeks. It makes no sense. My heart dropped to my ass when I seen the picture, and I responded, You're stalking me. Leave me alone already. He said he has a limo service, and he was driving around when no way in hell he could have seen me through the window, because my station is the second station. He zoomed in to take the picture. There's a desk where he took the photo. It's so weird and creepy. I called the police and they basically victim blamed me and said, how do I not know the guy I dated's last name or his home address? They said, since I didn't know his last name or home address, I can't file a restraining order or an order of protection. Please help. I know the laws are different in every state, but I am in Chicago, Illinois, and I don't know what he's capable of. Please help. Hey Reddit, I'm a longtime user 
but due to the nature of this situation, I decided to use a throwaway. Trigger warnings for baby death, abuse, stalking, etc. Also, apologies if this isn't the right sub. We just need answers. My girlfriend's mother is a longtime heroin user and has been in and out of jail for my girlfriend's whole life. When she lived with her mother and her mother's husband, she witnessed physical abuse and drug activity. She was forced to move out at a very young age in order to stay alive. She thought her mother was finally clean when her mother announced her pregnancy. After getting over the initial shock, my girlfriend decided to be supportive of her mother since she thought she was clean. That was until her mother overdosed while pregnant. She decided to cut all contact at that point. My girlfriend is also a mandated reporter and last year reported her mother and her mother's husband to the state since she knew it wasn't a safe situation for the baby. The baby died in their house not even a month after birth due to an overdose with signs of physical abuse. My girlfriend's mother was arrested for the murder of her baby and other charges. Her husband was arrested for child endangerment and other charges very recently. At first, the judge did not grant either of them bail. Eventually, her husband was granted bail in which he posted. We did not know this until recently, which helped us put some of the pieces together. My girlfriend and I like to sit outside her house in the car and just chat or listen to music. Recently, there have been black cars around my girlfriend's house. She also is frequently followed by black cars when she drives me home. It's the same couple of black cars that do this. They're not just random ones. At first, we thought we were just paranoid since everyone was still in jail. But when we found out that the husband was out of jail, we began to doubt our insanity. The first major thing happened after my girlfriend and I went on a dinner date. We got home after dark and sat in her car for about 45 minutes before we noticed the same black car passing by us every few minutes. After 10 minutes of that, a different car drove towards us, flicking its high beams on when it got close enough for us to see who was inside. It swerved into the oncoming lane, and I genuinely thought it was going to hit the passenger side of the car. It sped away and we ran inside. After that, we started noticing the black cars more and more. This past Wednesday morning, around 3 a.m.-ish, the same distinct black van that we had been seeing pulled up outside of my house. This was weird, because my girlfriend and I live about 30 minutes from each other in two separate cities. A man got out of the van and shined a flashlight through my yard, scanning it almost. He shined the flashlight up at the window I was sitting at, kept it there for a second, then walked 30 feet to an empty driveway, scanned around there for 20 seconds before getting in the van and peeling away. The windows were ice covered and frozen, so I couldn't make out the specifics of the van, but it was strange. A few nights later, my girlfriend and I spent some time hanging out in the car when we spotted a black van hiding behind another parked car further up the street. We could only see one headlight, but it creeped by us as we sat in the car. My girlfriend lives between two dead-end streets. Think of a very blocky U. She lives between the two prongs. The van went up the first dead end, four ways on, and sat for a few minutes before turning around and driving almost into the other lane of traffic to get close to us. It then went up the other dead end and stayed put. We thought it was weird that the van didn't just back out of the first dead end, instead opting to drive all the way up the narrow street and turn around. After a few minutes, we call a friend and recount the story just to get an extra opinion. While my girlfriend was talking to our friend, I got out of the car to go for a cigarette and to see how far away the van was. I walked up the dead end that the van was on for about 15 feet before getting the worst gut feeling I've ever gotten. Across the street from me was a black mass, which was darker than the darkness around it. I decided to just turn around and rush my girlfriend into the house. Later that night, we heard a bang coming from downstairs, followed by what sounded like a boot on wooden stairs. We locked the bedroom door and I sat against the door with a baseball bat, hopeful to barricade it. A few minutes later, we heard a car door slam before the sound of tires squealing and a car driving away. Our initial idea was maybe it came from the TV. 
but we had paused it, and the TV in the next room is never loud enough to feel real. When I went downstairs an hour later to get water, there was nothing damaged or missing. We theorized that maybe it was the sound of the front door trying to be opened, even though it was deadbolted. My girlfriend's exterior wall doesn't face the road, and we've never heard car sounds before. It is, however, next to a private driveway, and sometimes we'll hear her grandparents' car door close or the neighbors backing out. The next day, I was shoveling the sidewalks at my girlfriend's house, an activity that took about 20 minutes, and I saw the same black Chevy Silverado with mud streaks on the tailgate. It circled the block about four times. I was able to see the silhouette of the man driving through the passenger side window, and each time... It was the same man in the same truck. My girlfriend lives in a small town, and we were able to catalog the neighborhood cars. The black van and truck are abnormal. Our theory is that someone is trying to scare my girlfriend into not testifying, or flat out make sure neither of us ever have the ability to testify. We really just need more opinions. Are we just paranoid, or is this something we should actually be worried about? Do you think that these are just weird coincidences? I was always an extremely small and sickly child. I looked young for my age. My family and I lived out of town about eight miles out. Our little community was next to a highway. The school bus would always drop me off two blocks away from my home. One day, I noticed a red truck following slowly behind me, so slow that I figured that they were just looking for a house or something. I ignored it and walked to my house. That was the end of that. Consistently, this truck would follow slowly behind me. After a couple days of this, I walked into my house. I was always the first one home. When I got out, I looked out the window. Inside was an older man in a black lab. He was staring at me, idling in his truck, then he pulled away. I decided enough was enough, and I told my parents. Of course, my sister was quick to jump in, saying that I was lying. I did have a habit of telling stories, but my mom thankfully believed me. She drove me to the bus stop the next morning. The red truck was there, across the street at a gas station, pointing towards the bus. I got on the bus and my mom decided to drive around the truck. She described the scene. The man was disheveled and dirty, hunched over in his seat just staring at the bus. His license plates were caked in mud, so she couldn't make them out. It freaked her out so much that she called the police and the school. I went to school and was quickly pulled into the office. The man had been spotted at the school, waiting in his truck. That day, I rode the bus home. This time, the truck was parked alongside the street. I would have to walk past the man's driver's side door to get home. I debated, considering running for it. Apparently, this man was getting desperate now that he had been spotted. A police car showed up and I talked to the policeman. They went to go talk to the man in the truck. He quickly pulled away from the curb and took off down the highway. Never saw him again, and I don't believe he was ever caught. Because of this experience, I'm extremely guarded and paranoid over my own daughter and her soon-to-be sibling. The world is a terrifying place these days, and children go missing so easily. I don't like to think about if I had been grabbed. I wouldn't be here typing this. My kids wouldn't exist. I was lucky. Many children aren't. So, stranger with ill intentions, let's not meet. So I'm a 28 year old woman and this happened to me when I was 13. I'm an adult now, but still kind of traumatized. For a little context, I transferred schools because lack of money. This school I went to was a cheaper private school because where I lived, the public ones kind of sucked. I didn't have any friends for at least the first couple of months. I started noticing this boy, Victor. He was always staring at me during classes 
in the hallways, by the window, and at lunch. It was an everyday thing, but I didn't care because as a kid, I only thought of stupid stuff like dolls or whatever. Oh, one more thing. I was flat as a table back then, so it totally looked like a small child. The girls in my class started saying that Victor had a crush on me, which creeped the hell out of me because he was 18. I was creeped out but still didn't care as long as he didn't approach me or anything. Things escalated quickly. Victor would follow me home every day. Thank God I've moved since and he doesn't know where I live anymore. The most annoying thing, however, was he constantly asked his friends to try to talk to me and convince me into going out with him and to make out with him after school. These talks would usually take about 30 minutes of them trying so hard to convince me to agree with this while Victor was behind them watching the conversation like a freak. Obviously, I rejected it all the time, but being the nice guy that he was, he started spreading rumors about us making out anyways. Nobody believed him though, because he was such a weird guy, and the whole school knew it. The final straw was when our school had a trip to a book fair. I was super excited. At this point, I had made a couple friends. On our way to this fair, I was on the bus with my friend, and Victor was also on, three seats behind us. I could feel his eyes on me the whole way. Out of nowhere, he came and asked for my friend's cell phone, and she gave it to him. Very stupid of her. He returned her cell phone not even two minutes after. She checked the cell phone and showed me he had taken a bunch of photos of me. I guess this was his way of saying that he has already done this at some point. She got so pissed and went to go talk to him. When she returned, she said the creepiest thing I've ever heard in my life. She said this with a very scared look on her face. He said to me that when you least expect it, he'll push you into a bathroom and rape you, today. The only thing that went through my mind was, what should I do now? I looked at him and he gave me a creepy smile. After this, I spent the whole day looking behind my back, not leaving the side of my teacher. She didn't even understand why I didn't want to walk around the fair. I was on alert mode all the time, and thank God nothing happened. When I got home, I cried in my room like a baby. This was the end of the year, thankfully, and I switched schools again. I told this to my mom last year, and she was like, Yeah, it happens. It happened to me too when I was your age. So shocked how this is such a common thing. I'm now 28, and I still see Victor on the streets. He has followed me around a few times. I always walk in circles until I lose him, but sometimes he waits for me outside stores and restaurants. I think about what would happen to me at the book fair if I didn't have my teacher next to me the whole time and wonder if one day he'll do something or just continue this creepy behavior. The story goes way back to 1998 when I was 16 years old. I was with my two friends, who I'll call Ben and Jake for privacy reasons. It was a late summer evening on a Saturday, and I was sitting in my room listening to some 80s rock, as teenagers back then would do. I got bored after some time and went outside to meet Ben and Jake. We were chilling in Ben's garage for a while, drinking beer and smoking a little pot. We got bored pretty quickly and went out to do some teenage shit. I remember we were walking down the narrow path by the woods that goes down towards the lake. Back in the late 90s, there was a popular hangout for teenagers there, so we were hoping to see some other kids there. When we arrived, there was no one there except the sound of crickets in the taller grass. We sat on the bench for a while and just talked for about 15 minutes when Jake wanted to go to an old fishing hut by the lake. We all agreed on going inside and exploring it. We entered the hut. While Jake and Ben were walking around and breaking shit, I couldn't shake this feeling of being watched. We went upstairs where there was an old wooden boat laying there with a fishing net over it. We were kind of checking it out when all of a sudden we heard the wooden door to the hut creak open. We could hear heavy footsteps entering down below, followed by heavy breathing. We all stopped dead in our tracks and almost held our breath. 
There was around a five second break that felt like an eternity when suddenly the man spoke in a drunken voice. I know you're here. Come out, come out, wherever you are, you little brats. The heavy footsteps started to walk towards the stairs as the older floor creaked underneath. Jake went inside the wooden boat and the rest of us followed. We put the fishing net over our heads and didn't move. The man arrived upstairs and we could hear him stumbling around. I can hear you. We were sitting dead still, but I could feel the fear in all of us. The man was walking around moving stuff. I was thinking of a plan to escape without being caught, but we were literally sitting ducks. Suddenly, we could feel the fishing net being ripped off. Here you are. Jake reacted the fastest and pushed him away, and the man fell onto his back. We ran like hell out of there and through the tall grass into the woods. We could hear the man give a chase, but gave up, probably due to his drunken state. We all went back to Ben's garage and fell onto the couch, exhausted. Jake told us that the man dropped a knife as he fell onto the floor. We all just sat in shock for the rest of the night. To this day, I can't help but wonder what would have happened if Jake didn't push him. Recently, I feel like my dog was uninterested in our usual walk route, so I took him to a different area of the town. Everything was fine, but a guy approached me. He made small talk, asked me if he could pet my dog, and I didn't feel unsafe as it was still daytime with a few people out, so I let him. Pretty much right after, he just left. It was strange, no buy or anything, just walked away. Later when I got home, I was getting texts from a number that I never heard of. This gets creepy as it's happened to other women. But the guy looked at my dog's tag for a split second, memorized my number. Creepy from the get-go, but he was so casual about it. Like it was a normal thing to do. Even though I blocked his number, I still have had run-ins with him in places far away from the original spot. So I'm pretty sure he followed me home without my knowledge and kept track of places I frequent. I'm getting the police involved, so don't worry ladies. I know I can't really say much, but don't have a schedule that you follow to a T every day and keep a hawk eye on anyone that pets your dog or flat out reject it. My family and I had a caravan in a holiday park in NSW. We would go there every school holidays and there were many kids that I used to run around and play with. I have fond memories of this place, where I learned to ride a bike and had my first kiss, but other memories are not so good and now leave me with that egg flip feeling in my stomach. The people who owned the caravan park had a son. He was roughly 25 years old and I would have been around 5 or 6. He would drive around the park and collect everyone's rubbish on a tractor and do other odd jobs like this to help out his parents. Every once in a while, he'd pull up when I was playing out front and ask if I wanted a ride on the tractor. I, being young and naive, of course, accepted it and jumped on because what child doesn't want to ride on a tractor? This is back in the days where parents would let their children play in the streets without much supervision and you'd just come back home when the streetlights came on. One day when he dropped me back off at our van, my dad came storming out, grabbed me by my arm and yanked me off the tractor without saying a word to the man. He took me inside and told me, I don't want you hanging around that man again, he said, without saying why. But he's nice. He gives me lollies, I said. Just don't. I'm telling you. Don't talk to him. I couldn't understand why my dad didn't want me talking to a nice man, who only gave me tractor rides, gave me lollies and hugs, and sometimes the occasional sandwich. I remember telling the man one day, My dad said I'm not allowed to talk to you anymore. To which he smirked and replied, Oh yeah? Why is that? Fast forward nearly 14 years later. My family and I are watching the news when the man's face flashes across the screen, attached to a story where he killed two people and is now serving time in prison. My dad said, Look at this, look at this. I knew it was bad news. 
There was always just something about him. Do you remember when he used to take you around on the tractor? My blood ran cold and my stomach dropped. The most disturbing part, he killed people with pills he would call his lollies. Please always listen to your parents. I would be dead by now if it wasn't for them. Hi there. I'm a longtime listener, reader, and finally wanted to share my story. I hope it's allowed on the subreddit as it's something that has truly stuck with me for over 10 years now. My family and I are from Australia, and back in 2007, we decided to take a month-long holiday to America. We traveled from LA up the west coast and then went back down through Nevada. We did this by renting a car and doing the whole vacation road trip style. One night, we were traveling through Lompoc and stopped in Santa Barbara for the night to sleep. We drove around a while looking for a decently priced motel that wasn't to bring your own UV light, if you know what I mean. My mom and dad found a place that looked okay and went inside to inquire about the price of a room for the night, while my sister and I stayed in the car to listen to music on our iPods. We were bopping around to the Frey album I bought that day when my sister removed her headphones and said, Look at mom, what is she doing? I look out the window and can see into the reception of the motel. I see my dad talking to the manager and my mom displaying very cold and odd body language. She's usually very friendly with the staff wherever we go, so this was odd for her. What's wrong with her? I told my sister as we kept a close eye on them. My mom was standing behind my dad with her arms crossed and looking around the place as if she was on guard or something, as if her hypervigilant senses had kicked in. After some time, my mom and dad got back into the car and discussed what to do about staying the night. My dad stated that we wouldn't find anywhere cheaper for the night and he was hungry and ready for dinner, so we'd better just stay here. Plus, it was the last room available, so we would have to make a quick decision. To his dismay, my mom disagreed. I don't like this place. I have a bad feeling, she said. My dad argued on, getting more and more irritated that my mom couldn't explain what she didn't like about the place. Until my mom finally snaps and yells over my dad saying, We are not staying here. Fucking hell, fine, my dad says as he starts the car and backs out of the motel driveway. At this point, my sister and I are looking at each other like, what the fuck just happened? but we stayed quiet as my mom seemed on edge. Anyway, we ended up finding a place to stay that my mom approved of and bunkered down for the night. In the morning, we were all bustling around the motel room, getting ready for the day, when my dad turns up the TV to hear a story on the news about a shooting at the motel that my mom didn't want to stay at. Turns out, about 15 minutes after we left, a couple walked in and booked the last room, and the man that was behind them shot them because they took the last room. We all turned and looked at my mom who was standing there wide-eyed, watching in horror. I told you I had a bad feeling about that place, she said to my dad, who was pretending not to listen. Moral of the story is, always trust your gut, or better, your mother's gut. This is a story as told by my dad. My dad was a younger teenager at the time and was riding on the bus in Chicago. A man got on and sat in the seat across the aisle from him. He turned to him and started to strike up a conversation. My dad says that the hairs on the back of his neck raised and he seriously got a creepy vibe from him. The man was all smiles and charm and was asking my dad more increasingly personal questions. Luckily, before things got too personal or creepy, my dad's stop came and he enthusiastically noped off the bus and forgot about this. It wasn't until years later, 1978, the year I was born, that he saw on the news that the same creepy guy, affectionately known by children as Pongo the Clown and Patches the Clown, had a thing for teenage boys. His name was John Wayne Gacy. Here's another creepy detail. My dad is best friends with a guy who happened to live across the street from Gacy as a child and teenager. He confirms that Gacy was a creepy dude, 
He also confirmed that his parents observed the police and forensics going to work on Gacy's basement and painstakingly removing 26 teenage boys from the crawl space. Sweet home, Chicago. Stay safe and listen to your inner voice. When I was 18, I worked at my college's residential building at the front desk, and I think I almost got assaulted or murdered. You be the judge. During the summer, the building operated as a hotel. So two and a half floors were hotel rooms, and half of the third floor were for student rooms. The whole building operated with a hotel swipe key system that was pretty outdated. All the doors were powered with four AA batteries. If the batteries died, there was a decently lengthy process to replace them and reprogram the door. A dark-haired guy came to the front desk from inside the building while I was working the overnight shift. At around 1 or 2 a.m., he said he left his key card in his room. I made him a new one and made my first error of the night. Hotel guests could have as many room keys remade as they wanted. Students, however, were supposed to be given a temporary key card and charged $2 to be returned when theirs is located. I gave him a new key card to his room and asked if he was a student or a hotel guest. He replied, student. At this point, I should have checked our systems to charge his account, but I was caught up doing administrative duties and forgot. I used to trust people way too easily at this job, but quickly learned from it. Later on in the night, maybe around 3 or 4 a.m., he came back to the desk again and said that he couldn't get into his room. I asked if he just forgot his key again, and he said no, the door wasn't working. I asked if the light was coming on when he swiped his card, and he said no, so I figured the batteries were dead. I told him I had to change the batteries and went up to his room with him. He asked me for my name and I told him. He didn't tell me his. I opened the room door manually with a master key and told him to prop it open while I worked on the back panel to replace the batteries. He said, no, it's okay. I'll close it and closed and deadbolted the door locked. Really fucking weird, but I try not to think about it. I've changed the batteries for plenty of other doors by this point and some of the students were iffy about having their doors propped open for the room to be displayed for everyone walking by. He also had a really thick accent I thought he might be an international student. Since we had a lot of students from other countries where English was not their first language, I gave him the benefit of the doubt and maybe it was just a language barrier issue. At this point though, I really felt like something was wrong, but I tried to ignore it so I didn't freak him out. While I was trying to focus on fixing the door as quickly as possible, he kept trying to entice me to go further into the room saying that his bed was broken and he needed me to take a look at it and that there was something underneath it that needed to be fixed, etc. He held out a little gold house key and said, I have a key, go get it, and threw it under the bed. It said there was a leak under the fridge, just kept trying to get me to go down on the ground, throwing random problems at me. Obviously, I told him no. I'd send maintenance up here in the morning to take a look at it and to check if anything was broken. I had my back to him and he asked me if I would take off my glasses. I said, no, I need them to see. His tone of voice changed and in the most steady, chilling manner, he said, Ella, it's okay, you could take them off. And from behind me, he reached around and tried to take off my glasses. I swatted his hand away, trying to remain composed and said, no thanks, I need to keep them on. Even though he was creeping the fuck out of me, I didn't want to be rude to him. I didn't want to get in trouble if he complained about me or risk upsetting him and having him yell at me. I got up to grab something from the door repair kit and undid the door deadbolt and opened it up in the process. He jumped towards the door and closed it again and told me to keep it closed. I told him no, I had to open it to start reprogramming it from the front. While I held the door open with my foot and grabbed something from the door repair kit, he started playing with the little wispy hairs at the top of my forehead and trying to touch my shoulder. I swatted him away again and asked him not to touch me, just focused on getting the fuck out of there. He once again tried to get me to follow him into the bedroom, saying that the bed was broken, and I went as far as the door frame to see if I could spot the actual problem with his bed. 
This is when I realized that he had nothing in his room. No dishes in his kitchen. No shower curtain in the bathroom. No bed sheets on the bed. Nothing. This wasn't his room. My brain once again went back into the international student theory, thinking that he had just arrived today and hadn't gotten a chance to buy anything yet. But in the pit of my stomach, I knew something was wrong. I fiddled around with the door for a few seconds before announcing that it was fixed and quickly gathering the door kit and left. Before I reached the elevator, he came out without his shoes on to follow me. He tried to get back in to get his shoes on and called out, Ella, the door isn't fixed. You need to come back. I went back and opened the door manually and told him if the door was broken, I'd have to send up maintenance to fix it in the morning. I knew he was going to follow me to the elevator again, so I closed the door behind me once he went back inside and ran down the stairwell as fast as I could. When I got back to the front desk, I checked the computer and saw that the room that he was in was supposed to be empty. It wasn't a student room or a hotel room. I locked myself in the back office and called campus security. He came down a few minutes later and went behind the desk. I yelled at him to get on the other side and wait, now that I knew that he wasn't a resident. He tore a corner off a slip of paper I had sitting on my desk and drew a flower on it and then put it on top of my papers. When security arrived, he ran back to the empty room and tried to convince them that he lived there so he wouldn't have to leave. He kept showing them his key, which had decided to work on the door again somehow. They escorted him back downstairs and came to ask me if he really did live there. Obviously, he fucking didn't. That's why I called you guys crying and terrified. He kept interjecting and tried to argue that he did live there, but couldn't even recall his room number when asked. Security asked him for his student card, and he couldn't produce it, so they told him he would have to leave if he couldn't prove that he lived there. While they were grabbing his information, I listened from the office and could immediately tell that he was lying. The phone number he gave was just a bunch of random numbers. The name he gave them was prefixed by, um, as if he was trying to think of a name. When they asked him for his address, he just said, across the street. One security guard asked if he lived in the apartments across the street, and he said yes, but he couldn't tell them what building number it was. He said his apartment number was 1200, but I moved into that building a few months later, and apartment 1200 does not exist. When security asked him his purpose of sneaking into a room, he just kept up with the ums and us and saying he didn't know. They asked, were you trying to see a friend? Do you know anyone who lives here? Were you here to hurt somebody? He kept on fidgeting and saying, I don't know, no reason, I was just here. At one point he tried to tell them that he was my friend, at which point I poked my head out of the office to say that I had literally never seen him before this night. He left. We didn't call the police because he didn't actually do anything, but it was still fucking unsettling. Later on, it dawned on me how he figured that that room was vacant. One of the housekeepers had been using it as her personal break room. A few days later, the housekeeper came to the desk and told me they had found the door deadbolt open, the TV was on, and the housekeeper was inside watching TV. She must have forgotten to close the door when she left that night and that's when the creep let himself into the building and found it. I never saw him again, and to this day I have no clue what he was doing there. I haven't worked there since last winter, and overnight shifts still give me the heebie-jeebies. In the summer of 2015, I was 33 years old. I was broke, jobless, in Mexico City, my entire life had gone steadily down the drain for the past couple of years and my best friend had moved back to Europe. I was tired and bored, so when an online friend I had met in person two years before invited me to spend a month in his farmhouse in Norway, I accepted without hesitation. The deal was simple. In exchange for some work at the farm, I would get a pretty sweet holiday in a country I always, always wanted to visit. I had no problem doing labor work, and in fact, I was looking forward to do it and get my body back into some real action. Since I moved to Mexico City from Canada in 2011, I had been feeling rusty and soft. So I packed my suitcase, put on my boots, and said goodbye to Mexico City the best way I knew how, getting pissed drunk. I arrived at Stavanger in Norway, but my suitcase decided to go to Thailand instead. 
So after an hour of filling out reports and giving the address to my friend's house, I was able to walk out and meet him again. My friend Harold, he was standing there, confused and annoyed. He told me later that he was about to leave the airport, thinking I decided not to take the flight after all. I guess I was lucky. That night, I spent it with Harold and his friends in an oceanfront apartment in a quiet neighborhood in Stravanger, getting drunk on Norwegian beer and smoking hash. Disgusting shit if you ask me. I prefer the real thing. But anyways, I felt welcomed and content. The next day, Harold drove me all the way to his farmhouse, about an hour south of Stavanger, in a community called Eggersund. At least I think that's the name of the place I was in. Norwegian names and addresses are weird if you're not too familiar with them. The land Harold owned was huge and beautiful. Not really sure how it all works, but in his property, there's a lighthouse that attracts a lot of tourists from all over Europe. The house itself was small, located on the top of a hill with a huge barn next to it. Harold lived alone in a two-story house, but I was told the basement housed a tenant. As soon as I glanced to the basement window, I got a strange feeling of dread. There was a webcam facing the driveway, and the rest of the windows were covered with boxes and papers, but I decided not to mention it since Harold didn't seem to care. I just assumed the guy was an eccentric man or maybe was just a normal precaution considering we were more or less in the middle of nowhere with the neighboring houses separated by big fields. I took my mind off of it and focused on the joy of being in Norway. After being installed in one of the bedrooms upstairs, I was informed that week Harold's son's wedding was going to be celebrated and thus the house was going to be filled with the bride's family. In general, it was great to meet them. But on my second night, when everyone had gone to sleep and Harold and I were still chatting and drinking beer, I got to meet the tenant, Olaf. Harold had been having some troubles with his new smartphone, and apparently Olaf was tech savvy, and indeed had been the one purchasing the phone for Harold. We went downstairs to Olaf's basement. Now, Harold kept telling me he didn't like Olaf, and was actually upset by the way Olaf kept the newly remodeled basement. But from what I understood, they kind of had a relationship more than just a landlord tenant. The basement was dark. All the windows were covered and piles of junk cluttered the entire place. The bedroom was full of computer parts and electronic junk. He had blinking and beeping. Olaf invited us to sit down and when he turned on his desk lamp to check Harold's phone, I got my first real look of him. He was in his mid 40s but looked older, shaved head really skinny, big nose, and deep shadows under his eyes. He had an entire look of a meth addict. I should know since I worked in a recovery house in British Columbia, Canada. I had seen the same face back then in people who were dealing with some severe addictions. The way he stuttered only confirmed further my observations and I decided I had to keep an eye on him. My gut told me right then and there that he was trouble. Olaf finished with Harold's phone and then directed his attention to me. He asked if I wanted to see some porn, to which I declined entirely. I just wanted to leave the dark oppressive basement. Harold laughed a drunken laughter and asked Olaf if he had gay porn, to which Olaf said he didn't care about the sexualities of the videos. He simply liked to see people getting things introduced in them. When he said it, I got chills running down my spine and asked myself if he meant that in just a sexual way or if there was a more ominous meaning to it, but we didn't stay to find out. Harold had a busy day the next day and I was tired and thoroughly creeped out by Olaf. When we were back in the house, I asked Harold if he trusted his friend, to which Harold answered that Olaf wasn't his friend. He was just an addict running the basement. The government paid Harold the rent and a nurse visited him twice a week to bring his medication. After dropping that bomb, he said goodnight and went to his bedroom. I tried not to think about Olaf, but between my gut feeling and him popping in the house unannounced when everyone else was out preparing for the wedding that weekend, I couldn't really relax. The first time he went inside was to give me a flash drive with movies he had illegally downloaded from the internet. He made sure to emphasize the illegal part. The second time he seemed high and wanted to simply let me know if I needed something I could ask him for anything but asked me not to tell Harold about him going upstairs. He said that and then walked out very slowly and carefully as if he knew he would fall if he rushed. 
When the wedding was over and the house was empty again, except Harold and me, the encounters with Olaf became stranger and more often. One time, I was in the kitchen fixing myself some breakfast. I turned around to find Olaf standing in the kitchen door, bleeding from his nose and staring at me. I jumped out of my skin and dropped my breakfast, making a huge mess. He didn't seem to notice, but simply started babbling incoherently while directing his cloudy eyes to the ceiling on top of my head. I was petrified, trying to think of a train of actions that wouldn't trigger a violent response from him, when he simply turned around and quietly walked out of the house. I started to lock the doors whenever I was alone in the house after that day. When I told Harold about this, he got visibly mad and went downstairs to talk and yell at Olaf. Harold told me that he didn't really like him to have the basement and that he tried to kick him out several times, but the government always ruled against evicting Olaf and Harold's sister was mostly responsible for it. She felt bad for the guy and was 100% on Olaf's side. Just because he had the same name as her father, go figure. So Harold had to learn to live with him in the basement, but only because Olaf was supposed to be clean and in treatment for his addiction. After that day, Olaf stopped being friendly with me and became just a cold, invasive presence in my life. There was one day when I was in the barn chatting with a couple of Harold's friends when Olaf entered the barn to place his laptop and some homemade looking gadget by the window. Despite no one asking him, he began to explain to us that he was using it to hack into other people's networks and get their Wi-Fi passwords. You know, like everyone does, right? He gave me a nasty glare and then stormed out. I turned to Harold's friends and told him that I was completely afraid of him and I had this feeling that he would attack me one day. Harold's friends told me that that would never happen, but if I ever felt like I was in real danger, I could give them a call and they would pick me up. We exchanged numbers, hugged and said our goodbyes for the night. The next days, things between Harold and I turned sour, mostly because I didn't feel safe anymore and I had expressed my wish to instead go to Germany to visit a man who is now my husband. Apparently, Harold had hoped for us to grow closer, but had failed to let me know. In the end, I was exhausted and didn't want to deal with that anymore. I should mention that Harold has severe alcoholism that I wasn't aware of before until I spent a month seeing him get filthy wasted on a daily basis. To some, that might be attractive, but not to me. So altogether, the situation was bad, and I wanted out. I had done my job. I had done nothing wrong, and I wanted to be able to relax away from both of them. That night, I decided to organize my flight to Germany from Norway. Harold went out to get drunk and didn't come back until the morning the next day. I tried to stay up and wait for him to talk, but I must have fallen asleep at some point. I woke up to the sound of the front door being closed and caught a glance of him walking towards the barn with a dog and a six pack of beers through the living room window. I then tried to send him a message through Facebook, but discovered the internet was down. That's weird, I thought, and the whole time I had been there, the internet never failed, not even once. I went to the router and restarted it a couple times to no avail. I decided to let it be. Maybe Harold had cut the internet as a way of drunk childish punishment. So I would just have to get on with my morning routine and have breakfast before going to knock on the barn door. That would give him some time to blow off some steam, I thought. I went downstairs to the bathroom, got comfortably naked and jumped into the shower ready to refresh myself and sing a couple of songs to lift my spirits in preparation for all the grim talk that awaited me with Harold. Halfway through the first song, I hear a loud bang coming from the front door, followed by someone screaming my name. I thought Harold must be pissed drunk and angry. I sighed while turning off the shower, thinking I was going to have a long argument when the bathroom door slammed open and I saw to my horror, Olaf coming in with a completely deranged expression on his face, wielding the big cutter knife, the kind of employees used in warehouses to open boxes. For a few seconds, I couldn't think or focus on anything other than the knife in his hands and the fact that I was naked, wet and cornered in a small bathroom in the middle of nowhere in Norway. I was paralyzed. My biggest fear was actually happening. I couldn't scream or move. Just staring at the knife, he kept pulling and pushing, making that now horrifying noise those blades do when operated. 
I was just about to pass out when Olaf's screams brought me back to the gravity of the situation. He was yelling, accusing me of playing with Harold's feelings. He was calling me a liar, a filthy Mexican, and throwing in some threats about cutting me open and fucking me up if I tried to take anything from Harold. That, I think, is what got my gears moving once again. He called me a thief. I can be called whatever, but I'm not a thief, and I'm not a liar. So I'm standing there, getting myself angry at the psycho in front of me, threatening my life. My training from the recovery house in Canada kicked in. I remember the rules when dealing with alter addicts. Make eye contact. Keep your hands down so you don't startle them. Speak in a calm but dominant voice and always, always refer to them by their name. And that's exactly what I did. Despite the fear and the certainty of me being stabbed to death, I stared at him in his cloudy, crazy wide open eyes and said, Olaf, you are a thief. You are the one that keeps stealing Harold's silverware. Olaf, you are the one that keeps breaking into his house. Olaf, Harold is not your friend. Olaf, Harold doesn't want you living here. It was a long shot, but it worked. My words made him confused and I was able to take one one single step forward, making him take one small step back. He then charged at me again with his rant and wielding his knife to my chest and neck. I could feel the cold sweat dripping down my back and a burning void forming in my stomach every time he launched at me with that knife, but I didn't flinch. I stood my ground and kept repeating the same words to him, every time gaining another step, pushing him little by little out of the bathroom. He might have noticed what I was doing, but by then, it was too late. When he took that last step out of the bathroom door frame, I moved as fast as my terrorized body allowed me and slammed the door shut on his stupid crooked nose. I locked it immediately and pushed my body against it with all my body weight. While a storm of curses, punches, and kicks rained on that little farmhouse door. I remember praying to a god that I didn't really believe in to hold the door in its place and to keep the psycho outside. There was nothing I could use in that bathroom to defend myself. Nothing against an infuriated, high psychopath wielding a knife and a possibly broken nose. After what seemed like an eternity, I heard and felt a last strong kick to the door and then, to my relief, he stormed out of the house with a loud bang of the front door, announcing his exit. However, I stayed put for another 20 minutes, not able to breathe or think of anything else than keeping the door closed. I wanted to puke, but I couldn't move. Eventually, my senses came back and I knew I had to act quickly. I opened the door of the bathroom, flew upstairs, got dressed, and then exited the house through the window to the garden. I knew he could hear me moving on the first floor and they had that stupid camera spying the driveway. I jumped to the garden, jumped up fence, and ran around the house to the barn. I kicked and banged, screaming for Harold to let me in, but it was useless. The drunk fuck was living his drama and I needed help, so I ran all the way to the next house where the sister lived, rang the bell, and when she opened it, I explained to her the best way I could about what just happened. She didn't speak a word of English, so it was a comical exchange for about 10 minutes until her expression shifted from confusion to absolute terror mirroring my own. She walked me to the barn, opened the door, commanded Harold to guard me and went straight to the basement to confront Olaf. I was shocked and shaking, still trying to explain to Harold what just happened. His drunken state was gone by the time I had finished explaining. He too went to the basement and I could just hear screams. They took Olaf out. The sister and her husband got Olaf into the car and took him away. Harold stayed with me all day. I drank so much beer but I simply couldn't get drunk. I wanted to get drunk. I wanted to forget, but I simply couldn't. I was told that Olaf admitted having a knife and that his intentions were to make me fight him. So in reality, he wanted the excuse to stab the life out of my naked butt. After all, he liked to see people having things introduced in them, right? That night, I slept in the house while Harold kept guard of the house. I had some tools with me to defend myself. And of course, I slept fully dressed. It was a horrible night. The next morning, we went to the police to file a report. 
But even the cops seemed baffled and couldn't believe something like that could happen in their small, peaceful, picture-perfect community. But they believed me, and the cop who took my statement asked me if there was somewhere I could go. Well, this was all sorted out. I told them, in fact, I was planning to visit Germany the very next day. The last day, I barely spoke with Harold. I didn't blame him, but he told me that in his drunken state, he had told Olaf that I was leaving and that he was sad about it. Since Olaf had been doing drugs all night, he understood it as he had to defend Harold. So he, Olaf, cut off the internet, waited for me to go in the shower, and went upstairs to do his job. I left Norway without a single word, without looking back. They told me I could testify via Skype whenever the trial started, so they took my information and promised me justice would be served. It's been more than a year now and I've never heard back from the police. When I asked Harold about it, he told me the police dropped the case for lack of evidence and Olaf is back in Harold's basement doing whatever it is he does. Life goes on. I was angry for a while, but even anger goes away after a while if there's nothing to burn. I tried to focus on the good things of life and life itself. Every day is now a gift or a chance but the shadow of fear has never really left me. I keep looking over my shoulder, keep studying people just in case I have to defend myself. I still have a sense of dread whenever I take a shower, especially at a gym where I'm more vulnerable. I can't help thinking that anyone else would have ended up a bloody corpse in a pool of blood in that shower. I noticed for hours until someone had to use that bathroom. If I had done something different, if Olaf hadn't been so high to be intimidated by my words, that bloated corpse would have been me. I still don't know how to get rid of that thought, but I try. All I know is Olaf is free, and I really, really, really don't want to ever meet him again. Four years ago, I trained a new worker who was honestly a nice guy at the time. Early 30s, seemingly healthy, very much into yoga and had a beautiful girlfriend. He seemed very balanced and healthy. I'll name him Coworker A. We had another longtime coworker who was sort of Mr. Popular with the managers, but honestly, super annoying. Really large personality. People could only take him in small doses. He was essentially the embodiment of a TikTok frat boy who would randomly dance on the job and freestyle. Extremely annoying. Anyway, I'll name him Coworker B. Now, before I explain, I should include this workplace sucked. It barely holds a single star on a deed. It's a large factory with no windows, toxic management, long hours. It was very hard on most people's mental health. So anyway, roughly into a year of Coworker A's stay, things started to change. He and I were mutually friends to another. We would have long civilized discussions about interesting things. But something was really out of place when he mentioned his beliefs about the world being flat and a hologram moon theory. It was really unlike the old version of him who was super rational. I sort of shrugged it off and said it's probably a phase or he's just trolling. Fast forward a few weeks. Fast forward a few weeks, coworker A has seemingly took a lot of interest in coworker B and sort of developed some of his mannerisms, but in more of an endearing way kind of copying his silly dances and laughing. Seemed harmless. But as months go past, he continues to dance more and more to the point that he had even been asked to stop by the supervisors. He would even be moving around at the morning meetings using the same mannerisms and phrases as Coworker B. This really started to creep out Coworker B to the point that he switched shifts. We theorized maybe he was on drugs, but Coworker A was very vocal against substance use, including alcohol, weed, etc., he was also a vegan. Where things change for the worse is when coworker B ends up getting a new hire at work. She ends up becoming his girlfriend. They move in together, etc. This is when coworker A shows up at work using coworker B's name, even signing himself in on the logbook says him, referring to himself as B all morning. Then later in the day, he stands up on a work table screaming, "I'm in love with coworker B's girlfriend's name." with his arms spread out in the cross Jesus formation, face to the ceiling. The whole place went silent, and after, he ended up standing in the corner with a broom sweeping nothing for several hours. 
He wouldn't turn around from the corner either, not even if he tapped his shoulder or called him by name. The only time I saw him away from the corner was when it was time to go home. He was the last one out. Unfortunately, my job being QC, I'm always among the last ones out as well. Despite both of us being the last ones out of the building, I did my best to act normal when passing him in the hallway. I glanced at him, and he was looking directly at me, head tilt down, making a snarling dog face, eyebrows in a V, tongue and teeth out. The next day, our boss decided coworker A needed to go to the hospital, so we actually made an appointment and got him an Uber. He was put on leave for a week. The security guard who I'm friends with told me A was showing up in the middle of the night trying to sign in for work at the card reader, sometimes at 2 or 3 in the morning. Anyway, surprisingly, a week later, coworker A comes back to work and seems somewhat normal, almost like he had no recollection of anything he did. He even wrote an entire album on his phone in that time, which surprisingly was better than I thought it would be, but I noticed it was all love lyrics, sort of wanky country love songs. As things seemed to normalize with coworker A, he stated he really wanted to hang out with me and go for a hike, throw axes at trees, etc. I sort of didn't agree or disagree and told him I had to get back to him on that as I was secretly a little on edge. He asked me later that day if I was still down and I said unfortunately I had other obligations. He said, well I guess I can't throw an axe at your face then. And I laughed not knowing how to react at all. I told my manager about that and he kind of scratched his head uncontrollably and shrugged his shoulders. Anyway, coworker A ends up finding coworker B's address due to a work get together where everyone was invited and someone leaked it to coworker A. They would eventually find rocks and sticks in weird formations on their doorstep, like shrines, and we all collectively knew it was A. Things got really weird when we actually found A looking through their windows at night. He was also scratching the windows with his nails, calling out B's name, repeatedly whispering, I need to tell you something. This is when our manager finally decided to take action and fire A. Four years later, coworker A still stalks coworker B's now ex-girlfriend, who had to get a restraining order against him. He annually makes new Facebook accounts and adds all 200 plus workers who used to work there. The place has got shut down since. He uses a new name each time with a different selfie. He sends messages to each one of us as well saying, Hey, it's B from work. So I guess my question is, what would you call this behavior? And how did such a normal, likable, level-headed person turn into this? Is there a term for this behavior? What would his diagnosis be? One of my friends had the balls to ask him in a reply if he recalls anything, which he does not seem to, but he sure as hell remembers B's ex-girlfriend and says some extremely concerning things about how she's the one and only one. I'm the bigger one. She's the smaller one. He was put on this earth essentially to save her. He also seemingly has no support at all from his family or anything, and is working on a new job, living alone unintended. I feel like this is sort of a risk. About five years ago, I worked at a high-end kitchenware company as a floor salesperson. At the time, I was about 20 years old. I'm a female, and this matters later. I'm a larger woman, dress size 26 approximately, and I'm 5'9". I'm also mixed indigenous, so picture thick hair, dark features, wide build, etc. Again, important for later. I've been working at this job for a few months at this point. My boss, who, side note, is a total creep, had really warmed up to me and promoted me to the key holder within a few weeks of working. I had been comfortable closing on my own and working alone too. Often I would either be working the full day shift, 9.30am to 6.30pm, alone, or I'd work the crossover shift where I'd overlap with someone for about an hour and then I'd close the store alone. That shift was from 4pm to 9.30pm. One evening I came in, greeted my boss. He then decided to take a smoke break for about 25 minutes within the last hour of overlap. I didn't mind, as I mentioned before, the guy was a total creep. 
But as he was leaving, I noticed a kind of strangely behavior man pacing outside our store. Our location was inside a mall, so you get window shoppers all the time. But this guy was pacing with intention. He was wearing a large jacket, sunglasses, and a hat, so it was generally hard to see him. But he would occasionally lower his glasses to peer into the store. I even tried calling out to him from behind the desk at one point, saying something like, I don't bite, come on in, in a friendly way. He shook his head and said, just looking, in a low but clear voice. He backed away, leaving the storefront. I brushed it off as some rando just being too nervous to come into our store. Whatever, happens all the time. It was at this point my boss returned from his smoke break and began finishing up a couple of his end of day tasks before leaving. I mentioned to him that I accidentally scared off a nervous window shopper. We kind of laughed it off and disregarded it as nothing, but something felt weird. He was pacing for a solid 20 minutes just by the window staring in, although it's retail. I chalked it up to weirdness. After a few minutes, my phone rang and I picked it up. On the other end was a guy with a low and clear voice huffing as if he had been running, asking about getting gifts for his girlfriend. The conversation goes as follows. Oh, no worries. We have a couple of options for gifts. Is she looking for knives? Dining wear? Uh, don't know. She liked knives, I guess. Okay, if you're not sure what she already has, you can get her a specialty knife. Fuck. God, yeah. Sorry. Specialty knives. I know I should have hung up on him at this point. It's okay. Yeah, so, specialty knives... We have an assortment. Some are meant for meat and fish. Others are for vegetables. Does she cook a lot? Fucking slide that dick up inside you, babe. Excuse me? You look like you're a fat whore. Fat bitch is gonna get this cock. Your little blue shirt and blazer are gonna be shredded when I'm done rip- At that point, I promptly hung up the phone, shaking and nervously looking around. My boss knew something was up and asked me what was wrong. I told him what just happened, and he expressed his apologies, but otherwise didn't seem concerned. It clicked in my head suddenly. The guy window shopping earlier had the same voice as the guy on the call. I was petrified. I told my boss I was near certain it was the same guy. At that exact moment, my boss got a call from his very young girlfriend. That story is for another day. He had to leave 15 minutes earlier than planned. So there I was, alone in the store, and stuck for another four and a half hours. The stars were not aligned for me this evening. I ended up calling security and letting him know that I received a threatening call from a customer, who I was fairly sure was wandering the mall. They stationed an officer outside the store for the remainder of the evening, but I still felt entirely on edge. Every call that I got, I let go to voicemail. I was too scared to answer again. I was also working in another store game store in the mall at this time. I called my friend there to ask if after their closing shift, I could walk home with them. He lived a block behind me, and he agreed. I quickly walked over to the store with a security guard nearby. I started to walk home with my friend. The whole time I was scanning my surroundings, getting glimpses of shadowy figures outside, and making myself anxious. Eventually I got home, calmed myself down, and tried to get some rest. The next day I had to shift at my other job with the same friend who walked me home. At one point in the afternoon I picked up the phone and the calls from the same guy. I much more quickly realized who it was and hung up the phone a lot faster than the first time around. But he got as far as saying, I like this uniform better. I can see more of those curves without... Then I hung up. Our dress code was a t-shirt and jeans or leggings. I was wearing a shirt and jeans. I told my boss at the game store about what happened, and we made an official buddy system after that. Nobody leaves alone, ever. Luckily, we worked in pairs. We would not separate until we were either at a bus stop or at home. Nothing happened after that, thankfully. It was just awful having it happen back to back like that, with no conclusion. The security guard stayed on alert for a while. I ended up speaking to another female worker in the mall. And it turns out, there was a handful of plus-sized women getting harassed and violent phone calls for a little while. But they never caught a guy doing it. I still think about this years later. I wonder where he is and what he's doing. I never saw him again, I don't think at least. And if I did, I wouldn't have known. Anyways, 
Feels good to get off my chest finally. When I was in high school, I worked part-time at a local coffee shop. One day, this kind of weird, overly friendly guy came in and started to talk to me at the cash register. I wore a name tag with my nickname on it and he asked me if it was short for anything. I said yes and told him my full name. He asked me what kind of name it is. My name originates from a Greek name, so I told him that because it's kind of interesting. He asked me if I've ever been to the Greek festival in our city. I said no, and he replied, Well, you belong there. Them Greek girls are hot. Mind you, at this point, I'm 16, and this was a grown man. After that is when things got weird. He would show up at the coffee shop every day and ask my coworkers when I would be coming in or if I would not be coming in that day. Eventually, he would start sitting in the seat right next to the front door, waiting for me to come in. One day, he physically stood and blocked my path and asked if he could buy coffee for me. Yes, at the coffee shop I worked at, and then tried to grab my hand. When I decided to walk past to go to the back, he tried to follow me behind the counter and into the back room. He would hang out there for a few hours watching me and would constantly try to talk to me. My managers eventually told me to work in the back until he left every day, and then he started sitting in the seat that was closest to the back room. After that, I started coming into work through the back door and staying until he left. My coworkers would tell him that I quit, hoping that he would stop. Then he became obsessed with one of the other girls and the cycle started over again. Truthfully, he didn't seem that harmful except the time he grabbed my hand, but it was creepy and he was constantly there. The owner of the coffee shop had to file a restraining order in the end because no matter what he did or told him, it didn't stop him and he was just there watching and waiting. Nothing ever happened after the restraining order. He was still allowed into the plaza the coffee shop was located in, but obviously not into the coffee shop at all. And we usually saw him go into the grocery store until the restraining order. He just disappeared after that. Very creepy and kind of scary as a 16 year old girl. Hey everyone, first time poster. It's not the scariest, but it's one of the weirdest that left me with a strange feeling. So this is about the weirdest job interview I've ever had. This happened sometime after February 2018. My brother's community college was having a job fair and I went thinking, hey, this is legit. I'm going to go take some resumes and see what happens. So we're at the fair, a couple of cool booths, people looking for photographers, etc. We come across this table. I asked what they do. We work in contracts and entertainment or something like that. I hand the guy my resume. He looks at me and puts it down. Doesn't even look at the resume. He wants to schedule an interview with me, so I agree. I have to add, at the time, I wasn't doing well mentally. I was in the middle of what you would now call an emotional mental breakdown and not eating, etc. So y'all can imagine what I look like. But nonetheless, I secure the interview. I do some internet research and find that this company does not have a digital footprint besides their super bare bones website. Nothing on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Indeed, nothing. The job interview was in a random building right off the freeway. So I show up and there's no parking near the building. So I park in the neighborhood, go to the building and there's this guy, I would say in his mid 40s. He is friendly and helps me figure out how to get to the floor I'm supposed to be on. I thanked him and went up. When I get to the floor, I realized I forgot my resume, so I leave the building and walk back to my car. When I make my way back to the building, I see the same guy just standing by a window of the building, just standing there and staring into nothing. He seemed surprised that I was behind him and not upstairs. Then I go into the job interview room, and the front desk lady is blonde in basically a spaghetti strap shirt and black pants. She interviews me, and the strangest thing is, this woman is tweaker skinny, and this isn't to body shame or anything. She was just so thin, it didn't seem normal. Now, when I first met the guy at the job fair, 
They were in suits, dressed sharply, and said they worked with DirecTV. And during the interview, they basically said they're handing out Obama phones on the street. The whole office was decorated in basic Target decorations, some I saw later at a Target. Then the next week, they scheduled me for a full interview, and there's the same old dude, but this time, he's interviewing, and has the same panicked look on his face like last time. At the front desk this day is another young woman, better dressed, but just as tweaker skinny, and much more on the, this job is so amazing, I love my job. My interview this time is some young guy in his early 20s wearing a suit two sizes too big, comically so. The guy gave me an interview that was basically the same interview as before, and they were going to start my onboarding. Something felt weird, and something told me to just say no, so I ended up bailing. But damn, does this interview still stand in my head? I emailed the community college about it later, but basically what they told me was, we can't fix if people at our job fairs lie to us about their jobs. Which having worked at a college department that had job fairs really concerned me. How do they not verify the people who show up? I know in my old department, they would painstakingly verify the people there. To this day, I'm still worried about this. How many other college students have met these people? What was their exact goal? Why were all the female staff so thin? Why did they have no social media footprint for an entertainment-centered company? How many people actually fell for this? And what exactly did I almost get myself into? I work with disabled and vulnerable adults. One time I was grabbing a drink with a friend, Joe, and he asked if I could work with his girlfriend, Jane. Jane and I got on like a house on fire. She had some physical disabilities, but also had some mental health issues leading to her being pre-described antipsychotics. Joe was practically on top of Jane's medicine as he trained to be a mental health nurse. He had me filling in sheets as if I was working in a psych ward at their house rather than a private residence. Usually, I simply make sure people I work with take their meds. Sometimes, if they're on control drugs, I might fill in a tick box, but he had full on sheets that I was expected to fill in as a nurse would. Over time, I realized how controlling Joe was and how he used Jane's mental health against her. Gradually, I realized that if he attended doctor's appointments with her, she would get an increase in meds. And if I attended with her, this didn't happen. Joe was getting me stressed out with how useless I was, not putting items back into the cupboards perfectly, making spelling mistakes, or missing punctuation on the over-the-top med sheets. I didn't notice how quite off-balance he was keeping me, but I was very stressed out. So stressed out that I had several episodes of insomnia. One of these episodes, the doctors concluded led me to hallucinations twice while waking up. The doctor gave me sleeping pills and the hallucinations didn't come back. When I saw Joe hit Jane for the first time, I did have the wherewithal to call social services, but Jane claimed it didn't happen. Joe said I misunderstood what was going on and that I didn't have any right to interfere in their relationship. The first time Jane left, he claimed I had undue influence over her, and he left me checking words I had said in case I somehow was influencing her as a vulnerable person. Joe pinned me against the wall by my throat because I tried to prevent him from hitting her. I knew that I needed to leave, so I mentally gave Jane until January to leave him, and then I'd stop working there. I registered a complaint with Joe's nursing course about his treatment of the vulnerable. She left him before Christmas. By June, without him influencing her doctors, she had been taken off all the psych meds and didn't have any episodes since she had left, almost as if the stressor wasn't present. Her physical disabilities improved significantly as well in the years since she left. That's because of the lack of unnecessary psych meds. I haven't worked for Jane in years, as she moved away to marry a lovely bloke. I do work for a young adult who is a pregnancy in the workplace and for the first six months has me in the breakout area identifying anything a disability charity can provide for access needs. His colleagues chat away to me on their breaks, including one who is a very proud daughter. The daughter has a colleague used to provide fun tales of dumbasses who came to work hungover nature. Then the colleague turned up to work while drunk and high, 
at a psych ward. Then the colleague boasted about keeping an ex-girlfriend interfering friend quiet by feeding the girlfriend drugs so she didn't call social services on him. The daughter has made a complaint. Then I got to see a photo of this colleague. Of course, it's Joe. And I'm stuck here thinking about those times I hallucinated due to insomnia. Or did he put something in my tea? Might be completely unsupervised. Jada, my supervisor, was about to take off for the night. She kept repeating the same instructions over and over. Then again, this place had huge turnover. Maybe she honestly forgot I wasn't that new. No phones, she urged. If you got a slow night, make yourself useful. Nod and smile. I decided to get the worst tasks out of the way early. Cleaning the bathroom, restocking the freezers, taking out the trash checking the receipt rolls, watering the plants. Took me about an hour. It wasn't even midnight yet, and I was pretty much done for the night. I considered mopping the floor, but I figured I could save that for later. I'd been useful enough. I was on my fourth game of Team Flight Tactics when I realized I'd forgotten my name tag. No big deal, really, but I figured I'd might as well fetch it. The manager's office was usually locked, but tonight I had the keys to it. I opened the door and started going through the drawers. Didn't take long to find the name tags. There was an entire box of them. At first, I thought they were all blanks. But as I started going through them, I realized they were all previous employees. Sure, this place had high turnover. But this? We were talking a hundred people. Easy. This was ridiculous. I admit... This is where I started asking myself some questions. During the day shift, there was always someone new. Someone being trained or interviewed. I had only been there for about a week, and I was already feeling like a veteran. The only people who seemed to be regulars were the managers. Jada, Kenny, and Alicia. They seemed decent enough. So why were there so many people quitting? As I got back behind the register... I realized there was a customer outside, literally just standing outside the door. I waved at them. There was something off. They were just standing there, but they were so close that the automated door should have opened, and yet, the door remained closed. It was a man, late thirties, scraggly beard, rough red shirt, bit of a chunky look with sunken bloodshot eyes and a natural frown. He just stared at me. I waved at him again, but I got no response. Can I help you? I called out. Nothing. Not a blink. I pulled out a chair and sat down. The man stayed outside, looking in. I tried not to think about it, but it was bothering me. I couldn't see his car anywhere on the cameras, and he didn't seem to want anything. I couldn't tell if he was on drugs or just being weird. I gave him a few minutes, but he just stood there. Finally, I got up from my chair. Sir, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. He didn't seem to listen. He was a bit shorter than me, but he had a good 50 pounds on me. He'd be trouble in a brawl. I don't want to call the police, I said. Can I help you, sir? I pulled out my phone and held it up for him to see. I dialed the number and held it up for him to see. But still, nothing. Then, my phone rang. Unknown caller. It was just past midnight. Without letting the unnerving man out of my sight, I took the call. Yeah, I answered. Please don't hang up, a voice on the other end said. You're in danger, and I can help. I was getting nervous. I wandered back and forth, watching those bloodshot eyes follow me. Who is this? I asked. I'm Angie, the voice responded. I used to work there. Same shift, same managers. I wanted to warn you. I'd seen an Angie tag in the box earlier, maybe even several. She sounded young and nervous as all hell. In a few hours, something terrible is going to happen, she continued. And if you're not out by then, you might as well be dead. What are you talking about? Look outside, 
I'd been looking outside this entire time, but I'd been entirely focused on this one man outside the front door. From across the road, I could see more people, about a dozen, lumbering out of the woods. I need you to leave, she said. Just walk out. Nothing will happen if you just walk away. Nothing will come for you. Who? Who are these people? What's going to happen? I... I... I don't know what... Look, she interrupted. It is perfectly simple. Just walk out the door. Something in my head screamed for me not to do it. That I shouldn't step outside and just walk past these people. They felt malicious, and I couldn't put my finger on why. Still, I stepped up to the door. Leaving seemed like the obvious choice. Strangely, it didn't open. It won't open, I said. Hold on. They... they want to keep you in there. They don't want you to leave. They want you to stay and die. Die? I asked. What do you mean? I stopped my pacing. Something was wrong. Was I locked in? Tell me exactly what is about to happen. I demanded. Something is in there with you. Angie sighed. It could be five minutes. It could be a few hours. But that thing, in there, is coming for you. And what thing are we talking about? The man with bloodshot eyes had two people joining him. A young man with a grotesque overbite. And a young woman who could easily be mistaken for a child. All of them stared at me with the same broken eyes and rough clothes. They stopped, inches short from the door. It doesn't have a name, Angie said. But it'll leave you empty. It'll leave you like the people out front. But if I leave, I'll be okay. Yes, that's what I'm telling you. Hold on, I'll check the back. I hurried out back to the employee entrance. I pressed down on the cold handle and the door swung open. Outside were another group of four people. Two young men, an older woman, and a girl no more than 16 years old. They all stared at me. I couldn't tell if they were drawn to me or the store. I stopped short of stepping through the door. Why do... do they come here? I asked Angie. They serve their master. They want the spoils. What spoils? What? I thought about it. She was talking about me. Right, I said, nodding to myself. I see. Are you at the back door? Are you there yet? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Just walk out, she whispered. It's not too late. I was just about to walk out when a thought hit me. Why would they lock the front door but not the back? That didn't make any sense. If the purpose was to keep me here, they could easily barricade the back as well. Something didn't add up. The door is open, I said. Great, you can still make it. Why wouldn't they lock the back door, Angie? She hesitated, and there was a brief pause. If they're locking me in here to hurt me, why wouldn't they lock the back door? I repeated. I don't know, she said. But you have to trust me. They gave me the keys, Angie. They go everywhere. I can lock and unlock this door a hundred times. What's going on? They... they don't usually do that. I closed the door and stepped back. Four less pairs of eyes staring at me. Look, said Angie. I was the last person to leave. They messed up. I found a spare key and got out before it was too late. Maybe... maybe they figured I'd warn you. Maybe they're trying to trick you. Sure, yeah. I chuckled. Convenient. I'm trying to help you. She cried out. Those things out there are to discourage you from going outside. They're harmless. But they're there to scare you. Can't you see it as all just a way for them to keep you in there? I got one person screaming at me to go outside. And no one telling me to stay. No locked doors. Just plenty of creeps staring at me. What am I supposed to believe? Fine. You want more proof? Call the police. Hang up and call them. I ended the call. There were eight people out front by now, all gathering outside the front door. I couldn't tell if they were trying to get in or if they were waiting for me to step out. I called the emergency services, only to be met with silence. 
not even a dial tone, just a blank nothing. I tried a few more numbers. My mom, my friends. I tried going online, but all I got was cached copies of sites I'd been to before. My background picture had changed to a black screen, but there was something else. Something had started to smell. The freshly stocked frozen goods had suddenly gone bad, and a stench was oozing out of the freezers. Our flowers by the counter had withered and died, all except the sunflowers, which turned to sickly blue. I wasn't getting through to anyone. Being inside was awful. The single-serving frozen meals were making me gag. I figured I'd go for the landline. As I got to the manager's office, I got another call on my phone. Unknown caller. Looking back and forth between my phone and the landline, I weighed my options. I chose Angie. How were you getting through? I asked her. How do you know my number? I still got the email password. I just checked your application. But how come your number works? Everything else is down. I'm calling from a private network, she said. They don't know there's a way in. They? I asked. I thought it was just one thing. No, they're working together. People just go missing without someone noticing. So there's like a... An intelligence behind it? A conspiracy? Yeah, people come and go in these places all the time. Are they paying you under the table? They figured, um... It was sort of a trial, and no paperwork, no missing people, no records, just a box of name tags. It made sense in a way, but I needed more. I needed proof. There had to be something. Why didn't you call me earlier? I asked. You could have called me as soon as I got the job or, or as soon as my shift started. I had to make sure Jada wasn't around, she said. She would have tried to trick you. I'm not sure you're not trying to trick me. Why would I spend my time calling you from across the country just to have you fail? If I was part of this, I would have just let you sit there with your goddamn team flight tactics and die. She went quiet. So did I. I counted my breaths as I looked outside. There were more of them now. How did you know what I was playing? I asked. She didn't respond. The silence hung in the air. I'm asking you, how did you know what I was playing? She was just as quiet as the man with the bloodshot eyes, still waiting for me outside the door. You're watching. You knew I was alone. You knew I was getting antsy about the guy showing up outside. Yeah, she sighed. You tried to get me out as soon as he showed up. You tried to trick me before there were too many of them to scare me off. That's... that's not... She sighed. I could hear heavy breathing. As I paced back and forth, I was getting ready to hang up. This was a trick. She was the one tricking me. Clearly. Trying to get me to go outside to... Join those things. I know this looks bad, she said. I know. I'm sorry. I'm honestly just trying to help you. This time I was the one keeping quiet. I walked up to the door, studying the people outside. Blank stares, following my every move. I felt like a snake charmer, like they could snap out of it and tear me apart in the blink of an eye. As I said, I... I have the passwords for everything. I'm the only one who knows them. I just wanted to give you the best shot at getting out of there. I hoped they wouldn't come tonight. But as soon as they did, I just, I had to do something. You're not being honest with me. I'm not lying. I'm just, just having a hard time explaining it. There's a lot of stuff about this that all sounds completely insane. I don't want to throw you off the deep end. Give it to me straight, I demanded. Tell me what the hell is coming for me. It's not a thing, like not real. It's there, but it's just, I don't know how to explain it. It just steps through. Steps through what? The world, the air, a ripple in time or, or something. It just steps in and it's there. And then 
Then it shoves some kind of mouth spike into your head and gargles up something inside. A mouth spike? What the hell are you? Yes, a spike. And no, I mean, it goes into your mouth. It doesn't have a mouth of its own. It just goes into you and gone. Game over. I didn't know what to think. My mind was a jumbled mess and I felt my pulse rising and falling. There were over 18 people outside in various states of disarray. All of them just staring at me. If I just stepped outside, I'd know for sure. What does it look like? Does it... The lights flickered. There was a loud hum, a buzz, and then an electric failure. One of the fluorescent lights burned out, while the others just slowly dimmed to nothing. This was real. It was make or break by this point. Something was happening. The lights went out, I whispered. Is this... Now! Angie screamed. Get out! Now! I ran. I tripped and fumbled my way into the back room in complete darkness. I almost twisted my ankle as I bumped into the lunch table. I could barely hear my thoughts, and I had to remind myself to breathe. The roof of my mouth ached, as if anticipating a piercing pain. I could feel my head filling with blood and adrenaline as my dry eyes refused to blink. As I put my hand on the back door, I did the mistake of pulling instead of pushing. It took me three tries before a thought hit me. I couldn't see a thing on the door because of the darkness. In fact, I couldn't see anything. Nothing. Angie, I wheezed, putting my phone to my ear. Are you there? Hurry, she screamed. You can make it. How did you see it? The thing was huge. It just... No. How did you see it in the complete darkness? You... You said the lights went out. It was right there. I can't even see the sign on the back door. How the hell did you see a spike? Look, I... And to add to that, how the hell do you know what it does with that spike? You've never seen the thing kill. You said you were the last one to work this shift. And the thing sure as hell didn't kill you. You're missing the point. I... It doesn't add up, Angie. None of this adds up. You couldn't have seen it, and there's no way for you to know how it kills. I stood there in the dark. I heard Angie panting on the other side, matching my breathing. You're lying to me, Angie. You're not trying to save me. She stopped breathing. For about a minute, it was just quiet. The call ended. A wave washed over me. I was either dead or saved. There was no in between. I was moments from finding out. Every little sound shook me. A breeze just outside. A crackling wire. Ventilation struggling to turn back on. I hadn't even noticed my hand was on the door handle. You lied to me. I said out loud. You. You did. I caught you. There was a sound coming from the other side of the door, a shuffling of feet. Yes, said Angie, from the other side of the door. I must have stood there for an hour until the power came back on. The people outside were gone. Angie was gone. My phone worked just fine, so I called everyone and just cried for help. The police found me locked in the bathroom in a full panic and I barely even remember being escorted out. Cameras had picked up the mob gathering outside, but that was pretty much it. They couldn't be identified from the back of their heads. Jada and the other managers were called in, and they seemed genuinely surprised. I've since looked it up. A hundred people starting and quitting their job in a place like that isn't uncommon. People come and go all the time, the managers honestly didn't know why people disappeared, it seems. Maybe this is just how things work, or maybe there's more than one Angie out there, preying on short-term workers. And the front door? There was no conspiracy there. The thing just jammed sometimes, some kind of trouble with the wiring. If I'd messed with it just a little bit more, the thing could have kicked wide open that broken door was the one thing that saved me from joining them that night. 
I would have walked right out as soon as Angie asked me to. I worked there for another four months, but just day shifts and weekends. The night shifts seemed to go off without a hitch though. Maybe Angie and her friends moved on from an easy meal. I've saved up enough money for my move to Minneapolis, but I'd never forgive myself if I didn't Background. put this into writing. I was 26 at the Looking time, back at pregnant, it, and I it lived feels in a very surreal. rural area. There are things out there. Tom had always been friends with my friends that through high school. To join them. He was a quiet art kid who had insane natural talent. Seemed nice enough, but despite always wearing a smile, he just gave people, mostly girls, the feeling that something was off with him. I never spent a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with him because of this, but I never really had any reason to believe that he was dangerous. Just weird. Anyways, years after high school, I reconnect with my high school sweetheart, Jamie, who happens to be best friends with Tom. Everything was going great for Jamie and I. We got married, started a family, were remodeling an old family home on acres of land that was our own. The dream. By then, Tom had been a regular at greetings. I noticed more and more they had a weapons fascination and also liked to brag on himself. Obviously, obnoxious, but still nothing made me feel threatened. Tom by this time had been married to a woman who was old enough to be his mother. These two were not a healthy, cohesive couple. Super codependent, manipulative, and apparently they had gotten physical with one another. In the midst of this, Tom had started drinking and lying about his drinking, getting two DWIs, and even showing up to our house drunk. Jamie eventually told him to show up sober, or not to come over at all. I was about three months pregnant, and he didn't want that at our house. Time goes by, no word from Tom. That is until about three months, that's the last visit. He calls my husband, wanting to chat, and sounds very depressed. I'm about six months along at this time. Jamie hasn't come by, and they chat outside. Tom wants to leave his wife, good for him, but something isn't right, even more so than normal. Jamie sneaks through Tom's scooter while Tom had came inside to use our restroom. He finds a stashed bottle of vodka. While Jamie's still outside, Tom all of a sudden doesn't have to use the restroom anymore. He turns to me and looks me up and down, so cold and expressionless. You know Jess. Women are most beautiful when they're pregnant. You've never looked more gorgeous. He makes a move closer to me. By this time, Jamie is walking in. Come outside. We need to talk. Shortly afterwards, I hear Tom leave, and Jamie comes in to tell me about the alcohol. I tell him about the creepy comment, and we both agree that he can't be trusted. He was not welcome here until he got help. Tom stopped calling. No text. Nothing. Jamie reached out to make sure he was okay, with no response. From what we heard from his family, he was okay, just working and staying busy trying to keep sober. We really hoped that he was taking care of himself. Two months later, I'm eight months pregnant, I'm no longer working, and Jamie works six days a week. That's a lot of time alone. His schedule was always the same, and it's not changed in years. Tom randomly shows up at our house at 10 a.m. on a day he knew Jamie worked, so I was confused. I usually napped around this time because I was huge and tired. Luckily, I was awake this time and in the front room. This room has a huge window that faces the driveway and the door to my right leads to our garage. I shot him a nervous wave through the window. He didn't seem to see me and was grabbing something out of a duffel bag on his scooter. He pulled out a shotgun. I know there's fight or flight, but I just froze. He grabbed a bottle and took a swig from it, guessing whiskey because of the bottle and the color. Then he finally notices me, sheer horror on my face. In return, I get a hateful look. He says something I can't hear, then smiles. Not a happy smile. Packs up his gun and leaves. I immediately called Jamie. He works close, and the police take forever to get where we live. He didn't answer. 
I totally freaked out while checking the locks. Jamie calls back about 10 minutes later, and as we're talking, Jamie's dad, who lives just down the road, calls. Tom tried to break into his home. Thankfully, James' dad is always armed. He caught him red-handed, but didn't call the cops because of the long-standing relationship with Tom's family. Apparently, Tom hadn't had his gun out when he was caught, so Jamie's dad didn't feel threatened enough to call the cops. Not happy about that. Wasn't my choice. Don't worry, I called the cops myself later that day. That alone was scary and super confusing, but what Jamie told me later really freaked me out. When I was working, I worked a set schedule except the occasions I had been called in. One day, a month prior to my incident, Jamie called in sick and I, coincidentally, was called into work. I hated leaving him sick, but duty called. Jamie said he had been napping a little after 9 due to his high fever. He had woken up at some point due to the sound of the door opening and closing, but he was so out of it that he figured it must have been his fever. What woke him up and kept him at least semi-alert was the bell on our bedroom door. Our dog jiggles it to potty in the morning, and FYI, this dog is overly friendly. He'd be the dog to show the intruder the most valuable stuff to steal. He heard it jingle twice, lightly. He vaguely remembers looking up and seeing what looked like Tom at the end of our bed, staring at him. He said he passed out from the fever getting worse and came to not very long after. By then, Tom was gone, so Jamie figured it was just a fever dream messing with him. After the gun incident, though, he wasn't so sure anymore. It's been over two years, and we make no attempts to talk to Tom. He used to drive by from time to time, but never tried to make contact. I still make sure all my locks and windows are secure throughout the day. Tom, let's not meet ever again. Trigger warning for this story, as it has some details of domestic assault and abuse. My mother just told me this and I'm still in a bit of shock. My mother is strong, independent, and hardworking. She worked her ass off as a sergeant in the army until she was honorably discharged after she was raped by a fellow sergeant. They wanted to keep it hush hush, which in my opinion was messed up. She went on to work at a maximum security prison in Georgia. This is where she met my father, who was also a corrections officer. When they first met, they bonded over basketball. My mom was somewhat of a star in high school, but a lot of college scouts overlooked her because of her height and color. He was able to go to college for it until he hurt his knee and had to drop out and search for a different career. She says everything was great. They were the it couple, a beautiful couple. She still says that he was one of the most handsome men she has ever saw. She compares him to the singer Maxwell. He was smart, fit, charming, and funny. Life was perfect until he moved in with her a year into the relationship. Then everything went downhill. Someday she would come home from work to find him in a drunken stupor, lines of coke spread out over her coffee table. They would argue. She would toss out his bottles of Jack. He would smack her across the face, beat her throughout the night. She would have no choice but to go into work the next day, sore with bruises on her face and black eyes. Her neighbors and co-workers knew what was going on, but turned a blind eye. But the warden even threatened to fire her, saying it wasn't good for inmates to see her like that. So she decided to kick him out, cut all ties, get an order of protection against him, until she found out that she was pregnant. She put off breaking up with him for a while, working doubles as not to go home, basically living at the prison. Ironically, she only felt safe there. One day, she went home and he was there, sober for once. She told him about the pregnancy. By then, she was about two months along. He went off, saying he wasn't ready for a child. He demanded she get an abortion. He gave her money for it the next day before he went to work. Instead of an abortion, she spent the money he gave to her at the mall. 
When she got home, he asked if she had got it done. She said no, explaining that she was 32. She wasn't getting any younger, and she always wanted a child. She was ready to raise one with or without him. He glared at her, his eyes full of hatred. If looks could kill, she would have dropped dead right there. He just nodded and said, Fine, keep it, and stomped off to bed. She was surprised. She thought he would have went off on her. She began to feel hopeful. Maybe he would stop abusing her, stay sober, and they could live happily again. She dismissed the glare as just her imagination and followed him to bed. She had work early the next day. Sometime during the night, she woke up to find him leaning over her, holding a huge knife to her throat. The evil look in his eyes from before. You don't want to do what I tell you, bitch? I'll cut that fucking baby out of you right now. They fought, rolling over the bed and crashing on the floor. Somehow, she was able to knock the knife out of his hand and it rolled under the bed, out of his reach. He then picked her by her hair and threw her against the wall, punching her repeatedly in the stomach, chest, and face. She did the only thing that she could do and kicked him in the crotch as hard as she could. He let out a yelp and dropped to his knees. You fucking bitch! He hollered, cupping his balls. My mom says she quickly grabbed her car keys and ran out of the bedroom. Her stomach felt like it was on fire. It hurt so bad, and she could barely see. Her head ached from hitting it when they fell off the bed. She got into the living room, wanted to grab her purse before she left. She was trying to feel around for it, but couldn't find it. My father must have worked through his pain because my mom says he soon followed her. You're not leaving, he said, heading towards the kitchen. My mom said she felt a shiver run through her body. She knew if she didn't leave right then, she would die that night. She knew that he was going for another knife. She also knew that she wouldn't be able to make it to the front door since the kitchen was right next to it. There's no way that she could run to the door before he got her, not in her condition. She felt like she was going to pass out any second. She heard my father rummaging through the kitchen, calling her all types of names. She threw open the living room window, pushed out the screen, and climbed out. She hung from her hands, closed her eyes, began praying as she let herself drop. She fell into one of those large air conditioning things that you usually see outside, landing on her knees and elbows. She said it hurt like a bitch, but she was alive. Thanking God, she crawled off and limped to the parking lot where her car was. She drove off, never looking back. She left that whole life behind, her pretty condo, her friends, a job she loved and escaped to New York where my grandmother lived, all because of my father, a man she loved and someone she thought loved her back. Edit. Thank you all for the kind words and PMs. I showed my mom this morning and she started crying. Don't worry, it's happy tears. Seeing such kind comments from complete strangers just warmed her heart. A lot of you asked how she's doing now. She still has her bad days, but she's much happier. She's a counselor at the VA hospital for vets who come back dealing with issues, drug addiction, PTSD, etc. She loves her job and she loves helping others. She feels like she's making a difference in the world. Still overprotective, but I understand it's only because she's scared of whatever could happen to me. As for my dad, my mother told me today that he was just released from prison this year after doing a few years for robbery. Hopefully he dropped the soap or something a few times. My husband was at work. I was five months pregnant. I was pretty small and my belly hadn't popped yet. Other women who have been pregnant understand. One day you'll wake up and your belly is just huge. But I still was clearly pregnant with a bump. Let me preface this with the fact that we lived in one of the most upscale areas in our state. I went to take the dog out and noticed a boy 20 or so who was going from building to building in our apartment complex, walking down the halls and coming back out. It was an outdoor complex, so when I took my dog out, I could see multiple halls that he was pacing through. At first, I thought maybe he was trying to find a friend's unit, 
but he was acting a little manic, so that put up a red flag. He started walking towards my building, so I immediately started walking towards the apartment without making it obvious where I lived. There were two hallway entries in the building adjacent from each other. It was a three-story building, so I figured, even if I'm walking towards my apartment, as long as he's not close enough, he won't be able to tell which unit I live in. As I'm walking back, he's probably about 10 feet from me, and he whistles. Immediately, I'm freaking out, but he ends up walking down the adjacent hall. I get to my apartment and lock the door. A few minutes later, after thinking there's no way he could have figured out which unit is mine, I'm warming up some food and get a horrible feeling, like an instinct. So I look out the peephole and he's literally on the other side, facing against the door, like he's listening. Immediately I call the cops, then my husband. I grab the knife and open the window, just in case somehow he could break in. We live on the second story. Luckily the cops showed up and maybe he heard me call them because the kid was gone before he could do anything serious. After that, my husband and I bought a gun for our own protection. Gun control is a major issue in our country right now, but it can also help save lives. Had the person broken in, I felt helpless to protect myself and my daughter. I and my family decided to spend the New Year's with some friends of the family to ring in 2015. There are three big families that we were pretty close to, so there were about 20 of us there. The family hosting us that night made this huge, wonderful meal, and we were all so excited. The hostess, to avoid confusion, we will call her Maria. We were lounging around the house waiting for Maria's husband, son, and son-in-law to come home from work, and we were having a good time. Maria's son-in-law came home and it turned out he invited a friend from work to join in the festivities. Everyone was welcoming and tried to make him comfortable. I began to notice that I kept catching the friend's eye ever since he showed up. I was pregnant. One of the dads there took notice and began to bring up my pregnancy obviously with the intention of letting the friend know that in my condition, I was certainly not looking to hook up. This plan backfired. The friend began to give me pregnancy advice and talking about his children, and his eyes began to shine a way a person does when they are becoming aroused. This made me very, very uncomfortable, and I decided to just avoid the friend for the night. It didn't matter where I was, he would do his damn best to keep me in his line of sight and would not take his eyes off of me for any length of time. Even though I was in deep conversations with Pedro, who, God bless him, did his best to try to distract the friend from me and make sure that he was not near me. Eventually, around 11 p.m., we all decided we wanted coffee in true Hispanic fashion. And when Maria mentioned she had cake mix, I volunteered to make the cake so we would have something sweet to eat with our coffee. At that point, the friend was fidgeting like mad. He looked like he was on drugs. He suddenly gets up as I was about to crack the eggs and got so close to me that he had me pin against himself and the section of the counter. He was so close to me and starts giving me advice on how to make a cake. This cake is from a fucking box. I've done it millions of times. I start to tell him this and he keeps talking over me and presses his crotch on me so I can feel that he's rock hard and gives me that look. I'm so nauseous, uneasy, and annoyed at this point that I say, look, I've done this a million times and don't need your help. Thankfully, you can see perfectly into the kitchen from the family den from the waist up. So he finally gave up and went back to the den. Many more things happened throughout the night that made me want to throw up. Like the New Year's hug when he tried to fill me up. I have nothing against people with pregnancy fetishes. I can understand that people have sexual preferences. But this guy clearly didn't get the hint that I was not interested. and did not care that I was carrying someone else's child in my womb. I found it to be a sickening thing that he would do this to a pregnant woman. I hope I never meet him again. I 
I was 20 years old at the time. I was about 7 or 8 months pregnant with my daughter and I needed to stop to get makeup from the dollar store on my way home from work. I've done it a thousand times. I mean, this dollar store is literally 3 minutes from my house and is my go-to store when I need something fast and cheap. Well, I go in, I start browsing. It's a dollar store for God's sakes, like I was actually going to leave with just makeup. I notice this guy walking behind me. No big deal, right? He's probably doing the same thing I'm doing, looking at junk. So I grab a few things, throw them into my basket. All Walt do was casually follow me down aisle after aisle, looking at the junk. Eventually, I move into the makeup aisle. I'm standing there, trying to decide which $5 foundation I was going to butcher next. And I kid you not, this man is suddenly standing next to me in the freaking makeup aisle. And by next to me, I mean less than a foot away, looking at lip stain. Now, at first, I wasn't concerned. Again, it's a dollar store, and people are weird. But something about him being that close to me in that moment really wicked me out. Here I am, 5'2", very pregnant post-teen. Essentially a watermelon person who struggles to walk, let alone run more than 20 feet at a time, while stopping to catch my breath. Of course, the only thing going through my head was, Jesus, I'm too tired to be fucking kidnapped right now. Which at the time, I thought was a joke. Who would even want to snatch a pregnant lady? I doubt I'd even fit in their van. Imagine the abundance of inconvenience, non-criminally consistent bathroom breaks. That would really put a damper on their plans. You know, all those dumb, unrealistic thoughts that you think and try to make yourself feel less weird in a weird situation. Anyway, I acknowledge that this guy is creeping and I grabbed the last foundation bottle I looked at, not caring if it was even the right color, and went to the counter to check out. Dude followed me again. He was right behind me in line with absolutely no merchandise. Guess he ended up buying a candy bar or something from the counter. I paid for my crap and immediately called my fiance before walking out of the store. I made a point to state somewhat loudly that I needed him to stay on the phone with me until I pulled out of the parking lot. I was pretty freaked out at this point, but I made it to my car and got out of the parking lot. Cool, cool. Almost home. Having a glance from my rearview mirror at the red light, and this guy was, I shit you not, right behind me in his car. Cue watermelon person tears and absolute panic. Ended up pulling into a gas station. Dude followed me in there too. My fiance's best friend was managing and I ended up walking into his office and dude finally left 15 minutes later. My fiance's friend wanted to call the police but I was tired and high off of pregnancy hormones. I wasn't sure if this guy was actually following me or if I was just overreacting and paranoid. I didn't want to get this guy in trouble for just running errands or whatever so I convinced him not to. Thinking about this now, post-watermelon, I probably should have let him call. So this story is a bit of a long story from several years ago when I worked at a fast food chain that served barbecue. I clearly remember this because it was just so weird. My parents owned the business so they allowed me to work there whenever I wanted. At the time, I was 14 years old, but I had purple hair because I had had identity issues, I guess. So I looked a lot older than I actually was, but I was still only about 5'4". One night, I'm working on a Saturday night with only one other girl, a little older than me, trying to get started on closing since we closed in about an hour. It was 8pm and fully dark outside. It was completely silent. Usually you could hear cars pulled up and you could definitely see them as the walls were covered in windows. I'm just sweeping up when I see something move out of the dark. I look up and in the back of our parking lot is a man in all dark clothes just looking inside. No car in sight. I think it's weird but people are like that sometimes. About 10 minutes later the door squeaks open really quickly and it made me jump because it was loud. It was a very large, tall man wearing black scrubs with a scraggly beard. 
At this point, I'm annoyed because it's like 40 minutes before close and it's super hard to close this restaurant. But I put my biggest fake smile on and say like usual, Hi, welcome to... Nothing. No words for what felt like 5 minutes. Then a woman wearing the same clothes came in and the lady looks at the guy's twin. So they come up to the front counter to order and I say, What can I get for you today? Do y'all have fortune cookies? Uh, no sir. We only sell barbecue and sides. That's too bad. We brought our own anyway. I want a large sweet tea. So, no fortune cookies here? No ma'am. At this point, she actually was really mad that we didn't have fortune cookies. Then no food for me. That was their whole order. Just a large drink. They paid and sat down at one of the empty tables. The man had been carrying a computer bag with him, so I thought maybe he had to do some work real quick. But no, he opens his bag and pulls out a whopping handful of fortune cookies. Like, at least 30. They're both very silent and it's really creeping me out. As I'm sweeping under the table next to them, the guy says, without ever looking in my direction, We use these numbers from the cookies to play the lottery every day. Oh, that's really cool. No, it's not. It's serious. We didn't do it one night, and it was the winning numbers. We could have won $2,000. We cried for months. Oh. Little 14-year-old me didn't know what to say, so I just kept sweeping. Now we run an acupuncture shop in the next town over. We can cure everything. Awesome. At this point, I'm sweeping towards the back of the store. I'm facing away from them because they're already creeping me out and I was hoping that they would just stop talking. I don't think you think I'm serious. His voice got really loud all of a sudden, like he was yelling at me, and now he was looking at me. They both looked really pissed at me for some reason, but I didn't want to say any more, so I kept quiet. We cure everything. Smoking habits, cured. Back pain, cured. Chronic headaches, cured. He is actually screaming at me now and my coworker had been in the walk-in cooler, so she heard nothing. I'm starting to walk into the kitchen, but I had to pass him to get there, and to a phone. As I'm walking past, he stares me down. At this point, I'm absolutely terrified, and I don't know what to do, so I start to call my parents. Before I could even grab my phone, this man is suddenly right behind me. We even help ladies get pregnant. He said this a little louder than a whisper, and this sent shivers all the way down my spine that I actually froze. The man walks back towards the table, and I take off downstairs to my coworker. I decided the best option was to lock ourselves in the office and wait until they left. Eventually, we came out and they were gone. There isn't really a good ending to this, because that's all there was. I told my parents and they came and got me. We tried looking up acupuncture places in the town he said he was from, but there weren't any for another 60 miles away. A year later, I'm at a gas station down the street from the restaurant and I'm filling up when a man came back to his car which was beside me. I didn't pay him much attention until he said, what a nice day outside, a good day for some acupuncture. I looked up and I shit you not I was the same creepy dude from the night. I said, yep, and promptly stopped filling up my car and drove away. I don't know if this guy recognized me or what, but to that creepy guy that wanted me to get pregnant at 14 years old, let's not meet. I'm a 22 year old female. It was a pretty warm summer evening and I just finished a late shift at my office. I was feeling tired, eager to get home. I lived about a half mile away, so I walked down the empty street towards my apartment building. I noticed a homeless man sitting on the sidewalk. He was muttering something to himself and seemed agitated. I didn't think much of it though and continued on my way. Suddenly I heard footsteps and turned around to see the homeless man running towards me with a screwdriver in his hand. I immediately started running, but he was fast and quickly caught up to me. I could feel his breath on my neck as he lunged at me, swinging the screwdriver and nipping my jacket. 
My heart was pounding and I knew I had to do something to get away from him. I zigzagged down the street, hoping to confuse him or slow him down, but he was determined and kept chasing me. I could hear him screaming profanities and threats as he closed in on me again. I could see my local convenience store up ahead and I made a run for it, hoping to find safety inside. I could feel him right behind me as I was running to the entrance and pushed my way inside. I ran into the bathroom, shut it behind me and locked it, panting and sweating. The man pounded on the door, trying to force his way inside. I could hear him cursing and yelling as I crashed down behind the sink, just in case he broke through the door. I could hear the employee telling him to leave, but the man paid no attention. After what felt like an eternity, I heard his footsteps fading away and realized he had given up and left. I stayed in the bathroom until the employee came to the door. Eventually, I mustered up the courage to walk back to my apartment, my heart still racing and my hands shaking. That night, I had trouble sleeping, haunted by the thought of the homeless man's rage and the screwdriver he wielded. So, I don't live in the greatest area, nor the nicest apartment. I'm always checking my surroundings when I'm out and about. Nothing crazy, just being aware of what's going on around me. That being said, the other night I decided that the mountain of dirty clothes and happening in my closet was bordering on, uh, disgusting, and it was time for me to do one of my least favorite chores, laundry. I don't mind doing laundry itself, but the laundry room in this building always gives me the creeps. It's in the dank and dark basement of the building, and you always have to grope the wall for the light switch. It would really make an excellent location for a horror film. So I go down, throw my laundry in the machine. Everything is fine and dandy. Come back 45 minutes later to throw it in the dryer. Nothing out of the usual. An hour later, I go back downstairs to the basement to collect my stuff in the dryer. Well, when I turn on the lights, the dryer door is open and my shit is strewn about, on the ground, hanging out of the dryer, etc. To top all of that, they were still wet, which was the worst part because I didn't want to have to keep coming down to the laundry room because I'm a lazy shit. Normally, I'd be like whatever because sometimes people open dryers and don't close them, but this really looked like someone rummaged through my stuff. Shrugging this off, I put my stuff back in and that's when I get such a sharp chill running down my spine like it was so random. I generally felt like I wasn't alone. I turn around back to the elevator and all of a sudden I hear the sound of someone frantically running up the stairs on the other side of the room, almost as if they knew they had been spotted. Anyway, I get my laundry back to my apartment and notice I'm missing stuff, but at that point I'm creeped out, so I'm not in the mood to go snooping around looking for some t-shirts. I kind of forget about the whole thing until a couple days later. I receive an email from the landlord telling all the residents that a homeless guy not only broke into the building, he performed sexual acts upon himself in the laundry room, then started a fire and went around the building trying to break into people's unlocked apartments. So I'm guessing this guy went through my stuff, probably took something, did god knows what with it, and uh, started an actual fucking fire for some reason. I was homeless for a couple years and parked to sleep at a campsite up north from where I'm from. I pulled in, parked, fed the cats, and started to cook and relax. Flashlights appeared in my face, four of them, looking at my window so I assumed it was rangers asking me to move since this campsite was technically closed. I rolled down my window a bit and asked them what was up and apparently it was a family of four also parked and camping. They had a fire going and a dog so I figured things were okay here but there was a really weird feeling. My boyfriend at the time decided to try to befriend them and we got out to chat. They asked us a lot of very pointed personal questions. Are you married? Do you live around here? Do you have kids? But actually it was their two kids asking all the questions. They spoke like adults which made me assume maybe trauma was a real part in their lives. At some point their kids put themselves to bed by basically going, Mom, Dad, we're headed to bed. That really rubbed me the wrong way, but whatever. It all got worse from here though. 
They talked about their converted truck they live in. Apparently the kids shared a bed and the key point they made was that the van was soundproof. They really wanted to play with our cats, but no such luck. They started to try to separate me from my boyfriend, saying shit like, let's walk to the river, let's go look at the car. And at some point, they started letting the fire go out and standing behind us a lot. That was enough. We left some stuff behind and got in our car, started it up, and just talked like, what the fuck? It took two minutes for the woman to walk up to the van and asked if we were leaving. We said no and that we were just cold. She asked to sit in the seat behind us. I asked why. She didn't answer and asked if she could sit with us or on my lap. Again, I asked why. Again, she didn't answer. She said we couldn't leave her there because her husband beat her. So I asked her if she wanted us to call the police. She didn't answer, pulled out a cigarette and lit up. We looked at each other and heard someone douse the fire. I said, baby, just out of so much nervousness, which is when I found out that my boyfriend was suspicious from the beginning and didn't think to say anything until now, only to add that if I had stayed and not followed him to the car, he would have just left me there. He was a waste of space, but before I could process it, I heard the husband grab something off the fire tool set. And from earlier, I noticed that they had a large red axe. I just got tunnel vision and hit the gas. I felt the bitch prounce off the side of my van as we pulled away. And just as we got on the road, an ambulance was behind us with the lights flashing. I wasn't stopping for it. You know how easy it is to buy emergency lights for your car on Amazon. No fucking thanks. The ambulance eventually turned off a dead end road after a while of demon driving into town. We never heard a siren. I looked up the aforementioned river. It was two and a half miles into the dense woods. Apparently, a lot of people go missing out there. I wonder who's to blame. This happened about a month ago, and I can still not shake this traumatic event. I'm at a receptionist at a professional building in Pasadena, California. I'm female in my mid-twenties and spend the long boring days at my desk listening to my favorite murder, crime junkie, and new obsession, Let's Not Meet the Pod, that I started binging yesterday and got me writing this post. So it was a normal Tuesday at the office. I got off around 6pm and locked everything up. I make my way downstairs to the lit up parking lot and say goodbye to the standing security guard. I pull out my keys in preparation for the long walk to my car which is in the isolated employee parking lot. The employee's parking lot is about a block away from my office building on a secluded street with literally no street lights or through traffic. I'm not sure why the street has no street lights. Normally it's not dark out at 6pm, but since it was November, it's pitch black out by this time. So as routine, I pull out my keys while I'm in the lit parking lot and call my boyfriend just in case I get murdered or something. This situation made me realize that my boyfriend could not help me through the phone. So I'm talking to my boyfriend, keys in hand, and I see a dark figure on the sidewalk that I'm walking on to get to my car. I say something to my boyfriend and see the dark figure walking towards me. I flip my phone light to shine in his face and he says, Who the fuck are you talking to, bitch? I immediately go off the sidewalk into the street to get away and say, My boyfriend. I could tell right away that he was a dirty meth head homeless man with a huge beard, khaki shorts, and a ball cap. He then starts yelling at me, who are you talking to bitch, and follows me in the street. I literally stop and show him my phone like an idiot trying to prove that I wasn't talking to him. He comes up to me at an arm's distance and starts calling me awful names and demanding I go to the other side of the street as if he owned the place. We are both in the middle of the street now. I knew if I crossed to the other side, I would just have to cross again as my car was on the side of the crazy homeless man. I told him, get the fuck away from me, I'll call the police right now, with the most disgusting look on my face. He then puts his hands in the shape of a gun, puts his fingers to my head, and in a method do slur says, I'll kill you bitch, right here, you fat bitch, I'll kill you. My heart sank. At this moment, I realized this guy was out of his mind, angry and violent. I start to rush towards my car, all while my boyfriend is on the phone saying, 
What's going on? Get in your car. Put your keys between your fingers and run. I see the man running towards my car and luckily I dodged him. Pressed the unlock button and got in super quick. He's standing right in front of my car and proceeds to kick my front bumper hard saying, Fuck you. You better not call the cops. On repeat. He then runs behind a dumpster and is spying on me from behind the dumpster as I'm pulling out. He then starts running around my car towards the front and I truly thought I was going to have to run him over. He starts chasing my car down the road and stops at his belongings. I peel into my office building and fly down the security guard, hysterical. I told him that there's a crazy man that just threatened to kill me. I call the cops and see the man booking it down the street, which gave me the perfect view of his face and outfit. The cops sent an officer and I left the scene five minutes later. The crazy man was still on the corner just standing there, so I screamed, Fuck you! as I drove off. He tried to run at my car. Apparently the cops couldn't find him. He even sent a helicopter. I later found out that he tried to rob my coworker that night, but was unsuccessful. The next morning I saw the crazy man back in front of the employee parking. Two cops were surrounding him. He was arrested. I was happy, but anxious that I had to see the crazy man yet again. He proceeded to hang around the street for the next two weeks. I constantly saw him in the morning and on my lunch. I was paranoid that he was looking for me. I thought that's why he was coming back. He must be looking for me. I messaged our office building manager and they got a trespassing order on this dude. I hadn't seen him again until this Monday. He was sleeping at the same exact spot where the encounter happened. My heart sinks every time I see him and I relive the trauma all over. Our office building now has employees move their cars over from the employee parking lot to the main lot around 4 p.m. so no one is walking in the dark anymore. We also use the buddy system now. I got two pepper spray cans and I don't go anywhere without them now. I always thought that my obsession with true crime had prepared me for any scary situation thrown my way. After this night, I realized that there is no amount of true crime podcasts that could ever prepare me to fight off someone who has the will to harm me. If this man had a gun, I'd be done for. This is my second post of the sub. I have almost a lot of different encounters and few people wanted me to post more about them so here's another one for you guys. So the same suburban area where my family lived, there was a really old abandoned three story building, a few houses from ours. It was a local hotspot for teenagers and other young kids to go explore this scary old building. Me and my friends had explored it a lot of times. Mostly just the yard since the house owner still owned it and took care of it. By that, the owner just locked all the doors and windows whenever someone broke into it. But one day, me and my three friends wanted some excitement, so we figured we should just go to the house for old time's sake in the middle of the night. And so we did. We went to the house, and I'm not sure if it was just the feeling of an abandoned building but something already felt off in my head. But I feel like that in a lot of places, so I didn't think much about it. We then tried to open the door, but it seemed to be locked or stuck since we tried pulling it and pulling, but it didn't open. Then my other friend tried kicking the door in. He managed to get his foot through the door, making a hole in it. We then reached through the hole and opened the door from the other side. It had a weird mechanic or something but we got it open and we went in the rooms were quite small even though that there were a lot of rooms it had a basement and a middle floor and an upstairs we explored and chatted and explored it for old time's sake it was about pretty much 1 a.m when it started to rain a bit so we decided to stay inside from the rain we were upstairs in kind of a living room. We sat down on the floor instead of an old molded couch because, really, who would do that? We were chatting about Clash Royale until we heard a sound coming from the downstairs. 
floorboard creaking. Me and the others got all silent and confused about it. And then we just watch each other in silence. Then we heard another creak and something falling on the ground. We then looked at each other with wide eyes, scared to what to do. I then managed to stretch myself to look down the stairs with my head hidden. I didn't see anything, but I noticed that a table had fallen over in the kitchen area. I then told my friends that it was just the wind. It knocked down a table in the kitchen, and then we all started to chuckle from the jump scare. We then stood up and got ready to go downstairs, but before we could even reach the first step, we heard someone running and dashing from the back door outside. One of my friends got scared from it so much that he almost fell. It's so funny to this day. You should have seen his face. But in all seriousness, we got confused and scared, so we decided to book it from the front door. We ran half a block to our friend's house, and we didn't see or notice anything on the way. Except the back door was almost off its hinges in the backyard. It was a strange happening, but we didn't think about it much. It was probably another teenager trying to break in and explore it, and got scared and ran away. We thought. Then a few days go by, and a friend from our group in the house noticed something interesting in the newspaper. That a local drug addict homeless man had been found and taken to custody. The man had been living in the abandoned house and using it for drug deals and shelter. Now, I don't know what would have happened if we didn't hear his sounds and went downstairs with, I'm in there. And I still think about it sometimes. What could have happened, but I'm very happy nothing happened to us. But man, it was still pretty fucked up. I was working on a no-budget film. A really trashy script. Weird plot. No redeeming values at all. Toward the end of the production, me and the director were going around getting second unit inserts. We were on 59th Street at 6 a.m. on Sunday morning, uploading the camera. We were going up to a penthouse he knew of to get a shot looking down at Central Park. No one knew about the film other than the production crew and actors. It would never, ever have been mentioned in any media. So the director and I are unloading, and there's no one around except for one homeless man. He shuffled along the sidewalk, heading in our direction. He's one of the sad, mentally ill people that our society refuses to help. So his schizophrenia is untreated, and he's out on the streets, and he's talking to himself nonstop as he comes along. When he gets close to us, he looks at us and says, And here are those guys that are making that movie about. And he proceeds to rattle off the entire plot line as he walks past. As if he were reading the IMBD synopsis. None of our equipment was visible. None of our equipment was visible. So there was no way that anyone would recognize us as a film crew. The director and I just looked at each other like, What just happened? When I was 17, going through Virginia with my mom on our way to North Carolina, we were staying at this hotel called Alexandria, and a lot of places were walking distance from this place. So, one day, we got ready to get breakfast over at this place called Panera Bread, a few blocks away. It's around maybe 11 a.m., decently populated area. It's the summer. I'm in typical summer clothes. Nothing too extreme. A tank top and jean shorts. This guy is walking towards us on the sidewalk and he starts walking directly towards us as he comes closer and I'm like what the fuck is this dude doing and he comes up to my mom and I'm about five feet or so away because I didn't realize he started saying something until I hear how much for the little one because he thinks I'm a prostitute and my mom is my pimp. My mom was like, that's my daughter, and she's not for sale. And he was like, oh, you have a beautiful daughter. And then 
was like, Can I bomb some cigarettes? To my mom, when we were leaving Alexandria a day or two later, we are pretty sure we saw the same guy passed out on a public bench. So, to the horny homeless guy who thought I was a hooker, let's not meet again. I'm 18 and female, and I went to the beach with friends and my boyfriend. It was a hot day, so we had fun at the park, and then in the evening, we went to Brighton Beach and took some pictures of the sunset. We were having a good time. My friends Jay, who is 19 male, and E, 18 female, and her boyfriend D, 18 male, and my boyfriend, 19 male. So we were sitting there. Me and my friends were all wearing shorts because it was hot and the temperature was slowly going down. D leaves to catch a train. A drunk old man in his 60s approached us. I could sense something was wrong, so I asked him about himself, and he sat down with us. He seems friendly enough and just looking for human interaction. Personally, I like helping people and talking to strangers. He seems to take a liking to me, but I didn't think much of it. Basically, he told us about his mess in the past. His brother committed suicide. His dad had prostate cancer. And he got it too. And only had six months left to live. We were quite drunk, so honestly, we weren't all there. He then told us about how in the morning, he's going to jump off a cliff and kill himself. And then he describes his messed up life, self-harm, being R-word, etc. Obviously, I didn't want him to kill himself, so I opened up about my past too. Sexual and physical abuse as a child. It seemed to really help. He took my hand and started stroking it. I didn't mind because he was just looking for comfort. Anyway, we all talked for about 45 minutes. He's still holding my hand and stroking the top of it. My friend is telling him about her past too and that it's getting better, etc. He takes all of our hands, which is fine. He says we're like his sisters and that he's homeless and lives on the beach. He says he doesn't care about himself and he only cares about other people. I asked, What makes you think you're not worthy of being cared for? He burst into tears and said, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know I feel for him I take on too many burdens from others because I want to help anyway it's getting colder and I'm in shorts and a linen top because I gave my hoodie to E I'm really good at dealing with cold my body usually projects warmth he touches my leg and says oh you are boiling why are you so warm? He then touches my friend's leg and says she's freezing. We were still kind of drunk, so I didn't really think much of it. Before all this, he was talking about how he respects everyone, especially women, and any man who is disrespectful to him has to deal with him. He told my boyfriend to take care of me, etc. I asked if he likes jelly beans, and then I gave him the bag that I got from a store a few hours ago. My friends gave him a chocolate bar. We didn't really have any proper food. He looks at me and says, You are stunning. Absolutely stunning. Without trying to sound like I'm um, vain, I have thick, very long curly hair, dyed red, which gets a lot of compliments, an hourglass figure and, and long legs, and a pretty face. I'm not really usually freaked out when strangers call me pretty, so it didn't really raise any red flags. He calls my friend pretty too. Anyway, we gave him offerings and decided it was time for us to get some food. It was about 8pm. Me and my boyfriend were going on a date, and my other two friends were going off to get some of their food. So we get up and say our goodbyes. He then placed a kiss on my hand. He hugged each one of us a few times, but on the last hug, he kisses E's forehead and then hugged me and leaguer a kiss on my jaw. He touches my back and says, Oh, you are like a furnace. It was over so quickly and slowly. 
I didn't know what to do. At the time, we were all a little bit like, what the fuck just happened? But that was yesterday, and I talked to E about it, and she says that it made her so uncomfortable, and me too. After we left him, we all agreed to meet today and give him some more blankets and food, but we talked about it. We figured out he was making some stuff up because it was so elaborated and practiced, and it didn't even end up happening. I talked to a friend who always hangs out at the beach, and she says she knows him, and that he's a bit weird. Not dangerous, but definitely messed up. He tells everyone that he's going to kill himself, and she advised me to stay away. This happened like three weeks ago. It was 6.30 p.m. I was walking home from school, and I encountered this one homeless man, I assume in his 30s, he always wanders around my suburb, carrying a sack along with his two children, which I assumed to be toddlers. One of his children approached me and tried holding my hand, begging if I had any spare change. I think giving food is better than giving money, so instead of giving them some coins, I gave the kid one pack of biscuits from my backpack, and the kid was okay with that, but his father wasn't. He gave me a bad look, so I walked away feeling uneasy and also sprayed hand sanitizer on my hands afterwards because his hands were seriously dirty at the time and he had just scavenged from a nearby trash bag right before that moment. Two days after, I encountered them again when I was on my way home around the same time, but on a different street in my suburb after coming from a friend's house. They were begging really hard for money, didn't even have any food with me at the time. The man asked me if I really didn't have any money and that made me feel startled and gave me serious chills. He started approaching me really slowly, asked if he could check my backpack or pockets, so I started moving away from him. But then his two kids started grabbing my bag and prevented me from escaping. I managed to move fast enough that their hands got separated from my bag and they started crying real hard when they fell to the ground. Their dad yelled at me while I was escaping and called me a selfish and heartless person for doing that to his children. I tried contacting the local authorities in my area to see if they witnessed the man and child in the streets. They said that they were quite familiar with him since they wander around frequently. After telling them what happened to me, they told me that they will patrol the area to see if he comes back. However, I have not seen him since. This took place in 2019, before the whole COVID shit show started. I was trying to find a job and went through the global connections of employment. Due to a recommendation of my mom, she had worked with them when they were known as Gulf Coast Enterprise. I had gotten done with my seminar and I was waiting for the bus. This hobo had walked up and asked if I had any money for a drink. I told him I only had enough money for the bus and I needed it. That seemed to trigger him. He almost immediately got aggressive with me and demanded that I give him my money. I told him no again, that I needed it. His response was, Yeah, well I need it more than you. Wherever you need to go, you can walk, fat ass. I just stood there scared because I'm not one for conflict and this guy was making me feel really uncomfortable. His eyes went wild when I wouldn't pull out my wallet. He was about to throw a punch when we both suddenly heard a police cruiser blare their siren as they passed by. He stopped almost at once and stormed off, muttering to himself about God knows what. I was shaking pretty badly when the bus came around, and I never saw him again after that. For the rest of the time that I was training and I had to go take that bus, I did fear that he would come around again. He didn't, so that's a good thing. Let's keep it that way, shall we? Last night around 12.30, I was blitzed and wanted a snack as you do, so I went to 7-Eleven for a quickie. Now I live north of Orlando, outside the burbs, surrounded by cornfields. No streetlights, and I couldn't hit my closest neighbor's house with a rock if I tried. So imagine my absolute horror when I grabbed me my snacks, shut my car door, turn and see someone standing with a flashlight. I tried to hold my screams and halfway expecting it to be one of my six other family members who lived in the house. 
Before I can muster up a word, I hear, You don't know me, but... And take off, screaming babe over and over again as I ran the 40 feet inside of my house to frantically tell my boyfriend what happened and to get the gun. As we unlock the safe, I hear the dude talking outside my door. My boyfriend goes outside strapped, only to face a 6'2 skinny tweaker high off his ass with scabs all over his face on a bike two feet from our door. Dude, do you know where you fucking are? You're lucky she only went to the store and didn't go strapped. You'd be dead right now. What the fuck do you want? I'm sorry, sir. My name is Carrie. All my friends call me Bear. I used to be big, but all the fentanyl and meth left me like this. I got all my stuff stolen. My bike, my bags. I'm homeless. I got everything I own stole from me. I saw her come up the road and got excited that someone was awake, so I followed her to ask if I could use her Wi-Fi. He stole your bike? You're on a bike. Who the hell follows a woman alone at night with good intentions? My boyfriend followed, gun no longer pointed, but I could tell he was as conflicted as I was. Well, I grabbed it when I saw your car. I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know she was a woman. I won't mean no harm. Please, I just need your Wi-Fi, and I'll leave. I'm sorry I scared you. I didn't mean to. I put my hotspot on for this guy. There is no way I was giving him access to my home Wi-Fi and having him come back here for free Wi-Fi as he pleased. I left my phone with my boyfriend and went back in to get a couple of free promotional backpacks we had. I filled one with canned food and another with giveaway clothes and a trash bag full of old blankets. I told the guy that there's people here at all hours of the day and not to come back no matter what. He's lucky he found the only house of hippies in 10 miles, or he probably wouldn't be breathing. Then we watched as his little red bike light disappeared down our long dark street. This guy got everything he owned stolen, and I felt bad, no matter how awful he scared me. What would you have done? This happened several years ago. I was home alone one evening when I heard a knock at the back door. This confused me, as no one ever uses that back door. My husband and I lived in a fourplex at the time, and all the units had back doors at the top of a narrow staircase. These doors were a little inconvenient to access, as you would have to go all the way around the building and up the narrow stairs, as opposed to the wider main entrance at the front. It didn't make much sense to use the back entrance, and I couldn't think of anyone who would go to that door to visit. As I approached the back door, I saw two men in the window, standing at the door. A chill went down my spine. I did not feel safe about opening this door, so I called out, Hello? One of the men tapped on the window. Yes, hello. May we come in? We're with Bresnan. At the time, my husband and I had Bresnan for a cable, but did not have any issues with it. I replied, We're not having any issues. Is there a problem with it? Ma'am, the man said. Can we come in? We're servicing the area and it's important we look at your cable. I shook my head to myself. We're not having any issues, so there's no need to stop by. Ma'am, we're visiting every resident. Let us in so we can do our job. I noticed the man grabbed the doorknob and tried to open the locked door. I slowly grabbed the knife from inside our knife block and held it at my chest. We're not having any issues, I repeated, trying not to convey the shakiness of my voice. So you don't need to be here. The two figures appear to shuffle and then straighten. Ma'am, let us in. We're on a deadline and need to do our job. I glanced at the clock, gauging when my husband would arrive home from work, all while gripping the knife tighter. Ma'am. Ma'am. I saw them try the doorknob again. I closed my eyes and felt overwhelming gratitude as I always locked my doors. Just then, the thought came to the forefront of my mind. I'm sorry I can't help you. Could I please get your name and batch numbers? I'll give your supervisor a call and let them know that the cable is fine. I heard another shuffle and one of the men replied, No need to, ma'am. We're sorry we wasted your time. With that, both of the men exited the staircase and disappeared into the night. Shaken up, I held that knife tight and tried to get my bearings. I remember making a mental note to call the cable company or the police, but my hands were shaking so badly. I couldn't even hold the phone. With a knife still grasped to my chest and the phone falling out of my other hand, I sank to the floor and cried. When my husband returned home, I told him what had happened. 
I was still very shaken up and had started crying after he came home. He immediately called a cable company and spoke to a representative. They informed us that no one from the company was out on assignment in our area. The next day we asked our neighbors if they had a visit from the company. No one had. So to the two creepy men that tried to break into my home under the disguise of cable repair, let's not meet. My grandparents live in a house located in a very secluded area, surrounded by woods. The nearest neighbor is about a half mile away from the house. Whenever my grandfather has work in town for a couple days, he calls me home to take care of my grandmother who suffers from arthritis. One night, it started raining really heavily and the power was cut for the entire night. It was really windy and since this house is pretty old, you could hear a lot of creaking sounds. At around 1 a.m. in the middle of the night, I woke up to a loud knocking sound on the front door. My grandmother was still sleeping and I didn't want to wake her up. The noise freaked me out because it was impossible for someone to be out there at this time in the rain outside our house. But I thought maybe it's my grandfather who probably had some emergency and had to come home at this time of night. As I walked to the main door to see who it was, the knocking stopped. I saw our dog standing in the corner of the room, looking at the door with his tail between his legs. He looked super scared. I figured something wasn't right and that if someone was outside my door, it obviously wasn't my grandfather. I went upstairs to see who it was through a window and just saw a shadow, but I'm not sure if it was actually a person's shadow or just a hallucination from my sleepy mind. I did not open the door and went back to bed. The creepiest part was, the next morning, I saw muddy footprints on my porch and a broken door handle. My friends went to Mexico for vacation and asked me to house sit and take care of their dogs while they were gone. They'd pay me $40 a day just to sit around and let their dogs go out when they needed to. I am disabled, so this helps a lot. This is a semi-rural area, and the houses were roughly a quarter mile apart. Police have to come down from town 15 miles away, and response time can be well over an hour. I always take my pistol with me. It's always quiet when I've stayed there. This time was different. I was in the shower when the dogs started barking and growling. They are big, large German shepherds, and one is actually police trained. The owners loan him to the county as a drug dog, and if you tell them to be quiet, they obey. This time they didn't, so I went on high alert. I shut off the water and looked outside the window. I didn't see anything, but when I walked out of the bathroom, I saw a shadow go across the bedroom window. I whispered to the dogs to hush, and they did. That's when I heard a man's voice. I couldn't make out everything he was saying, but I distinctly heard two words. Come around so I'm sure that there's more than one person. I run into the living room with my pistol and saw the door handle turn. I yelled, I have a gun and I will fucking use it. I heard feet run away. I was telling Siri to dial 911 and got the county sheriff fast. She said there were two cars on another call not too far away and it would take about 20 minutes for them to get there. That's better than the usual hour, but I was shaken up. I explained that I was on a farm and I would have to go down the road to unlock the cattle gate to let them in and to please tell the police officers that I would be carrying a pistol and to please not shoot me by mistake because I was not going outside the house without it. The dispatcher said, Oh no, do not go out there without your gun. I will tell them. The good thing about living in a rest state. She asked if I could see the road and I can. So she said, Wait in the house until I saw blue lights. I hung up and called my friends in Mexico. Their camera footage could be downloaded via an app and they said that they would go through it while I waited for the cops. I locked the house and went down to the gate when the police arrived. They searched the whole place including the barn but didn't find anything. While they were looking my friends texted me the camera footage. There was a man on the porch. Unfortunately cameras were not angled to get a shot of his face and it was of course dark. I still think that there is more than one creep because of what they said, come around. The police were very nice and said that they had passed a man on a bike on the way, which was strange for this area, especially at night, and they went to go look for him. 
but that's all they could do. They took a full report, but never caught the creep. My husband came and stayed with me for the rest of the trip. One of our neighbors said that they found a tent and some gear near the woods a few weeks before, so maybe someone was living back there. Maybe a homeless person from town. I have house sat again since, and it was quiet. They are all going away for Christmas, and I will be there again. A lot of people asked me if I would have shot the creep if he had broken in. Yeah, absolutely. I would be sorry for hurting someone, but if it's them or me, yeah. Creepy porch guy, let's not ever meet again. A few years ago, I lived in a large apartment complex. My unit was at the very end of the first floor. A lot of strange people lived there, but seemed pretty harmless. One night, my boyfriend was over, thankfully, and we were watching a movie. I noticed a shadow passed by the window, but then I felt like it didn't completely pass by. At that point, I started feeling like I was being watched, but was too scared to turn and look. I finally look and see a silhouette of a person and a pair of eyes peeking between the space and the blinds. I told my boyfriend someone was out there and he jumped up. We saw a person's shadow run away. My boyfriend peeks out the window and we assume he had ran around the back of the building. A few minutes later, there was a knock at my door. My boyfriend and I just looked at each other because it's like 1am. I told him not to answer because I didn't want to open the door to anyone. After a minute of the decision, he's adamant of answering it, so I tell him to grab a knife. He opens the door and there is no one out there. He looked over and saw a man nearby a tree doing the come here motion with his hand. We called the cops and they said that they would keep an eye out, but we never heard anything more. In that moment, it felt like the beginning of a scary movie. The actual encounter was brief, but terrifying. I'm a 30 year old female. I live with my wife and our sweet orange tabby cat. We own a home in an older neighborhood in a college town. The neighborhood is mostly families and older people. Right around 2 a.m. Monday morning, my wife and I are both woken up by our cat. Immediately after we hear him, we distinctly hear someone rattling our door, making the sound that they would have been holding the door handle while trying to open it. We rush to our living room, my wife wielding her aluminum bat. She smacks our recliner and screams, I have a fucking bat. Our cat crouches on the ground and is growling, his hackles raised. I got 911 on the line and we all got into one bedroom with a lock on it while waiting for the police. They came by but didn't see anything. That night my wife didn't get any more sleep. I only got a little myself after our cat curled up next to me. We both called out of our jobs at the university on Monday and wound up getting lock bars for our front and back doors and replace our backdoor lock with one that requires a key on both sides. This thankfully went as well as it could have, but was so out of the blue and upsetting. More than anything, this is just a reminder to stay vigilant and invest in what security measures you can. We never imagined someone would try to break in in the dead of night when there are two cars in the driveway. This is a rather painful story to retell, I mean, it still keeps me up at night, but I'll do my best, as my therapist says writing about it will help me out and help me get through it. It's been two years and it still gets to me. It was just after midnight and I was home alone. My husband was out of town for work and wouldn't be back for a few days. I was curled up on the couch watching TV when I heard a noise coming from the front door. At first, I thought it was just the wind or a stray cat, but then I heard it again. It sounded like someone was trying to open the front door. My heart started racing and I quickly grabbed the phone to call the police. As I was dialing, I heard a loud crash and the sound of glass shattering. Someone had broken into my home. I quietly made my way to the kitchen and hid and waited for the police to arrive. Moments later, I heard footsteps coming towards me. They were slow and deliberate, and sounded like they were getting closer and closer. I knew I had to act fast, but it was panicking in my mind. I grabbed a kitchen knife and prepared to defend myself. 
Suddenly, the door to the kitchen burst open and a man stepped in. He was rather tall and somewhat muscular. He was wearing a ski mask that was covering most of his face. I could tell that he was older, but not much more than that. I held the knife out, rather uneasy, but he easily overpowered me and knocked me to the ground. I just laid there. He told me not to get up, not to move, and everything would be okay. So I was just laying there, helpless and terrified. The man was rummaging through my belongings, every so often looking back at me. When he did, I closed my eyes. I didn't want to stare at him. Not only not to make him mad, but also I didn't want that image in my head. He took my jewelry, my money, and my phone before finally leaving the house. I was left alone shaken and traumatized by this experience. I honestly laid there till the police came. Once I heard of them, I finally got up. They searched the house and the surroundings and ended up taking a report. As of now, the man has not been caught and this was two years ago. I was left to live in fear, wondering if he would ever come back. Since then, we put up cameras outside the house and we replaced the door in the back that had a glass window and it's now a much sturdier door. Anyway, that's my story and I hope one day I won't think about that every night before I go to bed. I was sitting in my living room one evening and I noticed movement outside my window. I glanced up and saw a man peering in. His face was pressed against the glass. I jumped up in shock and ran to the window, but he had already disappeared into the darkness. I felt very violated and scared, knowing that someone had been watching me in my own home. I immediately called the police, but there was little that they could do without any identifying information about this peeping Tom. The next night, it happened again. I was in my bedroom getting ready for bed when I heard rustling outside my window. I looked up and saw the same man staring at me with a look of excitement in his face. I screamed and ran to the phone, but by the time the police arrived, he was gone. This went on for weeks with the man appearing at all hours of the night, watching me from outside my window. No matter if I had the blinds drawn or curtains up, it seemed like he would find the opening and stare in. I know this because my neighbor told me that he saw a man hanging around my house. I felt like a prisoner in my own home constantly looking over my shoulder and jumping at every noise. I tried to stay strong and vigilant, but eventually, the stress and anxiety became too much. I couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, and felt like I was losing my mind. It was a constant battle to feel safe and secure in my own home. Finally, the police were able to catch the man in the act. It turns out that it was my neighbor who had been stalking me for months. I felt a sense of relief knowing that he was finally caught but the trauma of the experience stayed with me for years to come. I lost my sense of security and privacy and it took me a long time to regain those feelings again. This happened years ago when I was in college. We were four girls living in a dorm room. So I had this roommate, Anna, that used to stay late at night outside or at her boyfriend's and she would always forget to lock our dorm room door one night, around 3 a.m., I woke up from a nightmare. I heard something like a girl screaming, only once. But when I realized the dorm was all quiet, I thought for sure that it was just my imagination. I noticed that Anna had returned. She was in bed and I felt a strange urge to go see if the door was locked. So for the next few minutes, I had this internal dialogue. Go check the door. No, because if I stand up, I'll lose my sleep. Eventually, my laziness won and I fell asleep. When I woke up, my roommates briefed me on what happened that night. The whole dorm was talking about it. Apparently, a stranger entered our dorm that night. He was in his late 40s. He heard some girls in the room were not sleeping and were loud, so he banged on their door and said something that I can't quite remember now. After some time, thinking he left, one of the girls went to the bathroom the bathrooms are located in the hallway. As she was in the bathroom, he tried to break open the door. This was happening on the same floor where we lived, so that's probably why I heard the scream. Luckily, another girl saved her when she called the police and he got scared and ran away. But that's not all. 
Before he tried to assault that girl, he had been in the study room and vandalized it. He pooped on the floor, ripped the blast that was on a chair, and did other stuff in there. Made the study room a mess. The study room was right next to my room, and guess what? That night, we slept where our door unlocked. Just like you guys always say in here, always trust your gut. I should have trusted mine and checked the door. Thank God he didn't try our door. A few days later, I heard that the police found the guy, and I heard that he was free. After that event, they increased the level of dorm security. Evening, folks. This has been ongoing for some time now, but tonight was particularly weird. Please excuse any weird formatting. I'm doing this on mobile, currently under my blankets, kinda freaking out. So, some context. I'm 25, female, and live on the second story of my building across from a big city. We have lots of houseless people in my area, and there's a safe injection site right next to my home. I'll mention right off the bat that I have been houseless within my lifetime from the ages of 8 to 10 and grew up in the care of an addict. I completely empathize with folks who are having a tough go at things. However, I also value my safety and my neighbor's safety for that matter. So I will preemptively apologize if at any point I sound frustrated at this ongoing situation. I'm mad at the situation that has plagued both the life of myself and the houseless man who is tormenting my building. This all started uh, about a year ago when my partner and I were nearly attacked by this houseless man while downstairs in our parking lot. To summarize the situation, we had just gotten home where my partner was going to drop me off. We didn't live together at the time, we kind of do now, but only on the weekends. And as we said our goodbyes, we noticed a man pacing in the visitor's parking lot who was seemingly having a rough time. We kept our distance. Car doors locked and windows up, and eventually the man got the hint and left. Just to set the scene a bit here, my parking lot has two sections. One is a public parking guest area, and the second is a locked gate with a smaller locked door for residents to safely park overnight. The gate requires a FOB entry, and the door has a regular building key. Both were made with metal bars. This is important for later. I got out of the car and proceeded to walk towards the door, key in hand. My partner started up the car which caused the houseless man to rush back into the parking lot and promptly attack the car. He hopped onto the hood, beating on the windows and trying to rip off the mirrors. I watched in horror as this terrifying situation evolved next to me, a mere 14 feet away. I quickly got my key into the lock and opened the door at lightning speed. The sound of my keys caught the attention of the man and he promptly sprinted towards me. Thankfully by this point I had begun closing the door behind me. By the time he got to me, I slammed the door in his face and stepped backwards while he screamed at me. When my partner realized I was safely behind a locked door, he got into gear and drove away. Moments later, he called me and instructed me to get away from the door and safely upstairs. It was a good thing he did. I felt like I was in freeze mode. I couldn't move. My heart was pounding out of my chest as this houseless man screamed disgusting things at me. Most of which revolved around essaying me and gesturing crudely at his groin and flicking his tongue. I finally broke my fear freeze, walked away as he chanted, Pretty lady, pretty lady, 
wanted taste, huh? Those words are burned into my memory. I rushed upstairs and quickly closed the blinds of my windows. I heard him still yelling and chanting outside for a good few minutes after. But then I heard something unusual. A lighter clicking. The silence was deafening as the lighter clicked repetitively. Eventually the click stopped and he began laughing. I looked outside, peering through the blinds, I realized he was attempting to set our building's wooden fence on fire. Luckily it had rained, so the fence wasn't catching. I quickly hopped on a call with the emergency services who sent a police car and fire truck. As soon as the cop car pulled up, the houseless man went ballistic and started screaming bloody murder. They apprehended him quickly and took him away in the ambulance. Months passed with no sign of him, but one day a resident in my building reported being attacked by a man who matched his description. After the incident, we, the residents, repeatedly heard him screaming, crying, moaning and laughing at least three times a week outside our building, generally at night. He also started trashing and damaging people's cars when they parked in the guest parking lot. Thankfully, we installed a new gate last week that closes off the guest parking behind another FOB-activated gate. The thing is, as soon as the gate got installed, the man left us alone. It has been quite a week. It's been nice, but tonight, about an hour ago, I was laying in bed scrolling on TikTok when I heard what sounded like soft sobbing. At first I thought it was coming from TikTok, but after some scrolling I realized it was coming from outside. I looked outside and there he was, sobbing and pacing around the back alley. He suddenly switched gears though and started jogging while groaning loudly and continuing to cry while occasionally hitting and attacking the new fence we installed. He has seemingly left now, but I am terrified at this new habit. I am really hoping he doesn't start crying outside my building routinely. I feel really bad for the guy and I also feel bad making this post, but the whole situation is really freaking me out. I don't feel safe. My own home and... I just need to vent. Thanks for reading. If anything else happens, I'll update this post. This story happened to me back when I still lived at my parents' house. I was commuting to college at the time and had three siblings that also lived at home. My brother and two sisters. For some context, we live on five acres in rural Ohio, surrounded on both sides by woods and farm fields. Additionally, during the week, my dad normally left for work at 2am, so I had always felt like it was my job to be the man of the house, because he was gone during the times when you would imagine something sketchy happening. However, on this night, because it was the weekend, my dad was home. I woke up to the sound of my brother's voice trying to get my attention. We had separate rooms upstairs, and... Coming out of our rooms, you could look down over the banister and see our front door. When I woke up, it took a few moments to get out of the haze and realize what was going on. I looked at the clock, and it was around 2.30 a.m. My brother told me there were two men at our front door. Of course, now, this is a real wake-up call. We quietly walked out of the room and peeked over to look at the front door. When we looked, there was no one at the door, but I noticed my parents off to the side, out of view of the glass on the front door. 
I whispered down to my dad and he told me that there were two guys who had been talking to each other and knocking on the door. Hearing my dad say this freaked me out even more. I went back into my room and grabbed my pistol. Quickly shuffling down the stairs after looking to make sure they weren't at the door. If they had been, they would have easily seen me coming down the stairs as it is in direct view of the door. My brother is right behind me as we headed over to where our parents are. Whispering to try to find out what's going on. My parents had woken up to our dog barking and come out to see these two men knocking loudly at the door. At this point we see the men return and they begin knocking again. Despite the fact that no one had come to the door and our dog was still actively barking. The fact that they were there at this time in a location where houses are spread out hundreds of yards and still knocking while the dog was barking made this situation even more terrifying. After a couple of minutes the men walked away and we shuffled across the kitchen into the family room to peek out the windows into our driveway which is lit up by our outside lights. There was a black Cadillac sitting there but no one was inside from what we could see. Immediately the question was where did the guys go? They weren't in the car and they were no longer at the front door. Unfortunately we figured out the answer when the handles to our back French doors started jiggling. They were actively trying to enter the back of our house which enters into the kitchen. At this point I just remember my mum frantically saying David as pure terror overwhelmed her. At this point two things happened. Adrenaline filled my body as I prepared my handgun horrified at the very real possibility that I might have to shoot these men. Secondly, my dad finally grabbed his phone and called the police and calmly told them what was happening. Thankfully, after a minute of jiggling, they stopped at the back door and disappeared again, only to return to their knocking at the front. However, at this point, Several minutes had gone by and suddenly we saw the local police fly up in multiple cruisers with their lights on. As they whipped into our driveway and the yard, the two men bolted away attempting to run the long way around the house across the driveway. One of them disappeared out of view, but the other was intercepted by an officer yelling at him to get on the ground. He didn't, and he was immediately tased and fell to the ground. Some of the officers went around the house after the other guy, and one of them came back to my dad, and as we came out to the front, they ended up finding the other man hiding in my sister's little playhouse in the backyard. It appears both of them were drunk or high, as one of them had cocaine on him. While they were both arrested that night, we never did find out what they were charged with or what happened to them. Needless to say, the whole experience wasn't fun. So, random men at our door in the middle of the night? Let's not meet again. So let me preface this by saying I grew up in an upper middle class area. Really nice neighborhood with nothing but old people as neighbors. We live near great schools and there's a relatively low crime rate other than one neighborhood known for meth. When I was 13, we had our first break in. Nobody was home and I had just gotten off the bus. My mom was waiting for me at the top of the driveway in her grocery filled car. She was on the phone with my dad. She told me to wait with her since the window was busted out. My dad came home with three friends and got baseball bats to search the house. Nothing. The only reason we didn't call the cops is because we have a cat who likes to sit on the windowsill and we often left the window open for a breeze, leaving just the screen. We assumed that maybe the cat knocked out the screen by accident because someone forgot to close it. But then we later saw a boot print in the dirt going to the window. 
and noticed our rug is all scooby doo and rolled up from someone running. We assumed they saw our alarm system which tracks movement and flashes and got scared and ran thinking it was a silent alarm. What's odd is, one step after entering the window was the computer, a TV, cash, and a camera. Nothing stolen. The second time getting broken into, I was 14. Same exact thing, window busted, nothing taken, boot print. This time we knew someone was coming after our house. We started setting our alarm more often. About six months later, I'm in the backyard sitting on the swing with my back facing the woods. My mom comes out on the upper deck and calls out to me saying that her and my dad are going to go see a movie and they would be back home in a few hours. I said okay and came back in through the basement door. Stupidly, I forgot to lock it. I stay in the basement in a side room with only one exit point and play Xbox. I put on my headset that covers my ears and enjoy about 20 minutes of Call of Duty before my cat who is sitting on my lap absolutely freaks out and bolts. I absolutely heard nothing because of my headset, but got up because she is quite scared. I see my basement door shaking after presumably slamming open into the wall. My heart drops and I think, maybe I left it cracked and the wind pushed it open. I don't see anyone standing in the doorway, but right behind the door there's a huge bush. I got a bad feeling in my gut and bolted upstairs. I burst through the basement door to my main floor, leaving it open, and run outside to my neighbors. My neighbors aren't home, but I hide in their yard while looking at my front door, which is glass and somewhat see-through. I wait for about 45 seconds and start laughing at myself thinking I'm just crazy. That's when I see a 6 foot man walk up the basement steps and pass our front door. He peeks through the glass and I see him wearing a brown shirt and has short black or brown hair. I can't tell much more because the glass is opaque and because I was in my neighbor's yard. I called my parents and get no answer. I then called my sister who luckily worked at the theater and was there and she answers. I explain that there's someone in her house and she gets the on duty cop to send a bunch over. My sister rushes in the theater that my parents are in and they call a nearby neighbor that has guns to go check on me. At the time they thought I was still in the house. I see the man in my house turn away from the front door and head left down the hall. The left side of the hall has my parents room and an office room. The office room is where he usually entered, assuming it was the same guy breaking in. After 30 seconds, I see him pass the front door again and go down the right side. That's where my room and my sister's room was. My neighbor is now coming into my yard with a pistol and calling for me, but he doesn't know I'm across the street and I'm too scared to yell to him. Right as he's turning to the front of the yard, he entered to the side. I see the man come back out and go downstairs where he presumably left through the basement door. Poor neighbor probably thought I was kidnapped, so I called him on his cell phone to let him know that I was across the street. No joke, six police came, three dogs, and they were all armed and ready. They kneeled in front of my garage, and my parents rushed home using the garage door opener to open it for them. Looked like a movie where they all had their guns out and the dogs aiming at the garage in case he was hiding. He was not there, which I knew from seeing him go back downstairs. The dogs start sniffing. They find the scent outside and follow it, but end up just picking up another cop's scent and losing it. They search the entire house and say it's clear, and I go back inside. We sent a neighborhood email out that night, and the next morning we got a response from a neighbor six doors down on the edge of the woods. I saw a man sprinting through the woods back into the meth neighborhood. He didn't get a good look at him, but definitely saw him sprinting, so he must have escaped through the back door and then ran back into the woods. The more I thought back on the experience, the more I realized these things. 1. It was probably the same guy since nothing was ever stolen and they were within a year and a half. 2. This man clearly didn't want money because he had tons of expensive things lying around that he didn't take. He searched each hall for 30 seconds and left. He was looking for something or someone. 3. When I had my back to the woods on the swing, I think he was watching me. When my parents said they were leaving, he must have taken that as an opportunity. He had to have heard me because he came through the least visible door. 
the one I had gone through. Four, I was in a room that had no exits. If my cat wasn't on me, I wouldn't have heard him and he would have blocked my only exit and done God knows what. Five, I'm lucky he hid for a second before coming in. I'm guessing he wanted to make sure no one else was with me and waited to listen. Six, he was seen running back to the meth neighborhood, so he was probably drugged out and wanted to kill me. He never once took an item and only broke in three times when my parents weren't home. I strongly believe that this man wanted to find me and I think he was watching me from the woods. There's no telling how many days he watched me because I used to sit on a swing nearly every day. He was probably waiting for the right time for me to be alone. I love my cat to death and fully give her credit for saving my life. If she wasn't so loving and if she didn't want to be on my lap every waking hour of the day, I would have never known he came in and I don't even like thinking about what he would have done to me when he had my one exit sealed off. It's still super scary to think about and I'm not gonna lie, I hated being alone even up until I moved to college. I occasionally hear very distinct boot noises running up my stairs and back down. I would always check the back deck to see if anyone was leaving but never saw anything. I constantly set the alarm from there on out and hated going on the swing when no one was home after that. Gave me some lasting paranoia too. So to the man who probably wanted to gut me, let's please not meet again. I was around 8 years old. I was playing Super Mario in my room at night, probably around 8pm or so. I had a large window like two normal windows side by side. The blinds were down but were slightly open so you could see the darkness outside. While I was playing I had a feeling like I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I looked to the left and clearly saw the outline of a white t-shirt in the window. It looked like the size of an adult. I remember being frozen and the hair standing up on my skin. I was petrified. It felt like minutes but it was only seconds. I dropped my controller and ran out the room, telling my mom immediately. Just as that happened, I remember my dad pulling into the driveway. He said he saw nothing and checked around the whole house and everything, but found nothing. I was so scared though, I tried to even tell myself that it was a reflection of something in the room, but I knew what I saw. I tried to sit in the same spot for a few days to recreate the reflection and what it would look like, but nothing ever caused that look. I knew it. Someone was watching me. This all just happened 15 minutes ago and I'm freaked out, but hopefully I'll do an okay job recapping what just happened. At my apartment building, it's all street parking. Tonight as I pulled in and parked, I noticed a man walk in the opposite direction from me. But then we made eye contact and he immediately turned around and walked in my direction. At first I thought it was strange but then he started to cross the street and was making a beeline for me. He wasn't saying anything at all so I didn't think he wanted money or directions. It freaked me out so I frantically grabbed my keys out of my purse and peeled out of there. What freaked me out though was that he was close enough to get into my car at that point that I made crystal eye contact and he looked pissed. So I drove off and circled around. I did not see that guy anywhere but decided to circle around again and look super carefully. Once again, looking around the sidewalk and the street and he's not walking around. I start to get out of my car and I see the guy coming out of the area where there were a bunch of bushes where I guess he had been hiding. Again, he beelines it for me. At this time, I'm actually on the phone with a really good friend of mine who at this point says he'll drive over. Luckily, he lives about 10 minutes from me. Said friend looks around and walks me into my apartment where I am safe now. But seriously, what the hell was that all about? He didn't say anything threatening to me, so I don't think I can call 911. But I do think I'll try the non-emergency number when I calm down. Stay safe out there, folks. So the other night I was watching TV at 4 a.m. because I have stupid sleeping habits. I started hearing someone scream in despair. I opened my windows to take a look out closer, but the person was behind some trees and I couldn't make out what was going on. The screams were loud and painful, sounded like a woman, 
but I was not sure. The person finally got past the trees and I was able to see two men and one woman. The woman was screaming and the men were there, trying to help or being the reason she was screaming. Being a woman myself, I assumed the worst and I called the local police. They are like 20 meters away from where it was happening. I don't know how they didn't hear what was going on. I described the situation and the location and the police officer said that they were going to go check on it. The woman was still screaming. I couldn't understand what, then collapsed on the floor. The men were behind her, but they went on their way as she kept walking towards the police station. I never saw a police officer come out of the station, but they could have taken a route that I couldn't see from my window. I hope everything was okay with her, and that she just had some bad news delivered and was stressing out, and they were just friends helping. But if that was the case, I don't understand why they went away. The police said that they would call me back if they needed any info but never did. First post here. It's short, but creeped me and my wife out. I stayed up last night, couldn't sleep because I drank coffee way close to bedtime. My wife usually falls asleep way before I do and doesn't wake up to anything. Anyways, I stayed up watching videos and movies and even read a few stories on here back and forth through the kitchen getting snacks and drinks. Finally decided to try to go to bed around 2.30 a.m., but was tossing and turning. I decided to take a hot shower as that usually relaxes me. I got up, took a pain pill, recent surgery, and I was kind of hurting. I finally fell asleep around 3.30 a.m. My wife gets up around 7.30 a.m. to use the restroom and yells, Babe, the front door is open. I stumble out of bed and grab my pistol, heading towards the living room. I look around and see a dim blue light coming in because the sun is beginning to rise and the door is halfway open. I quickly shut it and lock it, go back to my kids' room, and they both sound asleep. I check the kitchen, bathroom, even our closets, nothing. I start looking for missing things like keys, console, belongings, and everything is still in place. Nothing is missing. I look up the windows, vehicles still parked. We never use the front door ever. It's always dead bolted and locked and I don't remember the last time we used it. Where our driveway is is the more convenient way to go in through the kitchen back door. We never figured it out. I was back and forth through the living room all night and the door was closed. This is the first time this happened to me in 10 years that we've been here. Never any crime or break-ins around here. It really creeped us out. This happened last year sometime. I'm a small guy and I'm married. We live in a sketchy apartment complex. Anyway, we were sleeping one night and out of nowhere, someone starts pounding on our door at like 2 a.m. We both wake up shocked and a little scared because neither of us really have any close friends or family here because we are both kind of antisocial and the people we do have would call multiple times before showing up. We also at the time didn't have a peephole and we were the only people with a white door instead of a red door. So when we have new people come over, we tell them that. We didn't answer the door, but I grabbed a kitchen knife just in case. They kept pounding on the door for a good five minutes while also sometimes trying the handle to get in. When they finally stopped and left, we watched them from our window as they got into an SUV. We still have no idea who it was, but I still think about it sometimes. I'm hesitant to share my story, but I feel it's important to warn others about the dangers of being a peeping Tom. You see, I used to be one. It all started out when I was a teenager, and I discovered the thrill of watching people through their windows at night. At first, I didn't think it was harmful. I was just curious about what people did in their private lives. But as time went on, my obsession grew. I found myself spending hours every night peering into strangers' homes, watching them go on about their daily routines. I thought I was being careful. I never got caught and I made sure not to do anything that would harm anyone. But then one night, everything changed. I was watching a woman through her bedroom window when she suddenly turned and caught me. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. 
I didn't know what to do, so I just stood there, staring at her in terror. To my surprise, she didn't call the police or scream for help. Instead, she walked over to the window and opened it. I thought she was going to confront me, but instead, she just looked at me with pity in her eyes. She told me what I was doing was wrong and that it could have serious consequences. She also told me she understood why I was doing it, that she had been in a dark place before and done things that she wasn't proud of. That conversation changed my life. I realized what I was doing was not only wrong, but also harmful to myself and others. I stopped being a peeping Tom after that night and never looked back. It's been years since that incident, but I still think about it often. Grateful to that woman for showing me compassion and understanding when I needed it the most. And I hope that my story can serve as a warning to others who might be tempted to engage in similar behaviors. It's never too late to change your ways and make a positive difference in the world. I received a knock on my back door around 1am. They tried about three times before giving up. Someone coming to my back door is quite rare and would only happen if it was a landlord or my brother. My girlfriend has a key and wouldn't need to knock. None of the former would knock at my door at that hour. I didn't answer, mostly out of general annoyance. Flash forward to today, two days later. My girlfriend had just parked in the lot and I opened my back door for the first time since hearing the knocks. I saw some purple flowers and plastic wrapping that had been wilted due to the heavy rain and snow over the past couple days. It was unmarked and has no note attached to it. I immediately assumed the visitor was someone who had delivered flowers from my girlfriend. I had flowers delivered to her just a week ago, so I assumed she did it too. I had felt bad that I had let them wilt in the rain and profusely apologized to her when she came through the door. The flowers were not from her, and the 1am visitor remains unexplained. If a family member sent them, they would have called to ask if I got it, and I doubt anyone is stalking me, a guy in his mid-30s. Any ideas what this could be? I just found it unsettling. I'm a 16-year-old female, so about two years ago I was home with my mom. It was just the two of us. Now, my mom at the time was addicted to drugs and alcohol and was basically in a drug-induced coma. Nothing could wake her up. I had decided to take a bath while she slept. My bathroom door was locked, as was my mother's bedroom door, as she seemed to think we didn't know about her addictions and kept it locked so we didn't find out. The house was silent. I had only been in the bath for a half an hour before I heard the front door open. I assumed it was my elder sister coming back from work as no one else would have just walked in. But I wanted to be sure, so I texted her. I immediately got a worried text back saying, No, I'm not home. Why? Was someone there? I froze. I could hear the footsteps. Now, our house was small, one story, and from the front door to the bathroom door was only a small living room. I heard a weird scraping noise coming from the hallway to the bathroom. I heard the scraping sound stop outside the bathroom door and then someone grabbed the doorknob. They turned it very slowly from side to side for about a minute. The entire time I was silent, still frozen and shaking like a leaf. I wanted to call my mom but I didn't want whoever it was to hear the sound and get to my mom. After a while I didn't hear anything. I stayed in the bath for what I think was an hour. Till I heard the front door open and then click shut softly. I stayed in the bath long after the water had gone cold until I heard my sister come in. She yelled if I was there and if I was okay and why the door was unlocked. I got out of the bath and heard her gasp before I had come out but when I did I swear my blood went cold. There's a line spanning the wall of the hallway. The paint had been cut out like someone had trailed something sharp along the wall. Currently, the theory of the scraping noise I heard was someone trailing a knife on the wall. This was a few years ago in my old house, around Halloween. I'm a 43-year-old male. One day, I was home alone in my house. I have a wife, three kids, and a dog. 
I'm in the basement cutting wood and working when all of a sudden I hear a thump on the ceiling above me, which is the first level floor. It's rhythmic and almost perfect in beat. I'm a handyman and do a lot of my own fixing and know the unusual sound houses make. This was not usual. I started following the thumping around the first floor. It's as if someone, something, is walking around. I call out my wife's name, no answer. My kids, no answer. Just soft moaning and thumps that are both getting louder. My dog is in the basement with me and following the sound with me with his tail straight up, completely silent. This is weird because I have a loud, jumpy dog. I then slowly follow the thumping to the steps. I hear a weak old woman's voice calling for Jimmy and she's calling it over and over again. Ignoring my hellos, she keeps walking around the first floor calling out, moaning, and thumping. I grab my dog by the collar and leave out the basement door and walk around the outside of my house. I go up the street and there's this younger couple calling out for someone. Let's say Nancy for the sake of this. I go up to them and say, are you Jimmy? The young guy looks at me in relief and confusion crossed on his face. He tells me that that's his dad's name, but he passed away years ago. Turns out Nancy was his mom with some kind of mental issue. She had snuck out of the house up the road. Her family lived in my house before we did, did not know that, and she was having some kind of episode where she went looking for her husband in her home. She also had a wooden leg. Don't know the story, but that was a thumping. We got her home safely, and now I double checked my locks from that point on. This happened pretty much an hour ago. I was pulling up to my house with my mom when she says, Who is at her house? Me, being confused, looked at her yard. Then I see someone walking up towards us. My mom says he was trying to open the door to get in. The encounter went like this. Hey, I just lost my job and was looking for some work. Could you help? My mom replied with something that I can't remember but I'm pretty sure she said no because of what he's about to ask. Could you spare a few dollars? Wanting to get rid of him, my mom said, Sure, if you can come to this side, I can give you a couple bucks. Thank you. My mom gives him some money. They start to talk about how he should take it as a blessing and pass it on to someone else. He says my mom is an angel. Then they start to talk about other things I can't remember right now. Then the man just appears. My mom starts to drive around to find the man to make sure he left as she understandably didn't feel safe getting out. We start to drive around. She calls her boyfriend and my dad. Then there's a cop on the side of the road. Hey, there's a middle-aged man on my doorstep with the screen door open. Then he walked up to my car and asked for work at this time of night, which I found suspicious. He asked me for money and I gave him some money. Where do you live? My mom tells the cop and he says, Okay, I'll follow you there. We drive back home. He inspects the front door and backyard, but there's no one. We decide it's safe to go back in. My mom's boyfriend is currently at our house right now and I'm shaking. Edit, I just talked to my mom. She said he could have been drunk and at the wrong house as it was St. Patrick's Day and people do like to get drunk on that day, even when they aren't Irish. But I highly doubt that as I find it weird that as soon as he saw us pulling up, he came over to our car with a sob story. Take this information as you will though. I have been seeing this young man who appears to be homeless in the park across the street from my house for the past few days. He must be new to this area because I had never seen him before and I frequent this park with my dog at least 3-5 to five times a day. He has some odd tendencies like sleeping in random and odd areas of the park, such as next to a busy sidewalk and in landscaping. Tonight, while walking to my car, I see that he has entered our small 20 apartment gated complex and is hanging out at the bottom of my stairs that is leading to my parking spot. No idea how he got in there other than he followed someone in as a pedestrian through the lock gates that you have to enter a code for. I get in my car as fast as possible. 
I grab some dinner and about 20 minutes later, I come home and don't see him around anymore. I quickly walk up my step and glance around while getting my key in the lock to see that he had followed me up the stairs and was watching me from about 3-4 to four feet back. I was visibly startled when seeing him and said hello or something while turning my key and going inside, locking the door as fast as I could. This happened about 30 minutes ago, still shaking from the creepiness. This took place a couple years ago in Hollywood, Florida. I was in middle school at the time. My sister, mom, and I were at our front porch unlocking the door after coming home from school. We noticed something was off right away because our alarm didn't go off. My mom has always made it a point to set the alarm before she would leave the house. Although that was weird, we just commented about it. It was very possible that she had just forgot to set it. Because of that possibility, we just ignored it and moved on. As we entered the house, we began to set our backpacks and other stuff down. I heard the drawer close in my bedroom. I thought I was hearing things, so I looked at my mom and was about to ask her if she heard something. My mom looked at me at the same time and her look of horror was enough for me to realize that she had heard the same thing. My sister didn't notice because she had her earphones in. That sound and the fact that the alarm was off was enough for my mom to decide to get us out of there. She loudly said, I want to show you something in the backyard. But she didn't want anyone in the house to know that we were onto them and that's why we were leaving the house. My sister looked confused, but I knew exactly why my mom said this. As we entered the backyard and shut the door behind us, we sped walked towards the alley behind our house. The only thing that separated us from it was a wooden fence. Once we reached the fence, we opened the gate and began to exit into the alley. I was the last one through the gate, and before I shut it, I looked at the house for the last time. To my horror, I saw someone looking at me through our curtains. We called the police and they found no one, and nothing was stolen. I never told anyone about what I saw. I was about 12 or 13. It was a Friday or Saturday night and my dad worked nights. My parents were separated so I was at my dad's place. I had done homework and once it got really late I got into my pajamas. I checked my doors and on my younger sister. She was asleep and I stayed up watching TV. I heard a knock at the front door. I had a dog. He begins to bark and runs to the back. It's just a little past midnight at this point. No one should be there. I decided to stay quiet. There were two windows I could look out of, but I decided not to. This was probably a good thing, because there were knocks on that window too. Once that happened, I called my dad. Honestly, I should have called the police, but I was scared. I was near one of them, and I could hear footsteps and voices. I didn't hear a word they said because I was freaking out, and I moved away. I went to the back door to make sure it was locked, and it was. Once I turned away, however, there were knocks. My dog stands by it and barks more. My dad tells me to check on my sister, and she's still sleeping. I finally decided to peek outside and see a truck, and it's just sitting there. My dad told me I'll be okay, and soon after, he sent my grandfather over. He sat me for a while before going home. Now, in the morning, my sister told me she didn't hear anything. To be fair, I did close her bedroom door. I'm also glad the entire house was locked up. I wouldn't find out until a couple weeks later that the house next door was broken into. We literally had the police come over to our house and ask if we heard anything. We hadn't. My dad later moved into a bigger house, and that was that. This only happened a few hours ago, so I'm shaken, but it's too early in the morning to phone and wake up my friends. I need to talk to someone and get this out. I'm so creeped out and concerned, so I thought about coming here. Brief setting and context. I'm a woman in my 30s caring for my elderly parents, so I'm staying in my downstairs room in my childhood home at the moment. The window faces the main street, which is an average residential street in a fairly quiet area. The bed faces the window. I often have that window open at night since I need to be cool to sleep. 
and haven't worried about it since there's a cabinet and aquarium in front of the window area. Not blocking the window from view and I could reach to open and close it, but it would make it difficult for someone to climb in. My dog, Sable, also sleeps in the room with me. While she's a sweet-natured, medium-sized dog who doesn't look the least bit threatening, she's a fantastic guard dog in that she's always alert to any noises and will stand her ground and bark and growl if she senses a threat. So I've never really worried about the open window. After tonight, I won't be able to leave it open again. It started at maybe 3.30 to 4 a.m. sometime. I was awake. Since I care for my parents, I often have disrupted sleep patterns and I'm awake at odd hours. I was reading a book when I heard Sable growl, low and deep. Then she jumped off the bed and began to pace a bit looking up at the window before jumping out the cabinet by the window, barking. I shouted, Hey, we're calling the police. Dog will bite. Just in case there was someone out there. I went to look at the curtains to the side. I didn't see anything. I pulled the curtains closed again and made sure to pull the right curtain over, then drew the left curtain, the one that covers the open part of the window, all the way over, covering the right curtain too, tucking it so the one wouldn't be able to move it. I really wasn't alarmed then. It was a fairly quiet residential street, but there are foxes around that we sometimes hear, and occasionally someone passing by our neighbor's gate next to the door will make Sable growl or bark. But she doesn't usually react the way she did this time. She usually growl, but stay in bed, and her reaction was much stronger than normal. I thought that if it was someone scoping out our window to potentially burgle, they would have now seen the room was occupied by a person and a dog and would find an easier target, but I mainly guessed it was just some random noise she heard outside. I was wrong. A good half hour later, after I relaxed and thought I might doze off soon, I heard a growl again, a really serious, deep, and low growl, and I listened, again thinking it might be foxes or something, but I heard what sounded like deep, horror movie breathing sounds like the heavy breathing sounds a pervert makes on the phone to his stalking victim in a film. I sat up, looked out the window, and my heart stopped. The curtain had been pulled back, lifted from the bottom like someone was peeking underneath it, and I could still hear the heavy breathing. I shouted, hey, and moved from the bed to the side of the window so I could see past the curtain. I saw a figure of a man moving away from the window to the right towards the front door and exit the front garden. Too dark to make out any features or clothing. It was just a dark male figure. Shakenly, I immediately thought that since I knew he moved away and it wasn't at or under our window, I reached and pulled it shut, grabbed my phone and called the emergency services. One thing that creeped me out in hindsight is that it would have taken me a few seconds to move from my bed to the side of the window. And that was after I shouted and he knew that he had been seen. But he must have stayed there even knowing that I had seen him. Until I pulled the curtain and could see out. Then he moved away. The heavy breathing was so deliberate. It was so loud. Like someone was trying to frighten me. While on the phone with the police, I went around the ground floor of the house, turning the lights on, making sure the rest of the house was secure. And it was. I'm very careful to lock all the doors and windows at night. And everything looked undisturbed. Two patrol officers came shortly before 5 a.m. and took their report. They suggested asking the neighbor if they had camera footage and to let them know that there's a prowler in the area. The cops went to drive around the area, saying that they'd be wanting to know what someone was doing wandering around at 5 a.m. Anyway, since the dark meant I only saw the shape of the person, I had no real description. I doubt they could do much. I couldn't even be 100% certain it was a man. But the breathing in the figure I saw instantly made me think male, and the outline of his head looked smooth. So either he was bald or wearing a tight cap, and the height would have been average, 5'8 to 5'10. I was still shaken, but feeling angry and violated, and wishing we had a camera system now. We'll be looking into that. I never thought anything like this would happen. Don't have any enemies, no recent exes, no one I know of harboring any grudges, since I'm caring for my folks full time now, I'm not out socializing or making any enemies, nor are my elderly or disabled parents. I'm at the wrong side of 35 and living in jeans, joggers, and t-shirts. No makeup 
or fussing with my hair most of the time, so not a likely target for a peeping Tom. If it wasn't for the fact that it was my dog who alerted me to something both times, I'd wonder whether I was half asleep and trapped it. I have had hallucinations once as a result to a bad reaction to antidepressants. That was more than a decade ago. Hasn't happened before or since, and I learned how to test my reality in times. I was worried about whether something was really happening or not. I have to think it was someone who was looking to burgle our house, but for the fact that they came back so much later, maybe someone was on drugs or having a mental health episode, or, and this one bothers me most, someone who wanted to scare me, but why, who? They know where I live, are they gonna come back? New fears keep popping into my mind. Like most nights, I'm up at some point late at night or very early in the morning and will let the dog outside into the back garden for a quick pee and I'm suddenly aware of how easy it would be to be attacked and the person gaining entry then. There's a passage around the side of the house that goes from the front to the back garden with only a very small side gate meant to keep the dog confined, not designed to keep others out. It would be easy for someone to access, then hide against the back of the house, completely hidden from view. They were bold enough to come back a second time, even knowing a person and a dog were in the room, perhaps hoping I would have fallen asleep again. They seemed to be trying to deliberately scare me when they returned the second time, doing the deep breathing noise, and stayed by the window even after I shouted. In those few seconds it would have taken me from the shout out until I reached the window and could move the curtains out of the way. They could have moved and been long out of sight, but they stayed there until there was a chance I could see them, only then moving away. The breathing noises and then the coldness ran through me when I actually saw the man moving away from the window will always haunt me, along with the questions of their motives. Were they trying to scare me? Why? What's to stop them from coming back? Back when I was in 6th grade, I had a close-knit group of friends. There were four of us, and we were all girls, and we hung out all the time. Sleepovers were the norm for us, and we usually rotated houses, seeing that all our parents knew each other, and we all lived relatively close to each other, the furthest being about 10 minutes away. One particular sleepover, we were at my friend Caitlin's house, and two of her cousins just happened to also be sleeping over. Caitlin had two sisters and an older brother that were really nice and friendly. During our sleepovers, they usually just stayed in their rooms and would only come out for food, so we never really felt like we were imposing on them. Her brother would sometimes let us play with his PS2, and his sisters would talk to us about boys and high school gossip, which at the time we thought was really cool. Overall, Caitlin had a really great relationship with her siblings. I couldn't say the same for her cousins though. One of her cousins was in 8th grade and she was closer in age to one of Caitlin's older sisters who was a freshman in high school so she was staying in her room. The other cousin was a boy who was a junior in high school and naturally he stayed in Caitlin's brother's room. The girl was nice but seemed a bit shy. The guy however just gave me the creeps. He was definitely more outgoing but something about his mannerisms was strange and when he smiled it looked like he was smiling about something he thought in his head and not necessarily at you. He had shoulder length, stringy and greasy hair that was dirty blonde and was pretty scrawny for a guy's age. He looked like he could be a freshman in high school. Caitlin really seemed uncomfortable around him. Later on, we were in Caitlin's room. She told us that she just recently met her cousins because their mom and her mom had a falling out years before and weren't talking to each other. They recently reconnected so they thought it would be a good idea for Caitlin's aunt and her children to come visit for a weekend. Caitlin said that her female cousin was really nice, but that she thought the guy was weird. Ever since he got to the house, he's been trying to hang out with her instead of her brother. He would go into her room and go through her toys and books, trying to make conversation with her. He was also kind of touchy. He would pet her cheeks and her hair. When she would flinch or move away from him, he would get this really cold look in his eyes and he would stare at her for a few seconds before smiling, that creepy smile he does. We all agreed that it was really weird but eventually moved on to other things and talked about the usual stuff 6th graders talk about. 
We ended up watching a movie before bed and took our turns going to the bathroom in the hallway that Caitlin shared with one of her sisters to brush her teeth. The oldest sister had her own bathroom in her room. Everyone called dibs on their turn and since I didn't really care, I was the last one to go there. When my friend Lucia came back and told me that she was done, I was relieved because I was getting antsy and tired and just wanted to brush my teeth, lay in bed, and gossip until we fell asleep. I walked down the hallway and opened the door to the bathroom. I was so distracted I didn't even notice Caitlin's cousin in the bathroom until I turned the lights on. I quickly apologized and closed the door. At that point, I was just about to leave and run back to the room. He was in the freaking bathroom with the lights off. From what I could see before I shut the door, he was sitting on top of the closed toilet. Before I could leave, he opened the door, smiled at me, and told me to go ahead. I didn't really care about brushing my teeth at that point, but I didn't want to run away and provoke a reaction out of him. I entered the bathroom and immediately locked the door behind me. I quickly brushed my teeth and did my business. This is when things really got creepy for me. I opened the door and he was still standing there waiting with a smile on his face let me walk you back to your room i didn't even know what to say to that i guess he took my silence as a yes because before i knew it he grabbed my right hand and was walking me back to caitlin's room his hands were warm and sweaty even though he didn't look like he was sweating or remotely warm i felt so numb and i could hear my own breathing i honestly felt like i was gonna pass out i swear that hallway has never felt so long when I got to the room, he let go of my hand and said goodnight, going back to the bedroom he was staying in, which we passed before we got to Caitlin's room. I walked back inside and I guess I was making a face because all my friends came up to me and asked me what was wrong. I told them what happened and they all agreed that it was super weird and Caitlin said she would talk to her mom in the morning. I was hoping it would end there, but it didn't. As a rule, we weren't allowed to lock doors during sleepovers. It's usually fine, but not in this instance. I had to have been sleeping for a few hours when Caitlin was shaking me awake. Apparently, she had been up for a while, and with me being the closest to her, I was the first one she ran to. She then told me, with her voice shaking, that her cousin had opened the door twice to her room and would stare in the room for almost a full minute before quietly closing the door. I was really frightened when I heard this. He was just watching us sleep throughout the night. I agreed to jump into Caitlin's bed with her and waited. It didn't even take that long when I heard the door open. Both of us just froze and stared straight at the door. There was no light in the hallway, so the only source of light in that room was from the moon outside, but we could still see a silhouette of someone's head peeking in through the door. We could feel his eyes on us, and he was just staring into the darkness of Caitlin's room for a few seconds. We were trying not to move so that he didn't know we were awake, but it didn't matter. He let some air out of his nose as if he was trying not to laugh. Hey Caitlin, he whispered, and then just closed the door. Caitlin looked like she wanted to cry. She grabbed onto me and we just held each other and waited until he decided to come back. He never ended up coming back though. I guess it wasn't as fun since he knew we were awake. We never ended up going back to sleep that night though. The next day, my mom came to get me pretty early, and I said my goodbyes. I was glad Caitlin's cousin was still asleep. When I saw Caitlin in school, I asked her what happened when I left. She said she told her mom, and her mom was really concerned and said she would talk to the aunt. I guess she told my mom about what happened to me too because she asked me about it later on and was prying to see if anything else happened to me. After that, she made sure that Caitlin's cousins were not around before allowing me to sleep over at their place. She didn't have to worry though, because they never came back to visit after that. I don't know if Caitlin's mom had another falling out with her sister, or if she just never invited them back to the house, but Caitlin's creepy cousin, let's not meet ever again. This story took place in early 2017. I had recently moved from a major city to a small town in the Midwest to get myself together and separate myself from bad habits I had developed. Previously, I had been living on the West Coast and worked for a couple who were pot farmers, just trimming their weed for one season, with a few other trimmers. 
Nothing major stuck out to me other than the guy who was in his mid-thirties was a major asshole and super protective of his weed. His girlfriend was someone I wouldn't normally get along with, but she was alright. So I trimmed their weed for that season and they paid me a portion up front. He said the rest would come after they sold a few pounds or whatever because that's just how the business went. They did end up paying me within a few weeks so all was good with me. However, the man here kept texting me after I moved mid-country with random, Hey, how are you doing? I never liked the guy, got bad vibes from the get-go, but his girlfriend was a friend of a close friend, so I sort of gave them the benefit of the doubt. Anyway, the girlfriend started messaging me via text nearing spring after I had worked for them trimming their weed that fall season, asking if I would be available to house it for them while they were on vacation out of the country. At this point, I was living in Colorado, and the farm was in California. I did not have a permanent job set up yet, and they were offering good money to house it, plus make some extra money trimming weed that they had left over from the season. Stupidly, I drove my ass 17 hours with dollar signs in my eyes, and all was hell from there. They lived in a full house with a gardener's quarters attached to their main house, there's one bedroom, one bathroom, an electric stove, kettle, kitchen area in the gardener's bedroom. There is also a doorway from this area into the main house, blocked by a bookshelf on my side. When they invited me to stay in house sit, they were there for two or three days and part of their stay included drilling the door shut on the opposite side so that I could not enter their house. But that didn't bother me and I honestly understood why they would want to lock up their house but things got really freaking weird afterwards. I had been there alone for a few days, trimming, walking the dogs, filling the hummingbird feeders, watching the house like I was supposed to. The girlfriend would call from Morocco every so often to check up on me. I thought everything was fine until I started hearing water running from the kitchen inside of the house, the part of the house that I had no access to but was directly connected to. I immediately called the couple and told them that I could hear someone in their house. Their response was literally, It's none of your concern what you hear on the other side of the wall. This turned my stomach. I was in the middle of nowhere, locked by a gate on the property, hired to house it, and all of a sudden it was not my concern if someone was inside their place. It freaked me out. I still had two more weeks to be at this place, and I was properly freaked the fuck out. Over the next few days, I would feel scared and calm in waves. At one point, I was sitting outside with the dogs and they ran up to the side of the house, wagging their tails like they were greeting someone and I heard a very quiet, shh, and then footsteps patter off. I could hear you hear the TV, microwave, water running in the main part of the house. The language the girlfriend was using with me via text was too personal in regard to what I was doing. I mean, sure, they could have had a camera installed, although I searched the room for any devices, but the sounds and even the dog reacting to what I heard was enough for me. Once I realized that I was house-sitting, but also being spied on in some weird way, I started to have fun with it. I don't know if I figured that I was going to die anyway, or maybe if I acted crazy enough, they wouldn't want me for whatever their purpose was. But one night, I was out on the small porch steps having a very late cigarette. It had to be close to midnight and I could hear someone walking around the perimeter of the house. So I stood up, opened the door to the gardener's quarters and closed the door as if I had walked back inside. But in reality, I just opened the door and closed it, keeping my position with a cigarette on the porch. Immediately, someone walked from the side of the house because they thought I was inside. They noticed me and ran into the woods. In my mind, I set a teeny trap to see if I was delusional and it had proved that I wasn't. So I started doing crazy dumb stuff because I was alone. Nothing too wild. I just blasted Backstreet Boys, set their garage cans up like a drum set, and walked around topless. Honestly, I thought if these people were crazy enough to be fucking watching me while I house it for them, I had to do something more ridiculous to push them away. Maybe that doesn't make sense, but I can't help but reference the Hey Arnold episode where the bully is after him and he says, Don't hit me. I'll hit me. I'm crazy. Anyway, the couple finally came back to their house from Morocco and acted like they didn't want to pay me. They did, after some pulling and tugging, but fuck, 
Don't ever go house hit and not really know the people you're house hitting for in the Emerald Triangle. Or just don't even go there. It's really shady business. It was about two years ago on a very hot night. It's very safe where I live and I went to buy some stuff at a supermarket at dusk. When I left the shop, it was quite dark. It gets dark suddenly in the tropics. It's only about a five minute walk home, but I was feeling uneasy. I kept stopping and turning to look behind me. Nobody, but the road was dimly lit and there are a lot of bushes, easy for someone to hide. I kept walking with this gnawing sense of unease and I still kept looking behind me. I gratefully reached home, put it out of mind, cooked dinner, watched TV, etc. About midnight, I went to lay down on my bed. I'm an insomniac, so I just lay there with the lights on and I started to read. I heard a creaking sound above my head. My bedroom window makes a lot of noise, but I was too scared to look. Nothing happened. However, I am now on high alert. Moments later, I heard a smashing noise in the kitchen. I froze. My bedroom door was open, and as I said, the light was on. I heard some noises in the living room and pretended to be asleep. After a short time, I heard the click of the front door being opened. Someone had let themselves out. This was around 2.30 a.m. 2.45 a.m. I'm convinced that I'm alone, and I called the police. 3.15 a.m. I called them again. 3.45 a.m. I rang them again. They told me that they only had two officers that night and that they were busy. 4.20 a.m. They arrive and ask me what the problem was. I rattled off my story. They didn't even bother to look at the broken window. All they said was, it does sound suspicious, and then left. As it stood, the person had taken my bag from my chair in my room, and yes, I had quite a bit of money in it, as I was planning to buy some furniture. I do believe that someone noticed me in the supermarket that night, followed me home, checked my bedroom window to see if I was asleep, then did their deed. I thank God that I wasn't harmed in any way. Even if I somehow managed to call the cops, screaming and begging for help, no one would have cared. So grateful I'm here, unharmed and alive. I live in a remote mountain area. About nine years ago, I was sitting at my computer at 2 a.m. when the side door got kicked in. The local meth head came through the door, pulling a revolver out of the shoulder holster. I picked up my Colt 44, cowboy gun, that I kept on my desk and put a slug right through his belly button from across the house. He fell outside so he didn't bleed in my house. I shot him there because I didn't want to kill him, but I knew from training that an abdominal shot was the most painful. A deputy and ambulance arrived about 45 minutes later. The deputy commented on my marksmanship, admired my gun, made in 1871, wrote a report and left. Six months later, he died from a meth-induced heart attack. Good riddance. When I was 26, my parents were on holiday. I went over to their house every day to feed the cat. One Friday, my husband was away doing a gig, so I waited until he left before going to the house. I got there around 6 p.m. The area that my parents live was not a good one. There was a very large council estate right next to where they lived. Due to all the attempted break-ins, every internal door in the house could be locked. The doors were all heavy and inset into deep frames. I unlocked the front door, then unlocked the door leading into the kitchen. As I opened it, I noticed the drawers were opened and there was stuff all over the floor. I heard movement, so I quickly relocked the door before letting myself into the living room and calling the police. I explained that I was in the house, the burglar was still in the house with me. They said that they would send someone over as soon as they could. An hour later, I rang again. I was so frightened if they were still in the kitchen. I sat there with a pair of scissors in my hand, not sure what I was planning to do with them, but they made me feel a bit safer. 
It was about two and a half hours later when the police finally arrived. It turned out the burglar had removed the kitchen window and frame. The police reckoned it would have been very noisy and would have taken a while. They said forensics would have to come to take the fingerprints, but that they were currently very busy. It took two days for forensics to come by and it had rained heavily in the meantime, so forensics didn't get anything useful. This happened nearly 30 years ago. The burglar was never caught, but the large council estate has been pulled down and there's much less antisocial behavior. This happened back in 2008, and to this day, I don't know if the person who broke in fully realizes how close she came to losing her life. In 2008, when I was 37, I had moved back home to take care of my dying mother and stayed there after she passed. It was a fairly small country town, and the house was in a rural area, very low crime rate, and I can't even remember if I locked the doors during the daytime if someone was home. It was a fairly large ranch style house with my room being at the very back and my dad's on the other side of the house. My father was a pastor for our church. One Sunday morning I was really tired and just didn't feel like going. My pops left and I was enjoying laying in bed watching TV on super low volume with my eyes closed. About 30 minutes later I heard noises from the other side of the house that just weren't quite right. I laid there super still for a few seconds, just listening, trying to figure out what the noise was, and then heard quiet footsteps. It hit me that someone was there that shouldn't be. We've always had a few firearms in the house for personal protection, for scenarios just like this. I got my loaded 45 from my nightstand and very quickly made my way through the house. Then I was finally able to see there was someone in my dad's room. His dresser had a cabinet type door on it and they were open. In a fast second I saw two legs of someone bent over going through his stuff. My gun was drawn down and aimed with my finger on the trigger when the intruder's head popped out overlooking the doors. Not knowing what to expect I was ready to fire but I recognized the face. It was the gal that cleaned our house off and on and her husband was a nice guy from our church. Turns out she had a drug problem and she knew that my dad had pain meds in his dresser from when he broke his hip. I yelled so loudly at her. What do you think you're doing? Do you know how close she just came to getting shot? She gave me some lame story and excuse about her being in the area and that she had a piece so she came to our house. Thought we were at church. But she also needed a t-shirt so she came looking for one of my dad's and she knocked my dad's pill bottle over by accident. Yeah, okay, makes no sense whatsoever. I told her again that she almost got killed, that I was told to never point a gun at anything if I didn't intend on killing it, and that this gun was pointed right at her. She was damn lucky that I recognized her in that split second. She kept apologizing and begging me not to call the cops or tell her husband. I told her to get out of my house. She left in tears and I sat on the couch trying to process everything that just happened. It was scary and infuriating at the same time and just left me with a crappy feeling. I told my dad when he got home. He was not happy for sure, but he had a meeting with her. Apparently, she admitted to everything and her problem, admitted to her husband a few days later, and went to rehab. I was living in Cape Cod year-round in a house that had been converted to three apartments. Because this was such a popular vacation destination, parking was at a premium. My apartment had five spaces, one for me, two for the mother and daughter who lived in the downstairs portion of the house, and two people who lived in the upstairs in the front. I was in the upstairs rear by the parking. One night, I get home to find a party raging in the rental house next door. A common occurrence in the summer, as almost all these houses in the neighborhood were summer rentals. I see that both of my downstairs neighbors are home, and one of my upstairs neighbors was home. However, a strange car was parked in one of the spaces. I parked in my usual space and went upstairs. I later looked out the window to find that one of my neighbors had returned and parked behind the strange car boxing it in. About 2 in the morning I was asleep when I heard something wrong. 
I realize I hear Boots coming across the stairs into my apartment. The downstairs door was locked, but it had to be closed in a very specific way or the lock didn't catch. I never reported this as I live in a very safe, upscale area. A lesson I have now learned. I honestly didn't think this was real until I saw the cat run and dive under the bed and realized that someone was definitely in my apartment. This was a large studio apartment, so there was only one L-shaped room and nowhere to hide. It's interesting because you can plan on how you would act in the moment, but when it actually happens, everything is just instincts. I just pulled the covers over me and said, Hello? I literally greeted the intruder politely. He started yelling incoherently and he bumped into the table and knocked over a vase. I got my phone and was trying to decide if I should run past him into the bathroom and lock myself in when I heard someone else running upstairs. The guy yelling, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, he's drunk and got away from me. The second guy started dragging the first guy out but then asked me if I could move my car because he was blocking them in. I told him that's not my car, it was from the front apartment. They leave and I heard them walk around front and pound on the door. I then hear a very heated argument which ends with the police being called. I talked to my neighbor the next day and he was fuming. He called the rental company that handled most of the houses in the neighborhood and from then on, renters were told that they would be towed if they used our parking area. After it was all over, it surprised me how long it took me to stop shaking. Even though it wasn't a dangerous situation, my adrenaline levels didn't know that. And just so you're aware, I never walked up the stairs without double checking that lock ever again. I wasn't home alone, but I was a kid and asleep. Our house had two stories. The first story was the main house, and the second story had been built above the separated garage. Between them, a set of doors had been built and it closed so that you would have to walk under the stairs to walk in between the two buildings. You had to be careful to stay on the garage side of the passageway so you didn't hit your head because you were passing under the slope of stairs. Our backyard was fenced and a gate from the driveway led to the passageway under the stairs. Our normal way to get into the house was not from the front door. We would get out of the car, go through the gate, greet our dog, go under the passageway, then turn left into the kitchen door. My dad was the sheriff's deputy, so the front door was bolted and chained, and the kitchen door always had a bolt. But because he was a cautious man, my dad never wanted us to accidentally get locked out of the house, so we hid a spare key in the freezer in the garage. We were strongly cautioned never to tell anyone about the key or let them see us use it. Although we spent most of our time downstairs during the day, we all slept upstairs at night. My bedroom was the furthest from the stairs. One night I was dead asleep and suddenly I jolted awake. Something had run across my hand. I ran out of my room. Mom, Dad, a rat just ran across my bed. They were instantly awake and we all went back into my room to see what it was. There, sitting on my pillow, was my brother's hamster. His cage was downstairs. How did he get up there? My brother swore he had locked the cage before he went to bed, but here the hamster was. He picked up the hamster, and we all went downstairs to see what happened, except for my sister, who just went back to bed. Sure enough, the cage in the living room was open. We put him back and closed the cage door. Suddenly, my mom had a funny look on her face. Why is the kitchen light on? My dad put his hand out to tell us to stay back, then crept into the kitchen. He yelled back to us, The back door is open. At that moment, my sister came flying downstairs. Someone just ran out of the gate. She had heard the gate slam. My dad bolted out the door to catch whoever it was, but they were long gone already. None of us slept for the next hour, trying to figure out what had happened. My parents probably didn't sleep all night after reclosing and locking the kitchen door and putting us back to bed. The best we can figure is one of us somehow let someone know about the key, although all of us denied it. The person had been at our house before because the dog hadn't barked. Maybe it was a kid because nothing was stolen and the hamster cage was open. We never did figure out. 
Needless to say, my dad moved the key to another hiding place. I was house and dog sitting for my sister when I took her dog, Bailey, out back for the last time before heading to bed. My sister's house is a townhouse that's connected on both sides in a long line of townhomes. In the back was a long, fairly narrow strip of grass running along the homes, then a large field with long grass and weeds. So, condos, grass, then field, no fence or any structures for about a mile. I was enjoying the evening air. It was probably around 10.30 p.m. and was completely dark outside. Not feeling weary of anything at all. All was quiet except for Bailey. After about two minutes when Bailey had done her business, I called her back and went inside. Out of habit, I immediately locked the door behind me. We walked across the room to go upstairs with Bailey right ahead of me. Right as I walked behind the wall that separated the view from our back door, I heard the doorknob jiggle. I froze. Doorknob jiggled again. I waited a few more seconds just so I could be 100% sure and heard a definite sound of the metal jiggling and someone trying to get inside. I bolted upstairs where Bailey already was, still completely unaware of the situation. I hid in the closet and called the police. They showed up a while later, searched the area and couldn't find anything and told me that it was probably someone who was actually trying to get into a home a few houses down that was having a party, most likely an honest mistake. They treated me nicely, but they clearly thought I was just a scared girl who was overthinking things from being alone in the house. They left, and my brother and his friends drove an hour and a half so they could stay the night with me. If I had been who I am now, I probably would have given the police at least a little pushback. I don't think they could have done much past searching the area they did, but I would have told them that they were wrong. It was not an honest mistake. Someone was definitely trying to get into the house after they saw me out there alone. The fact that I was a 19 year old, 100 pound girl by myself with a very sweet but very dumb and not intimidating dog at all. I was outside there for a long enough time that if someone was nearby me, they would have been intentionally keeping themselves quiet. It took me about 10 seconds to cross the room out of view after coming back inside. That means the person had to be close enough to me and almost definitely watching me when I crossed behind the wall out of view to try to open the door within 10 seconds. I can't imagine that someone sees a small woman by herself, doesn't make themselves known, and tries to follow her back inside the home as pure intentions. I look back and just cringe at what could have happened if I hadn't locked the door behind me right away. This was in 2011. I'm female and was 22 at the time. A year after I graduated college, I was living in my first apartment with a friend. I had adopted the sweetest dog I've ever had, a run of the litter Pomeranian who literally loved every person she ever met. My nephew was young at the time and would sometimes handle her a little too roughly. Sweet kid, we'd always correct him, but he didn't quite realize how little she was under all that fur but she tolerated it without ever nipping or anything. One day, my roommate was gone and there was a knock at the door. It was a handyman who said that he was there for an annual check on the appliances. He was wearing the apartment complex standard uniform and had a badge, so I didn't really think twice about it, even though I hadn't been notified that this would be happening. And upon following up, he did really work there. He comes in and begins chatting and sort of leering. I felt uncomfortable but not nearly as freaked out as when my dog came rushing in between us, ears back, teeth bared, and started growling at him. He kind of awkwardly laughed and went to go pet her. Odd choice for a dog that's baring his teeth at you. She immediately lunged forward like she was going to bite him. He leaped back before she could. Tiny dog, large man, but he obviously was freaked out. At this point, she's straight up barking at him. He asked if I could put her away while he worked and I lied and said she has separation anxiety. So I recommend that he would come back another time when I could walk her or when my roommate was there so one of us could be in the room with her. He never did come back. You hear about dogs being able to read people so while I don't know if he would have done anything to me while on company hours, I still think she could sense that he wasn't a good person. 
She was a good girl. Last night, I was sadly sleeping in bed when I suddenly jolted awake to a loud noise coming from downstairs. It sounded like someone had broken a window and was trying to force a way into my home. Panicking, I grabbed my phone and dialed 911, then hid in the closet and waited for the police to arrive. As I crouched down in the darkness, I could hear his footsteps coming up the stairs. My heart was pounding in my chest and I was wondering if the intruder would find me. Suddenly, I heard a loud crash and the sound of glass breaking. I realized the intruder had found their way into my bedroom. I could feel my body shaking with fear as the intruder was moving closer and closer to my hiding spot. I didn't know what to do, but I knew I had to be ready to defend myself. Just as I was about to jump out of the closet and confront the intruder, I heard the sound of the police sirens outside. The intruder must have heard them too because he quickly fled the scene. When the police arrived, they searched the house and the surrounding area, but no intruder was there to be found. They took my statement and made sure that I was safe before leaving. I'm now taking precautions to secure my home, including installing a security system and getting a dog. It was a frightening experience, but it taught me the importance of being prepared and taking steps to protect myself and my home. I'm also having someone come out to replace the door today, and this time it will not have a window. I'm a female and this happened last year. I was watching TV in my living room when I heard a strange noise coming from the basement. At first, I dismissed it as just the house settling, but then I heard the noise again and it sounded like someone was moving around down there. Feeling uneasy, I grabbed the flashlight and cautiously made my way to the basement door. As I descended the stairs, I could hear the sound of someone shuffling around and my heart began to raise. When I reached the bottom of the stairs, I panned my flashlight around the room and was startled to see an intruder crouch behind some boxes, rifling through my belongings. I froze, not knowing what to do. The intruder looked up and saw me, and I could see the fear in his eyes as he scrambled to his feet and tried to run past me. A side note, I should mention this. I'm an amateur boxer and well-versed in self-defense. I wasn't about to let him get away that easily. I tackled the intruder and wrestled them to the ground. We struggled for what felt like an eternity, but eventually I managed to pin him down and call the police. When the police arrived, they arrested the intruder and took him away in handcuffs. It turned out that the intruder was a homeless man who had been looking for a place to sleep and had broken into my basement. That made me feel kind of bad. After the incident, I installed better locks on the basement door, including a deadbolt. I'm a male and I'm 21. I was home alone in my apartment studying for an upcoming exam. It was late and I was starting to feel tired, so I decided to take a break and make myself a cup of tea. As I was waiting for the water to boil, I heard a strange noise outside my apartment. It sounded like someone was fidgeting with a doorknob. At first, I thought it might be my neighbor, so I went to the door and called out, Hello? But there was no answer. I started to feel a little uneasy. I double checked the locks on the door and went back to the kitchen, but then I heard the noise again and this time, it was louder. My heart started racing as I realized someone was trying to break into my apartment. I could hear the intruder moving around my patio, knocking over furniture and rummaging through my little storage space. I felt trapped and terrified, but I knew I needed to stay calm and get the police on the line. After what felt like an eternity, I heard him dash off. I went to go look at the people and I saw red and blue lights flashing. They searched the area, but the man was never caught. In the aftermath, I felt violated. The next day, I talked to the manager of the apartment buildings. They plan on putting up cameras in the next few weeks, so hopefully this will deter the guy from coming back. All in all, all he stole was my cigarettes and my lighter. But if my door hadn't been locked, what would have happened? At around noon yesterday, my ring camera at my back door picked up someone entering my gated back patio. They walked to the far corner of my paved area, took a picture of my ring and the area surrounding my back door, and then left. My roommate left around 11.30 and saw lawn care at our building. We live in a three-building townhome complex. 
There seemed to be some sort of lawn equipment left outside the gate when the man entered. He may have been instructed by the supervisor to take a photo for some reason. I contacted property management and am waiting to hear back from maintenance on if he was okayed by a supervisor. Wondering if anyone's encountered something like this, the steps they took to resolve it, and then what the outcome was. I'd like to preface this by saying my husband is an electrical engineer and I am a teacher. We're not crazy people. So, back when my husband and I were dating, my husband was in a terrible car crash. His truck hit black ice and he slid onto oncoming traffic. His truck was completely totaled, so was the other truck he hit. The weird thing though, both he and the other guy were completely fine, not a scratch on them. All my husband had was a bruise on his knee. The first responders were baffled, as was the towing company and insurance when they realized no one had died or was severely injured. Fast forward to a few days after the crash, my husband comes over to my apartment. We're having a conversation about a university class we're both in and he casually asked me when I got a flat screen TV sitting on my dresser. At this point, I was very confused because I had this little flat screen since I was 13 and had it the entire year we had been dating. I asked him what he was talking about. He told me to quit pulling his leg and asked me what I did with the old tube TV. I had no idea what he was talking about and told him so. He was convinced I had a tube TV. I proceeded to go on Facebook and showed him the pictures we had taken two weeks prior with a TV in the background. It's a flat screen in the picture. My husband goes white like he has seen a ghost and stares into space for a minute. His eyes start to water. I ask him what is wrong and he said, I swear to God, I'm not crazy. You've had a tube TV since we started dating. It was a tube TV when we took that picture. I brushed it off as him being rattled from the accident and he didn't bring it up again. However, anytime we hung out in my room, he'd always look at the TV weird. Fast forward seven years, my husband and I have been married for a few years and decided that we were ready to be parents. I'm not on birth control and we decided whatever happens, happens. We're not actively trying, but not preventing it either. So we're on vacation in Italy, wandering around Rome and I feel like shit. I had had my period that week before and it was one of the worst I've had in my whole life. As we were walking around, I'm suffering from back pain chills and horrific cramping. I go to the bathroom in the cafe and hurl my guts out, have diarrhea and realize I'm menstruating heavily. Obviously I'm weirded out since I just had my period that week before. I clean myself up and go back to my husband and tell him I think we need a doctor. I have a pretty high pain tolerance but this is insane. It's getting to the point that I'm having trouble walking and I start feeling pain in my shoulders. I don't want to ruin our vacation, but I'm starting to really worry. My husband is smarter than me, sees the state I'm in, and says I'm visibly paler than when I went to the bathroom and gets me help. 20 minutes later, I'm on a stretcher being taken to the hospital. An hour after that, I'm being prepped for emergency surgery as the doctor tells me I have a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. I have heavy internal bleeding, and if he doesn't perform the surgery, I'm going to die. Six hours later, I wake up very sore and tired. The doctor tells me I'm very lucky, and if I had waited any longer to seek medical attention, I'd be dead. My husband stays with me in the hospital the first night, then gets a hotel for the rest of my stay. A week later, we're cleared to fly home, and I go through a grueling month of healing from the surgery. Two months after our return, somehow my husband and I get on the topic of fires and he goes on about the dangers of kitchen fires and I say, no need to worry, we're all set with an extinguisher in the closet. He looks at me like I have three heads and asks me what I'm talking about. I remind him about the extinguisher in the front closet where we keep our coats. We've had it for three years. He insisted we buy one when we bought our house. My husband shakes his head and tells me that he has no idea what I'm talking about and we don't have a fire extinguisher. I remind him about not only the memories of us fighting about if we really needed one, where to put it, buying it from Home Depot, but also installing it on the wall in the closet. 
He looks at me with confusion and tells me none of that happened. I get up, go to the front closet, all while cursing at him for being an asshole for forgetting our two week fight about it. And lo and behold, no extinguisher. Not only is there no extinguisher, but there's no holes in the wall where I know we installed it. No fresh paint. The wall has never been touched. I insist he's moved it and fixed the wall. And he asked me why the fuck would he play such a stupid prank. He continues to insist we've never had one, let alone talking about getting one. This goes on for several minutes. I'm approaching hysterics. Tell him to quit playing games when he finally says, Now you know how I feel about the TV. We didn't speak about this for a long time. Then after I found this thread, he brought up this theory that perhaps in another timeline or dimension, whatever you want to call it, we both actually died and we reset like a video game and the TV and extinguisher are glitches. I don't know if I agree with him. All I know is I've never been so rattled in my life and every time I get something from that closet I'm overwhelmed with this feeling of wrongness. I know it should be there, but somehow, it's just not. I can't explain it. He says he will go to the grave swearing I had a tube TV. I think my husband actually experienced a reality shift or a matrix glitch because of some of the things he's mentioned to me lately about small things. He actually told me about the actual glitch that he knows happened, but he says that after that there have been things that are weird to him that he's been noticing. We're both pretty big into weird things like glitches in the Matrix and paranormal things, but he never expected to experience one of his own. I guess I should start with the actual glitch that my husband experienced. He and my son were out picking up food from the grocery store for dinner, which is not something he normally has to do, nor does he volunteer to do it. However, on that specific day, he had actually mentioned that he wanted to go to the store, and my son wanted to go with him, so they went out together. Fine by me, one less thing I have to do in the end. He told me that, while they were there, they were walking around grabbing things and they went down the aisle with the condiments. He had grabbed a bottle of mustard, because we were out, and then moved on to the next aisle to get something, when my son randomly remembered that we were also out of ketchup, because he had used the last of it the day before on his spaghetti. I know that's weird, don't ask. I'm not going to question him on why he puts ketchup on spaghetti. Anyways. My husband says that he'll go grab it, and tells my son to stay there since it was only an aisle away. He headed over to get it, and he said that it wasn't there, which made no sense, since it was the same aisle that they had just gone down. He then looked up, and he noticed that he was actually in the bread aisle, about two aisles down the store. He mentioned that he had somehow literally walked one aisle over, but then ended up three aisles away from where he started. He even verified this by walking back to where the condiments were, and going one more aisle and making sure that our son was still standing there, and he was. Obviously this makes no sense, and he says that it felt like he had almost somehow teleported to the bread aisle. But he moved on, grabbed the ketchup, and then finished shopping and was just super excited to tell me about what he experienced. Well, that's not where the weirdness ends. He said that now there are strange little things that are different that he's struggling to accept. The first thing he mentioned was my laptop. I do work as a graphic designer, and I work for a small company that does visual designs for larger corporations. Because of COVID, my position is now a fully remote one, and I have a room dedicated to being my office, which is a room that the other two typically don't go into. The other day, I was working on something, and my husband had to come in to tell me something else, and as soon as he walked up to my desk, he paused, and started staring at my work computer. I asked him what was going on, and he asked me where my MacBook was. 
I have literally never used a Mac. I don't personally like the operating system on Apple computers and have always had a standard Windows-based laptop. I told him this and he responded with, No, you had a MacBook Pro. I remember you and me sitting down to look at what you could order through your work, and we chose a really beefy Mac because that's what they wanted you to have. I recall the conversation you had with your boss where they told you the whole team was moving to Apple computers and you were upset about it. I told him that that had never happened, and I had no idea what he was talking about. We had a small argument about it, Nothing too severe, just a disagreement, and we moved on. One of the other events that happened was when we went to order pizza last weekend. My husband was asking what we wanted, and my son said that he wanted pepperoni. My husband immediately stopped and just stared at him like he had grown a third arm or something. He then started going on about how much my son hated pepperoni and said that he always asked for a cheese pizza, extra cheese, add chicken. My son has no memory of ever asking for this, and as far back as I can remember, my son has always loved pepperoni. Obviously, this was another thing that upset my husband, but we got our pizza and we moved on. I actually had a conversation with him about all this, and he told me that there are other small things that have been eating away at him that have changed. Things like the neighbor's cars are different from what he remembers, and one of the neighbors seems to live in a different house than what he remembered. He also mentioned that he was confused that I had eaten clams the other day, since he swears I was allergic to shellfish. There were a few other things about our son and about our home that he said felt different. I tried to talk to him about them, but I can tell that it's really upsetting him and he then mentioned that he thinks he's either losing it, or he has shifted to a different existence. Obviously, nothing seems out of place for me, other than his behavior and how he's feeling and acting about things. For the record, he has no mental health issues, he doesn't use drugs or drink, and he hasn't suffered any injuries, and all of these things just started happening after he had that weird event at the grocery store. So this actually happened last week. It just took some time to come to terms with it. I got a phone call from a next door neighbor late in the evening asking if I could help him move his mattress into his upstairs. His mom is ill and has a big heavy sleep number bed. I of course ran over to help because they're great neighbors. I get over there and his friend, who is also a priest, was there to help. I helped him figure out how to separate the mattress from the bed so we could fit it upstairs. We get it all moved up and back in place when my neighbor asked if I could help move the armoire upstairs too. I think nothing of it and we pull it out of his travel trailer and start bringing it up the front stairs of his house. The front stairs are 11 steps. I was on the lower end of the armoire, about six steps up when my neighbor and his friend lose the handle and it comes crashing down on me and I fall backwards towards the pavement. I then wake up in my dining room to my phone ringing and my wife asking me if I was going to answer the phone. It's my neighbor asking if I could help move the bed upstairs for his mom. I go over and meet the priest's friend again and this has been the first time I met him. I say I can help you with the bed but I cannot help you with the armoire. My neighbor was like, how do you know about the armoire? I then proceeded to tell him that I'm pretty sure I just died. I spent the next hour talking to the priest. He had so many questions. My neighbor didn't believe it until I described the upstairs bedroom in perfect detail, down to the metal material frame on the floor and the intricate headboard leaning against the wall, and I had never been upstairs in the house before. The priest told me what I saw after I died. I told him I never actually died. Before it happened, I woke up at my dining room table. About 10 years ago, 
I used to work for a small call center that did tech support for some smaller internet service providers throughout the country. The call center was 24 by 7, and it was probably the most stressful job I've ever had. But it paid the bills, and in the end, working nights meant that I could still go to school. So I pretty much just kept with it and did my best. Working the night shift meant that you knew everyone that you worked with, because there were only a handful of you there at any point in time. So when we got a new guy, it was almost an event because it was such a rarity. My glitch actually involves a new employee that we got, and it wasn't just the fact that he was new to the company that makes me remember the situation. It's that he had an accent. On that night that he started, he was introduced, and I was over the moon because he actually had a very thick Irish accent. He and I chatted a bit during the introduction, and come to find out he was from Ireland, and he had moved to the US about 20 or so years prior. He told me about his home life, his family, basically everything that a quick introduction could entail. I remember even commenting that I loved his accent, because it was one of those things that I said that was weird, and I caught it after I said it. I apologized to him after saying it, basically fessing up to the fact that I shouldn't have said it, and he laughed and told me it was totally fine. After we chatted for a few minutes, he got pulled away from his spot to shadow one of the other techs so we could explain a few things to him which was basically all of the training that you got there. He told me that he'd see me around, and I went back to work. The night ended, I went home, everything was pretty normal. The next night, I actually looked around for him, but I didn't see him, so I assumed they either had him shadowing someone else, he was in training with the manager, or he may have had the day off. The next day was the same, and he was nowhere to be found. On the third day, I was a bit upset, thinking that he may have decided that this job just wasn't for him and didn't come back. I actually went over to the night manager and asked him if the man had quit, and he asked me who I was talking about. I said, you know, the guy that just started, he had a really thick Irish accent. He stared at me like I was insane and said that no one had been hired in the last couple weeks much less anybody from Ireland. I stood there literally describing this guy, how tall he was, how he looked, his backstory. None of it rang any bells with the manager. I thought that he was messing with me, so I shouted for the other tech that the guy had shadowed, and he had no idea who I was talking about. I asked a few of the other guys, and they too told me that... They did not remember a man with an Irish accent ever starting. I was the only one who remembered this man, apparently. Nobody that worked our shift had heard of a man with an Irish accent. None of them had any memory of this guy ever existing, with me being the only exception. I guess it is possible that they were all just messing with me, but to get that many guys to just pretend that somebody didn't exist for the fun of it... That would have been quite a feat. It was honestly really upsetting too, because he seemed like a cool dude, and I would have loved to have been friends with the guy. A couple years ago, I lost a ring my grandma gave me for Christmas. I wore that ring 24-7 and rarely took it off, However, when I did take it off, I always put it in the same place so I wouldn't lose it. This ring meant a lot to me since, sadly, my grandma passed away from cancer shortly after. One day, I remember looking down at my hand and starting to panic because the ring wasn't on my finger. Before getting really upset, I went and checked the usual spot where I put it, but it wasn't there. I remember telling my family and having them search the whole house. Anyways, I lost it a couple weeks before Christmas, so they told me that they would give me another. After they told me this, I went down to my basement to do my wash, and when I was putting my clothes in the dryer, I felt something hit me in the head and fall onto the floor in front of me. 
Lo and behold, it was my ring. It literally fell out of thin air. I told myself it was a little message from my grandma, but it was one of the weirdest things. Still to this day, I think about it. About two weeks ago, I was driving home from a friend's house in a snowstorm. It wasn't supposed to snow that day, so it came on unexpectedly, hard and fast. The highway was relatively clear because of the constant traffic, but the heavy snowfall was already accumulating and freezing off the highway, which I discovered upon exiting. I stepped on my brakes to slow down at the red light ahead of me, where two cars were already waiting, but I began to slide. To avoid hitting the car stopped at the light, which I definitely would have if I hadn't changed directions. I turned my wheel and began sliding across the exit to the right side of the road. I was probably 25 yards across the street when I slid into a ditch. I was at a 45 degree angle and I was absolutely sure that my car was about to flip. I closed my eyes and braced for it, only to find myself on the cross street only a few seconds later, facing the right direction. I thought I possibly somehow drove the 25 yards onto the cross street, but I'd already been mid-tumble with my eyes closed and would have somehow had to avoid the signs at the end of the exit, which would have been a hard impact at what I estimate to be around 45 miles per hour. Now I'm legitimately entertaining the idea that I died in a parallel universe. So I was home alone and my dog was outside. I let him in after a while because I didn't want him to get distracted chasing squirrels. After he came in, I went into another room to watch TV. Then I heard my dog barking from outside the way he does when he wants to come in. I opened the door and it was my dog. I swear I had let him in 10 minutes ago and there's no way he could have gotten outside so quickly with nobody else there. We were moving states today. My husband has our kids in one car and I have our dogs in the other. They are about five or six miles ahead of me. As I am passing a rest stop, I notice the trunk of a black Ford Edge open and filled with boxes. I'm like, why'd they stop without telling me? There was a guy wearing jeans and a green waffle knit long sleeve at the back door of the driver's side, buckling a kid into a car seat. Okay, that's what my husband is wearing today and those are the contents of her trunk. I'm seriously annoyed that they didn't tell me that they were stopping and it's already too late to pull off. I call my husband and ask him why he didn't tell me. He has no idea what I'm talking about. They didn't stop and they're still a few miles ahead of me. So I work for a joinery company and was delivering a load to a construction site about an hour away from work. I'm playing a Reddit compilation video through my headphones. I was about 8 minutes into the video in the middle of town at a red light with a bad feeling of deja vu. The video started buffering. I thought it was odd since I had good reception but was going to wait it out. The light went green and a video played just long enough to say the word wait and started buffering again. I couldn't see anything at all. The road was clear but I thought I'd listen, look left, then right again and there was a massive semi that appeared out of nowhere and ran the red light. It would have taken out the driver's side of the cab and I would have been toast if I hadn't waited. Definitely reminded me of my own mortality. I have a thing that happened when I was a kid that some people may not consider a glitch, but... It was really weird, and it definitely seems like it was, in fact, a glitch in reality. Something happened, and I cannot explain it, so I'm submitting it, and if you think it's a glitch or glitch-worthy, then you're free to use it. This happened back when I was eight years old, and it was during the summer, so I was out of school and had a lot of time to do whatever I wanted to do. My dad stayed home during the summer while my mom worked, and he typically had the late shift. So, he would go in when she was getting home. That way, somebody was always there to watch me. On the day that this happened, my dad was asleep pretty late in the day, 
and I had gotten up pretty early and had jumped straight on to my Nintendo 64. I wasn't supposed to spend the whole day playing it, but no one was really watching me closely, so I decided that I was going to play it until my dad got up, and then figure out something else to do. Like I mentioned, I had been up pretty early and my dad was going to sleep until noon at the latest, so I had a few hours. I put in Glover and was playing through the levels, and when I looked over at the clock, I noticed that it was already noon. I decided to just go ahead and shut it off just in case my dad did get up, and then went and made myself a sandwich. After eating it, I was sitting there watching TV, just kind of waiting for my dad to get up, and getting bored with watching daytime television. After about 20 or so minutes, I started dozing off and decided that I wanted to take a nap, so I put my head down on the couch and dozed off. This is where things ended on my side, because I was obviously asleep. When I finally woke up, I got off the couch and walked into the kitchen and was surprised to see my mom at the table on the phone. I didn't realize that my nap had been so long that she had gotten home. She hung up the phone while staring at me like she was confused as soon as she saw me. I said hi and asked her what was wrong, and she started asking me where I was, what I'd been doing, and several other questions. I told her that I was asleep on the couch and she said that that was impossible, and told me that I needed to tell her where I was. I kept telling her the same thing, that I was sleeping on the couch, because it was the truth. That's where I had been the whole time. To keep this story fairly short and explain what happened, my dad woke up, and when he did, he couldn't find me. He looked throughout the house, and I was apparently nowhere to be found. He said that he looked in my bedroom, the living room, upstairs, and even in the basement, and he could not find me. He then called my friends that lived on my street to see if I had gone to their houses, and obviously I wasn't there. He called my mom, and told her that I was seemingly missing, and she rushed home from work. When she saw me just walk into the kitchen like nothing had occurred, she was shocked. She had also checked all the rooms of the house, the yard, the shed, everything, and she had no idea where I was. It was the weirdest thing because they were within minutes of calling the police and reporting me as missing, but the whole time I was asleep on the couch in the next room. I wasn't covered up, I wasn't wearing something that would cause me to camouflage, and the room wasn't dark. Neither of my parents could find me, and I was right there. It was almost as if I just didn't exist. Now, I guess it's possible that they both could have somehow overlooked me on the couch, but it would be really weird to think that two adults could just not see a kid lying on the couch in the middle of a living room for multiple hours to the point that they were about to call the police. It almost seemed like I just disappeared from existence for a few hours and then came back whenever I woke up. My mom died 13 years ago. About four years ago, my dad went on vacation in Arizona with his girlfriend. He said he was up watching TV and the hotel phone rang. He answered it, said it was my mom's voice saying, I'm okay. He said, Cass? The phone went crackly and said, Heather, my name, I'm okay. He said his girlfriend was confused why the phone rang. He immediately called me even though it was late and he was crying. Dad doesn't believe in the supernatural, but still to this day cannot explain the call. So I never really put too much merit into this matrix theory until I experienced it myself with my husband on my wedding day. I'm a 30 year old female and my husband is 32. In 2020, we were able to get married even during the pandemic 
and at our small backyard wedding of 20 people and got married at our local outdoor park for our vows. Everything was perfect that day. The sun was out, air was crisp, and more importantly, all our loved ones were around to listen to us exchange our vows. So after my now husband and I exchanged our vows, we proceeded to walk down the aisle towards our photographer, as I'm sure all couples do after getting married. We got some shots with everyone in the background as we walked away. Satisfied with the photos, the photographer went off to look at the next location that we were all walking to to do formal pictures with the whole family. We turned around to walk back to our families and give them hugs, but when we turned around, no one was moving, no noise, nothing, perfectly silent, just looking at us. My husband and I were alarmed, and my husband even made a joke. Why is no one moving? Did we do something wrong? There was a solid 45 seconds of pure frozenness, then everything resumed. I've never experienced anything like that. There's simply no rational explanation for it other than a glitch in the matrix. Okay, so this just happened now. I ordered some photo card sleeves from Amazon a few days ago, and my package arrived today, exactly as I ordered, and I put them away. Then I came back from school and saw another package on my bed. I had bought an album that said it would come later than the sleeves, so I thought that was it. But no, it was more sleeves of exactly what I ordered. I then wanted to go check if somehow I dreamt my sleeves arriving, and the sleeves themselves weren't where I left them, but the package that came in was in the bin, and part of the sleeve packaging was still on my desk. I then wanted to go check the emails where I confirmed my order, and I didn't somehow accidentally order two lots. I also checked and my bank balance hasn't changed, so I didn't end up reordering them on a separate occasion. It was the exact same amount, two softer sleeves, one harder sleeve. But also, the packaging is different, as in the label are two different fonts, and the cardboard packages are two different sizes. I have no idea how I could have misplaced the previous cards, or why I have more cards, on top of the fact that we never get two postman deliveries. It's just one time, at 11am every day, but I left for school at 1.15pm. I'm generally so confused. Everything I'm about to describe came to light in the last 30 minutes. I'm a 49 year old female and I drove to my parents house, 75 female and 78 male, to check on my dad. He was in the ER with chest pains earlier today and has since been discharged. Onto the glitch. My parents do not use reddit and have no clue what glitch in the matrix means. After the dust settled on, is dad okay? My mom presented me with an envelope that was in their mailbox this week with my writing on it. No debate, this is my writing and exactly how I would address the card to my parents, front and back, including Shirley's temple stamps from my mom. Glitch 1 Postmark is from July 2016, Los Angeles, which tracks where I lived in 2016, but how did it take 6.5 years to get to my parents' mailbox? Reasonable answers, the car got stuck in the postal bin, or inside my parents' mailbox for six and a half years. Okay, then riddled me this. Glitch 2. Yes, it's my handwriting on the envelope, but the card inside I've never seen. And based on the pop culture reference on the card, it's not a card I would send. And the message inside the card is my aunt's handwriting and signature. The card has been in transit for six and a half years, and it's from my mom's sister, and addressed and sent by me. Reasonable explanation. My uncle, aunt's husband, my mom's brother-in-law, and my favorite uncle could have handed it off to me for mailing when he passed through LA. This explanation isn't totally wild because he travels a lot, and we always find time for a dinner together whenever he's local and passing through. However, I have zero recollection of us ever getting together in my seven years in LA nor any sort of card handoff. Plus, why would my aunt in Georgia give her husband a card to take to me in California to mail to my mom in Virginia? So Reddit, how did my mom receive a six and a half year old card mailed in my writing but sent from her sister? 
on the day when my dad was in the hospital for a near-death experience. Also just noticed the happy birthday Mo makes no sense. My mom's birthday is in November. The postmarks are July 2016. So this birthday wish was 8 months late. I have a weird and kind of creepy glitch story that may be a case of quantum immortality. I'm really not sure. I can't say that I know a whole lot about simulation theory or glitches, and I know even less about what quantum immortality really entails, but I think that this falls into that category. In order to fully make sense of it all, I guess I need to explain what happened. This is not a situation that happened to me personally, it actually happened to my brother, and I'm a bit of a side victim to the situation. This is going to be a bit weird in structure, and I'm sorry for that, but I'm not really sure how to explain it all in a proper timeline, because the situation that caused it all happened about five years ago, and then I learned that the thing happened this past month and now I'm questioning everything from that moment forward. So, on that, five years ago there was a major incident in our family home. I was 16 at the time, and my brother was about to turn 18. It was the middle of winter, and it was getting pretty cold here in the Midwest. We had the heat on in the house, but my brother's room was in a separate room off to the side of the basement. The room was once a laundry room, but my dad had changed all of the hookups, so he had taken that room as his. Unfortunately, the basement did have issues with heat, so my brother had bought a small room heater to set up down there to keep it all as warm as the rest of the house. On the night that this happened, my brother had left his space heater on, and I don't really know if it was a short in the plug or the heater itself, but it ended up catching on fire. Now, I want to mention that I do not remember much about this night, beyond the house catching, me getting out, and the insanity and chaos that took place as the fire department put out the fire. I will say that while I don't remember much, there is one very specific detail that I don't recall anything about, and that is my brother. I don't remember him exiting the house, and I don't recall him ever being pulled out of the fire by anyone else. For some reason, his whereabouts after the fire started, for me, are completely unknown. I will say that I do remember him being home that evening, because he was there for dinner. We'd had pizza, and he asked Dad to get wings for him, which he did. I don't know why I recall that specifically, but I do. But for some reason, I have zero knowledge, memory, or idea where he was after the fire started. On the other end of this is my brother and what he remembers. He says that he remembers being home that night, and surprisingly, he said that he remembers the fire. He said that he was in bed and he remembers a weird popping sound that actually made him jump out of bed. Then, he recalls the room getting really hot and smoky. He said that he tried to get out of the laundry room but couldn't because the fire was blocking him in. With how that laundry room was built, there were no windows or exits outside of the main door and there was a decent amount of basement that existed between the laundry room and the stairs. Thinking about it, the old laundry room really should not have been used as a bedroom, but hindsight is twenty twenty. The whole thing that he told me sounds... horrible. He mentioned that he remembered starting to lose consciousness because of the smoke and heat, and that he tried as hard as he possibly could to get through the fire, but... He remembers being horribly burned, and he has a very detailed memory of not making it to the stairs before collapsing. Now, obviously, that's not what happened, but he remembers it very thoroughly. 
He says that after he collapsed on the ground in the basement, in his mind, he kept hearing his own voice telling him that he was not going to die there, that he was going to make it. He said that it was like he was telling himself that he was going to be okay, that he was going to make it, and that he was going to get up, but it wasn't him. I know that sounds confusing, but it was like a third-party version of himself was yelling at him to wake up and get out. Then, he says that he jumped awake, but that's where things get really strange. He says that when he woke up, it was morning, and he was at his friend Derek's house. He says that he asked Derek how he got there, and Derek told him all about how he'd stayed over that night, how they'd been playing Call of Duty all night, and how they had pizza. He looked outside, and sure enough, his car was sitting in Derek's driveway. According to Derek, Derek's parents, and even my parents, he had been there all night. He wasn't home whenever the fire broke out, a fact that everyone was beyond grateful for. However, he completely and totally remembers being in the fire. And I remember some of what he actually said, that he was home when we had dinner, and I don't ever remember him leaving. He says that he was home. Everyone else says that he was out. And for me, there's just a huge blank in my memory for where he was or what happened to him. It's a crazy event that I cannot explain. But my brother sincerely believes that he died in that fire. He remembers the pain, the heat, but... He was, by all official and known accounts, not home that night. Like I mentioned, I'm not sure if this is a glitch, but based on his recollection of the fire, and the fact that I can't remember where he was, it all seems like something went wrong here. Something about all of this really confuses me, and it makes me think how broken our simulation may actually be. This happened the other day, and it was seriously the weirdest thing that I have ever witnessed. It may not seem like much of an event, but it was certainly strange, and I have no idea how to actually explain it. I live on a side road that is attached to one of the main roads of my area, and they have the main road shut down partially due to construction. It's been going on for what feels like forever, but thankfully, as of late, they've been making strides and getting it all finished. Because they're doing it in bursts and sections, they have to block off certain parts and turns and put up detours. But it hasn't been much of a problem until they went into it this hard. When this happened, they had blocked off a rather large section a bit down the road to the right after turning off my road onto the main one. It was basically set up to where, if you turned right off of my road, you would hit construction within a few moments and have to immediately turn around. There were no driveways, no side roads, nothing like that, so there were a lot of cars that were going that way and having to immediately turn back around. It was almost humorous because from the intersection you could see that there was construction. Yet, people would still turn that way only to be sent back by the road being completely closed off. On to the event in question. My dad and I were sitting outside on the porch having a drink and enjoying the summer weather while talking about nothing in particular. We were watching people that went down the road and making a bet on how long it would be until we saw them make the U-turn and come back and laughing the whole time, mostly because, again, you could see the construction when you turned that way, and if you were paying attention, you could see that there was a whole section where there was no road at all. It was just broken down concrete blocked off by roadblocks. As we were sitting there, we saw a bright red Mustang head down the road. I made a comment that it was one hell of a car, 
because it was pretty clearly well maintained and taken care of. Then, when it got to the stop sign at the end, they hit their blinker to the right. My dad and I both threw out a number of how many seconds it would be until we saw him turn around. He turned to the right and started down the hill, and we just sat there waiting. We were both counting out the seconds and watching, but we were genuinely surprised when we didn't see it come back. We were both kind of scratching our heads, like, how long is he going to sit at that road close sign and just watching? After a couple of minutes, we both decided to walk down to the end of the yard to look at where the road ends to see if he was seriously just sitting there. But when we went and looked, the Mustang wasn't there. Somehow, this guy had just disappeared, but there was no way that he would have taken that car off-road, and like I mentioned, there was nowhere to turn off of the road or go. It was completely and totally blocked. He didn't turn around like we weren't paying attention or anything like that, because we would have absolutely noticed the bright cherry red and very shiny Mustang. It was super weird. He was there, he turned right towards the construction, and then he was just gone. Neither of us had an explanation other than my dad joking about how it was a ghost car, and if that's the case, then there's a ghost out there that has damn good taste in cars and a decent amount of money to spend on one. Hello, this is Bad Vibes. Joining me today is Interscare Wifey. She will be reading two stories. Make sure to drop her a sub. Link will be in the pinned comment. Back in 2005 or 2006, I was renting this house that was a nearly 100 year old farmhouse. My bedroom was upstairs and for some reason it always creeped me out a little bit. It was as if I felt a presence there, although I hadn't had any actual paranormal experiences. One night, my then boyfriend and I had stayed up late watching TV and had fallen asleep on the couch. I had to work early the next day, so when I woke up around 3am, I decided to go upstairs to bed. I gently shook my boyfriend to get him to come upstairs, but he did not immediately follow. It was beginning to get light, so when I got to bed I pulled the cover up over my head to try to block out the light so I could sleep. This house was old and creaky, and I heard my boyfriend coming up the creaky stairs and walked down the hallway to the room not long after I had laid down. I could hear him come into the room and I felt the bed depress on his side as he sat down. But then he got up and then sat down further at the bottom of the bed. He did this, getting up and sitting down along the edge of the bed until he was sitting right next to me. I was annoyed at this point, wondering if this was some weird attempt to put the moves on me, when all I wanted to do was sleep. Then I felt his arm go across my waist, so I flung the blanket back up to ask him, what the fuck? But he wasn't there. I ran downstairs to see if maybe he was tricking me and he was still sound asleep on the couch. So I ran back upstairs, got into the blankets and shut my eyes tight until I fell asleep. For as long as I remembered in the house, I never had another experience, although the creepy feeling upstairs always remained. I'm not sure that what happened was real. It felt real. I don't think it was a lucid dream because I hadn't had time to fall back asleep yet. First, I'm going to start by saying that growing up in my parents' house, I've always felt a sense of unease or as if there was a presence there. My sister also felt the same way. Our house is located in an area where there used to be a lot of mines. One night, I fell asleep on the couch in the living room. The couch was beside the stairs and also facing the kitchen. I remember very clearly opening my eyes but not being able to move. I started hearing what sounded like a hundred footsteps running up and down the stairs behind me, and then it went silent. 
I looked up into the kitchen and saw a dark silhouette of a woman standing in the kitchen, facing away from me. I remember that she was about 5'3 and very skinny. She had very long fingers and she was crying. I then woke up to my sister playing with my dog in the living room beside me and then everything was normal. Another time I was sleeping in my room. I'm unsure if this would be considered sleep paralysis because it only happened for a split second. I remember I opened my eyes and there was a face directly in front of mine, sideways facing me, and it was laying beside me. The face was decomposing and the mouth was wide open like it was screaming in front of me. I immediately closed my eyes and when I opened them again, it was gone. I've always had sleep paralysis since I turned 18. I used to have it 6 to 10 times every night when I was 18 to 20 years old living in my old military dorm room. It always started the same way with the same entity. I would always see his torso and head covered in blue and green ink tattoos and his voice mocked me when I prayed. Literally sounded like the low tone voices horror movies depict of evil spirits. After about two years, I started having sleep paralysis maybe once or twice a month. I am now 37 and live in a new place, in a different state. For the past three years now, I have had it every month, but it's always during a full moon. I know this because I kept a log of time and dates that occurred. I always wake up to see this dark figure standing in the doorway of my bedroom. It goes away when I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. It happens so frequently that I don't get scared anymore. Well, last night was weird. I was dreaming randomly about being in a bathtub. Nothing scary. Woke up because I felt like I needed to pee. Then sleep paralysis hit me. I saw a man who looked dead because his eyes were grayish with his back towards me. I panicked, closed my eyes and started praying. Once I regained full consciousness and control, I immediately opened my eyes and saw an 8 foot dark figure with red eyes standing in front of the doorway. I blinked several times and even rubbed my eyes, but it didn't go away. I felt so pissed because I felt violated. I began to rebuke it and it went away. I hate this. I don't know why this happens to me every full moon around 2 to 3 a.m. I have a feeling it sucks the positive energy or light out of me for whatever it needs it for. I'm so sick and tired of it. Anyone else feel this way or had similar experiences? Update. I put some small crosses at every entrance on the second floor on each window, doorway, and staircase. My room is on the second floor directly above the living room and adjacent to the stairway. Last night I woke up because I heard a man laughing. It was so crystal clear. I wasn't dreaming because when I woke up I continued to hear it for about three more seconds or so. The laugh was not like someone laughing at a joke. It sounded condescending, mean, or mocking. I looked at the time and it was 2.50 a.m. It sounded like it came from the first floor where our kitchen and living room is. Wondering if it's laughing because the crosses I put on the second floor wouldn't let it pass. I also checked the side from our security cameras and no one was out there. Plus I live in a very secluded area. The other night around 3am I started to experience some sleep paralysis. This is normal for me. I often have sleep paralysis and although it's uncomfortable it isn't necessarily abnormal. This particular night, I started feeling something wrap around me, like a snake, but it felt evil. I was sleeping on my stomach and the thing was on top of me and wrapping me in its arms, so maybe more like an octopus at this point. After a bit of this, I noticed that the thing is actually just a snake-like octopus version of my friend. The body is my friend, the face is my friend, with the hands suffocating and constraining me. I wake up completely for a short period of time, but was unable to stay awake. I fell back asleep and into the paralysis again, 
same shit. This also happens to me quite often. I try to fight my sleep paralysis and lose. Once waking up, I remember the friend I was dreaming of is more than likely awake because they had to work the night shift. I texted my friend and told him of my experience. When he tells me just had the strangest thing happen to him. He swears he saw someone walking and disappearing behind this small shed near the woods while he was outside on a smoke break at 3 a.m. Probably just a coincidence, but I thought I would share. To set the scene, it was my spouse, our two-year-old, and myself in a one-bedroom apartment. Two-year-old's bed was close to the wall by the door. Our bed was on the other side of the room. I could see our two-year-old, but also see the bathroom door, which was located just outside the room. It first started out with minor bad feelings. The usual walk into the apartment and feel something off. Bad vibes all around. One night while we were sleeping, I had woken to a strange feeling that our two-year-old was up to something that she shouldn't have been. The room was completely dark, so I sit up to have a look around, and almost immediately this small shadow catches my eye. It's my two-year-old. She's standing at the entrance of the bathroom looking back at me, and then proceeded to sidestep into the bathroom out of my view. I wake up my significant other and ask them, Wake up. Why is two-year-old out of their bed? How do they climb out? She said, What are you talking about? Two-year-old is in their crib asleep. My eyes finally adjusted to the dark, and I see my two-year-old sleeping peacefully in their crib. My heart starts picking up pace at this point as I'm trying to figure out who did I just see walk into our bathroom. I get out of bed and rush to the bathroom ready to catch whoever it is. I flip on the light, but the bathroom is empty. It's just me staring at my reflection in the mirror. I turn off the light and head back to bed confused about what just happened but not too sure what I saw. Fast forward a few nights and I'm still thinking about what happened. There I am in bed next to significant other with two-year-old sleeping sound. Again, I wake up to this strange feeling like we're being watched. I open my eyes, my body is still. I'm paralyzed, trapped in my own body. My eyes search across the room and I look at the door to our bedroom and what I saw made my heart drop. There was this man at our bedroom door. Something about him was completely off like he was something otherworldly in a man's body. He was more shadow than detail, and his posture was hunched like he was trying to be quiet, like he was stalking his prey. The shadow man begins to creep towards me, lurching closer to our bed. My mind is racing, I'm thinking, tonight's the night. An invader has finally entered our home, and I was the only one awake. I start planning my attack and what I'm going to do to defend my family, but my body is still immobilized. The intruder then does the unthinkable. He places one foot on my bed, then the other, and slowly starts creeping higher and higher up the bed. He's standing over me, and in the quick moment of fear, I was able to break out and kick both of my legs up towards the shadow man, hoping to catch him by surprise and ready to leap at him. As I kicked up, I felt the weight of my blanket fly off my body. I wasn't going to wait to hear the sound of a thud as he fell back. I was in fight or flight and my only focus was on jumping on this thing as fast as possible and keeping my family safe. My violent kick wakes my significant other up in a panic. I get up ready to pounce when I see that there's no one there. What the hell is going on? She said. There was a man in our room. I kicked the shit out of him. He was right there. The room is empty and dark. No man... No intruder, no sound. The silence is broken by my wife telling me to check the rest of the apartment. And after I look around, there was no one else there. I go back to bed and try to sleep, but my adrenaline was still pumping, so sleep wasn't really on the table. A few months after this event, we decided to move and upgrade to a bigger place to live, and since moving, there hasn't been any of the bad vibes as in the apartment. No shadow man, 
No little girl, just the three of us, thankfully. I have a friend, 27 male, who told me a fascinating story about lucid dreaming. He explained that his father had taught himself to lucid dream every night, a skill I was highly envious of. His father taught him how to do it when he was 15 or so, by drawing dots on his hands and looking at them throughout the day, so that eventually when he was dreaming, he could look at his hands and not see the dots, allowing him to realize he was dreaming. This is a common technique for inducing lucid dreams and something that I tried, but never long enough to actually stick to it. As a teenager, he learned to lucid dream on command, just like his father every night. He explained that it was more thrilling than any drug he'd ever taken because he had full control over every scenario. He could construct any environment of his wildest imagination. He could have sex with any person he imagined, obtain superpowers like flying, invisibility, teleport to any place he wanted, or visit alien worlds, etc. It was pure bliss, and he explained to me that he ended up sleeping all throughout the day at times because his dream world was more exciting than reality. He did this every night for more than a year or so, until things started to get strange. He told me that he started to notice a hooded figure in the periphery of his vision. But whenever he tried to look at the figure, it would walk out of his field of vision. The figure first appeared very far away in the distance from him. But every night after the first sighting, the hooded figure would return to his dream, closer to him, and still always outside his central view. He could never really focus on the figure or see its face, so he couldn't tell if it was supposed to be human or something else. Once the figure started appearing closer to him, he would be filled with an overwhelming sense of dread and felt less control over his dream environment. He finally felt terrified to fall asleep, knowing that the figure would get even closer and seemingly harm him as he sensed the evil nature of this faceless figure. He ended up fighting sleep every night to prevent dreaming and turned into an insomniac, which he still is to this day. He told me he doesn't lucid dream anymore, and I'm not sure how he unlearned it, but he hasn't seen the hooded figure since. Pretty creepy story that really stuck with me, and a caveat to trying to learn to lucid dream every night. You might still grow to regret it when things get out of your control. So to start off, I wanted to explain that I suffer from bipolar disorder and I deal with many sleepless nights because of it. I have experienced sleep paralysis so many times in my life since I was a little kid that I never kept count. When I was little, I was absolutely terrified. I wouldn't be able to move and there would just be this dark silhouette of a person standing nearby. The distance would vary from each experience. The most terrifying one that stuck with me was when I was maybe 10 years old. The figure was standing on my chest and I had difficulty breathing. I never understood why this was happening to me. Then as I got older, my fear turned into rage. Instead of wanting to scream out of terror, I was trying to let out a war cry and would try to charge the figure, but to no avail. I turned 21 and I had stayed up playing games all night. When I finally drifted off, there was a figure, but this time it was different. Again, I was filled with so much rage and all I wanted to do was attack this mysterious figure. I managed to lift my arms towards it. It took a step back and I woke up. That was the first time I saw it move. I then went a very long time without suffering from sleep paralysis till my wife left me unexpectedly when I turned 29. My grief consumed me. I spent many nights sobbing without sleep. Then one night when I finally did fall asleep after being prescribed a powerful sleep aid, the figure returned. Except it was more aggressive this time and it was no longer just a shadow but it would still never let me see its face. Still filled with rage, I would try to charge it, but my movement was very slow and it took so much effort just to lift a finger. It grabbed me by my foot, but to its shock, I grabbed its hand back. I tried to pull myself up using all the strength I had, 
Just before I could, it shoved its hand over my face, blocking my view. I then bit its hand as hard as I could. I completely woke up shortly after that. So far, it hasn't returned, but that was only a few months ago. I'm sure that isn't the last encounter I'll have. Every time I have these episodes, I make it a goal to defeat whatever it is, and I will grow stronger every time I face it. Given my bipolar condition, this could just be my imagination since I don't have a very good self-image. I don't claim to know what it is or what's happening to me, but what I do know is I will not stop fighting this until I defeat it or it leaves me forever. If anyone's had similar experiences, how have you fought back? To be clear, I have had sleep paralysis before, but never like this. In fact, I think this is the first time that I have truly experienced it, because usually what I do is just snap out of it. I think to myself, get angry, get angry, and I could shake off the sleep paralysis, because it usually felt like an intense amount of fear, but not this time. I woke up this morning, or thought I did, and my body was vibrating. I could hear a buzzing sound. I was laying on my left side, and it was so weird. Why can't I move? No way, I can sort of move. It was a lot of effort, but I managed to move my body slightly, but it seemed like it wanted to stay in that position because it returned to it, and the buzz sound continued. What the fuck is that sound? Aliens? Holy fuck, am I probed? I have to see, that's awesome, but I have to see. I blame seeing scenes from Signs and the abduction clip in VHS these days. But yeah, for the chunk of the panic moment, I was thinking irrationally, I'm going to see aliens. So I put everything into turning around and looking up. I mean everything. The buzzing just keeps intensifying as I made even more of an effort to turn. So it was a really intense fight to move. To me, it was like I was in a force field, and I was breaking through, teeth bare, eyes trying not to fall asleep. I was thinking, take a fighting stance, get ready to throw a punch. I used to box, so I'm thinking, if I see something, I have to punch it. In all of this, the buzzing is going insane in my head. It's like having an industrial fan going full speed on both sides of your head. And again, this is funny because in retrospect, I probably looked like I was just turning around very slowly in bed. To me, this was an epic moment. At one point, I think I momentarily fell asleep again, then woke up again. It was so stupidly intense that I was laughing in bed so much from it. This happened about two years ago. My father had passed about 10 years before and I kept his watch next to my bed. I live alone with two rescue kitties that sleep with me, and whenever I have a scary dream, seeing them next to me calms me down, and I realize it's just a dream. So, I go to sleep on Wednesday about 9.30 p.m. While I'm sleeping, I feel the watch next to me, and something in my room that keeps referring to the watch, but not in words. Then I hear it. Can you do me a favor? I'm frozen, I can't move, and I'm thinking this isn't my father, but referring to the watch was to trick me. I'm screaming in my mind, no. It asks again, can you do me a favor? I can't see, but I feel it in the room. I'm getting angry at this point. How dare this thing try to trick me into using my dad's watch? It's not my dad, I know that. I was trying really hard to move and getting angry. It asked me again, can you do me a favor? But I wake up and yell no. I look at the time and it's midnight. My cats are nowhere to be seen and now I'm even more mad that this thing scared my poor cats. I say to the place, saying you're not welcome and to get out. I get back to sleep and I wake up still mad. I tell everyone about what happened. I'm not sure how that thing got into my house. Later that evening, I found out that a woman I work with died Wednesday afternoon and she lived alone. 
She was supposed to start at work at midnight, the time I woke up. Also, she always used the phrase, can you do me a favor? I felt terrible knowing that she was alone, dead, trying to tell me. I had never had anything happen like that before. I felt some guilt, but when I told people at work, her trying to contact me made me feel better. Not really scary, but it did make me feel better about her death. Another girl at work found her body, said she wasn't the type not to show up without calling. It was a very sad time. Hey, this is Bad Vibes, and if you made it this far in the video, thank you. I'm going to tell two experiences that I had with sleep paralysis. So if you don't want to hear those, you can click off. These are the two experiences that stood out to me the most and the ones that made me have the most fear. I never once saw a shadow figure or anything like that. These were also the first and last time I ever had sleep paralysis. So for the first time, at this point I had never heard of sleep paralysis. I had no clue it was a thing, didn't know what it was. And that's what made this so scary. This was when I was living with my in-laws. I was in bed, my wife sleeping next to me, and I woke up. I was laying on my back and I opened my eyes and I'm staring at the ceiling. And I was freaking out at this point because I couldn't move and I had no idea what was going on. So I'm just laying there. I could move my eyes slightly, but that's it. And I'm just thinking in my head, what's going on? Why can't I move? And then I realized I couldn't move my mouth either. I don't know how long it lasted, but I finally, um, I guess fell asleep. Well, fully asleep. The next day I tell my father-in-law about it and my wife, and they look at me like I'm crazy. Like that's not a thing, that doesn't, that didn't happen. But anyways, I eventually found out what sleep paralysis was, and I had it some more in that house. But since I knew what it was, it wasn't really scary. It was more annoying. Well, the last time I had it, it was two days after moving into our first apartment. So the place was unfamiliar. I was laying in bed and I had my door open and you can see from my bed all the way to the front door. I wake up, can't move, same old, same old. But then my stupid brain goes into thinking, what if someone breaks in? What am I going to do? Like, how am I going to protect my kids and wife? And I'm just staring at the front door, just staring at it. And it's playing tricks on me at that point. So I'm basically causing myself to have a panic attack. Don't know if I eventually snapped out of it or I fell back asleep. I can't remember that part of it. But I just freaked myself out so bad, feeling helpless. And that was the last time I had sleep paralysis. Anyways... Thanks for watching. I grew up in Arizona in a relatively safe city. Before myself or any of my friends had a driver's license, we would walk everywhere just to get out of the house and do something. Typically going to Circle K for soda and snacks or Walmart and Target to just browse around. One time when two friends and I were 15, we were walking back to her house through her neighborhood around sunset. At the time, everyone in Arizona was fairly friendly, so whenever you would pass by another person or group, you would exchange a hello or a wave. This time in particular, we were walking past a house on the corner that had the kitchen light on, where a middle-aged man was washing the dishes. When he made eye contact with us, my natural instinct was to smile and my friends was to wave. What a bad idea. The man immediately dropped his dishes in the sink and what felt like one second later was outside on the corner staring at us in an aggressive stance with both hands balled into fists. All of our flight or fight responses were completely different. One friend immediately took off running in the other direction. My other friend, Peter Pants, and I was frozen in complete fear. He started charging towards us in force and I'm so grateful that my friend grabbed my arm and we started running as fast as we could. I was so scared. I was last in place. The man was well built and appeared to be in shape and had no troubles catching up to us. As I'm running, I hear his footsteps very close behind me. 
He reached out his hand and tried to grab a hold of my hair, but my adrenaline finally kicked in and I was able to speed off beyond his grip. After a while of running, we realized we were no longer being chased. We hid in safety and called my friend's mom to pick us up and told her what happened. We gave her the location of the house and all vowed never to go near the house again. The next morning we wake up and mom explains she checked the address of the house and someone living there was a registered sex offender. Not sure if it was because of this incident, but my friend moved houses shortly after this. Our moms all collectively agreed we were not allowed to walk alone around anyone's neighborhood and that if we wanted to go out, a parent should be close by. I completely forgot about this until I recently was talking to my friend and she brought up that night. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if the man got a better grip on my hair, but I'm thankful that we got away unharmed. At 27 today, I carry a pocket knife and pepper spray with me at all times. This happened around summer 2000 in Midwest United States. I was a 12 year old boy. I was shy and never did well with confrontation. Anytime I was scared, I'd feel myself shaking. One day, my dad and the cousins were weightlifting in the garage and it was open. I decided to grab my bike out of the garage and ride up and down the street while my dad and cousins lifted. As I'm pedaling away from my house, I see another kid riding his bike, probably about five to six houses down from mine, but he's kind of going in circles. I maybe get like 20 feet near him, but that's it. No words were exchanged, not even a wave or nod. I just kept my head down and kept pedaling. On my next circle back down the street, that's when things got weird. I get near the area where the kid had been riding, but he's not there anymore. So I guess he just went inside, wherever he lived. Right as I'm about to turn around and head towards my house, which is probably about 80 to 100 yards away, I hear a man yell, Hey! In an unsettling tone, I look up and a man is standing at his front door, probably 25 feet away from me, as I'm paused on the street with my bike. He's one of the creepiest looking dudes I've ever seen in my life. He has on a ball cap and is wearing one of those Jeffrey Dahmer looking glasses. He had tan, burnt orange, dirty looking, wrinkly skin and had to be in his 40s. He looked straight out of a horror movie and just had this sinister angry look on his face. He then says, If you say anything to my son again, I'm going to run your ass over. At this point, I was crying and frozen in fear. But then I started biking home faster than ever. I would never been in a situation like this in my life. I couldn't believe what happened because I never said anything to the boy. So I get to the open garage where my dad and cousins are still lifting tell them the story and then they decided to go to this guy's house and address the situation that had just occurred. My dad and cousins had a few beers and were pretty jacked so they were ready for a tussle if needed. My dad goes straight to the guy's door with my cousin behind him and knocks loudly. The man opens the door and has this huge rottweiler by his side barking and going crazy at my dad and cousins. He threatens to let the dogs loose but my dad and cousins aren't cowering one bit. After a bit of bickering for a minute, the guy goes inside his house and shuts the door. Nothing else happens that night and we walk back home. A few days pass and now I'm about to get to the creepiest part. During the summer when my parents worked during the day, my grandma would come over and babysit my little brother and I. We were about 10 minutes from downtown and my grandma was going to take us to grab food at Sonic. We get into the car and start driving down the road towards the creepy dude's house. This made me feel uneasy, but that's the direction we had to go. As we get closer to the house, the hairs on the back of my neck start to stand up. As we go by the house, I see him. He is sitting in his red truck in the driveway, facing the road like he's about to pull out. I don't remember well, but I think he might have even had a grin on his face when we drove by. We pass the house and he pulls out behind us. I start freaking out a bit, so I tell my grandma the story about the man driving behind us. At first, my grandma is chill about it, but then I notice she seems to be shaken. This is because she had made about six to seven turns to throw him off our trail, but he kept following us every little turn. At this point, me and my brother are in the back seat with our heads down as he follows us. But luckily, we made it downtown where it was busy. We get near the police station, I believe, and take another turn. Then he finally passes by. I never saw the man again. My mom and dad split up and we left that neighborhood about two years later when my mom moved to the country. 
My dad still lives in the same house, and I wonder if that dude stuck around for a while, or even still lives at the house. What was his intent? Was it just a coincidence, or did he plan on following us? It was so weird how it looked like he was just waiting in his driveway for us to pass by. I'm 21, male, and my girlfriend is 20, female. We rented an apartment for a month. The area was secluded, and after dark, everyone would mind their own business. Neighbors would hardly talk to each other, or even be outside in the evening. Our apartment was a building with four floors, and each floor had a single apartment. All the apartments were very compact and built to be rented to students. The night we moved in, our taps ran out of water, so I went upstairs hoping to borrow some from the people living upstairs. I realized that two out of the four apartments were vacant and locked. The apartment on the fourth floor was lit from the inside, so I decided to ring the bell. But to my disappointment, nobody answered. Over the next week, we used to hear the sound of someone whacking a rod or some sort of metal on maybe the floor or some other object. This would start late at night after 1 a.m. and continue for hours. Initially, we didn't care about it, but after some time, it got us intrigued. The sound was clearly coming from one of the apartments above us, but as I already mentioned, two of the three were vacant, for sure, and the third one seemed vacant, but was lit from the inside. I knocked on this door many times, but no one ever answered. The whacking sound was a daily occurrence, and on some very late nights, we could hear someone climbing the building stairs. It seemed as if we were the only one living in the building, especially during the day, until the very late nights. We made up theories to convince ourselves that it was just nothing, but the pattern of the whacking was too irregular for it to be made from wind or something other than a person. It would start almost daily around the same time. We asked people around, but didn't get a satisfactory answer. No one knew if anyone lived there. Towards the end of our stay, I saw a shady looking man going upstairs during the day. I asked him if he was the owner of the apartments upstairs. He said he was, also including the one on the fourth floor. I asked him if anyone lived upstairs and also about the whacking sound. He told me that no one did and that he's looking for tenants. He said he had no idea about the sound. To my surprise, he then asked me, So for how long are you going to stay here? Four more days. We leave on the 30th of this month. He asked me if anyone else had rented the place for the next month, and I told him that I didn't know. So the strangest part is that the next four days, there was neither the whacking sound nor the sound of someone climbing the stairs late at night. However, my girlfriend's internship got extended by two days, and we decided to stay there. And just as I anticipated, the whacking sound resumed on the 30th, the day we were supposed to leave. I don't know what it was, and I won't ever know. It really scared me sometimes, and feels weird thinking about it even now. So this happened quite a long time ago, when I was just 20 years old. At the time, I was living alone in an apartment in a notorious building near the center of the main city. It was a Saturday night, and I had just been going out with friends and my, now, partner. Because it was past 4 a.m. already, he and his friends drove me and my close friends back to our building. She lived near me, so she only had to walk about one minute home, but it was difficult to get through by car. We said our goodbyes and my friends started walking towards her place while his friends stayed in the car. We made out for a few minutes until some guy started hollering from one of the balconies of my building. I felt a little embarrassed, so for me, that was the cue to say goodbye and go inside. I walked to the entrance, and as I entered the building, a guy walked downstairs. So I just simply pressed the button of the elevator because I didn't feel like taking the stairs to the sixth floor. The man, maybe a few years older than me, asked if I had a cigarette. I told him, no, sorry, to keep it short and simple. He just nodded, kept staring at me, and stood next to me waiting for the elevator. I felt creeped out by this, but decided to still wait for the elevator and just get home as fast as possible. At this point, I naively thought that maybe he would just leave once the elevator arrived. However, he didn't. 
Once the elevator doors opened, he stepped in and just waited for me. I got inside the elevator and noticed he didn't press any buttons. I got a weird feeling, so I excused myself and told him I needed to call a friend. He grabbed my arm and tried to pull me back into the elevator, saying, No, no, come here. I told him louder, Let go, I really need to make this call, and pulled my arm hard to free myself. I almost ran outside, but didn't know where to go. I was afraid to go back inside, but it was so late, so I didn't feel safe outside either. I just started walking around the complex and called my friend. She asked me where I was so that she could come to me, but her phone died before I could answer. I didn't know my partner well back then, so I felt really uncomfortable and almost embarrassed to reach out to him, but I did anyways. The need to get somewhere safe was bigger than my embarrassment, and I don't know anyone else that would still be up this late at night. I texted him, and once he got to know what was going on, he and his friends came racing towards me. They were there within five minutes, parked the car, and escorted me back home. By the time I had got back in the building, the guy was nowhere to be found. They still decided to escort me back to my apartment and stay with me for a while, until the sun came up and I felt comfortable enough to go to sleep. I had three locks on my doors, so as soon as they left, I locked myself in and went to sleep. I reported to my landlord, but he couldn't help much since the security cameras often didn't work and happened to be offline that evening. I told them about the guys on the balcony as well, because I didn't know if it was one of them and therefore saw me going back alone. But the landlord told me that no one with the description lived on that side of the floor. Looking back, I am so grateful I trusted my gut instinct and just got the hell out of there. I don't know if he would have done anything, but it was a weird situation regardless and it could have ended badly. My last post was about someone making a scene at night and I was worried because I was by myself, but I have another story when I was with my brother. I was around 20 to 21 and he was 18 or 19. Our friends lived in a single story complex that used to be a Motel 8 and was converted into apartment buildings. Picture a horseshoe like parking lot with maybe 20 units. My brother and I parked directly in front of the unit and left around 12 AM. We never done drugs and we're just silly kids hanging out with other silly kids. As we pulled out, someone ran in front of my car and asked me for a ride to the closest gas station. We apologized and told them that we couldn't take him. I look at my brother, who was in the passenger seat, and asked him what we should do. He's a fighter, but even this situation made him uncomfortable. He basically told me, hit the gas and get the fuck out of there. There was a stop sign at the end of the parking lot, and the guy just jumped on my hood. My brother told me, fuck the stop sign, go! As soon as I accelerated, the guy jumped off my hood and chased us, yelling obscenities. We called our friend on the ride home and told him that his neighbor was insane. This guy was higher than a kite and definitely scared the shit out of two young people. This happened over a decade ago and I told my boyfriend at the time and my parents. My ex-boyfriend lived in a multi-level apartment with his mom and aunt. We were both around 20 to 22. I entered the gate code and started driving 5 miles per hour towards the back of the apartment as that's where he lived. While I was creeping a few miles per hour, a man ran out in front of my car and started waving his arms above his head, yelling and making a scene. I'm a 100 pound 5 foot 2 female so I didn't want to roll down my windows or ask what was wrong. I drove around him because he was in the apartment parking lot and he half jogged after my car. Luckily, the complex was large so by the time I parked, he was gone. I was scared shitless and called my ex to meet me at my car before I unlocked it. I don't know if someone was in trouble or if it was someone seeing meth monsters. Either way, it made me uncomfortable and I was shaking when I parked. Hi, my name is Addy. I've been listening to some podcasts. This is why I'm here, and it's my first time posting here. For our introduction, this story happened in 2019. My sister and I were international students in Sydney, Australia. 
As we were on a tight budget, we rented a room for four months. The house had three bedrooms. All rooms have no locks with a shared toilet and shower. The first room was occupied by the brother of the owner of the house. Let's call him D. D was in his early 40s, about 5 foot 11, brown skin, and an average body type. The second room was occupied by D's friend. Let's call him F. F was in his early 60s. He's probably 6'1", with an average body type too. Then lastly, me and my sister shared a room. It's not really a big deal since we're very close. And as I mentioned, we're on a tight budget. We knew D as he was a friend's friend of my aunt. Here's the story. I arrived from work, rest for a bit, then go shower. It was probably around 7-ish and since it was winter it was pitch black outside. When you enter the shower, on the right side has a big sliding glass window painted with white so no one could see inside unless you open the window. Behind the window was our backyard with table and chairs. So I went for a shower and noticed the window was slightly opened, like just a little bit. I didn't give it much attention as I'm thinking I can't be seen from outside as it's only a very small opening. So I finished my shower and just go into the kitchen to get some food. Then T came in from the backyard with his dog. I said hi and continued what I'm doing. Months passed. Me and my sister were studying and working, so most of the time we were not home during the day and just using the room to sleep at night. One time, my sister has a late night afternoon shift, which was not her typical schedule as she always worked the early morning shift. I left for work and my sister was still sleeping, covered with blankets all over her body since it was winter. We have the same body type, 5 foot and petite, so sometimes you can't tell if someone's under the blanket or it might just be a pillow. My sister wakes up as she hears some noises happening around the room. She then opens her eyes and saw that some of her panties were scattered around the floor. She thinks that I might have just been running late and threw everything on the floor. She then saw housemate F searching our laundry basket and looking for something. Then she saw F sniffing our panties. She was horrified and scared as F is a big man. My sister pretended that she didn't see anything and asked F if he was looking for a charger. F was so shocked to see that my sister was in our bed. He said, yes, that he was indeed looking for a charger. After how many minutes, F went back to our room again and asked my sister not to tell anyone what happened earlier. My sister just agreed as she was afraid that F might do something bad to her. She went to work and texted me what happened. I was so shocked and afraid to go home because I'm the one who usually gets home first. My sister then told Dee what happened. I didn't go inside the house without Dee. I just waited outside for him. We went inside without any conversation, but Dee installed a lock on our door that night. After that happened, my sister and I moved after a week. But before we moved out, I was folding our clothes and I remember... I still have some clothes hanging outside in the backyard. It was pitch black, but when my eyes adjusted to the dark, I get our clothes. My eyes move to the shower and I see a very small opening. To my shock, when you're outside, even that very small opening, you can see everything inside the shower. That is why Dee usually went outside in our dark backyard, because he could see everything inside the shower without you noticing him since it was pitch dark outside. This is a true frightening story that occurred more than a decade ago when I was about to head into my teenage years. My friend and I were wandering around the neighborhood that I was living in as we always did. We strayed several blocks from the house we were staying at when two dogs started barking up a storm at us as we passed their house. They were pit bulls. The dogs started digging the ground under their fence. We could tell that the dogs were about to break out so my friend and I started running. As we saw the dogs get under the gate and start coming at us, we went into this person's yard and shimmied up a tree which had branches for us to get up on. The dogs are now on the base of the tree barking, which made the owner of the yard come outside and shoo the dogs away. As we were still in the tree, this owner, which looked about 50 years old, started to tell us to get into his garage so he could keep us safe. My friend and I looked at each other 
Knowing between our eyes this was dangerous, we proceeded to tell him that we were okay and we were going to head home. But he was at the base of the tree at this point, attempting to coax us into letting him help us down. The tone and mannerisms of this guy were sinister, and even as young boys, we could tell that he was a predator. This man kept looking back and forth on the street to make sure that no one was coming down, but eventually someone walking their dog down the road came along, and I said that it was my relative. We jumped down, and as the man backed up, we ran up to the person like we knew them. I always wondered what would have happened if we would have let him keep us safe. I'm a 25 year old male. I was leaving my apartment and as I was backing up there was this guy in the car next to me. The car was backed in and I was pulling out so I could see the driver clearly and he was just staring at me. He looked away and looked back and he didn't break eye contact. I waited for like 20 seconds and just stared back at him. After that I rolled up my window and asked him what's wrong. He said, huh? I asked him, why are you staring at me? He said, because you're staring at me. I said, no, you were looking at me first and I've never seen you before. He just started slowly shaking his head and did not break eye contact. I said, are you good? And he didn't say a word. I started to drive away slowly and he got out of his car and just watched me drive off. This guy is my neighbor's boyfriend and I'm not sure what to do. I have no issues with him, but now I feel very uncomfortable and I don't know what to do the next time I see him. Am I just overreacting or should I be worried? Please give me any advice you can. For a little setup, I was a petite, 4'10", 13 year old girl when this happened. My friend, Danny, who is a couple months older than me, so was also 13 at the time but he was a bit taller guy for our age group. And Sam, he was 15, shorter than Danny, but as a whole, we were just an innocent group. Several years ago, my friend Danny, Sam, and I were walking our area. We used to hang out all the time before Danny and I moved away. We lived in an area with canals, and we had never walked them before the day that prefaces this situation. We had gone out on that day, as normal. I decided we should walk the canals, just hang out and goof around. The canals are positioned so they are the backyard of these sort of apartment buildings. The buildings themselves are one story tall and are all in a row. They have a parking lot and then two or three more rows of buildings. The houses were also pushed close together and some are attached to each other. They also have green rooms in the back that had like screen walls. We had started from the bridge and went over to the canal and walked all the way to the end. The woman that lived at the building at the end came out and chatted with us. She was the older lady and told us we could hang out in her backyard anytime and offered us money to do yard work for her. She told us to knock on her door when we came over just to let her know. So we went back maybe two days later. We knocked and she didn't answer. So we went to her backyard to chill. At some point, I suggested that maybe she didn't hear us knock and went back to the front. We sent Sam up and made him knock. The nice lady's neighbor had poked his head out the window's curtains. Sam and I both saw him and turned to look. I had barely managed to get a good look at him when Danny said, We need to go to the backyard now. So the three of us went to the backyard. Before either of us could ask what was up, Danny said something along the lines of, that guy had a gun. So we all began to panic. I myself had seen a dark object in his hand, but I thought it was a TV remote. Halfway through our talk about what to do, the guy went and sat in his green room. So we were in view. He still had the gun with him. We went to the side of the lady's house to try to figure out what to do. At some point, we decided leaving was the best decision. So we left. We had scooters with us and took off across the parking lot. On our way out, we were crossing the lot and a car almost hit me. I'm not going to describe the car in detail because I can't really remember. It was silver. 
This car pulled up to the guy's house and that was all I saw before I turned the corner and we were taking off towards the church we frequented. We turned into the church's parking lot and went to the back. We kept checking around the corner of the building and we saw the silver car drive by maybe five times. It was definitely the same car. I very vividly remember seeing the same make and model drive by. The first time could have been a coincidence, but you don't see the same car drive by five times without it being suspicious. Trigger warning for this story. So I was stupid and went to an acquaintance friend's apartment that was technically a neighbor. I walked in and immediately noticed all the smoke in the air and a little boy sitting on the couch in the midst of it. The acquaintance of mine, I'll call L, and the dad, R, start smoking illegal substances and I was immediately uncomfortable. This was right in front of a child. R hit the kid a couple times and I said please don't do that. He laughed at me. I spent some time with the boy. He was excited to show me his toys and stuff. I had to get out of there and the boy grabbed my hand and begged me not to leave. I told him I'll be back. I feel so bad for lying. I got home and told a couple of people and they told me to stay out of it, but I just can't. I reported it to a child abuse hotline. I'm afraid of the repercussions because it's obvious it was me who told. I'm so sick about it. I can't sleep. Edit. Thank you all so much for the support. It means a whole lot. I'm afraid, but I feel so much better with you backing me. R also called the boy horrible names. Like some of you mentioned, it's probably much worse when they're alone. I will pursue my call and make sure the boy is helped. Just know that I appreciate all the comments so much. Edit 2. It was meth, not weed. The smoke in the air was weed, but they started smoking meth, which was what I was referring to. One morning, my husband went to take out the trash, and when he came back, he said that some kids were staring into our yard. I thought it was weird, but eventually forgot about it, until I went outside to go up to our upstairs neighbor's house. This 16 to 18 year old boy was literally standing on something looking over the fence. I got really freaked out, but just went upstairs and knocked on my neighbor's door. She didn't answer. When I turned around, I saw him just standing there staring at me through the window. I kind of froze and just stared back. After about a minute, he sat down. Now every time I look over that window, he's at the fence just staring into our backyard. It's been hours. I'm not sure if I'm overreacting, but it's just odd. Trigger warning for this story. It's a good story, but it might get uncomfortable as it was a little uncomfortable to read. When I was in first through second grade, the neighbors at the end of the block terrorized my family and their son terrorized our next door neighbors. They were a family we were really close with. I'll start with that first. Junior, the teenage psychopath, was friends with their son, who was the same age. My brother and I were always there playing with their daughter, who was my age. Our moms were very close. The mom was Maria, and she was very pretty. One day, her son told us that he was going to kill Junior. Maria told my mom that Junior had been peeping into her windows. She decided to film to get evidence because she kept finding something white on her windows. She found out Junior was masturbating to her undressing. He would then wipe his semen on her windows. This was before our family had problems with his family. One day, my dad, an avid cyclist, noticed his very expensive bike missing. He saw Junior riding it around the neighborhood. He had stolen it out of our garage. My dad went to his father and told him to get his son off his bike and give it back. His father yelled at my dad and denied Junior stole anything. Luckily, he left the bike in the driveway and my dad took it back and kept it in the basement. A few days later, someone knocked on our back door and my dad looked outside to see a plate of rice with a dead crow on it. He called the police, but since he didn't see who did it, 
They couldn't do anything. Trigger warning for this next part. When we would go out, we would leave our bunny and guinea pig in their cage outside to get fresh air. My mom, brother, and I were only out for a short period of time, and my dad was in the basement. When we got home, we went straight to the backyard that had a fence and big bushes in the back. Our kiddie pool had been out, and this is what we found. Our bunny had been drowned in the pool, and our guinea pig was thrown over the extremely high bushes into the alley. It was devastating. Piglet, our guinea pig, was still alive and my mom took her to the animal hospital. She had severe internal bleeding and her bones were broken. She had to be put to sleep. I can't believe the cruelty all over my dad confronting Junior's dad over the bike. My mom went over to their house and confronted the father. He readily admitted doing it, saying that they were just animals. He did it with a friend. I can't remember how my parents figured that out. I think Maria's mother saw them in our backyard. The police were called, but nothing happened. That wasn't the end though. One night, I woke up to my dog, Wrinkles, going crazy. She was sleeping on my bed. My bed faces my window. Then I heard knocking, and also I heard a male's voice saying something about coming in. He also called me a son of a bitch, and I also heard motherfucker. Then I saw Junior. I ran to my parents' room crying hysterically, saying that someone was trying to get into my room. My dad went outside and saw one of her patio chairs outside of my very open window. He called the police. They searched outside my window and saw shoe prints. The cops thought that there might be two people because they saw two shoe prints on the ground. I bet they were in the house, but the police couldn't search it. I was traumatized afterwards, and my bed was moved so I couldn't see the windows. I was terrified to be home at night. My parents bought lights that you could run along the entire house and all around the patio to my windows. I was still afraid at night if my blinds were left open. Nothing happened to Junior since there was no evidence it was him. Plus, someone in his family was a cop. It explains why he wasn't sent to jail for what he did to Maria, who actually caught it on camera. I also forgot to mention that my mom was talking to his mom before any of this started and she referred to her husband as the man. She hated him and joked about poisoning his food. He actually died of a heart attack shortly after Junior tried climbing in my window. We always thought that she finally poisoned him. Trigger warning for this story. I'm 19 and I'm a guy, so I've never been in such a weird and uncomfortable situation like this before. I'm not gay and I have nothing against gay people. However, I thought this encounter was completely weird and inappropriate. My neighbor lives with his wife next door and he's always outside chatting with the other neighbors. Very popular in the neighborhood and he gives everyone free beer and cuts people's grass for free. So I just figured he was a really nice guy. Yesterday, his wife wasn't there and he asked me if I could help him connect his VCR to his smart TV. I figured, why not? As soon as I stepped inside, I immediately noticed he was really drunk. He kept hugging me, telling me I have a nice body, calling me handsome and touching my chest, face, and arms in a nonchalant way, playing in an office and being really friendly. It made me uncomfortable, but I figured he was senile or something. He kept trying to make conversation and was telling me we should go to the movies sometimes and be friends. Telling me about projects around the house that he wanted me to do for money and just other really awkward shit. As I was threading the HDMI cable through the back of the TV stand, I told him that the cable might not be long enough and he said under his breath, just like the hard cock of yours. I was so caught off guard that I just pretended I didn't hear him. I've been to this guy's house before and chatted with him, but he's never once acted like that towards me, so I was just in shock. His wife was always there though, so I guess that might be why he's never tried anything till now. While I was helping him, I noticed that he had his hand in his pocket and kept aggressively adjusting his crotch. At that point, I just wanted to get the fuck out of there, but he pretty much held me hostage and started bombarding me with strange personal questions and trying to get me to drink. Just weird shit about masturbation habits, what I jerk off to, if I like men, have I ever had sex with a guy, 
am I a virgin? And he even asked me if I have ever had a cock in my mouth and presented me with an offer. I refused to answer all the questions and promptly got the hell out of there after telling him off. I'm just completely shocked because this dude was the most popular guy in the neighborhood with a wife and kids. I just wonder if his wife knows about this or if he's behaved like this around any other people besides me. The guy next door. I know a dude who killed his brother. This was way before I was born. There's a lot to the story. I don't really remember it all, but it was fucked. He eventually got out of prison after serving X amount of years. Pretty weird dude. We were all told to stay away from him as kids. Fast forward, I'm a young adult. I have two school aged siblings, maybe 12 and 14. My mom comes home from work one night, and that dude's sitting on the front steps drinking. She says, What the fuck are you doing? Get the fuck away from my house. He doesn't listen. My young brother and sister are home by themselves, mind you. My mom goes through the side door and calls the cops. The cops come put dude in a police car and dig around where he was sitting and pull out a gun under the steps. I know wild as fuck, right? Anyway, dude went to prison for a while, got out, sobered up. And my mom would see him hitchhiking sometimes and pick him up and they would talk like they were friends. Shit was weird to me. I kind of felt that my mom thought she would rather befriend him than be someone he blamed for sending him to prison. <laughs> <laughs>